Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 181 Some kid stumbled and fell before scrambling to get back up and run away. Dager sighed. He knew that was going to happen, but it was still a little bit disappointing. He was sure that the scar was a lot scarier than the children thought it would be. However, while most of the kids were still away, looking at his face curiously and fearfully, the same small girl approached him again. D does it hurt? Dejer was surprised, and unconsciously touched the scar on his face. It still hurt, especially when he got in battles a wounded clone shouldn't. And he got into a lot of those. However, he thought this wasn't the best idea to tell that to the child. No. Not anymore. I, I also have one. A scar. I got it when I was little. The girl showed Dager a small scar on her leg, barely five centimeters long. She looked at Dager expectantly, waiting for him to do something. Smiling, he patted the girl on the head, and grabbed a fruit from the tray she was carrying. You are very brave what is your name? S. Shuda. My name is Shoyuda. Before Dejer could say anything more, he was surrounded by the kids, asking all sorts of questions related to his scar. How did you get it? Was it on a battle? In how many battles you were? It appeared the kids didn't actually care for the answers, since they didn't stop to listen. Dejer was unsure of what to do, but fortunately, a mother saved him. Come on now, scatter, let's go. Let the soldier rest. Dejer nodded gratefully to the woman. He really had no idea of what to do to free himself from the curious kids. Sir, I think I never saw you so scared. Dejer sighed. He knew his squad would never let him forget this. Unless he ordered them to shut up, which he was seriously considering. Even you, Tech. Ha ha ha. Dejer. Come over here. They were still laughing when Ragu called him. Instantly serious, Dejer grabbed his helmet and walked over to where the Jedi and Cham Sindulla were sitting. Yes, General. I need you to go to Lesu. Our communications are being jammed. Find my master and talk to him about Gobi. I am sure you already know we were framed. You need to find whoever did it. Hell Squad is ready, General. No. Only one person can go, Jedi. Sindulla spoke rudely. Dejer knew that although he told his people he trusted the Republic now, that wasn't really what he thought. He wanted to make sure that he had someone on his hideout, to make sure the Republic wouldn't attack it. Then you should be the one to go, General. We can stay here. Dejer saw Sindulla's eyes dart from him to Ragu, waiting for his reaction. The Padawan smiled to Dejer, understanding perfectly what the clone tried to do. No, Dejer. This has to be made in secret, and I will surely be recognized. You, however, won't. Sindulla nodded, and the suspicion on his eyes dimmed. Dejer acknowledged Ragu's command, and discussed with the two leaders briefly, before leaving the hideout. Hell Squad got on their feet to follow him, but he told them to stay. Just when he was about to leave, someone tugged at his armor. He looked down and saw Shoyuda, the little tree lek. Are you leaving, Mr. Clone? My name is Dejer, Shoyuda. I'm only leaving for a little, then I will come back. Are you going to fight someone? Ha ha. No, I'm not. I only need to talk with my general. He is in Lesu, so I have to go there. Shoyuda looked at him and smiled happily. When she saw Dejer take his helmet and talk with Sindulla and Ragu, she had been worried he was going to leave to battle. But since he wasn't, everything was all right. But, you have to be careful, Mr. Dejer. There are Gutkers out there. They are very dangerous. Dejer had no idea what Gutkers were, but he saw no reason to make sure you to worry, so he just smiled and assured her he would be careful. Putting his helmet on, Dejer followed a bulky tree lek who led him through a series of tunnels and out of the underground. There's BRC speeders were still there, so Dejer got on one of them, and was preparing to drive away when the Trilek stopped him. Clone. Cham trust you, but I don't. 
you better come back, and have Gobi with you. Otherwise. Dajer looked at the Trilek, and left without saying anything. He didn't need to prove anything to the freedom fighters, neither did he need their trust. He would come back because his general ordered him to do so. In his opinion, however, the Republic would be better off if they didn't bother with helping the freedom fighters. Surely, saving their planet was enough, right? It was night, but the outskirts of Lesu were well lit as dozens of clone vehicles patrolled. The bridge that connected the city to the other side of the crack circling it was turned off, but a speeder was approaching it regardless. On his way to Lesu, Dajer had gone through several outposts and checkpoints, but for fear of alerting the enemy, he didn't contact General D. He would follow Ragu's orders, and only talk with General D personally. An entire squad was guarding the bridge. They didn't have the switch to turn it on, but they would contact the command center if it was needed. Who is there? It is me, Agile. Subcommander. Sorry, we didn't see it was you. It is okay. Tell them to turn the bridge on. I need to enter the city. Yes, sir. Soon after, the ray bridge was turned on, and Dajer quickly drove through it. It was clear he was in a hurry. One of the clones turned to Agile, his squad leader. Wasn't the subcommander with General Ragu and Hell Squad when he left, sir? Yeah. I wonder if something happened. Dajer jumped out of the BRC speeder as soon as he arrived in front of the 303rd headquarter. However, before he could enter the building, he heard a low, rumbling sound. It took a few seconds before he finally figured out where it was coming from. Like the hundreds of clones and civilians around him, Dajer looked up to the sky. Massive ships appeared one after another, right in front of the 303rd fleet. Suddenly, the entire sky was filled with different ships, facing each other. The design of the newly arrived ships was very different from the Triangular Republic ships. They were cylindrical, and in tones of grey and green. The Republic fleet was dwarfed before the new fleet, outnumbered two or three to one. Suddenly, without any warning or pause, many small dots appeared from the two fleets, and launched itself at one another. Red and blue intertwined in the sky, and here and there explosions happened. The Separatists were here. The invasion had started, and it was much worse than they ever expected. Chapter 182 To your battle stations. Move, move, move. Come on, what are you, clankers? Blue one ready. Steel 6 ready. Thorn 11 in position. Sergeants, lieutenants, and captains barked orders while pilots got into their starfighters. It was an organized mess, as hundreds and thousands of clones got ready for battle in a matter of seconds. Soon, the hangars of the Republic cruisers opened, and starfighters flew off to meet their opponent. Seconds before the Separatist fleet left hyperspace, the scanners on the Sincerity picked it up. Admiral. The Seppis are arriving. Sound the alarm. Admiral Dow looked out of the command bridge as Separatist ship after Separatist ship came out of hyperspace. The feeling of doom in his heart increased, but he steeled his resolve. If they were going to die, he would take as many as he could with him. Turning away from the window, Admiral Dow had a serious expression on his face, but there were also glints of excitement. All soldiers to their battle stations. I want every pilot in the air. After the first engagement, find the weakest ship and focus your fire. Turrets, don't let a droid slip past us. Cannons, go all out, no holding back. Yes, sir. Let's show them Ryloth is not an easy target. Let's show them the 303rd isn't playing. Show them all we've got, and they will understand that they will have to pay a heavy price to get through us. All the crew acknowledged his orders, and the entire fleet was bustling with activity as the starfighters of both sides flew to meet each other. Under his breath, Admiral Dow murmured something only he could hear. And let us go out in a blaze of glory. Dajer looked up to the sky, and saw the huge battle happening. Instantly, he knew they had no chance. However, he believed in Admiral Dow. He knew the old commander already noticed it. He would buy as much time to the troops on the ground as he could. Shaking his head, Dajer yelled at the troops surrounding him to get back to work. 
they had to make good use of the time their brothers were giving them at the cost of their lives. If you have nothing to do, go find something, whatever it is. If you already have, hurry up. Move. The soldiers started to move, a sense of urgency that wasn't there before now gripping their hearts. Dajer walked inside the building as fast as he could without looking too worried. General D and Commander Keeley were around a hologram table, dead serious. On the table, a hologram of Admiral Dow appeared. Dajer hurried into the room and listened to the conversation. General D and Commander Keeley barely saw him enter. Won't be long before they break through our blockade. We are losing fighters too fast. The transmission shook, as if something hit the sincerity. I am sorry, General, but we can't buy you much more time. Hold for as long as you can, Dao. Contact the Jedi Council, ask for help. There have to be something they can do. I will try, General. May the Force be with you. The transmission was cut, and General D immediately turned to Commander Keeley and Dajer. We need to secure the supplies. In a few days they will break through our blockade, and land. We have to be prepared. About it, General. We have supplies for a month if we keep splitting them with the population like you ordered, General. However, if we... No. We are here to save Ryloth, not starve it to death. Commander Keeley looked at Dajer, and nodded. They were already doomed, maybe sharing their supplies wouldn't be of any harm. Yes, General. Dajer. Where is Ragu? What about the Freedom Fighters? We will need them. Quickly, Dajer explained everything that happened. The faces of the two became grave, and General D instantly left the room, followed by Dajer and Commander Keeley. They soon arrived at the City Council building, where two Trilek guards tried to stop them, but General D simply pushed them aside, leaving them extremely confused and fearful. Dajer and Commander Keeley looked at each other. They had never seen their general so angry. The Nikto had a lot to deal with, and it was clearly taking a toll on him. Shar yelps. His voice amplified by the force, General D called for the leader of the council. Many minutes later, the fat Trilek appeared in the room, followed by other members of the council. Master D. There is a battle in the sky. Is this the peace the Republic promised us? Shar yelps. You know everything that happens in this city. Did a man by the name of Gobi come looking for me? Fear glistened in Yelp's eyes, and he even shuddered when he heard the name. He quickly disguised it, but his reactions showed that he clearly knew something. Gobi. Isn't that Cham Sindulla's dog? Why would he come to me to see you, Master Jedi? Leave us. General D ordered the other Trileks in the room to leave, and, when seeing them hesitate, Dajer and Commander Keeley stepped menacingly towards them. Scared by the two clones, they quickly left. Shar Yelps tried to leave too, hiding amidst them, but General D pulled him back using the force. W what are you doing? Why you can't do that? I am your ally. General D made the fat Trilek float until he was above a stool, and released him. The stool creaked under his weight, but held on. General D sat in front of him, with Dajer and Commander Keeley on his sides. Shar yelps, for how long have you been working for the Separatist? Fear transpired from every pure of Yelp's body, and he let out a weird snarl, clearly scared. I, I don't know what you are talking about, Master Jedi. General D sighed, and motioned for Dajer and Commander Keeley to grab Yelp's. W what are you doing? Dajer, Keeley, arrest him for treason against the Republic. The Twi'lek shrunk, and stopped struggling. Being charged with treason was worse than death. He kept silent for a while, but when he saw that the two clones really were going to arrest him, he spilled everything. It wasn't me. Count Dooku forced me to help him. I had to put Gobi away, otherwise Count Dooku would eliminate me when he conquered Ryloth. Dajer almost spat with disgust. And I bet you would receive a nice role after he defeated us, right? Somewhere from which you can watch as your people starve and suffer under the Seppis. Don't worry, that is not happening. They won't set a foot on Ryloth. Who else is with you? 
Yelps told them a list that included almost all the members of the city council. Immediately, Dejer ordered some clones to arrest those men. After watching the defeated Shar Yelps being taken away, Dejer turned back to General D. Hadn't the Jedi been so decisive, it would have taken them a while to startle all the corrupts off their holes. Gobi was a Twi'lek with blue skin, and very friendly. After Deja rescued him from the dungeon he was in and told him what happened, he promptly said he would talk with Sindulla, and that the Freedom Fighters would surely join hands with the Republic to fight the Separatist. Deja looked up to the sky, where the battle was still going on, before turning to Gobi. Talk with Sindulla. We will need all the help we can get. And it still won't be enough. Suddenly, his eyes were attracted to a huge series of explosions. An acclimator class cruiser had thrown itself in between two separatist frigates in a move. Facing the point-blank barrage of the Republic cruiser, the frigates fell apart, becoming debris floating in space. The price, however, was steep, as the cruiser now lay dead in the space, just waiting to be destroyed. Chapter 183 Here they come, boys. Rosal only had time to say that before the enemy's vulture droids met them. The 303rd had about 2,500 starfighters, but they were outnumbered 4 to 1. The cloud of vulture droids flying at high speed to meet them was almost a compact mass, and when he looked at them, Rosal had no idea of how they were going to get through. He was in a V-Wing, a faster model than his old ARC-170. Taking advantage of the fighter's nimbler movements, he found a spot, and dove towards it. Lasers flew all around them as steel battalion cut through the droids. Without even letting his finger leave the trigger, Rosal fired all the missiles he had, without sparing one. A group of vulture droids in front of him blew to pieces, and he passed through the cloud of debris, his fighter shaking when the bigger ones hit it. Looking to the sides, he saw his battalion behind him, although he saw many gaps in their formation. On his communicator he could hear screams and his brothers yelling, reporting problems and casualties, or just celebrating a nice shot. Revert, now. Rosal pulled a lever, and his body went forward with the sudden stop. Luckily he was well strapped, or he would have gone through the windshield. Turning around, Steel Battalion was presented with the defenseless backs of the vulture droids, now with some noticeable gaps. Pushing the lever forward again, Rosal flew after the enemies, blasting as many as he could. At the first sight that the droids were turning around, he ordered Steel Battalion to scatter. The first part is over, boys. Now, let's fly. Admiral Dow was once more looking through the window, watching the battle unfold. Even with the statistics that the bustling command bridge was giving him, he knew they were facing problems. Up till now, only the starfighters had engaged the enemy, but soon they would clash with the bigger ships. Admiral. We established a connection with the Jedi Council. Admiral Dow rushed to the hologram table, and was faced with three holograms. The first one was General Kenobi, whom he had met not too long ago. The second one was a black, bald man with a serious face. He was General Mace Windu, a member of the Jedi Council. And the last one was a small, green, and old Jedi, Master Yoda. The Jedi refused to be called by General. Master Yoda. We are under attack by the Separatist fleet on Ryloth. We need reinforcements immediately. General Windu answered for Master Yoda while General Kenobi caressed his beard thoughtfully. That is impossible, Admiral. All our fleets are occupied in other sectors. General, with all due respect, but if we don't get those reinforcements, Ryloth will be lost. Hold on you will have to, Admiral. As soon as we can, reinforcements sent will be. Admiral Dow sighed, but before he could say anything, a crewman ran towards him, and whispered something. Put it on. An image of a clone captain appeared near the three Jedi Masters. They also could see it from their end. Admiral. We are starting to take fire from their frigates. Hold on, Captain Wheat. Rosal. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Admiral. Just. Give me a moment. Ehu. I'm here, Admiral. The voice of Rosal came through the communicator, and so did the sound of explosions. Rosal grunted for a moment, 
clearly focusing on something else, before letting out a victorious yell. Take Steel Battalion and help Captain Wheat. But split up. The Resolute is just the first to face heavy fire. Yes, Admiral. I'm out. Admiral Dow turned back to the hologram. Captain Wheat had already disconnected to deal with the attack. In moments like those, all cordiality was thrown away. I will also leave, generals. I have to focus here, otherwise we will all die. Or, at least, we will die faster. Admiral Dow disconnected right away. In Coruscant, thousands of parsecs away, General Kenobi looked at the other two. I sense a lot of rage in the Admiral. Is there really nothing we can do? If we move troops to Ryloth, we lose other systems. Master D will have to hold on his on, at least for now. I believe Master Skywalker and you might be free soon, if the battles progress as they are. That is true. For now, let's hope Master D can manage. What are your thoughts on this, Master Yoda? Um. Very clouded the future of Master D is. But Master Windu is right. All we can do is our hopes in the force put. Rosal zoomed by a separatist frigate, narrowly missing it. When a starfighter met a bigger ship, it had two options. It could either fly very far, or fly very close. By flying far, it was easier to dodge. By flying very close, the turrets would have difficulty aiming. As a veteran and skilled pilot, Rosal preferred flying close. He dodged the lasers fired by the turrets easily, and continued his flight towards the Resolute. His men followed him closely, but one of them wasn't lucky, and the turrets got him. Steel 6 blew up immediately, leaving almost nothing behind. However, their tactic worked, as the dozen or so vulture droids chasing them found UT almost impossible to have their dexterity, and hit their own frigate. Some big holes appeared in the armor of the ship, and two of the turrets were destroyed when the vulture droids hit them. Rosal and his ten remaining pilots flew towards the Resolute. The rest of Steel Battalion was scattered all over space. Now, they could see the Resolute, and the flames that flickered into existence, only to be immediately extinguished by the vacuum. By now, all the ships had joined the fray, but as the first one attacked, the Resolute was in bad shape. Rosal led his men around it, chasing away vultures and tri-fighters, but it was clear that the enemy was merciless, and didn't care for how many ships it lost. Ah! Rosal saw one of his men blew up beside him. Seeing the brothers with which he trained together for years die one after another, Rosal had the feeling that everything they were doing was futile. Since things were already like this, he might as well try one last time. Steel Battalion nearby, follow me. Since those clankers want to destroy us so much, let's show them what Steel Battalion is made of. Ehu. Oh yeah. We are with you, sir. Always. Rosal. What are you doing? Get back here. The voice of Captain Wheat cut off the cheers of his brothers. Deadly serious, Rosal calmly answered the captain while at the same time spinning his V-wing and firing two volleys of lasers at a turret. We are making no difference back there, Captain. If we are going to die, I want one of them to go with me. With us. Rosal dove between two frigates, dodging their turrets expertly. Steel Battalion followed him, and the two frigates aimed at the large group of starfighters. Two V-wings were hit, and crashed down on the Munificent-class frigates, one of them even hitting near the command bridge. The rest of Steel Battalion passed through almost unharmed, and in their hurry to take down the threat, the frigates forgot they were on each other's line of fire. Chapter 184 Explosions happened on both frigates as their turrets fired at each other. It took the slow circuits of the clankers a few seconds to notice they were being played by Steel Battalion, and that cost them a huge price. After stopping, the two Munificent-class frigates sent huge amounts of vulture droids after the seven or eight V-wings. Rosal looked unsatisfied at the damage they had done, but was forced to get away by the incoming droids. One more of his pilots had been shot down when he heard Captain Wheat speaking to him. He realized that the captain had been talking for a few seconds, but he was too much into the fight to notice. Get away, Rosal. Steel Battalion already did their part. 
Now is time for us to do ours. Rosal slightly looked at the Resolute, and saw a scene he wouldn't forget for as long as he lived. The Eclameter class cruiser had powered down its shields, instead putting all its power on the heavy cannons and turrets scattered around the body of the ship. Rosal realized what Captain Wheat was doing seconds before the cruiser dove between the two frigates in a move, and fired all batteries. In the command bridge of the Resolute, Captain Wheat looked at the valiant efforts of Steel Battalion, and his eyes became determined. Every one of his brothers was giving their lives to help them, but the captain knew that the Resolute was a lost cause. It was too damaged to last the whole battle. As such, why make Admiral Dow waste more starfighters and lives on it? The captain turned away from the window, and walked to the hologram table. An image of Admiral Dow and other officers appeared. The admiral barely paid attention to Captain Wheat as he was too occupied barking orders. Admiral. The Resolute is damaged beyond repairs. We only have power for one more volley. Hold on, Captain. I will try and send more fighters to aid you. No, sir. It was an honor serving with you. If you survive, pass my respects to General D. Wheat. What do you plan on doing? However, Captain Wheat had already turned off the hologram table. He sat on his chair, and looked at the crew around him, all working the best they could to fight. Sergeant. Turn off the shields. The clone staggered, and everyone on the bridge looked at him surprised. What, sir? You heard me, Sergeant. Turn off the shields and divert the power to the heavy cannons. The sergeant hesitated, then saluted Captain Wheat, and the crew copied him. They understood perfectly what those actions meant. Shields down. The shaking got slightly stronger, as each laser that hit the Resolute was doing direct damage instead of being absorbed by the shields. Thankfully, Steel Battalion had created a diversion, so the frigates had yet to notice that the cruiser was defenseless. The captain pressed a button on the chair, and when he spoke, every loudspeaker on the ship transmitted his voice. Brothers, the Seppis hit us good this time. But don't think we will let them go so easily. I want every man on the turrets. When I give the order, fire everything we have for the 303rd. For the Republic. Cheers and yells sounded in the entire ship as every trooper ran towards the turrets. In a matter of a few seconds, ammunition was stockpiled behind the turrets. Firing one round was good. Firing two was a bonus. In the command bridge, Captain Wheat waited for his orders to be carried out, and then nodded to the crew. Full power ahead. The Resolute was almost still before, but suddenly, it reached a terrific speed as all caution was thrown to the wind. The two frigates clearly weren't expecting this suicidal move, and the tip of the Resolute found a gap between them. As the wider parts of the cruiser followed the tip, the Resolute was like a hot knife cutting through butter. Pieces of the frigates were crushed or sent spinning in the vacuum, together with parts of the Resolute. The Republic cruiser shook, causing many clones to fall down and the turret's ammunition to roll around, crushing some troopers. The gunners, however, stood still, their fingers on the trigger, waiting for the order. It soon came. Captain Wheat's voice reached every trooper in the ship as he gave his final command. Fire. Like one, all the turrets fired and close how they were, the lasers cut through the frigates. Explosions followed the sides of the frigates as their own turrets fired seconds before being hit. After the initial clash, few turrets were still operational on the Resolute, but they didn't give up, and fired a second round, and some even managed to get a third one out before the cruiser lost power, and became completely dark. In the command bridge, Captain Wheat looked at the results of their desperate action. One of the frigates had been badly damaged, and started to tilt, leaving its belly exposed. In their last effort, some of the turrets managed to fire around in the defenseless frigate, and the separatist ship started to drift away, ripped apart. The second frigate was even worse. It had been directly torn in half by the barrage, and the command bridge had exploded. While Captain Wheat was watching, a late explosion shook the down ship, causing its two halves to totally separate. The two ships were out of the battle, and Captain Wheat doubted there were any survivors. The Resolute and him had completed their final promise, trading their life for the two frigates. 
Thank you, brothers. Those last words were whispered into the loudspeakers, but barely anyone heard them. The cruiser was almost dead, and the few crewmen still alive were mortally wounded on the floor. The last thing Captain Wheat saw were two giant lasers fired by the distant recusant class destroyer. The lasers hit the defenseless command bridge of the Resolute, blowing it up. The explosion started a chain reaction, and the once magnificent cruiser became more debris in the space above Ryloth. Rosal flew away from the Resolute just before the cruiser experienced its final moments. Hundreds of vulture droids were caught in the blast, leaving this part of the battlefield empty for a moment. He found the pilots of Steel Battalion. Of the ten that went to help the Resolute, only four remained. Come on, boys. This battle is far from over. Admiral Dow watched with sorrow on his face as the Resolute was mercilessly destroyed by the big Separatist ship. Captain Wheat fought to the very bitter end, and took down two enemy vessels with him. Unfortunately, that was far from enough. He looked at the crewmen around him. He wasn't a clone, but in the months that he battled together with them, he had come to think of himself as one. He mourned the death of his brothers, but the battle didn't stop for him. Get ready. Soon it will be our turn to shine. He was sure the sincerity would shine. It would shine a very bright light before its fire dimmed down. And when that happened, he wanted the cruiser to be surrounded by the wreckage of enemy ships. The explosion of the Resolute and the two frigates was visible from every corner of Ryloth. Outside the Freedom Fighters' hideout, Ragu and Hell Squad looked at the battle. Several Trileks were with them. That. That was the Resolute, wasn't it? Yeah. I bet it was Wheat's idea. He went out just like he always said he would. In a blaze of glory. In a blaze of glory. Watching the battle unfold, despair appeared on the hearts of Hell Squad for the very first time. Chapter 185 Rosal flew away from the broken remains of the Resolute, his mind now on the vulture droid he was chasing. He missed two volleys, but the third round of lasers hit the target, and the droid lost control, and crashed into pieces of debris that were floating around. There are two on my tail. Hold on, Steel 9, I'm coming. Rosal turned around, and saw one of the few remaining members of Steel Battalion being chased by two vulture droids. His left wing had been hit, but the pilot was still dodging expertly. Rosal flew directly towards the other V-wing, as if he was preparing to have a head-on collision. Seconds before the two ships hit each other, Steel 9 put all his weight in one of the levers, making the starfighter fly up. The two vulture droids were surprised to see another V-wing flying towards them, and weren't able to dodge Rosal's laser cannons. There was a brief pause as he couldn't find any droids near him, which allowed Rosal to take a look at the battle. The number of Republic starfighters had visibly fallen, while the numerical advantage the enemy had was still the same, maybe even higher. Two Aclamator-class cruisers were badly damaged, while the other three and the Venator-class cruisers were still holding on pretty well. The Separatist had taken more losses than them. Not only had the Resolute taken down two frigates, but during the battle a third one had been blown up. Many other frigates and dreadnoughts were damaged, but only one of them was in critical condition. The recusant class destroyer was still intact, its turrets taking down any pilot bold enough to attack it. If things continued like this, the Republic would lose in the first clash. Rosal, however, saw an opportunity. He turned on his communicator and called Admiral Dow. What is it, Rosal? The dreadnought in grid 0 to 17. It was badly damaged by our attacks. If we can do a bomb rush, we might be able to take it down. The Admiral thought for a while. Rosal was right. It was risky, but if they destroyed the dreadnought, the Separatist would probably retreat for the day. How confident are you? 50 50. I will take those odds. What do you need? Rosal quickly counted how many starfighters Steel Battalion had left, and ordered them to regroup with him. Three or four bombers, and a dozen pilots to escort them. Blue Leader, you heard him. Blue Leader on the move. Let's go, boys. Followed by about thirty pilots, twenty from Steel Battalion, and ten from Blue Squadron, Rosal started flying towards the dreadnought. The four Y-wing bombers were in the middle, 
protected by their small escort. Captain. BZZ. Our scanners detected a small group of. Republic fighters headed our way. In the command bridge of the dreadnought, AB-1 battle droid turned around to talk with the captain. Using the blue colors that identified him as a pilot captain, the B-1 unit quickly dismissed the approaching group. Focus fire on the nearest. Republic cruiser. Let the turrets. Deal with those flies. Yes. BZZ. Sir. The mixed group flew in a tight formation. Now, any kind of rank or division didn't matter. If they didn't destroy the dreadnought, then the battle would be over. Fighters, when we go by, fire all missiles, spare nothing. Try to take down the turrets. Bombers, your target is the command bridge. We only have one, maybe two chances, so if the first sweep fails, turn around and give it another go. Understood? Yes, sir. Good. Let's go. The first obstacle that the group met was the vulture droids that flew to stop them, but thankfully, the droid captain had been stupid enough to dismiss the Republic starfighters as a small threat and sent the bulk of his forces to attack a cruiser. As such, the thirty-odd starfighters cut through their opposing side with only four casualties, and now had a clear line of sight to the dreadnought. Only when they were so close did the scanners lock in the bombers. Immediately, the turrets focused their fire in the middle of the Republic group, but it was too late. The starfighters fired their missiles in quick succession, and knocked down many of the ship's turrets, although this came at the cost of seven or eight lives. They flew close to the ship, straight to the command bridge, and some of the droids threw themselves at the floor, thinking that the Republic was going to kamikaze them. However, seconds before the starfighters collided with the command bridge, they parted ways, one half going to the right, and the other to the left. For Y-Wing remained on the route, and released everything they had. One of them was taken down by the turrets, but the remaining three succeeded in their mission. The dreadnought's shields held on for a few seconds before finally failing. The command bridge blew up immediately, and the long neck that connected it to the rest of the ship broke, and fell down. Without the command bridge, the dreadnought lost control, and quickly fell towards the planet below. The recusant class destroyer had remained at the back of the separatist fleet, and only engaged in small parts of the battle. Sitting on the captain's chair, it was a weird droid. It was much bulkier than the normal units, and very square. Its eyes glowed with white light as it quickly calculated probabilities. It was a tactical droid, built to think instead of fighting. This unit in specific was called TA-175, and was personally chosen by Count Dooku. While he was watching the dreadnought being destroyed, TA-175 shook his head, and made some calculations before speaking to the nearby droid crew with his deep voice. We suffered too many. Losses too. Day. BZZ. Order retreat. Yes. Sir. Dager watched from Ryloth as a separatist Providence-class dreadnought crashed down towards the planet. The crash site was far from Lesu, but everyone in the city heard the explosion, and saw the dust cloud. Not long after, Dager saw the separatist ships turning around and retreating. The clones around him and the population of Ryloth cheered, but the enemy fleet simply stopped after getting out of range from the Republic. They had won the first clash, but the battle was far from over. All fighters, return to your cruisers. The Resolute's fighters, your new docking zone is on the sincerity. Admiral Dow spoke somberly, but most of the pilots cheered as they got back to their ships. Only those from the Resolute were quiet as they made their way to the sincerity. Landing his V-wing, Rosal looked around. He was glad to see many familiar faces, but sad for the ones he didn't. He had lost good brothers. Even with the starfighters from the Resolute docking in the sincerity, the hangar wasn't full. It was clear that they had lost many ships. Too many. Rosal got off his starfighter, and sat on the stairs. The battle lasted for more than eight hours, and his hands were hurting from gripping the controls and triggers. His back ached as he stretched to clear some of the tension. How are you, sir? Rosal turned around, and saw Spark, one of the newest pilots of Steel Battalion. He felt bad for the rookie, 
who had been sent from Kamino just to die. I am all sore. Come on, let the engineers deal with the ships. I'm hungry. Chapter 186 Dager, Commander Keeley, and General D looked at a hologram of Admiral Dow and the captains of the other cruisers. However, there were fewer faces there than on the day before. We lost the Resolute in three corvettes, General. However, Steel Battalion and Blue Squadron were able to take down one of their dreadnoughts. We saw it. What about reinforcements? Did the Jedi Council say anything? Admiral Dow shook his head. No help is coming, General. General D sighed. He already expected that, but it was disappointing anyways. There is nothing much to say then, Admiral. I suspect they will wait at least a day or two before attacking again. Even though they are a droid army, it stills take them some time to organize themselves. Take advantage of that time to prepare. You know what to do. Yes, General. Good luck, and may the force be with you. To you too, General. The holograms disappeared, and General D turned to Dager. We have to make sure Sindulla is on our side before the Separatists break through our blockade. Dager, show me the way. Sindulla's man is also coming. Yes, General. Keeley, you will be in charge of the defenses here. Bring the ones who suffered the most damage to the back. I want the sincerity and the righteous to be on the back too. They will be our last card. If they start to break through, these two have to cover the holes. Yes, Admiral. As soon as the call with General D ended, Admiral Dow started to bark orders, which were quickly followed. His decisiveness and tactics had been one of the reasons why the Republic held ground so well on the first battle, and his prestige was now higher than ever amongst the troops. After making sure everything was on the right path, Admiral Dow left the command bridge. It was very unlikely that the Separatist would attack again so soon, and he wanted to use this chance to rest. The battle had taken a toll on him, even though the sincerity was not once under fire. The corridors and hallways of the Sincerity were emptier than ever. Of the 2,000 starfighter pilots that the 303rd fleet had, about 400 had perished in this first clash. It was rare to find wounded and injured in space battles. If your ship was hit, it was almost the same as a death sentence. That was one of the reasons why the mortality rate of the Republic Air Force was much higher than the infantry's. Before he laid on his bed to get his much-needed sleep, Admiral Dow held some calculations on his mind. Before the battle, he had told General D that he would be able to hold the Separatist for a month. Now, after seeing their strength, he couldn't even guarantee he would survive for ten days. Jedi Master Imagun D. Welcome to the Freedom Fighters. Cham Sindela. I'm glad to see you didn't let your rage take the best of you. This proves you are a good leader. I hope that with your Freedom Fighters and the 303rd Attack Legion allied, we will be able to defend Ryloth." The Twi'lek sneered when he heard General D, but, even though the way the Jedi put his words was an obvious attempt to confirm their alliance, didn't deny it. That was the same as agreeing to fight side by side with the Republic. General D looked around, and didn't see Hell Squad nor Regu. Where is my Padawan? I didn't tell him you were coming. I wanted to make sure Gobi was okay. The blue Twi'lek stepped forward and tapped Sindulla on his shoulder, after which the freedom fighter visibly relaxed. I am, brother. I told you, we can trust the Republic. Sindulla gazed at Gobi, and shook his head. To him, this brother of him trusted the others too much. That would get him eliminated one day. But, for now, Sindulla decided to follow Gobi's advice. The Republic ships blowing up in space was enough proof of how much they were willing to sacrifice. Follow me. The four went through a crack in the rocks, and eventually found themselves in a tunnel. Not long after, Dager started to recognize the place. As soon as they entered the big cave, two Twi'leks threw themselves over Gobi. The first one was a young woman with pink skin, and eyes full of tears. The second person was a little girl. Iva. Shoyuda. Seeing the family be reunited, Sindulla allowed himself to smile. After gazing at the family, 
General D found his Padawan amidst the growing crowd, and beckoned him forward. Hell Squad followed the Tigruta closely. Master. I see everything went well. General. Yes, Ragu. Dajer will explain what happened. For now, I need to talk with Sindela. We have to move the freedom fighters around the planet to the cities. Moreover, I want at least one or two of them in every outpost we have. Why? They know the planet. Not only they know how to fight here, but they should also know better places for ambushes and defense. Dajer, talk with Gobi and the other leaders amongst the freedom fighters. Organize them. However, I am not sure they will listen to me. Many of them don't view the Republic well. They will follow Sindela. Dajer was watching as hundreds of Trileks packed their belongings and started to move. Cham Sindela was with General D and Ragu at the head of the line, while Hell Squad was scattered in the crowd, helping the young and elderly. Gobi, Maiwi, Tram Chalk, and two other Trileks called Taboon and Yate were Sindela's lieutenants. Those five were also amidst the crowd, organizing them to move faster. Since they were moving at quite a fast pace, and no problems had appeared yet, Dajer looked at the sky for a moment. Like they had been for the past day, the 393rd fleet was immobile in the sky. They were too far away for Dajer to see details of the cruisers, but if he was near, he was sure he would see various scars on the ships. For now, he couldn't see the Separatist, but he had no doubt they would strike again soon. What are those in the sky, Mr. Dajer? The subcommander looked down and saw Shoyuta standing near him. The little girl barely reached his hips. He crouched next to her, and noticed Gobi watching him. The Trilek might trust Dajer to fight alongside him, but no parent would be comfortable if their daughter got near a dangerous man like Dajer. Those are Republic cruisers, Shoyuta. See that big one right in the middle? Her name is the Sincerity. It is the ship that brought me here. Are they here to protect us? They sure are. All my brothers are giving everything they had to protect Ryloth. Yesterday there was a very, very loud sound. Did you fight the bad guys? Dajer smiled. The little girl didn't understand how wars worked, and her eyes shone with excitement when she heard Dajer talk about the battle. Yes. Yesterday a ship fell down from the sky, but it was a bad guy's ship. No one is going to get to Ryloth while our ships are in the sky. Let's see just how long they can last. Of course the small Shoyuta wouldn't utter such vicious comment. Standing up, Dajer saw Tram and Yate looking at him. The one who spoke was Tram. The two Trileks clearly disliked the Republic. Dajer, however, just gave them a cold glance before putting on his helmet and moving away. He had no wish nor reason to waste time talking with those two. Chapter 187 They are starting to move. All fighters to the air. Round 2 is about to start. The Admiral watched as the Separatist fleet started to move towards them, their vulture droids already flying in front of them. Several Republic V-wings got out of the cruisers. Soon, the battle started, and ships exploded on both sides. The Sincerity stood behind, and the other cruisers advanced to compose the first line of defense. When he saw the enemy condemning all of his big ships to the frontal assault, Admiral Dow knew it was going to be a tough battle. Rosal spun his V-wing, dodging a volley of red lasers. The battle had been raging on for more than two hours now, and no cruiser or frigate had been damaged beyond repair. With a sudden stop, Rosal changed his course in midair, and confused the vulture droid chasing him, allowing another steel battalion pilot to take care of him. Followed by his brothers, he went searching for other droids to destroy. The freedom fighters and their new allies were almost on Lesu when the battle in the space started again. Along the way they had dropped off some of the Trileks, people that Sindela trusted to help the clones on the outposts. As bright explosions illuminated the sky, and the Separatist fleet appeared, the Freedom Fighters stopped to look at the battle. Many of them felt despair. How were they supposed to fight something like that? Move, come on. They are on space, they can't get us here. Let's go. Sindulla quickly ordered his people to move. If they watched for too long, 
they could lose all their confidence, and that might lead to their deaths. Hell Squad looked at Dager, who shook his head. He wasn't going to lie to them. The tree legs around him, especially Shoyuta, were looking at them anxiously, as if they could do something. Thankfully, General D spoke before despair started to spread. People of Ryloth, do not worry. For as long as the Republic exists, we will not abandon you. We are here for you, and we will not leave. You hear? Yuhu. Cheers sounded as General D's words brought hope back to their hearts. The Separatist fleet might be big, but it was true that the Republic was doing everything it could to fight them. Sindulla looked at his people and said nothing. Tram's face still showed discontentment, but since his leader said nothing, he also kept quiet. For the first time Maiwi and Yate were hesitant in complaining about the Republic. General D, unfortunately, I don't think we can hold them back any longer. You did your best, Admiral. You gave us enough time to perfect our defenses on the ground. Still nothing from the Jedi Council. No, sir. I contacted them again today, but even though I told them our blockade was going to fall, they said it was impossible to send reinforcements. Then we fight with what we have, Admiral. May the force be with you. We will continue our battle up here, General. Admiral Dow out. The Admiral looked ten years older, even though only sixteen days had passed since the first Separatist offensive. The 303rd Fleet was now severely depleted. Of the more than 2,000 starfighters, only 700 remained. Including the Resolute, four of the six Acclimator class cruisers had been destroyed. A Venator class cruiser had also fallen during the tenth day of battle, when a Separatist Munificent class frigate crashed into it. Several dozen CR 90 corvettes and other support ships had been destroyed. The losses of the Separatist were even worse, but their fleet remained bigger and stronger. Of the 10,000 vulture droids, about half became floating debris. Nine munificent class frigates were taken out, and three Providence class dreadnoughts were wrecked. Even the recusant class destroyer was damaged. But now, the separatists were about to break the Republic blockade. Even with them giving all they had, the 303rd fleet simply didn't have enough ships to cover the area. They really couldn't be blamed, for they had fought bravely, and resisted for much longer than they were expected to. Each pilot had been so dedicated that even in their dying moments, with their ships and starfighters burning and breaking apart around them, some had resorted to attacks, crashing their ships in hopes of damaging more the enemy. Any other army would have collapsed by now, but the clones were still persisting. As Admiral Dow said, and his men adopted, they all went out in a blaze of glory. Admiral Dow now watched as several C-9979 landing crafts crossed the blockade. The sincerity was in no position to help, as it was currently under siege by one dreadnought and three frigates. The cruiser had holes in several places, and many turrets were gone, but with the assistance of several V-wings, it was still holding on. The only ones going after the separatist troop carriers were a small squadron of starfighters, the remainings of Steel Battalion. When Rosal saw the C-9979s, he gathered about ten pilots, all that was left from his entire battalion, and followed them without hesitation. They, in turn, were chased by several vulture droids, but completely ignored them. Even without Admiral Dow's orders, Rosal knew what was Steel Battalion mission. Truth to be told, Steel Battalion and Rosal were one of the reasons why the 303rd hadn't faltered before today. Every pilot gave their all, and the battalion was responsible for taking down two of the dreadnoughts, four frigates, and several smaller ships. The number of vulture droids they destroyed was uncountable. One last effort, boys. Remember, each troop carrier we take down is a thousand droids less for our brothers on the ground. Uha. Let's get them. These seppies don't know who they are messing with. Laughing madly, the clones pushed their starfighters to the maximum. They now didn't care for whether they died or not. They had accepted their destiny, and the only thing they wished was to eliminate more clankers. Rosal also laughed, and pushed the throttle to the maximum, increasing his speed to dangerous levels. The C-9979s soon entered his aim, and he fired his last two concussion missiles. One of them missed when a vulture droid escorting the troop carriers entered its way, 
but the other hit the side of one of the ships, blowing up a hole. Several other missiles and normal lasers followed his, destroying the escort and taking down two of the troop carriers. We got bugs on our tail. Suddenly, the vulture droids that chased them announced their arrival by blowing up one of the V-wings. Keep going. When they reach the atmosphere they will slow down automatically. Push forward. Entering the atmosphere too fast would cause a ship to catch on fire, systems would fail, and depending on the speed, the whole ship might blow up. Steel Battalion, however, didn't care. Just before he entered the atmosphere, Rosal spun and stopped. The vulture droids flew past him dangerously close, but as their circuits dictated, slowed down when they reached Ryloth's atmosphere. Taking advantage of this, Rosal fired wildly, destroying at least eight or nine vulture droids before the second batch of them caught up. Grinning, he speed up again, reaching maximum velocity almost instantly. With the corner of his eyes, he saw two of his starfighters blow up as the impacts from entering the atmosphere proved to be too much for the already damaged ships. His own V-wing caught on fire, but held on. His men were focusing their fire on one of the C-9979 landing crafts, so he followed them. He laughed wildly when the ship started smoking and lost control, although its destruction came at the cost of one more Republic starfighter. Chapter 188 Of the ten pilots of Steel Battalion that followed the C-9979 landing crafts, six were left. Rosal watched the flames on his V-wing start to burn his reactor, and knew he was out of time. The whole starfighter shook as screws fought to hold the ship together. Rosal grinned, and silently thanked the starfighter for fighting by his side for so long. Come on, boys. Two more and I will be happy. He heard a clone curse on the communicator, and saw one of Steel Battalion's ships spin wildly as it lost a wing. The starfighter crashed down on Ryloth. Now they had five pilots. Finding his target, Rosal lowered his starfighter, which caused the V-wing to shake even more, and pushed the trigger, sending wave after wave of blue lasers at the belly of one of the troop carriers. He was joined by the other four pilots, and soon a hole opened on the landing craft, spewing deactivated droids. Ah! Damn it! The vultures got me, sir. See you soon. Ha ha ha! Spark, a rookie on Steel Battalion laughed maniacally. He had been sent to the 303rd very recently, and his first battle would also be his last, but the clone had proved himself to be an amazing pilot by surviving till today. Unfortunately, his time was over, but the rookie didn't seem to be sad. Rosal turned his head in time to see Spark halt his V-wing so abruptly that the starfighter cracked in two. Still, Spark got his revenge when three vulture droids crashed into him in quick sequence, and blew up. Four pilots remained. Even the rookie did something, boys. Let's go, one more time. As another C-9979 blew up in the sky, one of the V-wings that was following it closely was hit by the pieces of it that flew off. Three pilots were left. The cost of the seventh troop carrier they took out was two starfighters. The clones piloting them refused to give up their pursuit even when they felt the impact of the vultures' lasers on their starfighters. Rosal looked as the burning remains of his two last brothers crashed on the red soil of Ryloth. Now, only he was left. Memories flooded him. Memories of all the time he spent training with his brothers, of all the battles they fought, all the stories they shared. Now, all of those were over. They were all dead, and Steel Battalion was over. Come on, you metallic bastards. You want to eliminate me? Let's see if you are fast enough. Now flying alone, he chased the C-9979s. With instincts even he didn't know he had, he dodged most of the lasers fired at him expertly, all the time holding down the trigger. An uninterrupted torrent of blue lasers left his starfighter, eventually mowing down the thick steel plates that made the troop transport. The entire left wing of the ship broke off, and Rosal dove just in time to avoid it. The giant metal piece hit half a dozen vulture droids, creating a giant cloud of fire and smoke. That is eight. He flanked another C-9979 landing craft, fully aware that he didn't have enough time to bring it down. Suddenly, 
he felt an impact as a laser found its mark on the back of his V-wing. The impact, combined with the loss of integrity thanks to his reckless entry in the atmosphere, caused his entire right wing to be ripped off. Rosal lost control of the starfighter, and started spinning. His head hit the inside of the cockpit, making him dizzy. After a lot of effort, he was able to stabilize the V-wing, but his hands were hurting from holding the controls too strongly. It was at this moment that he looked out of the window, and saw he was side by side with the troop carrier. Smiling, he muttered his last words. And now goes nine. Rosal crashed himself in the C-9979. The ship lost control as a giant hole opened on its right side, and lost altitude. The droid pilot was unable to control the troop carrier, and crashed in one of the many pillars of rock that Ryloth had. The impact brought the pillar down, and several dozen vulture droids that had been following Rosal weren't able to steer away in time. Giving their lives, Steel Battalion destroyed 9C-9979 landing crafts. That's as equivalent to almost 20,000 B-1 units. To their last breath, Rosal and Steel Battalion had protected their brothers on the ground. Their efforts saved thousands of lives in the battles to come. They are gone, Admiral. Steel Battalion and Captain Rosal perished. Admiral Dow blinked, pain appearing in his eyes as he thought of the cheerful clone. Rosal had been the best pilot the 303rd had, and his death would surely be a blow to morale. On the other hand, they wouldn't live long enough for morale to matter, so Admiral Dow had to focus on the battle. He did his job perfectly. We need to make sure his sacrifice wasn't on vain. Remember, each troop carrier that goes through us means thousands of clankers that General D has to fight down there. We have to hold them here. Yes, Admiral. The sincerity shook once more as the laser cannons of the enemy fired at them. Surprisingly, that was the last volley they fired before turning around and retreating. They are leaving. I can see it. Ha! All they wanted was for their troops to land on the planet. Order all ships to come back. Don't chase them. I repeat, don't chase them. We don't have the firepower to do that. They will be back for more soon, and we have to get our defenses in place again. Yes, Admiral. As he watched the enemy retreat, Admiral Dow looked at Ryloth. He didn't even bother warning Ryloth, for he was sure they saw all that happened. We did our best, General. We will continue fighting up here and we will go out in a blaze of glory. Let's just hope this blaze is strong enough to burn those damn seppies. Dajer watched as several C-9979 landing crafts finally broke through the Republic blockade. To tell the truth, they had held for much longer than Dajer thought it was possible. And then, Dajer saw ten Republic starfighters following the C-9979s. Just ten, nothing compared to the number of vulture droids after them. But those ten pilots were a force to be reckoned with. Using their lives to stop the enemy, to the point of using their own ships to blow up some more vulture droids, those ten pilots took down seven troop carriers. Even without being able to see the starfighters clearly, Dajer knew that only someone who had given up trying to survive could pull off such an impossible feat. Watching the V-wings blow up or crash one by one, Dajer stopped and saluted his brothers. Hell Squad was also standing still, looking at the battle. Even the Twi'leks couldn't stop but look at the suicidal efforts of those ten pilots. And in the end, when Dajer saw one last pilot giving chase to several C-9979s, while at least a hundred vulture droids followed him, Dajer knew that only one clone could engage in such mad pursuit. Rosal Dajer's grip on his DC-15A was so strong that the blaster's handle cracked with a loud sound, scaring the nearby Twi'leks. They never saw Dajer get angry, and it was truly fearsome, especially with his scar. As Rosal crashed his V-wing on the 9th troop carrier, Dajer watched the destruction unfold. Rosal would be proud to know that even after he died, he still destroyed several dozen vulture droids together with the C-9979. Goodbye, brother. Chapter 189 Goodbye, brother. Dajer closed his eyes, and then opened them again. He ended his salute, and turned around to Hell Squad. They all had their helmets on, but Dajer could feel their sadness. 
Not only had Rosal been a good friend, but his death also meant that the fight finally got to Ryloth. Looking at the C-9979 landing crafts, Dajer quickly counted. Initially, there were fifty of them, but Steel Battalion had taken down nine, at the cost of their lives. If each C-9979 carried between 1500 and 2000 B-1 battle droids, then they had to cope with just less than 90,000 clankers. Plus, there would also be B-2 super battle droids, droidikas, AATs, MTTs, and what else. That meant each trooper had to eliminate seven or eight droids, and that was without the separatist reinforcing their troops on the ground, which was highly probable. Dager. Here, General. Dager pushed his thoughts to the back of his mind, and walked to the front of the freedom fighters. Lesu was already in sight, and Dager could see a group of clone transports going towards them. General D had a serious look on his face as he talked with Cham Sindulla. Prepare your people, Sindulla. The battle will start today. For once, Sindulla didn't disagree. He urged his people to walk faster, and soon, most of them were on the Republic transports. Master D, I will distribute my people to your defenses. I hope that together we can stop the Separatist. That is all I hope for too, Sindulla. Dager. Yes, General. Prepare Hell Squad. I'm sure you already saw how many droids we are up against. If we can dwindle their numbers before they can set up a proper outpost, then things will be easier. I understand, General. I think we should choose a few more soldiers to go with us. Do it. Dager turned on his comm link, and contacted Lieutenant Fonder. Subcommander, sir. Fonder, the Seppies arrived. We are going to give them a welcome party. I need twenty troopers. You have ten minutes. Also, tell that to Commander Keeley. He might want to join. Yes, sir. Sindulla looked surprised. He saw with his own eyes the 303rd fleet being torn apart, and the number of troops the Separatist had thrown into the planet. He couldn't believe that the Nikto actually wanted to attack them, instead of taking a passive position. W.H. Watt. Master D., are you crazy? There must be 50,000 droids there. How can you even think of attacking them? More like a hundred thousand, Sindulla. But they won't all be in the same place. Instead, they will scatter around the planet, and try to conquer the major cities. Dager, contact our troops and order them to do the same. Hit and run tactics, just like on Mon Cala. That is still craziness. You will all be eliminated. No, we won't. Our objective is to blow up a few ships, eliminate a few droids. The longer we delay, the better our odds at receiving reinforcements and winning. At this moment, a group of clones came from Lesu on a lot. Leading them was Commander Keeley, his armor brown and dusty thanks to all the time he spent on the outposts in the last few days. Dager saluted Commander Keeley from a certain distance while General D went to speak with him. Cham Sindulla held Dager back to ask him a question. Do we really have a chance at winning? Dager looked at the freedom fighter, and saw fear in his eyes for the first time ever. Maybe before, when he hadn't seen the might of the Separatist, he thought they were just tin cans. Now, however, he knew what they were up against, and, for the first time, Sindulla realized that maybe they couldn't win. But I guarantee you, Sindulla, we won't let them take Ryloth so easily. Now, even if we were ordered to retreat and leave Ryloth, I don't believe we would be able to escape. But remember, don't tell your people that. We are soldiers, dying in battle is normal for us. But for your freedom fighters, they might crumble if they know there is no hope. Dager said all that whispering, making sure that the surrounding Trelex didn't hear them talking. Sindulla looked at him surprised. He clearly wasn't expecting Dager to be this harsh. Aren't you afraid that I will just take my people and leave you all by yourselves? Ha! To tell you the truth, Sindulla, you could leave me alone, and I would still fight the clankers. Why? Dager sneered, and looked up to the sky, where the Separatist fleet was now retreating. They had clearly completed their first objective, which was to get droids on the ground, but they would be back soon. Because I knew every clone on those ships up there. 
I fought side by side with them countless times. They were my brothers. And no one kills my brothers and get away like that. Twelve troop carriers came our way, General. General D. nodded to Lieutenant Fonder. Since Lesu was the capital, it would surely be heavily targeted. Commander Keeley turned to Dager. Get Cell to scout ahead. Wait. My we will go too. Sindulla interrupted them, and pushed the Trilek forward. Although she seemed unhappy to work with a clone, she didn't complain. Sindulla had decided to go with the Republic to ambush the newly arrived droids. To do that, he brought ten of his freedom fighters. Dejo suspected he only wanted to make sure the Republic was telling the truth, and that the number of clankers really was this overwhelming. Okay, but she has to follow Cell's orders. He is the best scout the 303rd have if she does as he says, the chances of them being captured are smaller. General D quickly agreed to Sindulla's request. It was clear he wasn't in the mood to discuss. I am not going to follow. Yes, you are, Maiwi. The beautiful Trilek looked angry, but only scoffed. She knew better than to disobey Sindulla. Cell gave a side glance to Maiwi, and turned back to the path. The woman hadn't said anything since they left the others behind. However, he had to admit she was a good scout, since she made almost no sound when she moved. If she had received proper training, then she would be better than Cell. R8V6, secure the perimeter. What is TH? Shu. Sure. Cell used his left hand to shut Maiwi's mouth, while aiming his DC 15S at the direction of the sound. A patrol of 6B1 units passed right past them, but since they hid in time, they weren't detected. After the patrol was gone, Cell released Maiwi, who looked ashamed. Apparently, she knew her mistake could have eliminated them. Going on quietly, Cell and the Trilek soon arrived at the separatist outpost after dodging several patrols. Oh no! This time Cell didn't stop Maiwi. Things really were looking grim. Cell used his binoculars to do a quick count on the number of enemies. Let's go. Already? I know what we are against. We need to tell the general quickly. Using some techniques he learned when he trained to be a scout, Cell was able to tell almost exactly how many droids there were. As soon as the two returned, all the officers in the mixed group surrounded them. General D motioned for Cell to talk. 18,000 B-1 units and a couple hundred B-2 super battle droids. I didn't see any droidicas nor commandos, but there is a weird crab-like droid. What about vehicles? Then things get really bad, General. They brought out the big toys. Chapter 190 What about vehicles? Then things get really bad, General. They brought out the big toys. Everyone looked at Cell, and the scout closed his eyes to remember exactly how many vehicles there were. He knew wrong information was a mistake they couldn't afford to make. About a hundred staps, and twenty AATs. There were also forty or fifty dwarf spider droids. I also saw three MTTs. And that wasn't all. There are six vehicles I never saw. They are like a big ball held by a few dozen meters tall legs. However, I recognized their weapons. Three laser cannons. Commander Keeley's face became serious. Try droids. This is bad. Sindulla looked at Maiwi, who nodded, confirming Cell's report. How do you know there are 18,000 of them? Cell looked at Commander Keeley, and the clone nodded, allowing him to tell this kind of information to Sindulla. You add the officers, then multiply by the number of troops each rank had. Then you add a corresponding number of B2 super battle droids. And what are tri-droids? This time it was Commander Keeley who answered, since, amongst the clones, only he and Dager knew what they were. A huge death ball. Their laser cannons can easily blow up an entire platoon. Their height gives them a huge range, but is also their weakness. The way to take them down is to destroy two or three legs, and when they fall, concentrate all your fire right in the middle. It is where their core is. That doesn't sound so bad. Commander Keeley looked at the Trilek who spoke, Yate. 
The freedom fighter was an idiot if he couldn't recognize the danger of the separatist weapons. Wait till they are firing at you. That is enough. Let's get moving. General D interrupted Commander Keeley and ordered the group to get into action. Sindulla commanded his men to do the same, and they started to follow their plan. Retreat. Deja quickly yelled to the people around him, and fired at the incoming droids to hold them back. Metal, Tech, and Dab, stay with me. The rest, move back. Both clones and Trilex followed his orders without hesitation. Deja had proven himself to be a leader worthy of their trust. Ah. A Trilek that wasn't quick enough was hit in the back, and fell face first to the ground. Deja rolled behind cover, and checked the freedom fighter. Dead. He wasn't the first. Between troopers and freedom fighters, at least ten combatants were dead. Of course, the droids had played a hefty price, since two of their tri-droids and several dwarf spider droids and AATs were destroyed. Dajer looked at his comlink, but it was still out, leaving him unable to contact General D, Ragu, Commander Keeley, or Sindulla. After being attacked, the droids were quickly to jam communications and counterattack. Move back, quick. To the first outpost. Using his DC-17, Dajer quickly emptied the magazine in AB-2 unit, almost melting it down. The attack went well initially, but soon they started to be suppressed by the clankers, forcing them to retreat after suffering casualties. Two hours earlier. General D looked at the surrounding leaders, and started splitting them into two groups. Keeley, Sindulla and I will go to the left side of their outpost, and try to hit their dwarf spider droids. Ragu, you take Hell Squad, and Lieutenant Fonder, with ten troopers, and to the right. Bring down one of the tri-droids, and they will all focus on you. I believe you can distract them for long enough to us to plant a few detonators, right? Yes, Master. The troops were easily divided, and about six Trilex followed Hell Squad. When they were already quite a distance away, Sindulla looked back at them, and turned to General D. Are you sure they can do what you ordered them, Master Jedi? I am. Not only is my Padawan is with them, but Hell Squad is also there. With this combination, I am confident they can escape without many casualties even if things go wrong. Sindulla looked pensive. I hope you are right. Ragu quietly led the group forward, careful to not alarm the droids. Suddenly, they heard a patrol ahead. The clones and Trilex gripped their blasters, but the Jedi soothed them. It is too early to make noise. Danger, let's take them out. Cell, metal, 3-4, with me. Wait. Are just those enough? A female Trilek named Apele that was leading the other five stopped the Jedi. Ragu flashed her a confident smile that a youngster like him shouldn't have when facing battle droids. Don't worry. We can take them easily. Besides, if we are too many, they will hear us. Without saying anything else, Ragu and the chosen clones went ahead, getting out of sight from the group. Barely thirty seconds later, Cell returned. Let's go. Dumbfounded by how fast things went, Apele and the other Trilex followed Cell. Twenty meters away from where they were, the broken remains of six B-1 battle droids laid on the ground. Two of them were sliced by a lightsaber, while the others were without their heads. The Trilex didn't know how to react. They were so close to the patrol, yet they didn't hear a sound. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Fonder and the clones just stepped over the droids as if it wasn't anything uncommon. Five more patrols found the same destiny in their hands before the group arrived at the separatist outpost. By now, the Trilex already understood why the Republic was bold enough to attack 18,000 droids with less than 50 people. They are just ahead, General. Cell returned from scouting, and quickly reported. Since he had already gone there with Maiwi, he was used to the way, and quickly showed them their entry point. They were hiding behind a bunch of rocks, but it was very easy to see the almost endless droid army. Dajer looked at the dozens of droid battalions in front of them. The entry point that Cell mentioned was a place where the metal wall the droids used to build the outpost wasn't completed. However, the droids clearly weren't expecting an attack, since only a few dozen droids were guarding it. How do you plan on doing it, General? 
Ragu thought for a while before pointing towards the tridroids, which were visible over the walls. I will sneak in, and cut down at least one of those. If it is possible, I will try to cut the stabilizers of the AATs, but nothing too big, so they don't notice. That will keep them out of order for a few days. When you see the tridroid fall, blast your way in. Brain and Dab, use the thermal detonators and the charged shot to take down the dwarf spider droids. All the clones acknowledged his orders without hesitation. They knew that Ragu was way more capable than any of them, and that by using his Jedi Force powers, he would be able to infiltrate much better than them. Even the Trilex agreed that Ragu was the best option. The rumors and stories about Jedis had long reached their ears, making them seen as mystic entities. Contact my master, I will get going. After saying that, Ragu disappeared in the night. A few seconds later, they saw a shadow ran up the walls of the Separatist outpost, defying gravity. None of the clankers noticed the Padawan. Now, all they had to do was wait. Chapter 191 Dejer watched the exposed section of the wall that Regu jumped, then turned to 3-4 and ordered the clone to keep an eye open for any changes, as if everyone wasn't already doing that. Commander. General Regu is inside. We are waiting for his signal to move in. Roger that. Warn me as soon as you get into action. I think you will see it, sir. A small figure slipped past droid patrols, hiding into the shadows and behind vehicles. Whenever he got to an AAT or a deactivated dwarf spider droid, a green light flashed. Nobody could see it, but several key components of the vehicles and the droids had been cut by a high-powered weapon, leaving them unusable for days. He had sabotaged about three AATs and six dwarf spider droids when he arrived at his real target. Looking up close, the tri-droids were even more intimidating, and their huge heads spun, each time aiming their laser cannons in a different direction. Since slow cannons had a slow firing rate, Ragu initially thought the tridroids would be easy to deal with, but seeing them now, the Tigruta understood that they never actually needed to cool down, since they were always switching. That meant they could maintain a steady firing rate. Verifying that there were no droids nearby, Ragu turned on his lightsaber, and got ready to cut the legs of the nearest tridroid. However, he forgot the tridroids weren't vehicles, but, well, droids. As soon as the green light of the lightsaber appeared, he was spotted by the huge droids. Six laser cannons aimed at him as the tridroids found the Jedi, their aims constantly shifting. He could deflect one of the huge laser cannon's shots, but nor six. So, instead of waiting for them to fire, he did something his master taught him. When surrounded, attack. The enemy won't be expecting, giving you an advantage over them. This lesson was proved right, as the tridroids hesitated when they saw the tiny figure ran towards them. That hesitation cost them enough time so he could get under one of them, and the others couldn't fire without hitting their allies. The tridroid he chose to hide under moved around furiously, trying to both get away from Ragu so it could attack him, and crush him. The commotion quickly attracted the droids, and considering there were 18,000 of them, Ragu wasn't very anxious to fight them. As he became the focus of fire from the nearby B-1 units, Ragu deflected the red lasers the best he could. When one of the legs of the tridroid almost hit him, he decided that it was enough. Jumping up, he grabbed one leg of the tridroid, and flung himself towards another. Slicing with his lightsaber while in the air, a huge chunk of the metal leg fell down. When the tridroid tried to put weight on it, the leg broke, almost causing it to fall. Taking advantage of the unbalanced droid, Ragu pulled back both his hands, and looked like he was grabbing something with them. When he pushed his hands forward, a huge force impacted the tridroid, bigger and stronger than any force blast Ragu had ever done before. Several B-1 battle droids in the way of the blast were flung away, their bodies breaking in midair, and many more stumbled and fell on the ground. The tridroid, the target of the blast, shook, and slowly started to tilt. His fall became faster, and the huge head impacted on the ground, crushing several droids. Ragu panted with the effort needed to push such a huge thing, but didn't stop. Running forward, he jumped on top of the droid he just took down, and continued running while holding his lightsaber with the tip aiming at the tridroid. Half of the lightsaber penetrated the tridroid, 
and as Regu ran, a blazing line was left behind. Two laser cannon shots from other tridroids hit the fallen one, causing huge holes to appear on its armor. Ragu somersaulted over a bunch of droids, and landed on top of an AAT. The pilot had the top half of his body out, trying to see what was happening, and Ragu cut his head off. When he was sliding off the tank, he waved his lightsaber, and the tank's barrel was also cut in half. At no time did Ragu stop running, making it almost impossible for the droids to hit him. Dajer saw the tridroids start moving, and instantly ordered the mixed group of 303rd clones and freedom fighters forward. A volley of lasers hit the droids guarding the missing section of wall, taking most of them down. While the clones missed almost no shots, more than half of the Trilex hit meters away from their target. Deja heard a loud sound, and saw a bright blue light leave Dab's DC-15X as he fired his charged shot, a special modification he built himself. A B-2 super battle droid that was commanding the guards was hit, and a huge hole appeared on its chest, so deep it was possible to see the other side. A millisecond later, the droid exploded, taking down two B-1 units next to him. By the time all this happened, the attackers were just halfway through the missing wall section, but the attack had been sudden and unexpected, and that, coupled with Ragu's distraction, ensured that there weren't that many clankers near them. Followed by the others, Dajer dashed towards the nearest cover, and they got there just in time to dodge the incoming lasers. The cloud of red lasers was so big that it was almost impossible for them to show their heads. After all, they were against thousands of droids. Dajer, however, had already considered that. He looked at his comm link, and signaled to sell. The scout dropped to the ground, and sneaked past Dajer and the rest. When he was about 20 meters away from the nearest droid, he quietly rolled a thermal detonator that Brain gave to him. The thermal detonator exploded at the same time several deactivated dwarf spider droids blew up on the other side of the outpost. General D and Commander Keeley were right in time. Dajer didn't know how well their attack went, but judging by the small number of explosions, the result wasn't that good. Fortunately, it was enough to distract some of the droids, giving Dajer the chance to show himself and counterattack. The clones followed suit, and the Trilex mimicked them. Before they ducked behind cover again, two clones and a freedom fighter were hit. One of the clones was only injured, while the others died. Dajer. Initiate retreat. Get back to the. And we. You. Commander. Commander Keeley. However, there was no response from the comlink. Clearly, the droids had fought back quicker than General D had predicted, and jammed their communications. But Dajer got the gist of what his orders were. Fall back. Fall back. Dajer yelled his commands, and Lieutenant Fonder passed them around. Soon, the group was retreating back to the gap in the wall. Dajer ordered a stop. Hold here. We have to wait for the general. Arg. A clone fell next to him, a smoking hole on his helmet. Dajer quickly took care of the attacker, but hundreds of droids were behind it, and several AATs and dwarf spider droids were starting to turn on, although many just got off the ground before falling again. Probably Ragu's work. Suddenly, Dajer saw one of the tridroids in the distance wave and fall. A small figure jumped on top of it before running again, but his way was paved with droids, forcing him to change directions. Chapter 192 When he saw Ragu being forced to change directions, Dajer quickly ordered the small group to retreat even faster, since the droids would focus on them. With the communications being jammed, he had no way of knowing how General D and Commander Keeley were, so he had to follow his instincts. And his instincts were telling him to get out of the Separatist outpost. Watching hundreds and then thousands of droids and vehicles move towards them, Dajer ordered the others to escape while he, Metal, Tech, and Dab stayed behind to cover their retreat. They were never meant to fight the droids, since even for Hell Squad this was a mission. All they were was a decoy for the others. As they retreated, another Trilek fell, shot in the back. That was the third Trilek to die, accompanied by five clones. Dajer looked at his comlink, futilely trying to contact Commander Keeley again. As he was doing that, Two lasers flew past him, millimeters away from his face. Dajer returned fire, 
but he and the other three clones were slowly being overrun, even with Lieutenant Fonder and the others providing covering fire. Two hours had passed since Ragu had sneaked in the outpost, and now they couldn't hold back the droids anymore. Thankfully, the Separatists didn't know the terrain, so their choice of camp was poor. Rock walls and formations created a labyrinth that allowed the Republic to escape easily. And with four members of Hell Squad covering them, the clones and freedom fighters ran away quickly. They left nine people on the ground as another clone was hit in the back. Ag. Damn it. Dajer heard Dab scream, and looked at his brother with the corner of his eyes. A laser had scratched his arm, but Dajer could tell it was nothing serious, and the sniper was already back into the fight. Seeing his men disappear behind the rocks, Dajer gestured to Tech and Dab, and the two stopped firing and ran back. Dajer and Metal got up, revealing themselves completely, and pressed the trigger if their blasters. Lasers flew all around them, but the clones ignored them. Dajer felt an impact on his leg as a laser hit the outer portion of his armor, but he wasn't injured. About four seconds later, blue lasers flew over their heads as Tech and Dab found somewhere to hide and were covering them. Let's go, Metal. The two clones walked backward, emptying a magazine after another in the droids. This time, the huge number of droids proved to be a disadvantage, as they stopped their own vehicles from getting to the front. As such, only B-1 and B-2 units fired at Hell Squad, and they could deal with that. The 30 meters run towards the rocks and the cover they offered looked like 30 kilometers, but the clones got there surprisingly uninjured. As soon as they disappeared from the droid site, and met the others, everything seemed to be calmer. The only sound was of the lasers hitting the rocks, and the ragged breath of the tired Republic soldiers. Lieutenant, we need to move. Retreat to the first outpost. You know what to do. What about General Ragu? Dajer looked at his comlink nervously, but it was still not working. He sighed, and hurried the group to move. He will be all right. He is more capable than any of us. Lieutenant Fonder acknowledged his words, and was following the others when he noticed Hell Squad staying behind. Sir. Dajer shook his head, and showed the lieutenant his blaster before using a finger to show the way they just came from. The sound of approaching droids could be heard. Lieutenant Fonder looked at him seriously, then nodded before leading the mixed group of clones and Trilex. Only when they were almost a kilometer away did they hear the sound of fighting going on behind them, and the Trilex noticed Hell Squad was missing. Apele looked around surprised, and soon found the lieutenant. Where is the other seven? They aren't here. The lieutenant nodded, showing that he knew. At the same time, he hurried her to keep walking. They stayed behind to cover us. Otherwise, the Sepis would catch up to us. Apele opened her mouth to say something, but in the end, decided not to. The seven clones were sacrificing themselves so they could escape. They couldn't waste the time they were giving them. While Apele thought that Hell Squad was sacrificing themselves, the clones were engaged in a heated fight with incoming droids, but the thought of dying never crossed their minds. They really were covering their retreat, but that wasn't their only objective. Dajer had chosen a choke point where only three droids could hoe through at the same time. So, when facing Hell Squad, all they could do was fire one laser and die. Not even grenades could hurt Hell Squad, since they had enough space to dodge the blast. Metal bodies soon started piling up, difficulting even more the entrance of the other droids. Dajer was prepared to spend hours there before finally calling a retreat. He was confident that if it was only Hell Squad, they could escape from the Separatist pursuit pretty easily. Suddenly, however, something weird happened. The droids stopped firing. Dajer looked at his brothers, and gestured for them to retreat. He didn't know why the droids stopped attacking, but it couldn't be good. Soon, they heard the sound of metal being crushed. The hovering sound the new enemy made was too familiar for Hell Squad not to recognize it. AAT. Take cover. Just as 3-4 yelled that, the barrel of the tank appeared over the pile of dead droids. It fired, blowing up a bunch of rocks just over Brain. The clone ducked out of the way, and avoided being buried, but the AAT turned towards him. Without thinking, Dajer ran towards the tank. 3-4, 
who was close, did the same. Both of them jumped up, and grabbed the barrel of the AAT. The droids which were behind it started shooting them, and Dejer felt a sharp pain in his chest as his blast padding blocked a shot from killing him. At this moment, however, they were lucky. The weight of him and 3-4 made the AAT tilt forward, exactly what they wanted, and blocked the view of the droids. The shot charged on the barrel was fired, and hit the ground. The impact made both Dejer and 3-4 release the barrel, and the AAT was thrown off balance by his own shot. It hit the walls of the gorge they were in now, and stopped. The tank almost fully blocked the path, barely leaving space for a droid to pass through. At this moment, the hatch of the AAT opened, and a droid using the yellow markings of a captain appeared, only to be torn apart by Hell Squad. Dager looked at the smoking droid body, and signaled Hell Squad to follow him. They quickly ran, leaving the AAT behind. Dager planned to stall the droids for a few hours, but since the chance presented itself, he would take it. We need to meet the commander at the rendezvous point. Let's move. Chapter 193 After slicing the barrel of an AAT, a small Tigruta started running. However, the direction he wanted to go was blocked by thousands of droids. Ragu looked at his communicator, and discovered that it wasn't working. The droids must have jammed it. Looking at Hell Squad retreating, the Padawan decided to go in another direction, where his master should be. He deflected the incoming lasers without even looking, but there were too many, causing him to almost be hit many times. Over there. A droid pointed at him, and he became the focus of even more lasers. He slashed forward, cutting down three droids with the same move, and jumped over their heads. While he was in midair, he pushed his hands forward, and the force smashed several droids in the ground. Using the impulse, he flew four or five meters before landing on one of the tridroids. The droid's head spun, trying to throw Ragu away, but he used his lightsaber to pierce the droid, and steady himself. The droid jolted, then started falling. The Jedi apprentice jumped, using the droid's height to reach the wall. Up there, he was out of sight from most of the droids. The few that were up on the wall were quickly pushed off. Ragu took advantage of the brief period of calmness to look for his master. Hell Squad and their men were already in the rocks that surrounded the Separatist outpost, most likely heading to the Republic One. There was an AAT following them, and hundreds of droids, but Ragu wasn't too worried. Dejer knew how to take care of himself and his men. On the other side, he saw more droids entering the gorges and valleys, probably after his master and commander Keeley. At this moment, Ragu sensed something. His instincts took over, and he jumped as high as he could, which saved his life. The part of the wall he was in now had a big hole, and shrapnel flew everywhere as a laser cannon shot from one of the tridroids hit it. Even though he jumped, the shockwave still hit him. He felt his bones rattle under the pressure, and his lightsaber escaped his hand. Despair filled his heart. A lightsaber was a Jedi's weapon, but it was also its companion. He couldn't lose it, no matter what. Not only that, but losing his lightsaber amidst the droid army was the same as asking to be eliminated. So, when Ragu saw his beloved weapon fall on the outer side of the walls, he didn't hesitate, and jumped. The walls were about a dozen meters height, and that, for a Jedi, was nothing. He landed on the ground, using the force to soften his landing, and looked for his lightsaber. A few meters away, he saw a metal stick amidst a pile of scrap metal. He pulled his lightsaber using the force. And he was just in time, since two lasers hit the ground next to him. The droids had gotten to the top of the wall, and were aiming at him. However, since he had jumped to the outside, he was safe, at least for now. The few lasers that came his way were quickly deflected. Using the force, he sensed where General D was, and ran towards him. Everything had gone well at the start, but they had underestimated the reactions of the Separatist. Now, General D, Commander Keeley and Sindulla, together with the clones and freedom fighters, were trapped. They had destroyed one AAT, and eleven dwarf spider droids. That was way less than they wanted, but they had been discovered, forcing them to retreat. Their retreat path was blocked by droids, so they entered another gorge, but that resulted in them being surrounded. 
That is, until a young Tigruta saved them. General D watched proudly as his Padawan came from behind the droids, and used the force to push them, opening a path. Keely. Follow Ragu. The commander was quick to react, and soon, the survivors of the attack were escaping, not without casualties. In total, including the ones led by Hell Squad, 13 clones and 8 Trilex died. That was almost half of the attack group. Ragu. Where are the others? General D looked around, but saw only his Padawan. Ragu shook his head, and pointed to the separatist outpost's direction. We got separated, and our communicators aren't working. He will probably retreat towards our outpost. General D looked to the fleeing Republic combatants, and his face became even more serious. They couldn't make it to the outpost, nor could they meet with Hell Squad now. All they could do was flee to one of the Freedom Fighters' hideouts, and wait until they got out of the jam's range. Dajer looked at the horizon, and finally saw the Republic outpost. Five hours had passed since they ended their attack on the Separatist base, and although the results weren't extremely good, each vehicle and droid destroyed meant one less for them to fight. In the meantime, he finally got to talk with Commander Keeley. Although the two Jedis and the Commander wouldn't be able to support them on the outpost thanks to the Separatist cutting their path, the plan would remain the same. Since the droids outnumbered the Republic by a large margin, then they would fight a drawn-out war. Hell Squad was to defend the outpost for as long as they could before retreating. Then, they would repeat it again and again. Dajer had no expectations of being able to win the battle for Ryloth this way, but at least they would cause serious damages to the Separatist. And that was all he wanted now. Lieutenant Fonder, go ahead and get the injured to the infirmary. Freedom Fighters, follow him. Those who aren't injured, find a position. The Seppis will arrive soon. Lieutenant Fonder acknowledged, and the Trilex nodded. After seeing how many droids they were up against, they had no complaints about fighting anymore. They would give everything to defend their planet. The clone in charge of the outpost was Sergeant Storge, a battle-hardened veteran that was with the 303rd since Geonosis. Dajer quickly explained to him why they were separated from Commander Keeley, and ordered the sergeant to get into position. The outpost was nothing more than a complex of simple buildings and two walls, one to the north and another to the south. The west and east were two rock walls almost a hundred meters tall. It was impossible for the droids to climb it. The outpost held 36 clones. Plus Hell Squad and the others, there were a total of 52 defenders. After talking to Sergeant Storge, Hell Squad went straight to the walls. It had been more than a day since they last slept, but none of them would be able to sleep now. They already had too much on their hands without the nightmares. As the sun appeared in the sky, Dajer saw the Separatist. Only two tridroids were with the army, meaning the others had gone to attack another place. The Separatist intelligence was much better than expected, and they were able to uncover the locations of every Republic forces on the planet. That was, at the very least, suspicious. But he had no time to worry about that. Looking at the thousands of droids, Dajer ordered his snipers to fire. He heard a loud sound as the blue lasers hit several droid sergeants and captains. Looking up, he saw that the Separatist fleet came back for more. Chapter 194 Admiral Dao rubbed his eyes and watched as the Separatist fleet approached again. Less than a day had passed since they broke through the Republic blockade, and they were already back. It seemed they were determined to exterminate the 303rd. Then they would give them a good fight. He looked around to his crew. All of them had swollen eyes and were almost dropping to the ground, but their gazes were determined. Just like Admiral Dao, it had been two and a half days since they last slept, but none of them had the opportunity to. Every ship in the Republic side was badly damaged. Almost no starfighters remained, and the cruisers all had holes and broken parts. The Separatists had also suffered severe damage, but they were relentless. Looking at the vulture droids coming at them, and the pitifully small amount of Republic starfighters that went to meet the enemy, Admiral Dao smiled savagely, and talked in the open channel of his comlink, meaning that every soldier could hear him. Brothers, those pieces of scrap metal are coming after us again. Don't be afraid, and let's show them why we are the best legion in the Republic. 
Buha. Let's go. After facing so many battles and knowing that they would all die in Ryloth, all the soldiers considered Admiral Dao one of them, even though he wasn't a clone. This was a fight to the death, and only one side would survive, while the other would be annihilated. Hierarchy didn't matter that much anymore. Soon, the first explosions happened, and missiles started to impact on the Sincerity's shields. Several minutes later, Admiral Dao saw separatist frigates surround Ryloth, ignoring the 303rd fleet. They cut off our path. Not that the clone needed to tell him that, since he could see it happening. He sent straight towards the hologram table, and called General D. Admiral Dao. I see the battle restarted over there. Bad news, General. They surrounded the planet. Our ships won't be able to get to you without getting shot down. Um. Don't worry, Admiral. We will do our best here. However, when we get low on supplies. Unfortunately, General, there is nothing I can do. We are. Suddenly, Admiral Dao stopped talking as the sincerity rocked under his feet. He only managed to stand up by holding onto the hologram table. What happened? He turned around, and asked his crew the same question. Soon, he got an answer. A vulture droid crashed on us, sir. No serious damage reported. That is good. Intensify the turret barrage. Destroy as many as you can, don't worry about ammo. After dealing with the situation, Admiral Dao turned to General D and quickly explained. The Nikto sighed in relief. For a moment he thought the sincerity was gone. Try the Jedi Council again. Tell them we are trapped on Ryloth, and that supplies will soon run out. If they don't send help, then we are doomed. Master Yoda, we received a transmission from Master D's fleet. A tall man looked at the green Jedi. Like ways, Mace Windu was dead serious, even more since the transmission was from the 303rd Attack Legion. For the past days, they received repeated requests for help, but the Republic had no fleet idol. As such, they could only let the 303rd suffer casualties, to the point that the once powerful fleet was reduced to a handful of damaged ships. Accompanying General Windu was General Kenobi. Put it through, you do. See how Master D is faring, we must. General Windu nodded, and clicked a button in the hologram table. A projection of Admiral Dao appeared. His once well-groomed appearance was now destroyed. He appeared to have aged ten years in a few days, and had dark circles under his eyes. Admiral Dao. How is the battle going? Poorly. We have less than a dozen ships in battle conditions, and our blockade was broken through once more. Um. Bad things are. For how long can you hold on, Admiral Dao? The Admiral turned to General Kenobi, and was about to speak when a clone muttered something to him. His face grew serious, but his lips had hints of a smile. A madman's smile. Permission to speak freely, generals. What is in your mind, you can speak. They just destroyed our supply ships. Ha! I regret to inform you that soon our troops on the ground will be out of everything. Food, medical supplies, ammunition. The Jedis looked at each other, clearly surprised by how lightly the Admiral was making of the situation. Admiral, unfortunately, we can't send any troops nor supplies now. But as soon as. With all due respect, General Kenobi, but even if a fleet came to our rescue right now, the only ones you would have any chance of saving would be our troops on Ryloth. Our fleet is gone, but we will fight to the end. Master Yoda frowned, while General Windu and General Kenobi exchanged glances. Knowing what they needed to do but being unable to do it was one of the worst feelings they ever had. Admiral Dao, on the other hand, grinned. This might be the last time we talk, General Kenobi, General Windu, General Yoda. We might be dead already, but those on the planet aren't yet. Please, send supplies. They are already fighting the Sepis on the ground, so they will soon be in dire need for everything. We will do our best, Admiral. While we are alive, there is still hope. Hold on for as long as you can. Yes, General Windu. May the Force be with you. 
Admiral Dao disconnected the call, and the three Jedis looked at each other, impotent to do anything. General Kenobi turned to Master Yoda. What do you think, Master Yoda? Death I sense. Lying the Admiral was not. Survive this ordeal difficult will be. The future of Master D uncertain is. After talking with the Jedi Council once again, Admiral Dao stared at the crew around him. They were all busy dealing with the battle, and didn't see him looking at them with pity in his eyes. Just like the others, he laughed at the prospect of their deaths, but that was just to hide how deeply afraid of it he was. No one wanted to die, but sometimes destiny didn't give other options. As such, the only choice left for the 303rd was how they wished to go down. And the answer was fighting. Inform General D that we lost our supply ships. And tell him that he is on his own. As for us, let's keep going. I want at least two of their frigates to go down today. Yes, Admiral. Understood, Admiral. Dajer was sitting on the floor, his eyes closed. At his side was Sergeant Storge, laying on the ground. Both of them were alive, but too tired to say anything. Around them, clones and Trilex, alive and dead, were also breathing heavily. Two hours went by since the droid army attacked the outpost, and they were still holding it, although barely. The initial fifty or so defenders had dropped to around thirty, most wounded. Tri-droids, AATs, and dwarf spider droids had been bombarding the wall they were on, and huge holes had been blown up. However, for some reason, the droids had slowed down their attack, and instead of recklessly throwing troops at the outpost, were concentrating their fire. They probably are afraid that it is another ambush. If only they knew we can barely hold on. Shut up, Tech. The longer they take, the better for us. Don't jinx it. Ha ha ha. Chapter 195 The wall shook as another laser cannon shot hit it. The metal bent and broke, and a piece of the outpost's walls fell down. If this kept on for much longer, the whole wall would cave in, and the defenders would fall with it. Storch. Any idea on how we can take down those tridroids? No, sir. Our RPS-6 rocket launchers are all used up. They didn't even scratch the armor of those things at this distance. Arg. In the short seconds when they were discussing, a trooper, who showed himself to fire at the incoming army, died, his helmet and chest armor almost melting due to the number of lasers that hit him. A Twi'lek freedom fighter soon suffered the same destiny. Subcommander Dager. We are being slaughtered. Apele ran over to him at the same time that Dager was firing at the droids, which incited a heavy response by the clankers. His body moved before his mind could even process the information, and he swiped his leg, throwing the Twi'lek on the ground. Red lasers missed her by millimeters, and she laid on the ground dumbstruck. The clones ignored the surprised freedom fighter, and returned fire, but they were terribly outnumbered. Many troopers fell at the cost of just a few dozen droids. After several more minutes, the wall was impacted once more, and another huge hole appeared. Just a few more shots and it would break entirely. Dager decided they had defended the outpost for long enough. Sergeant. Apele. Start the retreat. Fifty kilometers from here is another one of our bases. That will be our second line of defenses. Yes, sir. Yes, Dager. The defenders retreated quickly, and went to the south wall. From there, they would take speeders and flee. But destiny wouldn't let the Republic forces get away so easily. A stray laser cannon shot hit the rock slopes that surrounded the outpost, and a large boulder fell on top of the speeders. The moment this happened, Hell Squad, a Pele, and two other freedom fighters, as well as another four clones, were still inside the outpost. As the dust settled, Dajer saw that the BRC speeders were destroyed. Unfortunately, even though they now had no means to escape, they could still be considered lucky. Under the rocks, boulders, and pieces of the wall, broken limbs and white armor could be seen. Storch. Storch. Are you there? Several seconds trickled by when there was no response. But them, Dajer heard someone moaning. Quickly, 
He and the others pushed aside the rocks on the away, and found Sergeant Storage and two other clones still alive. They were lucky to have been on the outskirts of the rock slide. As Dajer pushed another rock aside, Sergeant Storage groaned in pain. The armor on his right leg was broken, and a horrible wound appeared under it. Flesh and blood mangled together, and bones could be seen cutting through the skin. Dust and small rocks were on the wound, making it even more painful to move. The other two clones were also hurt, one of them with a broken arm, and the other had lost his helmet, and his head was bleeding profusely. 3-4. On it. The medic knelt down near Sergeant Storch, and started cleaning and bandaging the wound. However, in the middle of a battle and without supplies, there was no way he could treat it properly. Meanwhile, Dajer ordered the others to pay attention to the north wall. Cracks and holes were appearing on it, and the Separatist army could be seen through them. Luckily for the Republic forces, the rockslide hadn't totally blocked their escape path. Subcommander. Dajer turned around and saw Lieutenant Fonder. The lieutenant had been one of the few lucky ones who weren't near the BRC speeders. Lieutenant. We have to move sir. But. I don't think Sergeant Storage and the others will make it. Dajer looked at the lieutenant. As a soldier, he knew very well what Lieutenant Fonder meant. As a clone, he knew how painful it was for his brother to suggest it. The lieutenant is right, sir. We will only slow you down. Me and Torkir will hold the Seppis for as long as we can. A coarse voice interrupted Dajer and Lieutenant Fonder. Although they had been talking quietly, Sergeant Storage had heard them. The clone had taken off his helmet, revealing a familiar face. He gestured to the trooper with the head injury, Tork. Leave us here and go, sir. You can't let the clankers win, and dying here won't help. No way, sergeant. I won't leave a brother behind. Dajer looked around, and everyone nodded at him, even the Trelex. What difference did it make, dying here or in the next Republic base? The subcommander is right, Storch. You know us better than to suggest that we flee. Let the Seppis come. Is there anything for us to fear? At most we will die. All the troopers agreed with metal. They had been through hundreds of battles together, and they had faced death countless times. For them, there was no place better to die than on a battlefield, side by side with their brothers. That is nonsense, metal, and you know it. And you do too, sir. While the two clones discussed, Dajer looked briefly at 3-4. The medic shook his head slightly. The subcommander glanced at Sergeant Storage, and nodded. We are leaving. Brain, Fonder, get going. I need to talk to Storage and Torque. Yes, subcommander. Sir. Brain and the lieutenant immediately started moving, and after a small hesitation, the freedom fighters and the other troopers followed them out of the ruined outpost. There was no time to waste, since they didn't have their BRC speeders anymore. Only Cell and Metal stood there dumbfounded. They never thought that Dajer would really leave the two clones to their deaths. Only after Dab and Tech pushed them did the two move. We have our orders, let's move. But. But. Are you stupid, Cell? Torque can barely maintain consciousness, and Sergeant Storage lost too much blood. They will die no matter what we do, so at least let them choose how they want to go. This. Only after hearing 3-4 explanation did the others understand why Dajer made such a decision. Still. They all followed their orders as well-trained soldiers did, but that didn't mean they were happy with what they had to do. But none of them could blame Dajer. The subcommander was surely the one who suffered the most for his decision, since it was the same as killing the two clones. Dajer knelt beside Sergeant Storage and Torque. The trooper could barely maintain his eyes open. It was clear that his injury was far worse than it seemed at first. The sergeant, on the other hand, wasn't in a much better condition. The bottom half of his body and armor were dyed red with his blood. You should go too, sir. The clankers will break the wall at any moment. I know. Storge, Torque. You will be avenged. You can be sure of that. The two clones smiled, and Torque helped Sergeant Storge to get up. 
the two clones walked to behind a boulder, and prepared to make their last stand. We will eliminate as many of those bastards as we can, sir. Dajer watched as the two of them laid their DC-15 as on the boulder, and aimed at the wall. Nodding, he turned back and left the outpost through the south wall. Goodbye, brothers. Chapter 196 Sergeant Storage and Torque lasted for last than two minutes after the wall was taken down. Dajer didn't see their end, but he knew it happened because Cell, who was on their rear guard, saw the clanker storming past the outpost and following them. General D. We lost the first outpost, and are retreating to the next defensive line. A hologram of a tired Nikto appeared in front of Dajer as he used the hologram projector as he was running. At the same time, his comlink bipped. Through his transmission with General D, he heard the same noise coming from behind the Jedi. He and Commander Keeley had received the same thing. Looking at the data, Dajer's expression grew serious. Did you get that too, Dajer? Yes, Commander. The hologram became smaller and now encompassed both General D and Commander Keeley. Soon, the Padawan, Ragu, joined them. What is it, Keeley? Bad news, General. It appears we were the ones who fared best after their first wave of attacks. Several of our bases and defenses near the other cities were taking down. Casualties are as high as 70% in some places. Dajer nodded. Without the Jedis to help on the other fronts, the 303rd suffered a lot more. According to the information he just received, several dozen troopers died, while hundreds were injured. He read the lines on his comlink. Sergeants Yom, Milo, and Cooker died. Lieutenant Shield, Lieutenant Womp and Captain Macro were severely injured. We were forced to order total retreat on all fronts. General D closed his eyes, and stood like that for a few minutes. Things were deteriorating fast. Their fleet was almost destroyed, and they were getting pushed back in the first confrontation. How long do we have? If they continue at this pace, 15 days at most for the capital, and 10 to 12 days for the other cities. That is, if they don't receive reinforcements. Which will most probably happen. The Jedi looked at Dajer, and turned to his Padawan and Commander Keeley. He said something to the clone, and Commander Keeley left the hologram. We are going to switch tactics, Dajer. You still have some freedom fighters with you, don't you? Dajer looked around, and saw a Pele and three Trileks. They were all that remained from the freedom fighters that Hell Squad had with them. Apele saw him looking, and nodded to him, although she couldn't hear what the sub-commander and his general were discussing. I have, general. Four of them. Good. Let's wait for Sindola, then I will tell you all what we are going to do. Dajer acknowledged General D, and said nothing. Several minutes passed by where everyone stood silent. General D's group was already on the second base, waiting for Dajer and Hell Squad, so it took a while for Commander Keeley to find Sindulla. When he arrived, the Trilek had a fierce expression on his face, and a bandage on his shoulder. It appeared General D also faced problems to get to Republic territory. Master Jedi. Sub Commander Dajer. How can I help? The Separatists are advancing to the main cities. Our troops can't contend with them on an open battle. Sindulla looked at the Nikto, his expression growing uglier. His thoughts were clear as day for anyone to see. He was disappointed by the Republic's incapacity of holding their promises to the Trilex. What do you suggest then, Jedi? We leave the cities. We let my people suffer. Is this the peace the Republic promised us? Drops of saliva landed on General D's face, and Dajer saw Ragu tensing up, ready to speak in favor of his master. However, before the Tigruta could say anything, General D gestured for him to keep quiet, and although indignation filled his face, Ragu obeyed. Listen to me, Sindulla. We aren't going to abandon you nor your people. But I won't let my troops die in vain. Then what do you plan on doing? Your people know this planet. They know the topography, they know the mountains and rivers. They will be our guides. We won't be able to completely stop the droids, but we can slow them down. You want to ambush them. Not ambush. I want to annoy them. 
hit and run tactics. Keely, Dager, you know what I am talking about. We see each other in two hours. Sindola, Kelly, let's get our people ready. It isn't fair. So many clones died, and Sindola is blaming us. How can he do that? Dejer stood quiet as a very angry Ragu complained. They were in the planning room of the Second Republic base. The Separatists were about 30 kilometers behind them. Being a huge army also had its disadvantages, they being mainly the huge amount of supplies needed, energy cells for the Separatist army, and that they moved slowly. General. Sindulla might be rude, but I understand why he is angry. And you also do. He is worried for his people, and he is worried that he made the wrong decision by joining the Republic. Considering our recent results in battle, well. Still. Our losses are far greater than his. Can't he see we are doing everything we can? Dejer sighed. He might understand Sindulla's reasons, but that didn't mean he was happy with his words. If anything, he was angrier than Ragu, after, it was his brothers who were dying. I didn't live a very long life, General Ragu, but one thing I learned in all the battles I fought is that sometimes, not even doing everything you can is enough. Dejer is right, my young Padawan. War isn't fair. If we changed sides with the Separatist, we would do the same. As a Jedi, it is important for you to understand that. Don't be clouded by anger or sadness. General D entered the room, followed by Commander Keeley. It was clear he heard the Padawan and clone talking. Ragu turned to the Nikto, less angry, but still somewhat indignant. But, Master. Remember we are peacekeepers. We are fighting the Clone Wars because there is no other option. But don't be fooled. We aren't soldiers. Our job is to follow the Force, and maintain peace. Dejer looked at the Jedi, his expression unchanged, but he was quite confused. How could the Jedis fight a war and still be peacekeepers? Anyway, it didn't make a difference to him. He fought because it was all he knew, it was all he was created for. Besides, he now had his personal motives to fight the Seppis. One for each brother that died. You will make a fine commander one day, Dejer. Just like Ragu, you can't be clouded by anger. No leader can. Erm. Um. Thank you, General. Dejer was quite surprised by General D, and didn't know what to say. He didn't understand what General D meant, nor why he said it. He looked at Commander Keeley, but the clone was impassive. Now, let's get back to the present. Sindulla is picking several freedom fighters to guide our strike groups. Keeley, Dejer, you sort out who those groups will be. Chapter 197 Sir. We received a report from. Ryloth. Our troops are. Facing heavy resistance. On a planet deep into Separatist territory, a tower stood tall above a cliff. Several people of different species walked around the tower, working. However, the last floor was empty, aside from a human and a droid. The human, an old man with white hair and beard, and using a long dark cloak, was sitting on a chair. Behind him, Green glass with beautiful designs covered the entire wall. In front of him, with his metallic hands behind his back, was a droid commando. It was very similar to the one that Dejer eliminated on Majido, but this one had dark red paint on his body. It was part of the personal guard of the old man. Why are you telling me this? I told you not to interrupt my meditation. The old man stayed seated, his eyes closed and his legs crossed. However, the droid commando suddenly fell to the ground, as if he was being stepped on by something invisible. His tough armor, capable of taking several laser shots, started to deform under the pressure. The droid, however, ignored all this, and continued with his report. According to our spies, Republic generals and Jedi masters Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker will soon be sent to assist the 303rd attack. Legion on Ryloth. Our strategists. Request permission to send more. Troops to the planet. The Republic scum there is almost. Wiped out. The pressure disappeared, and the droid commando got up. 
His left arm was hanging by a few wires, and sparks were flying from it. His head and chest were deformed to the point that he could barely stand up straight. Even his vocal device was damaged, making his voice sound even worse. Send as many troops as necessary. Ryloth is an important asset, and cannot be lost. Yes, Count Dooku. White stars filled the dark sky, and the two moons of Ryloth shone upon the land. Five figures sneaked around the red rocks that covered most of the planet. Dager, Tech, Metal, and Brain, were one of the strike groups that General D sent to attack the Separatist. Guiding them was Gobi, but the Chwilek wouldn't join the attack. Sindulla said he didn't want to risk his people any more than necessary, and stated his thoughts clearly. For him, ambushing the Separatist wasn't going to do anything, since a droid army wouldn't care about some losses. We are almost there. Quiet now. The blue Chwilek raised his fist, and the clones stopped. Following the freedom fighter even more silently than before, they soon saw the droids. It was unusually quiet, very different from the Republic army camp. In the Republic, even in the middle of the night there would be soldiers waking up, moving around and making noises. But in the Separatist camp, aside from the patrols, there was no other sound or movement. The B-1 units were crouching on the ground, deactivated, and connected to large boxes, the size of an ATE. Each of the batteries could power a few hundred droids. The vehicles of the droid army were also laying on the ground. The clones shrunk back when a patrol passed close to them, and Dager turned to the others. We will focus on the vehicles first. Don't go for the tri-droids, since they probably have sensors and alarms. They are too valuable to just be left unguarded. Plant detonators on the AATs and crab droids. Tech, see if you can do something about those batteries. If we can take them out, our chances of surviving will incur. Do you copy? Do you copy? Before he could finish, the subcommander was interrupted by Commander Keeley. Not only was the commander yelling urgently, but Dager could also hear explosions through the comlink. However, that should have been impossible, because Commander Keeley had stayed in the base to organize the troops. It took a few seconds for Dager to realize what was happening. It's a trap. Run. Other than Gobi, who was slightly confused and hesitated for a split second, the others followed his order immediately, without question. That was good, because moments later, the spot where they were was hit by several red lasers. Hiding behind a rock, Dager saw several B-2 super battle droids appear from their hiding spots, and felt the impact of lasers on his small protection. Not too far away, he heard several other battles happening. Apparently, not only him, but all the other strike teams had also been ambushed. Commander. We also are under attack. It was a trap all along. Retreat. We weren't the only ones. All our bases are being hammered by their bombers. We are going back to Lesu. I understand. Strike groups, you heard the commander. Forget the attack, and retreat. Now. Understood. Right away, sir. Several clones answered him, but Dager doubted many would be able to escape. The ambush had been too well planned. But now he had to worry about himself, and the others who were with him. Thankfully, since their mission was a sabotage one, they brought plenty of thermal detonators. Dager motioned slightly to Brain, and the clone understood him immediately. They had been working together for so long that they rarely need to speak to one another in the middle of a battle. In fact, that happened not only with Brain, but all of Hell Squad. While Brain was throwing the detonators, Dager signaled to the blaster in Gobi's hands. Time to use that thing. When I run, follow me, and don't stop. We parked the speeders not that far away. Metal and Brain will cover our rear guard. Okay. Good. Now, let's go. Ignoring the rain of lasers following them, the five people ran, with the two chosen clones turning slightly to shower the droids with lasers and thermal detonators. They got to the next set of cover just in time, because the droids adjusted their aim. Lasers hit the ground right behind Dager as he dove behind a rock. Don't stop. If they encircle us, we are dead. Dager pushed Gobi, who was leaning on the rock panting hard. 
The Chuilek might be a freedom fighter, but he obviously wasn't used to battles. Behind them, Deja could hear the whole separatist army turning on. He heard Tech yell a curse, and saw a black spot on his shoulder. However, the clone said it was nothing much, and kept running. They didn't have the time to stop and look at it, so Tech would have to endure the pain. Luckily for them, the droids were trying to ambush the strike teams, so they couldn't bring heavy vehicles like AATs. That allowed them to get to their speeders easily, and escape. On their way back to the capital, Dager confirmed the situation of the other groups. Seven groups had been sent, and two were completely wiped out, while some suffered casualties. In the end, nineteen clones and three Trileks died. On the tall walls of Lesu, General D and Ragu watched as the separatist army organized themselves. The Ray Bridge had been turned off, meaning that the only way for the separatists to attack was through artillery. Dajer and Commander Keeley walked beside the two Jedis, analyzing their defenses. Too much had happened in the spawn of one night. Not only the Sepis devised a trap, but they also attacked on all fronts. All the outposts and bases the Republic built were destroyed in a single night, and the four main cities of Ryloth were now under siege. Chapter 198 Lesu was the capital of one of the most important planets of the galaxy. Millions lived there, and ships were landing on it all the time. It was a noisy and busy city, bustling with life. But now, said city was eerily quiet. Even though it was day, no ships were landing and taking off because of the battle in the space. The residents stopped working, and were looking nervously out of their windows. From time to time, a loud bang resounded, sometimes followed by a scream. Snipers from both sides were trading shots, trying to take out enemy commanders. That was the only noise that could be heard, and it made the civilians tremble. Somehow, it was worse than a full-on battle. Deja was looking at the enemy army outside Lesu when he heard a loud sound. Instinctively, he dropped down, and felt a heatwave pass by him. Fortunately, he wasn't the target of the enemy sniper, or he would be dead. However, by his side, a clone lieutenant fell down, a hole on his right chest. The laser missed his heart, so he would probably survive, but was out of combat. Man down. Almost at the same time that the lieutenant was hit, a sniper blaster fired from somewhere else on the wall surrounding Lesu. A cloud of dust rose in the plain behind the droid army. Using his macro binoculars, Dajer saw a dead droid with a hole in the head. Good shot, dab. Dajer didn't need to ask who the sniper was. In all of the 303rd, only dab could react so fast. He located the droid sharpshooter, aimed and fired in less than two seconds. Probably few in the entire Republic Army could match him. Thank you, sir. Hell Squad had reunited in the capital after their failed attack on the droid army. On their path they had to take a detour around their second base, which was in ruins and crawling with droids. Since they were a small group, they moved much faster, and got to lesser hours before the Separatist. General D., Ragu and Commander Keeley were already there, together with the surviving clones of the 303rd. Around Ryloth, on the other three main cities, Nabat, Rovari, and Kalyan, the 303rd was also forced to retreat, so now they were concentrated on those four places. Any kind of aerial support that they asked for was quickly taken down by a crushing amount of vulture droids. And, to make things worse, they were starting to run low on supplies. Subcommander. Sir. General D is calling you to the meeting room. A clone came to him, and Dajer followed it. It wasn't like he could do anything on the wall. For the past few hours, all he had been doing was patrolling and firing at the droids. The atmosphere of the meeting room was very somber. Only six people were inside it, and all the other staff members were sent away. It was a secret meeting, and a very important one. The two Jedis, General D and Ragu, sat on one side of a hologram table, with Dajer and Commander Keeley behind them. On the opposite side were Cham Sindulla and Gobi. As soon as Dajer arrived, Commander Keeley had told him to look forth bugs. The so-called bugs weren't insects, but hidden transmission devices, created to listen to the conversation of others. Not surprisingly, they found one. 
The bug looked like a calm link, but it was one third of its size, no bigger than a nail. It had been hidden behind a command panel, and probably wouldn't be ever found if one wasn't looking for it. Now, it was laying on the table, and the six people were looking at it. Nobody said a word, since it was still active. Only after a few seconds did someone move. With an angry expression, Sindola picked up the device, and crushed it with his fingers. He let it fall on the table, and turned to General D. What does that mean, Jedi? General D was very calm, and waited for Gobi to pull back Sindola. The Freedom Fighter's leader was red with anger, because he knew exactly what General D was implying. We have a spy in our midst. And you think it is one of my men? I do. Sindula closed his eyes and took a deep breath. General D wasn't beating around the bush, and the Trilek had to control himself not to fight the Jedi. He knew what the result would be, and Ryloth could not afford to offend the Republic, at least not now, when the 303rd Attack Legion was all that was between them and the Separatist. Why? We are fighting for our planet, Jedi. We would never betray ourselves. If there is a spy, then it should be on your end. As soon as Sindula uttered those words, Dajer and Commander Keeley tensed up. It took an enormous amount of discipline for them not to retort. Seeing the clones grabbing their blasters and taking a small step towards him before retreating, even someone like Sindula felt a little scared. He saw more than once how deadly the two clones were. You shouldn't question the loyalty of the clones, Sindula. Keeley, explain to him. Maybe he will believe better if it comes out of the mouth of a clone. We were created to fight for the Republic, Sindula. Even if we wanted to betray it, our genes wouldn't permit it. Besides, we have a reason stronger than any orders or discipline. Do you really believe that a clone would defect to the one who eliminated hundreds of thousands of his brothers? That is enough, Keeley. Seeing the commander get so worked up, General D frowned and stopped him. He didn't expect that having their loyalty questioned would impact him so much. And looking at how Dager also seemed to be angry, the Jedi suspected that every clone would have the same reaction, which was quite confusing. What General D didn't know, however, was that each night, in their dreams, a dark shadow would ask them to betray the Jedis, their generals. As such, loyalty was much more important to the clones than anyone could ever guess. When Commander Keeley stepped back, General D turned back to the Trilex, and gestured towards the bug. Someone, one of your own, tipped us off to the Separatist. Our strike teams were ambushed, and many barely made it off. Our bases were attacked where we were the weakest. Although it wasn't a very well-guarded secret, those pieces of information weren't known by most. So whoever betrayed us, is in a high position. One of my officers. Exactly. Now, Sindola, we have to be very careful. Think hard, and tell me, who is the traitor? Chapter 199 Who is the traitor? Sindola looked like he wanted to argue again, but in the end, he just sat down, defeated. Knowing that one of the people he trusted betrayed not only him, but also his home planet was almost too much for the old Trilek. For several minutes the freedom fighter stood quiet, and no one said anything. They knew Sindula was going through a difficult time asking himself again and again which of the officers was the spy. Ay ay. Damn it. Sindula punched the hologram table, and held his head with his hands. None of the people in the room said anything, and Gobi put his arm around the shoulders of his leader. I can't think of anyone. Jedi, I hope you know how painful it is for me to say this. Uff. If there really is a traitor, it is probably Tram Chalk, Yate or Taboon. Tram and Yate are very dissatisfied with me asking for help if the Republic. Not that you helped much. And Tay, he. Is complicated. He wanted to side with the Separatist at first, but when I decided to follow the Republic, he changed his view. He is just like that, but I can't believe he would betray us. Tay thinks of Cham as a kind of hero. Whatever Cham does, he will always agree, even if he. Well, disagree. Gobi seemed quite uncomfortable with the subject, while Sindola became silent once again. Usually, General Du would press in such a matter, because both Trilex seemed very awkward. 
But now they didn't have time to be polite. What happened? This is important, Cindella. It can decide who lives and dies in the next battle. Gobi looked at Cindella, who didn't seem to want to answer the Jedi. Finally, after a few seconds, the freedom fighter decided to do it for his leader. Tay. Tay is Chams. He is my son. General D, who was about to talk, was stunned, and said nothing. Ragu and the two clones were also extremely quiet. It was clear now why Sindulla couldn't bear to say that Tay Boon might be a spy for the Separatist. Does he know it? I was planning to tell him just before the battle. But I don't know if I can. General D shook his head, and smiled lightly, but his smile carried no happiness, only understanding. You have to tell him now. His reaction will show who he sides with. Leave Tram and Yate for my men. We will keep an eye on them. As for Tay. I will leave him to you. Sindulla nodded, and got up, followed by Gobi. When they were at the door, the Chwilek turned back, and put his hand above his chest. It was a sort of greetings used by the people of Ryloth. Thank you, Master D. After the freedom fighters left, General D gestured for Commander Keeley and Dager to sit down. What do you think? We should keep an eye on both Sindulla and Taboon. If Tay isn't the spy, then it is for the better. But if he is, knowing who his father is can cause. Unexpected reactions. Both clones nodded. Ragu said exactly what they were thinking. If he was a traitor, the revelation would probably startle Tay so much that he would reveal it. But what he would do after was impossible to know. Maybe he would tell the truth, or he might even start his plan earlier. Anyway, it was sure there would be repercussions. Let's do this then. Keely, get someone on Taboon and on Sindulla. Don't let them know they are being followed. The same goes for Tram Chalk and Yate. Now, are we ready for the battle? As ready as we can be, General. Suddenly, the Nikto stood up, and put his hand in front of Commander Keely. After shaking hands with the Commander, he did the same with Dager. For the first time ever since when Ragu was captured and taken to Tatooine, the Jedi showed his emotions without holding back. Only, this time it wasn't rage, but fondness. Keely, Dager. Whatever the result of this battle is, whatever happens to Ryloth, I want you to know that it was my pleasure and my privilege to have you two with me. And I say this not as your general, but as your friend. The 303rd couldn't have finer commanders. For a moment, Dager was overwhelmed by emotion. Any soldier would like to be praised by his commander, but this was different. General D was the person Dager respected the most, even more than Commander Keeley. The Jedi was harsh, tough, and mostly emotionless. But Dager also knew that he was kind and helpful, qualities he suspected every Jedi needed. Dager had seen him put his life at risk for clones and civilians hundreds, if not thousands of times. Both he and Keeley saluted General D at the same time. They knew that was the Jedi's way of saying his farewells, and they wouldn't do anything less than return it with the same respect. Thank you, General. The Nikto smiled, and waved at them. You should go now. I am sure you still have duties to perform before this final battle. Watching the two clones leave, General D sat down and looked at his Padawan. Ragu had been quiet this entire time, as if only now did he realize that they were about to face an army dozens of times their size, and without any chance of retreat. What troubles you, my Padawan? Ragu bit his lips, and the protuberances that identified him as a Tigruta twitched, showing he was nervous. Master. Is there. Is there any chance that we can survive this? As long as we are alive, there is hope. The Republic won't give up on us. We only have to hold on, and trust the Force. Being reassured by his master, Ragu became somewhat worry-free. After all, he was still a child, and it was easy for him to forget those things. With his head down, the Padawan didn't notice the sad expression of his master when he lied to his apprentice. Dager and Commander Keeley walked in the corridors of the Trilek building that had become the Republic base on Lesu. Both clones said almost nothing, as the weight of General D's words was still sinking in. Eventually, 
Dajer turned to his commander. We are going to die on this planet, and I have no problems with it. We were born to this. Do you think there is any chance we can convince General D and General Ragu to leave the city? I don't believe the Republic will leave Ryloth to the Sepis. The planet is too important. If they could hide for this long. You know very well the answer. The general will live and die with us, Dajer. Even suggesting that to him would be disrespectful. Now, come on, brother. We have troops to command, and clankers to eliminate. Commander Keeley tapped Dajer on the back, and laughed. No matter how grim the situation was, dying side by side with his brothers, and such a general, didn't seem so bad. On the back of his mind, something that Dajer said had been bugging him. However, a clone rushed towards him with a data pad, and the commander forgot what it was. Chapter 200 Artillery Strike Incoming Get Dal. Arg. Dajer didn't know who yelled that, but he was cut short when a barrage of lasers as thick as his waist landed on the walls of Lesu. A huge portion of the wall crumbled, falling into the city below, crushing several houses. More than ten soldiers went down with it, and the situation repeated itself on many portions of the wall. Dajer stood up again, and fired several shots. He didn't even bother to aim, since the mass of droids outside Lesu was so compact that he was sure to hit something. However, no matter how many droids he eliminated, it was but a drop in the ocean. For the last four days, ever since the Separatists started a full-on attack all around Ryloth, several more C-9979's landing crafts landed on Ryloth, and now the Separatist had almost half a million troops on the planet. Behind Dajer, Lesu was almost in ruins. Smoke and fire spread all around the city, thanks to the artillery barrage and the hyena-class bombers of the Sepis. Thankfully, most civilians were okay, since they had long hidden inside bunkers. Tri-droids, MTTs, AATs, and dwarf spider droids bombarded the city without stop, and most of the clones' vehicles, which were basically at TES, SHAPTS, and at APS, were destroyed. In hope of doing a last stand inside the city, General D ordered the remaining five at TES to retreat. Of course, that only accelerated the fall of Lesu. Up till now, the 303rd had suffered severe losses under the separatist attack. In fact, in four days, they lost more than on the entirety of the battle up to this moment. Of the four cities they were protecting, only Lesu still was under the Republic. The other three, Kalayun, Nabit, and Rovari, had fallen to separatist hands. In total, 9,000 clones died protecting those cities, although it was in vain. The survivors, who didn't amount much more than 1,500, retreated together with the freedom fighters to one of their bases deep in the wilderness. After Lesu fell, and it was going to, the remaining clones would go there too. That was the alternative that Commander Keeley had found. Since they couldn't win the battle, nor could they send General D away as Dajer wanted, then they would all retreat. What would happen next, they didn't know. Sir. Lieutenant Fonder just died. His injuries were too great. Just when Dajer was thinking, a trooper touched his shoulder, and gave him the bad news. Yesterday, the section of the wall where Fonder was had been hit, and he fell down. Although he didn't die immediately, his skull cracked, and several of his bones broke, puncturing his organs. It was a miracle he didn't perish immediately, but the poor soldier couldn't hold on. Dajer closed his eyes. Fonder had been a good soldier, and, above all else, a good brother. Unfortunately, war didn't wait for the people to grief. Not only had Fonder died, but many of his closest brothers also had. Captain Narza had died two days before, when he and Blyer decided to stay behind to cover the retreat of the others in Nabit. When they realized that they wouldn't be able to leave, they strapped a bunch of thermal detonators to a speeder, and drove it straight to the droids. They were dead before the speeder blew up. Thartum, the medic that helped Dajer on Majido, had been blasted in the face by a tri-droid. Sharp and Spike also died in battle in one of the other cities. Smith and Agile didn't resist their wounds. Lieutenant Jesper, Lieutenant Virgo, Sergeant Pride, Sergeant Vigil, and Captain Plasma also perished in battle. 
One by one, everyone Dager knew, the clones and brothers that he grew up with, were dying, and there was nothing he could do. That caused not only him, but also the others, to be reckless. It was almost impossible to find a trooper uninjured, but anyone who could carry a blaster was fighting. Deja himself had many bruises and cuts, although the worst injury Hell Squad received was a laser wound on Brain's shoulder, which he totally ignored. Deja turned to the clone who warned him, a squad leader called Trapper. The clone was limping, and two black spots in his left leg showed where he had been hit. Still, Trapper acted as if the wound wasn't there. Get Sergeant Sanel to replace him in commanding his battalion. The sergeant is dead, sir. All right. Then you are in charge, Trapper. You are a sergeant now. Do your best. Understood, sir. The newly promoted sergeant died before he could even make it back to his men, shot in the head by a lucky droid. This time no one warned Dager, because they couldn't stop fighting or they would die. It didn't matter really, because now each clone had one mission, fight, for as long as they could. And then there was a pause in the battle. The droid stopped firing, and looked up to the sky. Dejer took the chance to grab an RPS-6 from a dead trooper, and fire at the legs of a tri-droid. The giant thing tumbled down, and crushed several droids. Still, the Separatist army ignored him and the 303rd, which caused hundreds of clankers to die in a few seconds. He asked himself why the droids would act so weird, and the answer came almost instantly. He looked around, and saw Yate holding an injured arm. Next to him, the son of Cham Sindulla, Taboon, looked at Dejer in the eyes, and tried to yell something to the clone. Somehow, Dejer knew the freedom fighter discovered he was suspected of being a spy for the Separatist. But it wasn't him. When Dejer understood what was happening, it was too late. Several things happened at the same time. Firstly, Dejer heard a clone scream on his communicator. It's Tram Chalk. It's Tram. Then, he saw a young Trilek that was next to him turn around, and fire at him. Dejer dropped to the ground, barely dodging, grabbed his vibroblade, and cut off the hand that was holding the blaster. While the Trilek screamed, Dejer kicked him, and he fell in the abyss outside the city. All around the city wall, several freedom fighters turned against the 303rd. Not all clones were as fast as Dejer to react, and dozens were executed on the spot by the people who were fighting side by side with them instants before. In fact, not only the 303rd was targeted, but several Trileks were also eliminated. Dejer couldn't imagine how the traitors could murder the people they knew and lived with for years, but it was happening. And lastly, Dejer heard a small rumbling sound as the ray bridge that was the only connection between Lesu and the outside appeared. At the same time, the droid army also came back to life, and several vehicles concentrated their fire on the gate of the city. Chapter 201 For now, Dejer ignored the droids attacking the gate, and got up. Aiming his DC-15A, he fired six shots in quick succession. Each of them hit the forehead of a freedom fighter traitor. The others also started to react, quickly taking down the traitors, and turned back to defend against the separatist. The Trilex, however, stared blankly at the corpses of the ones who moments before were their brothers in arms. Dejer pushed one of them, and yelled in his ear to wake him up. Get on your feet and use that blaster, soldier. I I. He. H he. I'm not a soldier. Now you are. Move if you don't want to die. He dragged the Trilek down, just in time to dodge a volley of lasers. Seeing that the freedom fighters were coming back to their senses, Dejer turned on his comlink to contact General D and Commander Keeley. However, only a buzzing sound answered him. Communications were jammed again. Of course they were. We are falling back to the city council building. Comms are out, pass it around. Yes, sir. Dejer grabbed a trooper by his side, and ordered him to call the retreat. Just when the clone was about to move away, Dejer pulled him back again. And if you see anyone from Hell Squad, tell them to go to the bridge controls. Looking at the walls one last time, Dejer went towards the bridge controls. Since he had ordered the retreat, he had to go against the flow, and bumped into several tree legs. 
the freedom fighters weren't as organized as the clones, so their retreat was quite chaotic. On his way to the bridge controls, he reunited with 3-4, Dab, and Brain. When they arrived there, he saw Tech, Cell, and Metal. Tech wasn't wearing his helmet, and was bleeding from a cut above his eyebrows. 3-4 quickly bandaged it, and the clone put his helmet on again. Subcommander, sir. I have a message from General D. Say it. Ferret, who had recently become a sergeant, ran towards Dager, with a message from the Jedi. He and Commander Keeley are in the city council building. He said that you should know it is Tram, and that you would understand. And that you have to capture him. Understood. Go back. Hell Squad will take care of it. We will go too. Both clones turned around, and saw Cham Sindola, together with his son, Taboon. Sindola had a bandage around his chest, while Tay looked battered but all right. Tram was one of my officers. I've known him for years. I want to know why. Let's go. Dajer ignored Sindola, and turned around. The freedom fighter leader was stunned, but seemed to understand, and smiled sadly. After all, not only did he fail to find out there was a traitor amongst his troops, there were in fact several. Seeing Dajer and Hell Squad entering the bridge controls building, Sindola and his son followed. Just at the entrance, they were greeted with a sorrowful sight. For corpses were laying on the ground. Three of them were clones, and all, with the exception of one, had been shot at point blank on the back of the head. Dajer knelt beside the corpse of Timer. The trooper had been in charge of following Tram Chalk, and had been the one to warn Dajer about his betrayal. Timer was holding his comlink in one hand, and had four wounds in the chest. If he had defended himself instead of contacting Dajer, he probably would have lasted longer. But Timer saw the big picture, and knew that this was more important than his life. Getting up, Dajer looked at the stairs that would take them to the bridge control room. It was a circular set of stairs, meaning they would have to be careful, because any defender could just put his blaster out and fire, without exposing their body, while those who were going up wouldn't have anywhere to hide. Dajer looked around, and saw Sindulla closing the eyes of the dead Trelek. Surprised, he recognized her as a Pele, the woman who lead them to ambush the droids when they landed on Ryloth. Unfortunately, there was no time to mourn. We need to move. Either we retake the controls and deactivate the bridge, or we get surrounded and eliminated. Hell Squad followed him without hesitation, while Sindulla looked at Tay and nodded. They let the clones go first, because they were more experienced, but also because Sindulla didn't want his son to be hurt. Their decision was proved correct, because the circular stairs that posed so much threat for others were nothing before Hell Squad. Before the Trelec traders could even aim, they were blasted by the clones, who knew exactly where they were. How they knew that, it could only be attributed to how many times they had been in similar circumstances. In total, they eliminated five Trelecs to get to the bridge control room. Each time they stepped over a dead body, Sindulla, and Taboon would mutter a name. When Dajer and 3-4 were about to breach inside the bridge control room, a piece of the doorway was blasted by lasers. The shards hit Dajer's helmet harmlessly, and he stepped back, taking cover behind the wall. Dab, how many? I counted six blasters firing, sir. Damn it. No way we are getting in there quickly. Plan B then. Tech, if we destroy the controls, will that take the bridge down? Probably. Let's do it, then. Brain. On it, sir. Under the shocked gaze of Sindola, Brain pulled out about ten thermal detonators from his backpack. Dajer gestured for the clone to wait for a moment. Tram Chalk. We know you are there. Of course you do. I just tried to shoot you. What do you want? Dajer was about to answer, but Sindulla rushed forward, and yelled at the room. Tram. I know you never liked me, but. Why betray your people? Ha ha ha. Betray my people. I didn't betray anyone. The only traitor here is you. You knew the Republic couldn't protect us, and yet you engaged in a lost war. You think I don't know you were promised the power to rule Ryloth if you win this war. Sindulla looked stunned, 
as if for the first time it occurred to him that he made the wrong decision. Dager didn't care. He ordered Brain to throw the thermal detonators, and a bunch of explosions shook the whole building. Immediately, Brain and Dager entered the room, one looking to the left and the other to the right. Seven Trileks laid on the floor, two of them clearly dead, and the other four very stunned by the explosion. Tram wasn't amongst them. Without pity, Dager and Brain eliminated the traitors, and looked around. They had heard Tram chalk, but couldn't see him. It was at this moment that somebody jumped on Dager, and tried to grab his neck. The person had been hiding behind the doors, so both Brain and Dager had their backs to him. The attacker obviously wanted to capture Dager, so the clone let him do it. Without facing resistance, Tram Chalk put a blaster pistol against Dager's head. You take one more step and I will eliminate him. Chapter 202 Tram knew that Dager was a big shot of the 303rd Attack Legion. Not only was he the sub-commander of the Legion, but he was also the leader of a so-called special squad. He didn't know what was so special about them, other than their different armor and weapons. However, he knew that by capturing Dager, he would be able to use the hostage to go free. Or at least, that was what he expected. However, after he grabbed Dager, and put his blaster against his head, the clone didn't struggle, which he understood, after all, he had a blaster aimed at him, but the other clones didn't seem worried. One of them, in fact, even put down his blasters and start analyzing the destroyed bridge controls, as if Tram wasn't there, holding his squad leader hostage. The bridge is still up, sir, but I should be able to deactivate it with a little bit of time. The clone, that Tram recognized as Tech, turned to Dager, and said that. At the same time, Sindola and Te entered the room, and were almost as confused as Tram. The traitor was furious, but before he could threaten the clones, he heard Dager mutter something. What? Get out of the way or I will blow his head off. I said. You are too close. Before Tram could process what Dager said, the clone launched his head backwards, and headbutt Tram. With a crack, the nose of the Trilek broke. At the same time, Dager grabbed the arm that Tram had around his neck, and threw him over his shoulder. Before the traitor hit the ground, Dager already had his DC-17 aimed at his face. Take this bridge out now, Tech. I saw an MTT and a dozen battalions already crossing it. Dager signaled for metal and 3-4 to hold Tram Chalk, and turned to the window. Several hundred droids had already entered the city, and small fights erupted everywhere as the Republic forces were hunted down. Now, after securing the entrance of Lesu, the vehicles of the Separatists were starting to move in, the first one being one of the big MTTs, capable of carrying hundreds of troops. Behind it, closely packed B-1 units marched. Come on Tech, you have to be quick. Tech typed frenetically in the control panels, but this time their plan worked against them. When they blew up the room, the machines were damaged just enough so Tech couldn't work with them. However, the Ray Bridge was still there. Come on, come on. We really need to move fast, Tech. I'm trying, sir. But this damn thing isn't working. You are doomed. When the Separatist arrives, you will all be eliminated, and I will represent Ryloth to join the Confederacy of Independent Systems. You and all the clones will be eliminated or captured, and Ryloth will be safe. Finally. Tram, with a crazy look on his eyes, laughed at the futile attempts of Hell Squad to stop the clankers. At this moment, Dager decided it was enough. Turning around, he walked until he was in front of Tram, and put his DC-17 in the forehead of the traitor. Suddenly, the look of contempt on his face became one of fear. He was sure Dager was about to eliminate him, and that the clone wouldn't hesitate for a moment. Tram Chalk, you betrayed the Republic and aligned with the Separatist. Your actions caused not only the loss of a crucial planet to our efforts of war, but also the death of hundreds and thousands of troopers. That is enough for you to be sentenced to death a dozen times. I, as the sub-commander of the 303rd Attack Legion of the Galactic Republic, have the authority to execute your sentence immediately. Tram was frozen in fear, while all the members of Hell Squad looked at Dager quite shocked. It was rare to see Dager so angry. However, in the end, they had orders they had to follow. 
Brain stepped forward, and put his hand on Dejer's shoulder. We have orders to take him alive, sir. For a few seconds, Dejer stood still, looking straight at Tram. The black visor of the clone's helmet didn't let the Trelec see Dejer's eyes, but it was somehow even scarier than if he could. Finally, Dejer lowered his arm, and walked to Sindulla, who was standing in the corner of the room without saying anything. He gave the freedom fighter his DC-17. We have orders to take him alive. You don't. Brain, take those detonators, plant it on the controls. This is our last chance. Ye yes, sir. After hesitating a while, and being scolded by Dejer again, Brain planted the thermal detonators. Dejer was being harsh, but it was all because of the situation they were in. Let's hope this works. Dejer pressed a button on his comlink, and the detonators blew up. Almost at the same time that the bridge controls exploded, the ray bridge started to falter. Several holes appeared in it, and hundreds of droids fell through them. When it totally disappeared, it was a massacre. At least three to four thousand B-1 units and several hundred B-2 super battle droids disappeared in the abyss below. Six AATs, two dozen dwarf spider droids, a few crab droids, and one tri-droid also went down. The sound of metal hitting rocks engulfed Lesu, silencing, for a moment, everything else. Unfortunately, even taking out the bridge was not enough at this point. The MTT had half of its body hanging over the edge of the abyss, but it managed to get up. Immediately after it entered Lesu, it started spewing droids. Almost a thousand of them joined the ones who were already in the city, pushing the 303rd even farther back. Let's go, or we will be trapped here. Dejer turned to Sindola, who was aiming the DC-17 at Tram. The Freedom Fighter nodded to Dejer, and the clone acknowledged. Gesturing to Hell Squad, the clones left the room, headed to the city council building. Air. Sir. Shouldn't Sindola come with us? He knows the city better than anyone. He will figure his path. Besides, what will happen between him and the spy is something concerning the Freedom Fighters, not us. What about Tram Chalk? What about our orders? Our orders were to take down the bridge, and we did it. The rest you leave for me to worry. Understood. To tell the truth, none of the clones liked the idea of Tram Chalk being alive after causing the death of so many brothers. However, they wouldn't disobey orders, and even though Dejer technically wasn't disobeying, it still felt wrong. But, they decided to shut up and follow their squad leader. Nobody knew what Tram Chalk and Cham Sindulla talked about. However, Sindulla and his son made it back to the city council building, and Tram Chalk was confirmed dead. Other than a stern stare, there were no consequences for Hell Squad or Dejer. A few hours later, suffering heavy casualties, the Republic was forced to abandon Lesu to the Separatist. The next day, the Ray Bridge was up again, and hundreds of thousands of droids walked into the city. Despite the small number of surviving clones and freedom fighters on the ground, and the few Republic ships still battling in space, Ryloth was considered conquered by the Separatist. The planet was lost, at least for now. Chapter 203 Kneeling, Dajer closed the eyes of Captain Jax, and gestured for two troopers to take him away. The captain was the latest of the hundreds of wounded troopers who weren't able to resist. But he wouldn't be the last. It was at this moment that the entire camp became quiet. Before, it was bustling with movement, clones, and Trelec speaking in wounded moaning. But now it was quiet. He looked around, and saw heads turned to the sky. When he looked up, Dejer couldn't help but curse. Dozens of ships had just appeared above Ryloth. Separatist ships. We just detected movement in the hyperspace, Admiral. Two minutes until they arrive. Any word from the Republic? Are those ships ours? We have nothing. Then those are enemy ships. Get ready. This can very well be our last battle. All fighters to the air, and don't spare ammunition. Admiral Dow looked at the enemy fleet already there, and made a comparison. The result wasn't good. Of the entire 303rd fleet, 
only one badly damaged Aclamator class cruiser still remained, together with two Venator class cruisers, the Sincerity and the Righteous. Meanwhile, the Separatist still had the Recusant class destroyer, very damaged, but still operational, and four Providence class dreadnoughts, alongside with seven Munificent class frigates. If one were to compare the ratio of Republic starfighters to vulture droids, it was even worse. Only 153 V-Wings were left from the original 2500. On the Separatist side, about 800 vulture droids could still fly. Considering only numbers, the Republic fleet had caused a lot more damages than it suffered, killing about four enemies for each starfighter it lost, but in the end, a defeat was still a defeat. Of course, nobody could accuse the 303rd of being useless. They were given a mission, and they completed it to their best. By all means, they should have been destroyed days ago, but the determination they showed was enough to make even the merciless droid army falter. The enemy commander, the tactical droid, had already been informed that he would face punishment for taking too long to destroy a, simple, Republic fleet. The unfortunate TA-175 couldn't even argue that it was not his fault, because his circuits also couldn't process it. According to his initial calculations, they should have lost less than 20% of their army to conquer Ryloth, not the whooping 60-70% to that they did. They shouldn't have taken 21 days to win this battle, but 10. Everything went wrong, and the tactical droid didn't know why. TA-175 had the same problem that countless other tactical droids also had when facing the clone army. Their calculations took into account only numbers, but clones weren't just that. Each and every one of them were fighting for their lives, but also for the lives of others. That made them much stronger. An alert sounded as the ships came out of hyperspace. Just like they expected, it was another separatist fleet, bigger and stronger than the first. This time, the enemy didn't wait to start the attack. Immediately after they exited hyperspace, the hangar doors opened, and thousands of vulture droids left the ships. The commander of this new fleet seemed decided to crush the Republic's remaining forces completely. Well, Admiral Dow wasn't going to let them destroy the 303rd so easily. For the last time, he turned on the speakers, transmitting his voice to every cruiser and starfighter of the 303rd fleet, what was left of it. His voice carried sadness and sorrow, but also an unwavering determination. Attention, troopers, and pilots of the 303rd Attack Legion. This is Admiral Dow speaking. O enemies have received reinforcements. It is with the deepest of regrets that I inform you that we will not live to see another day. I won't lie to you and say there are reinforcements on the way. There aren't. But I will say one thing, you sacrificed so much for the Republic. Too much even. No one could have done more than you did for the Republic. He paused, and sensed something hot on his cheeks. Surprised, Admiral Dow realized it was tears. He laughed lightly. Who would have thought that the battle-hardened Admiral, a commander of the Old Republic, would cry? But he wasn't crying because he was afraid to die. He was crying because he knew that was the last time he talked with those soldiers, those brothers. But I have to ask you to do one more thing. I have to ask you to trust me. Since we can't win against the Seppis, then we are going to make this the most painful victory they ever had. Now, here is what we are going to do. Cruisers, we will be in the front. All power on the forward shields. Fighters, you will be coming behind us. And bombers, you will be in the middle of the starfighters. There was a collective gasp of surprise amongst the officers in the command bridge of the Sincerity. They understood what the Admiral claimed. It was, but he was right when he said it would hurt the Separatists the most. By putting the cruisers on the front, they would take the brunt of the attack, and most likely be damaged beyond repair, even destroyed. However, that would give the starfighters a chance of bypassing the vulture droids, and directly attacking the big ships. That is where the Y-Wings bombers came in. I'm sure you know what I mean. Bombers your job is the most important of all. You won't stop for anything. Ships will blow by your side. Brothers will die. You will go on, understood? That is the only shot that we will have at avenging them. Now, get in your positions, and prepare to fight. And remember, if we are to go out, 
then let it be in a blaze of glory. He turned off the speakers. He said all he had to say. Now, all that was left was to battle. On the three cruisers, nobody said anything. There were no cheers, no answer to Admiral Dow's speech. The pilots put on their helmets, resolve on their faces. Gunners and crewmen prepared the cannons and turrets. The odd formation that the Republic got in confused the enemy commander, but when he realized what their plan was, he just laughed. The puny efforts of those clones were nothing before the might of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The last battle of the 303rd Attack Legion started. That day, one of the top legions of the Republic Army fell, annihilated in battle. No ship of the fleet stayed in one piece, and no pilot survived. It was a dark day for the Republic. Chapter 204 Maybe it was a mistake, maybe it was on purpose, but Admiral Dow's speech was transmitted to General D. down on Ryloth. General D. was, at this moment, surrounded by clones, freedom fighters, and citizens of Ryloth. They were outside of Lesu, escaping to the hideout where the survivors from the other battles were. Considering that the total amount of clones that survived was just a little more than 2,000, and that even when adding up with the freedom fighters and civilians. There were no more than 5,000 people, the separatists deemed them as unimportant, and sent just a small force after them. General D was preparing a group of combatants to meet that enemy force. So, when Admiral Dow talked, it wasn't only General D who heard him, but also Hell Squad, Commander Keeley, Ragu, Sindulla, and dozens of troopers and Trileks. It didn't take long for word of it to get around. Is it over? Maybe we should surrender. Hold on, dear. You will get better. You have to. While the Trileks muttered amongst themselves with fear, the clones were silent. They all looked up to the sky, where three Republic ships threw themselves against three dozen Separatist ships. Not much later, a trooper came to talk with Dager. He, in turn, whispered something to Commander Keeley. Soon, Commander Keeley walked up to General D. Appearing ten years older, the Nikto signaled for the commander to speak. General, sir. The troops want to fight. We want to fight. General D looked like he wanted to deny, but Commander Keeley already had an argument for whatever the Jedi was about to say. If we let the clankers follow us, General, they will know where we are hiding. And we don't have enough power to defend against them if they launch a full-on attack. We don't have the power to defend against them even if it is just those 8,000 droids following us, Keeley. But you are right. We can't let them reach the Trilek hideout. Gather the troops. Only clones, no freedom fighters. And while you are at that, tell Dager to prepare a report for me. I want to know our exact numbers. Soon, the clones sorted themselves out from the group. Since they couldn't lead the droids to the hideout, they would be reinforced by the clones there. So, they had a little less than a thousand clones, many with different kinds of injuries. Dager presented a data pad to General D, and the Jedi asked Regu to read it. We have 947 troopers, Master. How many are able to fight? Air. Ragu looked at Dager unsure of what to answer. According to the report, more than 500 of the clones had some kind of injury, and most of them would put a soldier in a back to tank at least for a few days. However, the report only excluded from the fight about 150 clones, those who had injuries so serious that were life-threatening. Dager stepped forward to help Ragu. Put a blaster in the hands of those troopers and they can fight, generals. I won't allow injured men to die because they want vengeance. Only those who are in good condition can come. The others will go to the hideout. General, with all due respect, but I doubt we can eliminate those droids with just 300 men. Besides, what is the difference between dying here or in the hideout? If we bring everyone we can, at least our chances are bigger. Dager is right, Master. Even General D couldn't help but agree with Dager and Ragu. As much as he hated the idea of forcing wounded troopers to fight, they really didn't have much of an option. Even when taking the 800 clones, they would be at a disadvantage of 10 to 1. Okay then. But, Dager, I need to talk with you. Alone. Dager followed the Nikto. 
he wasn't afraid of being scolded by General D, because he was simply representing the troopers. However, what the Jedi said next was totally out of his expectations. Dajer, I will be brief. You are a soldier, one of the best. And, as such, you know better than anyone that we have no chance of winning this battle. Not the one we will fight now, but this battle as a whole. In fact, we already lost. Our fleet is practically destroyed, and so is our legion. You and I will probably die in battle. I know you don't care, and I have lived a long enough life to accept it. It is part of the Jedi Code to embrace death, because it is nothing to fear, but a natural part of the Force. But Ragu is just a Padawan. He is my Padawan. I can't let him die here. Dajer said nothing. The Jedi didn't seem to need an answer, he just wanted to talk. His eyes were shining with countless emotions. I want you to take the wounded and Ragu, and escape together with the Trilex. I can't do that, sir. You will do that. It is an order. But not now. First we need to fight those droids pursuing us. If we can defeat them, there will be no need to do what I said. If we can't. Before Dajer could say anything, Sindola approached them, and General D told Dajer to be quiet. The Trilek was already suspicious enough without hearing the word escape. Master D. I was told you are gathering your troops to fight. Yes, Sindola. If we don't, the droids will discover where the wounded, children and civilians are hiding. I understand. We will fight side by side. What followed was a long discussion. In the end, it was decided that the freedom fighters and clones would fight together, probably for the last time. Not only that, but suddenly several hundred people arrived, clones and Trilex. Apparently, Lieutenant Shield, who was in the hideout, decided by himself to come aid in the battle. He knew General D wouldn't agree to that, so he didn't tell him, and now that they were there, it would be stupidity to send them away. That bumped up the number of the Republic forces to about 3,000 fighters. It wasn't nearly enough to fight the droids, but it was much better than before. All while that was happening, Dajer was in deep thought. He couldn't bear to abandon his brothers and his general to escape, even if it was to guard the wounded and ragu. But he also couldn't disobey orders. It was simply impossible for him, because obedience was ingrained in his genetic code. We gathered the information you required. It is not good. Brain approached Dajer, and handed him a data pad. When he read what was in it, Dajer's face looked grim. It was worse than he thought. He gave the data pad back to Brain, and went to find the General D. The Jedi was together with Commander Keeley, discussing the best positions to put there at TES and at APS. General, Commander. There is something you need to know about. Chapter 205 General, Commander, there is something you should know about. Dajer saluted the Jedi and the clone as usual, but he was bringing bad news. Very bad news. What is it? Bad news, General. I asked Brain to do an inventory of our supplies, since I doubt we will have a chance to restock. We are good on water and food, and I think Sindola would be able to arrange that for us if it is needed. We are also good on ammo. We lost troopers faster than they could spend it. What is the problem then? Most of our medical supplies are spoiled and useless. I think we were sabotaged. Bacta tanks were broken, bandages were ruined and medicines destroyed. General D showed an angry face. It was clear what Dajer was implying. Tram Chalk. I think so, General. He is the only one who would do that. That idiot. Even after death he is betraying us. For once, General D let Commander Keeley curse a dead man. This last blow that Tram Chalk hit them with, even after his death, was really too much. Just like Dajer said, they could do without water and food, because Sindulla certainly could arrange that on his own planet. However, without medical supplies, each wound could take the life of a trooper or a freedom fighter, even if it was just the tiniest scratch. Put me in contact with Admiral Dow. Dajer was holding his helmet under his arm, but he put it down on a crate, and pulled out a hologram projector. Admiral Dow showed up, 
but the transmission was blurry, and the admiral kept looking back. Of course, all of this was understandable, since the sincerity was locked in a death struggle at this moment. Admiral. We need medical supplies immediately. Contact the Jedi Council once more. Tell them that if we don't get those supplies, the 303rd and the Freedom Fighters won't be able to defend Ryloth. Do so, General. Not sure it will. Matter. I've tried this many. Answer is always. Same. Try again, Admiral. It is our only hope. General. General D ended the transmission, and turned to the two clones and Sindulla. They could already hear the sound of the droids approaching far away. The Nikto inspected the troops behind them. 1,700 clones, and about that same number in Trilek Freedom Fighters. The wounded and civilians were already far away. Now, we can only fight. And hope. May the force be with us. Admiral Dow held on the hologram table so he wouldn't fall. Although they had only just started their attack, the Sincerity and the other ships were already taking heavy fire. He had just spoken with the members of the Jedi Council, as General D asked, and the answer was a little bit better this time. He was told that a representative of the Senate was already in Toydaria, negotiating a convoy of supplies for the Republic troops on Ryloth. Toydarians had a neutral stance in the Clone Wars, and, as such, could enter Ryloth without being attacked by the Separatist, but the benefits the Republic promised were enough to make their king send those supplies, and nothing more. However, negotiations were still going on, and if it took too long, there would be no one alive to receive the supplies. For now, all Admiral Dao could do was continue to fight, and eliminate as many droids as possible before he died. Dajer jumped down a trench, just in time to dodge a volley of red lasers coming in his direction. For the past hour, he and Commander Keeley had been fighting side by side, and caused so many losses to the droids that they became the focus of attention of the enemy army, even more than General D. The commander also jumped inside the trench. Around them, clones and Trilex fought side by side, and died side by side. Dajer felt someone stumble and hit him and when he looked at the corpse, he recognized Sharp, even though half of his helmet was black and smoking. Putting his dead brother down slowly, he turned to Commander Keeley. The commander had two DC-17s, one on each hand, and was firing them non-stop. Dajer looked over the top of the trench, and saw a dozen droids falling in quick succession, each of them with a laser hole in the chest and another in the head. It was incredible how Commander Keeley could be so accurate with pistols at more than 300 meters. However, Dajer didn't have time to admire the commander, because an AAT was crushing the dead droids in his path, and it was aiming at them. The tank is looking at us, Commander. Everyone around, move. They only had time to jump out of the way before the AAT fired. Red soil and mud flew everywhere and Dajer heard screams as at least one freedom fighter was caught in the explosion. Thankfully, the AAT didn't have time to fire a second shot before one of the few at TES the 303rd had destroyed it. His head buzzing, Dajer felt Commander Keeley helping him get up. Come on, Dajer. It isn't time to sleep now. Chuckling, Dajer got up and grabbed his DC-17. His DC-15A was lost somewhere, and he didn't have time to look for it. Suddenly, a loud sound encompassed the battlefield. Dajer looked up, and saw two hyena-class bombers flying towards them. Clones and Trilex threw themselves on the ground, but it was useless. Several explosions shook the battlefield, and a cloud of dust appeared, covering Republic and Separatist troops alike. Screams of the wounded resounded, but the droids didn't care, and red lasers cut the dust. Commander Keeley looked at Dajer, his visor covered in dirt. You go west, I will go the other way. Get the troops back in position. Those bombers will come back for another round. Understood, sir. Dajer started running and helping people get up. From time to time he fired his pistol, and never once missed the target. Commander Keeley, on the other hand, ran off to encounter General D. Some instinct warned Dajer that something wasn't right. Most people wouldn't pay attention to this kind of thing, the vague feeling that they were in danger. 
but Dager wasn't a normal person. He was a soldier who had been through hundreds of battles, and put his life on the line more times than he could remember. So, when his instinct kicked in, he followed it. He humped forward, and rolled on the ground before getting up again. Burning pain in his left shoulder and arm told him he had been hit two times, but the lasers missed his bones, only cutting flesh. He ignored the pain, turned around, and emptied the DC-17's magazine in the dust above him. Three B-1 battle droids fell inside the trench. All over the Republic's defensive line, clankers used the dust as cover to reach the trench. Clones and freedom fighters were being massacred without a chance to resist, so Dager did the only thing he could do. He climbed up the trench, the vibroblade he took from a bounty hunter a long time ago in his hand. Chapter 206 A very surprised droid watched as a clone climbed the trench and appeared before him. Even more surprised, the B-1 unit saw a black blade, almost a sword, stab his chest and appear on his back. The vibroblade wasn't a lightsaber, so it couldn't cut through metal like it was nothing. It was also quite short, about 30 centimeters long. But it was sharp enough to cut into the B-1 battle droid and server its circuits. So, after Dager stabbed the droid, he turned it around, and hid behind it. At the same time, he grabbed the E-5 the clanker was holding. E-5s were inferior to the DC-15S or DC-15SS of the Republic, but it would get the job done. Dragging the dead droid with him to cover his body, Dager advanced, following the trench line. Every second, dozens of lasers hit the droid, almost dismembering it. However, it wasn't the first time Dager had done that, and he knew exactly what he had to do to keep his body hidden. He eliminated two dozen droids, and walked a good 100 meters before he ran out of ammunition. He was using the E-5 with just one hand, so he wasn't able to reload. Dropping the droid, he rolled back into the trench. His arm and shoulder ached as he put weight on them to get up, but he once more ignored it. It would make the wound worse in the long run, but now he didn't have how or where to bandage it. The trench line wasn't very big, about 300 meters long. Both sides of it ended in a cliff wall, so there was no risk of the Republic being flanked by the Seppies. Therefore, when Dager eliminated the droids in this hundred meters of land, at least the ones on the front, because there were a few thousand following behind them, the clones found the window they needed to fight back. The ATS and AT APS were wreaking havoc in the clankers' ranks, the skilled gunners taking down AATs one after another. Surprisingly accurate Trelex sharpshooters laid on top of crates and rocks and fired their blasters without stop. Sir. Good to see you here. Are you having fun? Dager saw the rest of Hell Squad crowded together inside a deep part of the trench as several dwarf spider droids and crab droids concentrated their fire on their position. Cell, as always, seemed unaffected by the situation. Some. Keep the defense going. Yate, Tate, I need you to go along the trench line and talk to the freedom fighters. They are losing their will to fight. The blue tree lek, Yate, spit on the ground. Clearly, he didn't like the idea of following Dager's orders. Taboon, however, pushed Yate. He knew how important it was for them to keep fighting, and as leaders of the freedom fighters, it was their job to motivate the freedom fighters. Leave it to. The head of Tay swung to the side, as if he had been punched. His body stayed up for a few seconds, while the clones and Yate watched without reaction. Then, Tay crumbled, and fell to the ground. A scorched circle appeared in the side of his head, and the smell of burned meat drifted into their noses. Tay. Clearly, Yate and Sindulla's son were much closer than Dager initially thought. The Twi'lek knelt beside the dead body of his friend, and cried. The surrounding freedom fighters seemed lost, their eyes fixed in a serious expression in the face of who was once a leader of their people. Dab. On it. Metal, brain, tech, with me. Dager quickly gave orders, almost ignoring the death of Tay. He quite liked the Trelek, and if he had the chance, he wouldn't be so heartless, but they were in the middle of a battle. So, Dager ruthlessly pulled Yate up, while Dab found the killer of Tay and shot him down. The clones that Dager called followed him, bringing Yate with them, all the while covering their subcommander. B-1 
Before Yate could complain or say anything, Dajer put a blaster in his hands, and aimed it at the droids. Tay is gone, Yate. You need to go around the trench, get your people to fight, or more will die just like him. However, Yate seemed to be in shock. He just stared straight ahead, and mumbled, so the clones had to pull him back down before he was eliminated. All hope is lost. All hope. I think he isn't going to help, sir. I can see it. Forget him, let's move. Brain and tech, fire at will. Cell, 3-4. Over here, sir. Any sepai that gets near US will be your responsibility. It's our pleasure. Ha ha. Dab, use your charged shot and anything else you have, and eliminate the dwarf spiders and crabs. If you can't do that, then aim at the B2S. Metal, remember our training? When a window opens, blast those damn clankers. Ha ha ha. Leave it to me. Dajer looked around, and saw Hell Squad getting in position. Whenever the droid stopped firing for a second, Dab and the others would cover metal as the heavy machine gunner swiped the front rows of the Separatist army, killing dozens of droids each time. If one watched the battle from above, they would be able to see that the droid army, which looked like a compact block before, now had a big incision on one of the sides, as hundreds of droids were eliminated by the coordination of Hell Squad, 303rd clones, and Trilex. Shield, I need a report. How are we looking? Dajer walked towards Lieutenant Shield, and crouched beside him. The clone had a nasty wound in his neck, and the white bandage on top of it was red with his blood. Not too good, sir. We have about 1500 troops remaining, between freedom fighters and us. The clankers probably lost two to three thousand units, so they have about five thousand remaining. Those bombers got us bad. All right. Keep fighting, but organize the troops. We will fall back soon. Understood. To tell the truth, Dajer wasn't sure they were going to retreat soon or anything, but it wasn't General D's style to fight till the very bitter end. Usually, they would retreat and ambush the droids, or fight where they had better defenses. They are here again. Get down. Find cover. He was pulled back from his thoughts as two hyena-class bombers appeared once more. This time, however, they had a clear objective, and weren't just aimlessly dropping bombs. Dajer watched in despair as a portion of their supply deposit was blasted into nothingness. They were already low on medical supplies before, now, those were mostly gone, and for a time, even food and water would become a problem. One of the bombers received a direct hit from an ATTE, and exploded in midair. Its debris fell on the separatist troops below, crushing a few of them. Unfortunately, they had already done their job. To make things worse, the second bomber was hit on its left wing, and spun out of control, crashing in the cliffside directly behind the ATTE that fired at it. A huge piece of rock crumbled, and fell on top of the vehicle. The six legs weren't able to hold, and broke one after another. Both pilot, crew, and gunner were dead before the ATTE blew up. Chapter 207 Hell Squad watched as their last ATTE crumbled under the rockslide that the hyena class bomber caused. Suddenly, Dajer felt a sharp pain in his leg, and was forced to kneel. Lieutenant Shield, who was beside him, turned around, fired at the incoming droids, and pulled Dajer to cover. Ugh. How bad is it? Lieutenant Shield looked at the injury in Dajer's leg, and took off the armor around his calf. He called for 3-4 and the medic quickly ran over to them. Don't worry, sir. It went right through. Just let me bandage it, and you should be able to walk normally. While 3-4 was treating the wound, Dajer took some painkillers that the clone gave him. In two minutes, he got up again. His leg still hurt, but as 3-4 said, he could walk, and even run. All right, boys, we are falling back. No need to wait for orders. Hell Squad, on me. We are the rear guard here. Shield, get some squads to do the same on the rest of the trench. Soon, the Republic started a slow but organized retreat to the canyons and gorges behind them. The droids followed suit, but they had to pay a hefty price for every meter of ground they won. After splitting up with Dajer, 
Commander Keeley ran across the trench, firing his pistols wildly. More than once, when the clankers were about to break into the Republic's defenses, he showed up just in time to stop them. Thanks to years of specialized training, and months of non-stop battles, the commander was better than normal clones by a lot. Still, his armor was full of scratches and blast marks, but he wasn't hurt. At least not too much. He found General D just in time to watch the hyena-class combat clash in the cliffside and destroy the at -E. The Jedi was deflecting lasers side by side with his Padawan, Ragu. Keeley. We have to order retreat. That is why I came looking for you, General. And now that we don't have heavy vehicles anymore. The Jedi deflected another laser, spinning his lightsaber. Commander Keeley crouched, and fired at the faraway droids. Ragu was also doing his part, using his green lightsaber to send back one laser after another. Master D. General D, Ragu, and Commander Keeley turned around to see a beige Trilek, with a number of scars, approaching them. Sindulla was riding one of the creatures used by the Freedom Fighters. The Blurgs looked like big lizards, with two powerful hind legs, and small arms. They had a big mouth full of sharp teeth, but were very docile. Sindulla. We don't have any more medical supplies. We need to flee now. Sindulla had an expression full of concern in his face. He could see his people dying in droves around him. And he had yet to learn that his son died. One could only imagine the impact that this news would have on him. After all, he had only recently told Taboon that he was his father, and for now, few knew this truth, so nobody bothered to tell him about another dead Trilek. General D spun, reflecting a volley of red lasers, and turned to Commander Keeley and Ragu. Keeley, call the retreat. Ragu, guide the injured out of here. Our troops are already moving, General. Dajer saw how the battle was going and ordered it a while ago. Firing his DC 17s, Commander Keeley answered without looking to the Jedi. Ragu, on the other hand, glanced at his master. Worry, anger, and sadness dwelled in his eyes. You have to retreat too, master. I can't leave you alone. General D smiled, and patted his Padawan on the shoulder. He could sense the turbulence in the force around the youngling, clearly depicting his feelings. Don't worry, my young apprentice. I will stay behind just enough to get the last of our troops out of here. But I need someone to lead the injured, and a Jedi, even just an apprentice, will have more authority to do that. Now, go. Every second count. Ragu looked at his master, clenched his fists, and bit his lips, but followed the orders that the Nikto gave watching his Padawan run, General D smiled. Ragu would be a good Jedi master one day. He could feel it. Master Jedi. We are running out of food and water too. And our heavy weapon systems are out of power. Sindulla clearly thought General D wasn't paying him enough attention, so he added some more bad information to the already dire situation. Lack of food and water, thanks to the separatist bombers, would be a problem for some time, but could be fixed. However, with their at TES and at APS all destroyed, they had no chance of winning this battle. General D put his hand on the head of Sindulla's blurg, and used the force to calm the animal. Then, he turned to Sindulla, his expression serious as always. I will contact our forces in orbit. Admiral Dao, this is General D. We are in trouble down here. Before the Nikto could finish what he was saying, a tridroid's laser cannon shot hit the ground next to them, killing two clones, and showering them in mud and red soil. Turning on his comm link again, General D continued what he was saying. We need those supplies immediately. In the space above, the 303rd fleet was locked in a deadly struggle. They had followed Admiral Dao's plan, and thrown themselves at the enemy, even though they were heavily outnumbered and outgunned. So far, their plan had worked, and they had yet to lose a single cruiser. In fact, the Sincerity, the Righteous, and the Acclimator class cruiser had destroyed two munificent class frigates, and the V-wings and Y-wings had yet to come into play. However, the Sincerity was shaking, as laser cannons, missiles and bombs were aimed and fired at it. Their shields wouldn't hold for much longer. 
It was in this situation, with clones and crewmen running around the command bridge of the Sincerity, that Admiral Dao stopped in front of the hologram of General D. From time to time, the Jedi would swing his lightsaber at someone out of the range of the hologram. I understand, General, but I am in no position to help. We are critically low in fuel and ammunition. A series of explosions shook the small Acclimator class cruiser, the blast even making the sincerity shake, and breaking the transmission a little. Thankfully, the cruiser held on despite the explosions, and continued to fight. Contact the Jedi Council again. Tell them reinforcements must be dispatched without delay. General D cut off the transmission as an AAT aimed at him, forcing him to turn off his comlink and run. Where he was, a giant black crater appeared. Admiral Dao couldn't even answer the Jedi, and stopped to listen to something a crewman was telling him. After that, he turned on the hologram table again, and called the Jedi Council in Coruscant. General D seemed to have faith that the Jedi Council would help them, but Admiral Dao knew that their plea for help would be as futile as the three dozen others he made before. Still, he did as the Nikto asked. Chapter 208 Far, far away from Ryloth, a giant planet was bustling with life. Ships and people of every corner of the galaxy landed and took off in a constant stream. Buildings as tall as the planet itself, going from one side of it to the other, and lights that never turned off. However, not all of Coruscant was like that. In a famous, clones-only bar, several troopers wearing differently painted armor looked at a hologram. All the clones were captains and above, with the exception of a few sergeants and lieutenants. Commander Cody, of the 212th, Commander Pons, of the 91st, and Captain Rex, of the 501st, together with many officers, looked at a hologram of Admiral Dow. The Admiral had transmitted his pleas for help not only to the Jedi Council, but also to the commanders, in hope that when the 303rd died, others would avenge it. We can't let them die just like that. Calm down, Pons. There is nothing we can do. Even if we could get to Ryloth in time, and we can't, we don't have our orders. But we will have soon. I spoke with General Kenobi today. In twenty or thirty days, our battle over Christophsis should be over, and we will be redeployed. I doubt they will leave Ryloth belong to the Seppis for long. While the clones were discussing in the Revanter, a very similar conversation was happening in the Jedi Temple, on the other side of Coruscant. Like the last few times, the ones talking to Admiral Dao were General Yoda, General Kenobi, and General Windu. This time, however, the Admiral talked with an urgency that wasn't there before. That was understandable, since he was not only in the middle of a battle, but in his last battle. Generals, I said before that I probably wouldn't contact you again. I was wrong. But now I am certain. Ryloth needs help. General D needs help. Much fear I sense in you, Admiral Dao. Fear. But also happiness. I am about to die, General Yoda. That is why I feel fear. A wise man fears death, Admiral. But Master Yoda is right. I can sense excitement, even when you say you are about to die. General Winda frowned. He had been to many battles since the Clone Wars started, and even more before that, but he had never seen a man happy or excited because he will die. Remember how I told you before that our fleet was already dead? That the only ones who could be saved are the troops on the ground? That hasn't changed. I've ordered our ships to attack. Attack? I thought the fleet lost so many ships you could barely hold. That is the truth, General Kenobi. This is our last attack. If we have to go down, then many of their ships will go before us. The three Jedis looked at him stunned. Even General Yoda seemed surprised by the determination and madness in Admiral Dao's words. Suddenly, the hologram buzzed with interference, startling the Jedis. Alarms went off on the sincerity. Admiral Dao looked behind him, and saw the acclimator class cruiser blowing up in millions of pieces. Without time to talk anymore, Admiral Dao just conveyed the message that General D gave him. If help doesn't arrive soon, the entire outer rim garrison will be wiped out. Surely there must be something you can do. General Kenobi looked pensive, and tried to think of solutions to their predicament, 
but before he could finish talking, the hologram suffered from interference once more, and a clone ran up to Admiral Dao, panicking. The main reactor has been hit, sir. Systems are shutting down. We are dead in space. Admiral Dao's face showed deep sadness. It was clear that, no matter what he said, the admiral wasn't happy with the idea of dying and failing in his task. Still, he mustered up the courage to finish what he was saying. With regret, I report that my fleet will no longer be able to provide protection for the troops on Ryloth. Something happened on the other side of the transmission, and Admiral Dao had to grab the hologram table to stay on his feet. The clone next to him fell to the ground, as probably did many others on the sincerity. Its main reactor had been hit, meaning that not only the turrets and laser cannons have stopped working, but so had the shields. I repeat my request that help be sent right away. Unfortunately for Admiral Dao, he wasn't even able to finish General D's message. The hologram that showed him shook once again, and the three Jedis could hear a clone yelling before the transmission ended. The shields are gone. We have no. A few hours earlier, on the sincerity. Admiral Dao watched as thousands of vulture droids threw themselves at the small Republic force. It wasn't necessary for the Separatists to do that. It wasn't even strategically good. But the Sepis must have been feeling ashamed for taking so many losses to conquer Ryloth. That made Admiral Dao happy. The 303rd had put on a good fight. Like they had planned, the three cruisers flew in the front, protecting the starfighters behind. And their plan worked, at least for a while. They took down three separatist frigates before they had their first loss. The acclimator class cruiser blew up while Admiral Dao was transmitting General D's message to the Jedi Council. That made him hurry up and deliver what he had to. Unfortunately for the old Admiral, he wasn't able to do anything else. When their shields faltered, the hyena class bombers hit the Sincerity's main reactor. When that happened, all systems failed including long-distance communications. Therefore, while the Jedis thought that the sincerity had been destroyed, and Admiral Dao was dead, what transpired was different, but not much. When their systems shut down, the cruiser started to drift in space. Without power, they couldn't control it. Several droid bombers turned around to have another go at it, and this time, the ship was sure to be destroyed. However, before they could get there, the Righteous took the Sincerity's role as the spearhead of the Republic's attack. Without caring for anything, Captain Ace threw his Venator-class cruiser in the nearest Separatist dreadnought. The enemy tried to move out of the way, but it was too late. The sharp front of the cruiser carved a path through the dreadnought, eventually taking down the command bridge, and, with it, the whole ship. However, it also lost its shields. A few minutes later, it suffered the same fate that the acclimator class cruiser had. Looking at the last two cruisers the 303rd had blowing up in balls of fire, Admiral Dao felt proud. He fought with those men for months, and he knew each and every one of them gave their lives with a smile on their faces. Now, he stood in front of the window of the Sincerity's command bridge. All the clones and crewmen had stopped working, and were on their stations watching the droids come for them. With his hands behind his back, Admiral Dao smiled at the incoming lasers. He knew he had done his best, and even at the end, he was happy he had the chance to fight alongside people like General D, Ragu, Commander Keeley, Dajer, Rosal, and all the others. Twenty-four days after the Battle of Ryloth started, the Republic fleet position there, belonging to the 303rd Attack Legion, was destroyed. There were no survivors. Chapter 209 a few minutes before the destruction of the Sincerity. The Republic troops on the ground had disengaged from the enemy, and retreated even further than before. Now, they were waiting in an opening. Three paths crossed this opening. They came from one of them, and so would the droids. Of the other two, one was directly in front of the other, and crossed several canyons, while the other followed the terrain. They led to the same place, the Trilek hideout, but one was much longer than the other. That opening was where they would make their last stand, because if they retreated any more, they would have to fight around civilians, and that would only disturb them. Thanks to the brave sacrifice of three dozen clones under the command of recently promoted Lieutenant Agile, 
who stayed behind, the survivors of the battle were a few hours ahead of the separatist. Dajer, Commander Keeley, Ragu, General D, Gobi, and Sindulla were sitting on rocks, planning for the next skirmish. The situation was dire. Of the 3,000 troops they had, only 1,100 could fight, while the other 600 who survived were badly injured. And, without medical supplies, they were suffering. Every moment, another trooper died due to untreated wounds. The clankers, on the other hand, still had more than 4,000 units, and the possibility of receiving reinforcements any time. Suddenly, a bright light attracted everyone's attention. Looking up to the sky, they saw one of the three Republic cruisers on orbit blow up. The ship was ripped apart by the explosion, and like shooting stars, burning debris cut across Ryloth's atmosphere. Vindicator. It's gone, General Ragu. What followed next was something straight out the 303 RD's nightmares. The sincerity was hit several times, and the turrets and cannons on it stopped firing. The lights went out on the ship, and several smaller explosions shook it, as every laser now hit it directly. When those on the planet below thought that the cruiser was going down, the righteous dove between it and the enemy fleet, and straight into a Providence-class dreadnought. The two ships collided, the dreadnought falling first, followed by the Republic cruiser. Every trooper held their breaths, and clenched their fists. Some, like Dager, so strongly that they hurt themselves. But they didn't care. They had joked about their demise, they had mocked it, but when the end really arrived, none of the clones could look at the sky and be indifferent. General D sat on the ground, looking defeated. For the first time ever, the Jedi showed his inner thoughts. The Nikto couldn't bear to watch as the clones under him died far, far away in space, fighting for a planet they had never set foot upon. Only now he questioned the decision that the Galactic Senate made when sending the 303rd to Ryloth. Ragu knelt beside his master, but he couldn't muster the strength to say anything. He had seen death before, many times, but to him, the war always was something that they would certainly win. Now, he knew that wasn't the case. He understood that the Republic would have to pay a heavy price to win the Clone Wars, and that the 303rd was only a small part of it. Sindulla and Gobi looked at one another, despair filling their eyes. After everything the 303rd had done to them, they felt their loss not only as allies, but as friends. Commander Keeley was more direct than the others. He punched the ground in anger, until his fist bled. He couldn't believe it. He was trained to face defeat, he was even trained to be expressionless when sending his troopers to certain death. But nothing trained him to lose everything. And then the sincerity blew up. It started on the command bridge. Then, a chain reaction ran around the capital ship of the 303rd Fleet. In a matter of seconds, the cruiser broke in half, and fell on Ryloth, not far from where they were. Dager stared at it, but couldn't process what happened. He knew they were going to lose. He knew they were going to die. Still, all he could think was about how many brothers he lost. And Admiral Dow. The old admiral was the only one in the entire legion who wasn't a clone nor a Jedi. Still, he had proven his worth more than once, and earned the respect of all the clones. They all started treating him like a brother, and the admiral returned the treatment with honor. It was the first time he ever felt like that, and the first time he felt the loss of every soldier he commanded. It were the best months of his career, and he couldn't have asked for a better legion, a better army, and a better general. And now, it was all over. Dajer was sure Admiral Dow had died with a smile on his face. It was just how the man was. He liked to say that he would go down in a blaze of glory, and not die on his bed. And he sure had. Leading an outnumbered fleet, he had protected Ryloth to his last breath. Dajer felt pain in his chest when he saw the burning remains of the sincerity crashing on the planet. The ship had been his home for a very long time, and even her destruction pained him. The fight that followed the fall of the sincerity was as short as it was intense. Admiral Dow's plan worked, and almost a dozen separatist frigates, and three dreadnoughts, were destroyed by the Y-wing bombers and the starfighters. Flying past the broken remains of their cruisers, the Republic pilots saw not only pieces of metal, but also many bodies floating in the vacuum of space. It was a horrible sight, 
that only fueled their desire to eliminate. Although they felt burning rage and pain, they didn't forget the last mission the dead admiral ensured them. The V-Wings cut down vulture droid after vulture droid, the few hundreds of pilots destroying more than five times their numbers in enemies. When they approached the big ships, and the turret started to take down starfighters, they flew even closer to each other than before. They gave their lives to make sure the bombers would arrive at their destination. And they did. The enemy commander had despised the suicidal strategy, and that cost him more than the tactical droid could ever imagine. Just like Rosal and countless clones had done before, the pilots sacrificed themselves, even if it did just a little more damage to the enemy. Now they weren't fighting because they had orders or because it was their only option. They were fighting for revenge. Missiles were poured into the Separatist ships, breaking the long necks that were their command bridges. Several frigates crashed in Ryloth, and the others became pieces of metal floating around. Twenty minutes after the battle started, it ended. After all, there were just too many vulture droids. They hunted down every single Republic starfighter. The last pilot of the 303rd tried to crash his V-wing into the command bridge of a Separatist dreadnought, but only pieces of it reached the ship. The 303rd Attack Legion was no more. Chapter 210 Somewhere in the galaxy, traveling through hyperspace, a Republic CR-90 received an important transmission. A tall human male, with black hair, and dressed in the characteristic robes of a senator, faced a hologram of General Kenobi, General Windu, and General Yoda. My trade mission was successful, thank you for asking. The man frowned when he spoke. The Jedis called him without any prior warning, and everyone knew that when a Jedi looked for you, it wasn't good. Besides, his instincts were telling him something was wrong. Bail Organa was an important senator way before the Clone Wars started, and had spearheaded many peace talks and negotiations between different planets. He also was one of the leaders of the pacifist faction of the Senate. So, when General Yoda contacted him out of nowhere, he knew something was wrong, and he didn't like to beat around the bush, so he asked straightforwardly. But what is the matter? You all look very somber. With his arms crossed in front of his chest, General Kenobi seemed troubled, but he still answered the senator. The fleet protecting Ryloth has been destroyed, and the supply lines had been cut. Senator Organa was shocked to hear that. As a member of the Senate, he had heard of the Battle of Ryloth, and how the Republic troops were suffering. However, he never thought that the fleet would be wiped out. And, without a fleet to protect them, and to provide supplies, it was only a matter of time before the ground troops were defeated. What the senator didn't know was that only a few thousand troops remained. The troops are out of food, fuel, ammunition. And the civilian population is starving. That was true. One of the first things the separatists did after arriving at Ryloth was arrest thousands of civilians, including children, for helping the enemy. Now, those civilians were forced to work for the Sepis, and those who weren't arrested had nothing to eat under the merciless government of Amir Watambor, one of the closest allies of Count Dooku. And, while the population was starving and working, Tambor was grabbing their riches, and sending them to his capital ship above the planet. Not only that, but most of the politicians and leaders of Ryloth had been arrested or eliminated, including those like Shar Yelps, the Chwilek who General D had arrested. The council member had been executed for treason against the Confederacy of Independent Systems. And so, the separatists succeeded in pissing off not only the civilians, but also the higher-ups of Ryloth. Thousands of Chwileks escaped the cities to join the freedom fighters, but unfortunately, just a few hundred could fight, and the rest became another burden that Sindulla had to carry. That is grim news. Senator Organa was cautiously neutral when answering. He had been a politician for long enough to understand what the Jedis wanted. Our blockade runners should be able to penetrate the separatist lines, and drop relief supplies. But they do not have the range to reach Ryloth. The planet Toydaria is 2,000 parsecs closer than the nearest fleet. If the blockade runners get supplies from there, they might reach Ryloth in time. As always, General Windu wasn't willing to waste time talking, and stated their objective directly, forcing the talkative General Kenobi to cut to the chase. Senator Organa sighed. It was dangerous, 
and he was against getting involved in the war. However, he wouldn't be able to sleep if he didn't help the innocent people of Ryloff. Besides, he was still a member of the Republic, so, he had the obligation of helping. What would you have me do? We dispatched a ship with relief supplies to meet you in Toydaria. After a long talk with the senator, General Kenobi turned off the hologram table, and went to meditate. He was a good friend of General D, and it pained him to be unable to provide help to the Nikto. Not only that, but the much-needed supplies were stuck in Toydaria, thanks to the interference of a senator of the Trade Federation. The Trade Federation, although maintaining a neutral stance, worked for the Separatist, and everyone knew that. However, there was no proof. With the trouble caused by this senator, it would take a long, drawn-out negotiation to convince the Toydarians to help the Republic, even more after they discovered there was a Separatist blockade around the planet. Unfortunately, General D and his troops didn't have that time. He couldn't even warn the Jedi that relief supplies were coming, because all communications were cut. For now, all General Kenobi could do was hope that General D could hold on. Dajer felt pain. An incredible amount of pain. Looking down, he saw a piece of metal had gone through his armor, and was stuck in his tight. Judging by the amount of blood dripping down from the wound, it probably had cut a big artery. He fell to the ground, and leaned on the carcass of a destroyed AAT. That was the source of the piece of metal that hurt him, and it was his own fault. He had approached the tank and delivered a thermal detonator to it, rolling the grenade down the barrel. He was unlucky, however, because the AAT was already charging another shot, and when the detonator blew up, the two forces combined, creating an even bigger explosion. Since he was still in range of it, several pieces of scrap metal peppered his armor, and this one was able to pierce it. Dajer looked around. Dead droids, Trilex, and clones surrounded him. He could see a few allies alive, but they were too far to help him immediately. It was a rare moment of calmness on the battlefield, and for a few minutes, no lasers were flying. Dajer saw this happen before, in many battles. The droids were regrouping, and the Republic was happy to let them do that, and get a few minutes of rest. Knowing that he had a little bit of time, Dajer ripped off a piece of cloth from a dead freedom fighter, and tied it above his injury. He also left another improvised bandage near him. Gritting his teeth, Dajer pulled out the piece of metal. The pain was almost unbearable, but he didn't make a sound. He had suffered worse before. He quickly tied the second bandage around the wound, and it was soon dyed red. It wasn't the most effective of bandages, and it also wasn't the right treatment for this kind of wound, but it would do. At least it was better than running around with a piece of an AAT on his leg. Getting up, Dajer started moving towards the next pocket of Republic resistance. He didn't want to be caught alone by the clankers. Sir. Ouch. That isn't looking too good. Sit down. No matter what is your rank, a medic always has absolute authority when you are wounded. Dajer did as 3-4 said, and sat down to let the clone treat his leg. It was only at this moment that he noticed the medic also was hurt. A bloody bandage wrapped his head, and there were two black spots in his chest, where lasers hit. Looking around, he saw that it wasn't only 3-4. The entirety of Hell Squad was injured in some way or another. We will have to retreat again so. A laser cannon shot hit the ground next to them, and Dajer fainted. Chapter 211 Kaka 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 Harahar Eliminate 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 Them all Kaka Kaka Wake up Eliminate Uff Ugh Dajer put his hand on his head trying to stop the throbbing pain, but his helmet was on the way. Taking it off, he was finally able to open his eyes. Blood dropped off his old scar, now reopened, and he wiped it with the back of his hand. 3-4 was next to him, his armor covered in dust, his helmet nowhere to be seen. The other members of Hell Squad were moaning on the ground, together with Trilex and clones. Glancing at the surroundings, Dajer realized he could hear almost nothing. His ears were buzzing, and every noise sounded. Distant. He knew this was a sign he had hit his head badly. That would also explain the pain. 
However, his hearing was slowly but surely returning. Ugh. He heard a trooper moan next to him, and turned to see the clone getting up. He had been closer to where the AAT hit than Dager, and was visibly dizzy. Dager and the clone saw the same thing at the same time. B-1 battle droids, and a B-2 super battle droid, towered above them, their blasters aiming directly at the poor soldier's face. Dager half jumped, half rolled, out of the way just in time to dodge. He heard more freedom fighters and clones scream as they were brutally executed, and heard Dab and Tech yell in pain. For the second time this day, he grabbed his vibroblade. He threw it, and the weapon pierced the chest of a clanker. That got the attention of the others, and they turned to him. Just when Dager thought he was going to die, a storm of blue lasers destroyed the nearby droids. He looked behind him, and saw Metal with his back on the ground, holding his double-barrel repeating blaster above him. Nodding his thanks to the clone, Dager grabbed a DC-15S on the ground, put his helmet on, and fired at the droids. Commander. Are you there? The Seppis are breaching our defenses. The right flank won't be able to hold for much longer. Wait. There was a long pause after Commander Keeley said that, as if he was talking to someone else who Dager couldn't hear. After a while, he heard the voice of the commander again, a lot somber this time. Fall back, Dager. Get Hell Squad to stay on the back. We need time to move our troops. Move the troops. Dager was confused when he heard Commander Keeley through the comlink. He had been told multiple times that this was their last stand. Either they defeated the droids there, or they all died. General's orders. Sindulla is fleeing with his people. That is, if he is able to. Do as I said, and retreat. The general will explain his idea later. Dager became even more confused. There was nowhere for Sindulla to flee, even more after the right flank collapsed. And those orders from General D were very weird. The only reason to move the troops would be if. Suddenly, Dager understood what the Jedi wanted. And if he was right, then he had to meet with General D as soon as possible. Hell Squad. We are covering the retreat. Everyone, fall back. The clones looked at him surprised, but followed his orders without hesitation. The freedom fighters didn't understand the implications behind it, and just were glad they could get away from the fight. Lifting his DC-15S, Dager grabbed the vibroblade stuck into the chest of the droid, and fired at the clankers. He didn't miss a shot. General D and Commander Keeley were talking further behind their defense lines when the right flank collapsed. Dager had just told him, but they could see that from their position. The clones were fighting bravely, but they were being overwhelmed. He didn't wait for Dager to finish talking, and warn General D. However, a very angry Cham Sindulla got to them fist, riding his blurg. What about reinforcements? Gobi, and several other Trilex, followed Sindulla, and surrounded General D and Commander Keeley, hoping to hear a positive answer. General D looked at the civilians cowering behind them, but he couldn't bring himself to lie. So, he could only try to give them the slightest bit of hope. Communication has been spotty. But I promise you, Cham, the Republic will not abandon Ryloth. When he said that, General D looked up, and watched the Separatist fleet above them. More ships had arrived today, including a Lukaholt class battleship. The Separatist blockade was almost impenetrable now. He wished Sindulla would trust him, but even he didn't believe in his own words. Sindulla circled around the Nikto, looking at him from above his blurg. He knew they didn't have too much of a chance, but seeing his people dying in droves made him lose his reasoning. In no moment did he consider that the 303rd lost much more than him. I've heard enough of your promises, Jedi. But the fact remains. If we stay here without reinforcements, we are going to die. Commander Keeley lifted his head and looked at the Freedom Fighters leader. He didn't like where this was going. Gobi, tell the people we are leaving. Yes, Cham. The worst of Commander Keeley's predictions came true. Sindulla had been blinded by his rage and disappointment, and was going to ignore the pieces of advice of General D. I don't think you understand. The right flank has collapsed. There is no leaving. 
We are stuck in here together. Commander Keeley felt it was necessary to yell at Sindulla until the Trilek came back to his senses, but General D stopped him with a gesture. It was useless to try and change Sindulla's mind. The Trilek just glanced at him, and urged his mount to run. He was going to flee with his people, with or without the Republic. Only much later did he understand the choice he forced General D to make, and the results of his actions. However, it was too late for regret. The decision he made that day haunted him for years. After he ordered Dager to retreat, and told the subcommander that General D had a plan, Commander Keeley sat on a rock for a moment, and took off his helmet. The helmet was still the same he used back on Geonosis, with the two brownish-red horns painted on the front. It was also the symbol of the 303rd Attack Legion, and a reminder of all the troopers who lost their lives under his command. Around him, Trilex and clones were doing their best to move supplies and injured away from the approaching battlefield. Commander. He looked up, and saw Dager standing in front of him. The clone was battered, to say the least. Laser marks, dust, and blood adorned his armor, giving off an eerie vibe. The members of Hell Squad, behind him, weren't much better. Are we going to do what I think we are going to do? Commander Keeley sighed. Dager was sharp. He didn't even need to tell his second-in-command what General D planned. He was glad that back on Scarif, he chose Dager to be the sub-commander. He doubted they would have survived for as long as they did if the clone, and his special squad, weren't there. Yeah. We are. Then we better get to work, right, sir? Dager stretched his arm, and Commander Keeley grinned. Putting his helmet back on, he grabbed Dager's forearm and pulled himself up. Let's get to work. Chapter 212 On Toydaria, almost at the same time that Dager was talking to Commander Keeley, Senator Organa was in an audience with the Toydarian king. With him was Representative Binks, of Naboo. Unfortunately for them, Senator Lot Dod, of the Trade Federation also was there. Great King, Senator Organa is deceiving you. The inconvenient fact remains, that this is a war, and Ryloth is a battlefield. Senator Dod showed a projection of Ryloth, surrounded by separatist ships, and then another hologram, this one depicting a clone shooting at 2B1 units. The planet is under a separatist blockade, because Jedi Knights and clone soldiers are battling the droid army for control of the surface. This will not be a humanitarian base. It will be a military base. Come on. We gotta move quickly. Trilex riding blurgs hurried to get all their supplies packed, and to get the civilians to safety. Clones, those who were injured and couldn't return to the battlefield, helped them. Hurry, hurry. Now is not the time to play, children. Where is your mom? Move. While all that was happening, General D and Commander Keeley approached Sindulla and Gobi, who were supervising the freedom fighters. The commander took off his helmet, showing his shaved head. He wasn't in the middle of a battle right now, so it was more comfortable this way. How is it going, Sindela? We are going as fast as we can, Master D. However, we have too many to take care of. It will take a while. General D frowned, and looked at the not-so-distant battlefield. He, Commander Keeley and Ragu had been away from it for a while, but they received constant reports from Dager, who was back in the fray. The droids were crushing their defenses one by one, and it wouldn't be long before they got there. Keeley, call Dager and Regu back. I need to talk to them both. They are not gonna like it, General. I know. But it is my decision, and they will obey it. After all, I am their general and master. Understood, General. Sindulla and Gobi looked at the Jedi and the clone, not understanding what was transpiring between them. Dager? Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Commander. What is it? I need Hell Squad back here. And bring General Ragu with you. There was a slight pause on the other side of the comlink as Dager processed his orders. Or fired at a droid, Commander Keeley wasn't sure, because there was too much noise. I am not sure we can get back now, Commander. We are quite deep into the fight here. And I have no idea where General Ragu is. Communications have been a little. 
difficult. You have your orders, Dager. The general is somewhere between your position and us here. He went to bring back the wounded. Now, get back here. Yes, commander. Dager had no option but to follow his orders. He commanded Lieutenant Shield to take Hell Squad's position, and hold off the enemy while they returned. The lieutenant was a seasoned veteran, and although he and the men under him weren't as good as Hell Squad, they would do the job just fine. After Commander Keeley got confirmation that Dager was coming, he turned off the comm link, and nodded to General D. The Nikto acknowledged the gesture, and frowned. The dialogue he was about to have with Commander Keeley was one which they both knew how it ended, but they needed Sindulla to listen to it. Taking a deep breath, General D turned to Commander Keeley. Commander, is the gunship ready? But it is too small to evacuate the refugees. The clone gestured towards a lot. It was the only one that remained. All the others had been destroyed or had gone to the Freedom Fighters hideout before, carrying wounded and injured, and couldn't return now because of the vulture droids roaming Ryloth's sky. When Sindulla heard that, he panicked. He had ordered his people to abandon the fight, but now, they had nowhere to escape. No escape. But our families are with us. When Commander Keeley heard Sindulla yelling, he felt sorry but angry at the same time. Sorry because they were all going to die, including the civilians. Thinking of Shoyuta and the other kids he met before, Commander Keeley thought it was a pity. However, he also felt angry at Sindulla, because it was mostly his fault. If he had trusted the Republic since the start, then they probably could have done something to save the Trilex. But Sindulla had been too stunned by the Tram Chalk's treason, and later by the death of his son, Taboon, to think straight. General D frowned too, thinking the same as Commander Keeley. However, he already expected this, and he had long made a decision, without even telling Commander Keeley about it. Holding a twig, he used it to draw on something on the sand. If we reconfigure the fuel system, we can turn the ship into a bomb big enough to collapse the pass. He crouched, and put a cross on one of the two paths that lead to the Trilek hideout. Then, he marked the second path, the long one, with three crosses. Here. The enemy will, then, only be to engage us on one front. From this ravine. Commander Keeley was completely stunned, while Sindulla and Gobi traded glares, shocked and surprised. They didn't know what to say. The clone obviously knew that General D planned to stay behind, but he hadn't listened to the plan before. While we provide cover, the Trilex will have time to escape with their families, over the mountains. He got up and, Commander Keeley mimicked him. Surprisingly, the clone felt a smile on his face, and chuckled ever so slightly that only he himself was able to hear. That was the reason why he admired General D so much. He never hesitated to put himself in danger to save others. In this case, he was prepared to give his life so the Freedom Fighters could get to the hideout without the droids finding them. Commander Keeley would gladly follow him into death. Brilliant strategy, General. Uff. I will go tell the men. He gave Sindulla and Gobi one last glare, disappointed. The Trilex looked sad, surprised, and even pained. However, none of them said anything to convince General D to give up his plan, or even offered their help. Walking towards the soldiers, Commander Keeley put on his helmet. If the troopers saw his face, he wouldn't be able to tell them what their last mission was. Lieutenant, is Hell Squad here yet? Subcommander Dager said he and General Ragu are on the way. It should take a few more minutes. Commander. The left flank is breaking down. Before he could even finish his talk with the lieutenant, a trooper ran up to him with bad news. After mulling over it for a few seconds, Commander Keeley ordered full retreat from all troops. Lieutenant, get that lot to the pass over there. Is Timer still alive? Then find two troopers who knows how to fix a gunship. I need them to mess with the fuel systems of the lot. I want that thing to become a bomb. Bomb, sir. The bigger, the better. Then, get all troops ready. We are going to fight our last battle. Suddenly, the lieutenant became serious. Putting his helmet on, he saluted Commander Keeley. Right away, 
Commander. Chapter 213. Representative Jar Jar Binks of Naboo, and Senator Bail Organa, from Alderaan, walked dejectedly on the halls of the royal palace of Toydaria. They had just come out from a meeting with the king and his advisors, and the answer to the Republic's plea for help was negative. According to the king, he and his people wanted to help, but he couldn't risk losing their neutrality, otherwise the war would arrive at their doorstep. Needless to say, Senator Lot Dod was extremely pleased with his answer, after all, it meant that Ryloth couldn't be saved, and it would remain in separatists' hands. It also meant that most clones and freedom fighters there were going to die. My friends! Senator Organa and Representative Binks turned around, and saw the Toydarian king flying towards them. He looked quite clumsy, with insect-like wings that were too small for his body. Toydaria cannot turn a blind eye to the suffering of Ryloth. The Chuileks are innocent victims caught between the warring factions through no fault of their own. Senator Organa felt a rush of hope and excitement, but he didn't let it show on his face. He knew that even though the king's words meant he would help Ryloth, the fact that he met them secretly meant he wouldn't do it out in the open. They would have to be careful with what they said, otherwise the Toydarians might change their mind. I'm glad you agree, your highness. What are you prepared to do? You may use Toydaria to transfer the supplies you brought with you. That is only enough supplies for one, maybe two rotations. It will have to do. And you must guarantee that the Trade Federation will not be able to link Toydaria to the mission. Agreed. Senator Organa didn't hesitate. It wasn't a lot, but it was better than nothing, and the Trilex could use anything, no matter how little. That night, several Toydarian ships left the planet, heading for Ryloth. They were undetected by the Trade Federation, and, since they were ships of a neutral planet, they wouldn't be stopped by the separatist blockade around the planet. When Dejer met Ragu, the Padawan saved his life. He had been too absorbed by the conversation he just had with Commander Keeley, and he wasn't paying attention to the battlefield. There was something wrong about how the commander talked. Very wrong. However, Dejer couldn't put his finger on what it was. And now, Hell Squad was tasked with finding Ragu and retreating. That was even weirder. For all he knew, there was nowhere to retreat. And how were the Trilek supposed to escape? Dejer knew that the 303rd was going to make their last stand there. He had known that since the moment their fleet was destroyed, because that was the moment their last hope of leaving Ryloth was gone. To tell the truth, he didn't really care. Even if they somehow won, or even just survived this battle, the 303rd had less than a thousand men remaining. They were hardly a company, whatsoever a legion. So, Dejer didn't care about dying here on Ryloth. He was afraid of dying, of course, but he would gladly go down just to eliminate a few more droids. He had never hated anyone more than he hated the scum who started this war. Without it, so many of his brothers would still be alive. It never crossed his mind that without the war, he and all the others wouldn't even exist. And so, it was when Dejer was lost on his thoughts that he felt something pulling him. It was invisible, fast, strong, and it saved his life, because the spot he was on blew up milliseconds after he was pulled. The impact from the explosion added to the force that was pulling him, and he was launched a dozen meters forward. When he approached the ground, he curled up, and rolled. Feeling at least two of his ribs crack, the subcommander looked up and saw Ragu stretching his hand to him. Are you okay? Grabbing his hand, Dejer pulled himself up, wincing in pain as he felt wounds all over his body opening and bleeding again. Thankfully, 3-4 had bandaged them well enough, so the bleeding didn't last long. As okay as I can be, General. Thank you. He looked around. The explosion originated from an AAT, but the tank didn't see to be aiming specifically at him. It was just a random shot, after all, he was already a distance away from the front lines. Arc. Behind him, Dejer heard Dab groaning as he got up, and realized that Ragu hadn't only pulled him, but the entirety of Hell Squad. It was no wonder the Padawan looked tired. Is everyone all right? Call out. Dab okay, sir. Cell 2. Metal. Tech. I'm all good. 3-4. 
Arg. While the others seemed to be mostly uninjured from the explosion, only from the explosion, because they all had at least a dozen wounds for many different reasons, 3-4 was holding his right leg tightly, and was already bandaging it. He appeared to be in lots of pain, and the armor did little to stop the blood from seeping out. How is it, 3-4? I will live, General. But you should worry more about brain. He didn't answer. Ragu was surprised. With all that was happening, it was difficult to keep track of every trooper, and he didn't notice Brain hadn't said anything. However, when he turned around, he saw that Dajer was already kneeling besides the clone. Brain. Wake up, trooper. How is he? Dajer took of Brain's helmet. It was soaked with his blood, coming from a big cut on the back of his head. Bad. 3-4, can you take a look at him? Just give me a moment, sir. I'm not sure I can walk just yet. Meanwhile, put something on it to stop the blood. Understood. Dajer took one of many bandages that 3-4 carried with him, and used it to cover the wound. In a matter of seconds it was red, but at least it stopped the bleeding. We need to move. Metal, cell, carry brain. Tech, help 3-4. Soon, Hell Squad started moving again. However, they were now in a bad shape. Dajer warned a trooper that they would soon arrive at Commander Keeley's location, and started walking next to Ragu. Thanks for the help back there, General. If it wasn't for you, we would have suffered a lot more than just a few injuries. Ragu laughed awkwardly. It wasn't like Dajer to thank him twice. Is it really that bad? It is. We are down to about 500 troopers. And the freedom fighters. Well, they are fleeing for their lives. Sometimes they are more of a hazard than of help. You can't blame them. They aren't soldiers. Neither are you, General Ragu. Ragu stopped, and Dab almost bumped into him. The Padawan knew exactly what Dajer meant, after all, the subcommander wasn't being very subtle about it. I'm not leaving my master and you all and escaping, Dajer. You have to, sir. You represent the 303rd more than anyone. More than any clone. We were created for this war, and this war is our life. But it isn't yours. Neither it is General D's. You two have to go. Leave the dirty job to us. This is not an option. Now, keep quiet, trooper. I don't want to hear any more about it. Chapter 214 A very battered hell squad arrived in front of General D and Commander Keeley. Brain had woken up midway, but he could barely keep his eyes open. He had lost too much blood, and smashing your head is never good. As soon as they got there, 3-4 made the others help Brain sit down, and started working on the clone, ignoring his own injury. Commander Keeley glanced at Dajer, and he answered with a positive nod. Brain would survive, although he probably wouldn't be able to battle anymore. Not that it mattered much, because Dajer didn't think anyone could escape. Ragu, Keeley, Dajer, follow me. I need to talk to you, alone. 3-4, after you finish with Brain, get a good look at this leg of yours. We can't have you out of combat like in Coruscant. Don't worry, sir. You should look at yourself, though. You also aren't looking too good. And you still have the mood to joke. Ha <laughs> ha. Now shut up, and do your job. The others, help the Trilex. They seem to be prepared to leave, so make them go faster. Understood, sir. The three that General D called followed him to a secluded spot. The Nikto clearly wanted to talk to them in a quiet place. Ragu, Dajer, I'm sure you saw the troopers running around, preparing. We did, master. What is the plan? The Jedi didn't answer his Padawan. In fact, he stayed quiet for several minutes. Disciplined as he was, Dajer stood still, hands behind his back, and said nothing. However, under his helmet, his face showed a frown. The clones they passed by on their way were all occupied preparing weapons, checking ammunition, and some were moving fuel barrels. The wounded clones had been moved from their precarious infirmary to the Blurgs, as if they were about to be taken away from the death trap they were in no. Dajer hoped that was the case, 
because it would mean General D had an escape plan, at least for those who couldn't fight. In the end, General D didn't answer Ragu, but turned to Commander Keeley. Would you tell them, Keeley? Dajer was surprised. He had never heard General D sound so. Tired. Ragu frowned, and walked to his master before putting a hand on his shoulder. The tension in General D's face eased when he felt the support his apprentice gave him through the force. General D devised a plan that will let us buy time for the Trilex and our injured troopers to escape. We are going to use the lot that we have to blow up the short passage, so the Seppis will be forced to follow the big one. That will give us more time to prepare an ambush. Our hope is that, adding the time they take to move through the path and the time we hold them, it will be enough so Sindulla can take the others and escape to their hideout. From there on, well. It will be on his hands. Ragu gasped in surprise. He knew they were in trouble, but his young mind never processed the thought of dying. For him, they would somehow survive. This. How? Master. What do we do? Ragu was clearly panicking, but his master seemed to not notice. Dajer looked at Commander Keeley, and remembered something he and the commander had talked about not too long ago. And seeing the expression on General D's face, he remembered another conversation. Separately, they weren't much. But when he put them together, Dajer could imagine Commander Keeley and General D having a very similar talk. Half stunned and half angry, Dajer took off his helmet, and put it on the ground. Hell Squad is staying, General. Ragu looked at Dajer surprised. That had come out of nowhere, and he didn't know exactly what the subcommander meant. Staying. What? What is that supposed to mean, Dajer? No, you aren't, Dajer. Suddenly, General D yelled at Dajer, startling not only him, but also Ragu and Commander Keeley. Some of the clones and Trilex gave them surprised glances. Look at yourself, Dajer. Look at Hell Squad. You can barely walk. I've seen troopers retire in a better state than you. We don't have a retirement option, General. General D was surprised when Dajer rebuked him. The clone always took what he said quietly. It appeared that he wasn't the only one affected by their situation. Commander Keeley yelled at Dajer, shocked by the lack of discipline and respect the subcommander was showing. And, meanwhile, Regu was staring at them dumbstruck. Dajer. You are one of the best troopers I have ever seen, and one of the most loyal ones. However, just like I can't send injured troopers to a fight, I can't send you to your death. Me, Keeley, and the others will hold the clankers back. However, our sacrifice won't matter if the Trilex don't escape. And I don't trust Sindulla to do that. Master. You can't. No. Once again, General D ignored his Padawan. He wasn't willing to look at Ragu, because he knew what he had to say to his Padawan would be a thousand times harder than what he was saying to Dajer. I need someone I can trust there, Dajer. Sindulla is only worried about his own people. If he needs, he will leave our injured troops behind without hesitation. I know you won't let that happen. Then you should go, General. A Jedi has more power than any clone does. Sindulla will listen to you, and probably only you. General D smiled. He could sense the panic in Dajer's voice. Although his face was serious, and his voice steady, the force revealed to him that the clone was looking for every excuse he could to convince General D to run. I don't need Sindulla to listen. I need someone who will aim a blaster at his head, and make him walk. I know that isn't what a Jedi should do, but you are no Jedi, Dajer. Dajer clenched his fists. He wanted to say something. Anything. However, he knew the Nikto was right. Hell Squad and he couldn't fight properly anymore. Hell, they couldn't even keep their eyes open because of their tiredness. And General D was right when he said Sindulla wouldn't hesitate to abandon the Republic troops. The freedom fighter leader wasn't a kind man. Commander. Dajer looked at Commander Keeley. The clone was his last hope of convincing General D to escape while the clones, and only the clones, stayed behind. However, he knew the answer before he even asked. I'm not happy either, Dajer. 
but you know the general is right. You are the best the 303rd have I wouldn't trust anyone but you to lead the injured. We need someone to keep the 303rd alive, and that someone is you. As he said that, Commander Keeley picked up Dager's helmet on the ground, and gave it to him. Dager looked at the horn drawn on it, and then at Commander Keeley's own helmet. He closed his eyes, and sighed with resignation. Commander. And General. Aye aye. I understand. Hell Squad will do its best. I will do my best. Commander Keeley shook Dager's hand, a smile on his face. He had made the right choice of sub-commander, and he couldn't be more proud of what Dager had become, from a simple trooper to what he was now. General D also had a smile on his face as he nodded at Dager. He always felt that Dager was something else, and, just like Keeley, he was proud of Dager. Now, Dager, I have an even more important mission for you. Say it, General. I need you to take Regu with you. Chapter 215 I want you to take Regu with you. There was a stunned silence following General D's order. Dager and Commander Keeley already knew the old Jedi would try to convince his apprentice to leave before the battle started, but Regu didn't. For several seconds, the Padawan said nothing. Then, he snapped out of his confusion, apparently outraged by his master's words. No. No, no, no. I'm not leaving you, master. General D looked at Commander Keeley, and the clone patted Dager on the shoulder. Both clones walked away, leaving Master and Apprentice alone. When they were a certain distance away, Dager looked back. He could see Ragu sobbing slightly, and General D comforting him. The Nikto had a warm, almost paternal, smile on his face. Yes, Commander. Dager looked at Commander Keeley. The clone had put on his helmet now, and was playing with his DC-17s. I know what the General ordered is difficult. However, orders are orders, right? But it was I who requested him to do that. Dager looked up, shocked. He expected his commander to say anything, but that. After all, Commander Keeley was a clone, so he understood better than anyone how Dager felt about leaving him and General D to die. Everything General D said is true, Dager. You and your men can barely walk. I didn't even ask for a report on your condition, but I can see at least five places where you were shot, your leg is wrapped in a bloody bandage, and you are holding his chest as if you broke a few ribs. Damn AAT. General Ragu saved us. See? I have no doubt that if you stayed behind, Hell Squad would eliminate a few hundred more droids. However, what difference would it make? The Sepis have almost half a million troops on the planet. It might not make much of a difference, sir, but it would be a pleasure to eliminate a few hundred droids, even if it means dying here. Especially if it means dying here. I know how you feel. However, I don't need you to die here. I need you to avenge us. I'm not sure I can, Commander. You said yourself how bad I am. The Republic won't let the Clankers have Ryloth forever. Not only it is an important planet, but the loss we suffered here is more than enough to convince several neutral planets that the Separatists are stronger than us. We didn't stand a chance from the start, Commander. They outnumbered us 1 to 10, and that was before they got reinforcements. That doesn't matter for those who are watching. All they care about is that we lost. There will be retaliation by the Republic. Winning Ryloth back or not, that will be your chance to get out of here with the wounded. Meanwhile, I want you to piss off the Seppies. Hit and run tactics, that kind of thing. That is what Hell Squad does the best. We won't disappoint you, sir. I know you won't. Now, come on, and let's check how the Trelex are faring. We need to make them move faster. General D watched his dejected Padawan use the force to move some wounded troopers into the Blurgs. He had spent a long time talking with him, and, although he convinced Ragu that the Padawan had to leave, it was still very difficult to see him so. Lifeless. While he was lost in his thoughts, Commander Keeley approached him, followed by Sindola, Gobi, and Dager. Ragu soon joined them. It is time, sir. General D nodded at Commander Keeley, 
and looked one last time to the others. This was the last time he would see any of them. Sindulla, Gobi. I am really sorry that the Republic wasn't able to provide you with the help Ryloth needed. However, I assure you that more help will come as soon as it is possible. Please, believe in the Republic. We won't abandon Ryloth. Humph. Sindulla ignored what General D was saying, and left. Gobi shot an apologetic glance at the Jedi, but General D had already turned to Commander Keeley. How is it going? We are loading the rest of the explosives in the gunship. Very good, Commander. Ready the men. Commander Keeley saluted General D, and before leaving, he turned to Ragu and Dajer. General Ragu. It was an honor fighting side by side with you. I may not undeserve the Jedi's ways, but I know that you will be a great one. The honor was mine Keeley. Off. Thank you, Keeley. For everything. Just doing my job, sir. The commander looked at Dajer, and stretched his hand. Dajer grabbed it, but none said anything. They knew exactly what was going through the mind of the other. After releasing Commander Keeley's hand, Dajer saluted him, his back straight, and Commander Keeley returned the salute. Dajer would remember this moment for the rest of his life. It was the last time he saw Commander Keeley alive. The commander then put his helmet on, and walked towards the waiting clones. They were all in the standard attention position, helmets under their arms, and blasters aimed up. 324 clones were staying behind, conscious of the destiny that awaited them, and ready to face it. Commander Keeley stood in front of them, waiting for General D to finish his talk with the others. The Jedi knew that it was time, so he turned to Dajer and Ragu. There were indescribable sadness and pain in his eyes, but the Nikto stood strong, and didn't let it show on his face, although he was sure Ragu and Dajer could feel it. When this war started, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to lead troops. After all, I'm a peacekeeper, not a soldier. However, you and Keeley helped me through all of this, and I couldn't be more grateful. Remember what you learned from us, and don't let hatred cloud your judgment. And. General D smiled, and watched Dajer walk towards the line of Trilex and injured clones that were leaving. Master. Listen carefully, my Padawan. I still have much to teach you, and you still have much to learn. Unfortunately, we don't have time. Don't forget what you learned, and, above all else, don't look for revenge. It was revenge that started this war, and it is what it keeps it going. He put his hands on the Padawan's shoulders. He was proud of Ragu. He loved his Padawan, and he was glad that Ragu followed his decision quietly, and was escaping. He didn't want the young Tigruta to die. You have to go now. And remember, Ragu. I will always be with you. You just have to feel the force. Ragu sobbed hard, but didn't cry. He knew there was nothing he could do, but follow his master's orders, and go. Goodbye, master. It always is. May the force be with you too, my young apprentice. Ragu turned around, and joined Dajer and Hell Squad. Now, the only one remaining next to General D was Gobi. Cham is still angry. He feels betrayed. He counted on Republic assistance, and it didn't come. War turns promises into hopes. I wish it wasn't so. Tell him. General D shook Gobi's hand, and left. I will. Soon, only General D and the clones were left. They could hear the droids coming. They were prepared. Chapter 216 Keeley, tell the pilots to move the gunship into position. This is command. Are all the charges in place? Not too far from where Commander Keeley was, two clones were hanging on the sides of a giant rock pillar, setting thermal detonators all over it. If everything went according to plan, it would blow up together with the gunship, and block the path. Copy that. We are all ready. The droid army is closing. As soon as they are in range, blow up the gunship. Yes, Commander. The two clones retreated until they were in a tree lean, and waited. Soon, they saw two droids approach the gunship. Clearly, after all the battles and ambushes, the commander of the clankers was more cautious, 
and wouldn't get near something that was obviously a trap. Unfortunately for the droid captain that was commanding this group of seppies, that wasn't a trap they could escape from. When one of the clones pressed the switch, the lot exploded, blowing the two droids and nearby units to kingdom come. And, not only did the gunship blow up, but so did the dozens of thermal detonators on the rock pillars around it. Within seconds, they all fell, creating a wall more than 20 meters tall. The droid captain spent half an hour trying to get past it, but it was useless. If the droids went one by one, they could get past the gaps, but there was no way the AATs and B2 super battle droids could do that. And, without them, there was no guarantee the clankers could win the battle. Seeing the droid army turn around to follow the other path, the two clones cheered and reported to Commander Keeley, who ordered them to get back. Soon, the last battle would start. Hearing the explosions in the distance, Commander Keeley knew that their plan had worked so far. Now, all that was left to do was fight. You hear that, men? Commander Keeley straightened his back when General D started talking. The Jedi stopped next to him, his hands behind his back. You hear that? That is the announcement of our last battle. And all I have to say is that we are going to win, do you understand me? We are going to hold back those clankers, and make them regret the moment they decided to chase us. Am I clear? Then, before we start, I have one last thing to say. You are the finest soldiers the Republic ever had. You fought bravely, and you never gave up. I am honored to fight alongside you. I am honored to die alongside you. This might be our last battle, but the 303rd will never be forgotten. Screams of agreement resounded as the troopers chanted General D's name. The Jedi was their general, but now, above all else, he was one of them. He was willing to sacrifice his life, and didn't run away, but decided to stay and die with them. That was enough to garner the respect and loyalty of any clone. Then let's go. We have an army to face. Commander Keeley stepped forward, his eyes gleaming with determination, put his helmet on, and pulled out his two DC-17s. You heard the general, lads. Let's get to work. Soon, they were in their positions, waiting. 326 men, including General D and Commander Keeley, that knew they were going to die, and weren't the least afraid of it. Watambor looked angrily at TA-175. He had been in Lesu for a few days already, pillaging the riches of the Trilex to his heart content, and knew nothing of General D or the 303rd. Now, however, TA-175, who was just waiting to be deactivated thanks to his failure in conquering Ryloth sooner, asked him to send more troops to deal with a few hundred dirty Republic soldiers. I thought. Kirk Serb. Chdij. There was no Republic scum left on the planet. His vocal dispositive made a lot of noises as what Tambor talked, making it almost impossible to understand what the Separatist was saying. We faced unexpected resistance from a group of clones. But they will soon be destroyed. Reinforcements are only to guarantee it happens faster. Agreed. Squash that Republic scum. General Dean Commander Keeley stood side by side watching three C-9979s drop even more clankers on the ground. They originally had to deal with less than 3,000 droids, but now that number had gone back to the initial 8,000. Not that it made much of a difference. The Republic had chosen a small, open forest to make their last stand. The rocks and trees were sparse, but at least provided a little bit of cover, and it would take time for the AATs to navigate through it, meaning that they would only have to deal with B1 and B2 units. As much as Commander Keeley would have liked to destroy some AATs, he doubted they would survive long enough to even see the tanks. It seems like they really don't like us, General. No, they don't, Keeley. How are you feeling? Commander Keeley knocked his helmet with the butt of his DC-17, showing he was prepared, and ready to fight. I've never been better, sir. Let's give those seppies the fight of their lives. General D looked at the commander, and said nothing. There was no need to say anything, nor talk about it. Commander Keeley knew exactly what he was thinking. Turning to the others, he saw the clones all looking at him. 
they were hidden behind trees and rocks, just waiting for his command. Each time he looked at one of them, the trooper would nod at him, indicating he was ready. General D knew the name of every soldier there. They were all elites who had fought in thousands of battles, and survived up till now. Just like Rosal, Admiral Dow, Captain Narza, Lieutenant Fonder, Sergeant Storage and tens of thousands of others, they were ready to give their lives for the Republic. Through the force, General D could sense fear, anxiety, and despair. However, he also felt their excitement, their desire for revenge for all their fallen brothers, and their determination to protect the ones who were escaping. And, for once, General D let those feelings become his own. He felt angry at the droids, who dared to attack and eliminate so many of the troopers under him. He felt sadness, directed at all those who had died in this unnecessary war, not only in Ryloth, but in the whole galaxy. And he felt disappointed at himself, for not being able to teach everything he could to Ragu, for having to abandon his Padawan so early. He could still feel Ragu through the Force, albeit weakly. The Padawan was far, far away, and he was glad that was the case. He had feared that Ragu would disobey him and come back. Looking up at the sky, General D saw the Separatist blockade, but also the debris of the battle that took place up there. And he remembered Admiral Dow, an old friend whom he knew even before the Clone Wars started. In a Blaze of Glory Chapter 217 Commander Keeley watched as General D looked to the sky and muttered something, seemingly reminiscent. About what, the commander didn't know. He looked back, at each of the clones. They were his men. They were his legion. And, above all else, they were his brothers. Now, although they were going to die, Commander Keeley smiled. If he could die together with his brothers and his general, then he would die happily. Sergeant Ace, are the men ready? You bet we are, Commander. Let's show those damn seppies that the 303rd won't go down without a fight. The sergeant laughed wildly when he answered. He was the highest ranking officer after Commander Keeley, Lieutenant Shield was gravely wounded, and escaped together with the others, and it was his job to represent the troopers. And, well, that was how they were feeling. For the hundredth time in a few hours, Commander Keeley felt that he was lucky to have such men under him. He had no doubt they were the finest legion in the entire Republic Army. After all, they were the 303rd Attack Legion. Here they come. Commander Keeley looked forward again, and saw many black spots approaching their position. Lifting his binoculars, he zoomed in on the enemy. Steady. Stay low, and wait for them to get closer. The droids were too far away to see them yet, and Commander Keeley didn't want to give up their position sooner than necessary. If they could catch the clankers by surprise, it would be even better. Just like you said, General. Their B-1 and B-2 units are coming first. I can see a few AATs behind, but they won't have a shot on us. How many? More than we can deal with. It wasn't a precise answer, but at the same time, it was all General D needed to hear to steal his resolve. When one was in a dangerous situation, that person would try everything to escape. However, when there was nowhere to go, then there were two options. Either that person would become a coward, and beg for their lives, or they would throw away all their fears, and become almost insane, not caring for anything. Clearly, the clones and General D belonged to the last type. Seeing the droids approach, General D looked at his men, and they all gestured with a thumbs up, meaning the clankers were in range of their blasters. General D glanced at Commander Keeley, and the clone smiled under his helmet, at the same time cocking his blasters. He was ready. The first droids were very surprised to see an old Nikto come out from behind a rock, and aim a blue lightsaber at them. For the Republic. For the Trilex. General D ran forward, slashing two droids in half with the same move, and, before the others could fire at him, he jumped and spun in the air, bringing his lightsaber down on a B-2 unit. As the symmetrical halves of the droid hit the ground, blue lasers flew from the trees and rocks, taking down more than a hundred droids in less than two seconds. Commander Keeley was somehow even more impressive than General D. In less than ten seconds, he had to stop and reload his pistols. 
more than 20 clankers have died by his hands in those few moments. After reloading, Commander Keeley ducked behind a rock to avoid enemy fire, and then jumped out again as soon as there was a pause. Walking and firing his DC-17s, he approached the droids until he was able to put his pistols in their heads and fire point-blank. He was only able to do that because his men were covering his back, taking down any droids who turned their blasters to him. That was the trust they had built over the course of months of war. Each clone knew exactly what to do, and how to do it. With the corner of his eyes, Commander Keeley saw Sergeant Ace lead six or seven clones forward, he could hear the clone laugh maniacally. And realized that he also had a mad grin on his face, to take cover in another position, from where they could keep an eye out for General D, in case the Jedi needed help. However, it was obvious that the Nikto was faring way better than any clone. He was running and jumping all over the place, and barely any laser could even get close to him. And the few who did were quickly deflected back to those who fired them. General D pierced a B-2 super battle droid with his lightsaber, then lifted the dead body using the force, and threw it at a group of clankers. He was unstoppable. Suddenly, the Jedi stopped, and turned off his lightsaber. Red lasers showered him, but they all seemed to be stopped by an invisible wall, and just stood there, frozen. Then, General D stretched his hands, and several rocks fell from the canyon walls around them, crushing dozens of droids. The lasers around the Nikto were also reflected back, some even hitting droids. Commander Keeley and the clone stopped firing for a second, surprised. They had never seen the Jedi do something so powerful. What are you waiting for, Keeley? Let's go, boys. The fight is not over. Commander Keeley and the clones snapped out of their days when they heard General D, and fought with renewed effort. For a few minutes, it seemed as if the battle was going on their favor. Almost a thousand droids had died, and the 303rd had only suffered a few dozen casualties. Unfortunately for them, the droids soon showed the advantage that their overwhelming numbers brought them. R. Commander Keeley looked behind him when he heard Sergeant Ace yell in pain and alarm. The sergeant had been hit on his shoulder, but he still lifted his DC-15A, trying to get another shot off. However, before he could pull the trigger, two lasers hit his head, killing him immediately. No matter how bravely they fought, the 303rd clones couldn't escape their destiny. One by one, they fell to the unrelenting torrent of lasers coming from the droids E-5s. As they got closer, their accuracy became better, and the clones were forced to keep their heads down. The moment they showed themselves to try and fire at the droids, tens of lasers hit them. The only one in the open was General D, who seemed not to get tired at all, deflecting lasers and cutting down droids as if they were nothing. Minutes and hours passed, and the 300 clones had been reduced to just a bit more than a hundred, while the Separatist army still numbered in the thousands. After another hour, the last few clones stood tall near Commander Keeley and General D. Around them, Dead droids and the corpses of their brothers piled up, and the small forest was destroyed. Commander Keeley stopped to reload his pistols once again, for the hundredth time in the battle. At least they didn't have to worry about ammunition, because many of their brothers died without the chance of using theirs. Suddenly, he saw a small squad of droids drop their blasters, and pull out thermal detonators. Careful! He finished reloading as fast as he could, and fired his pistols wildly. He hit two of the detonators still in the hands of the droids, blowing them to pieces, and another two in the air. However, the last one got to them. Looking down at the detonator who rolled to his feet, Commander Keeley felt as if time had stopped. His short but eventful life flashed before his eyes, mostly filled with images of his dead brothers, and especially with General D, Ragu, and Dager. He smiled. The detonator exploded. Chapter 218 General D watched the thermal detonator land, and blow up. The last troopers, including Commander Keeley, were thrown in the air, and landed harshly on the ground. None of them got up. The Jedi sensed a wave of peace coming from Commander Keeley as the clone looked at the detonator before it blew up. And now, seeing the lifeless body on the ground, General D felt anger. He remembered the moment he was told that a war was going to start, 
and how he and the other Jedis were supposed to lead troops. Clone troops, all from the DNA of a single bounty hunter. He, like many others, objected fiercely. After all, Jedis were peacekeepers, not warriors. And, when he met Commander Keeley, in a cruiser above Geonosis, he despised the clone, although he knew it wasn't his fault. He felt it was cruel to create people just so they could fight, and he thought it was even worse that none of the clones contested that decision. However, after hundreds, even thousands of battles, his opinions changed. In fact, since when he first landed on Geonosis, and watched all the death and destruction around him, all the lives being lost, he felt different. The clones weren't just emotionless killing machines like he first assumed, but were real people. Each and every one of them had feelings and desires. And he soon learned that they wished for one thing above all else. And that was to keep their brothers alive, no matter the cost. In that very first battle, he witnessed clones giving their lives for others not once, not twice, but hundreds of times, over and over again. He could sense their fear and regret as they died, but also their determination. And, deep down, he realized that clones and Jedis weren't so different. As he got to know Commander Keeley, Dager, Brain, Dab, Tech, Metal, 3-4, Cell, Rosal, Sharp, Fonder, Shield, Barrow, Narza, Timer, and thousands of other 303rd clones, he stopped thinking about them as soldiers. They became people he wished to protect. And now they were dead. All this time on Ryloth, he had pushed away the anger and grief that came with their deaths, but now that Commander Keeley was gone, and only he was left alive, amidst the bodies of so many, he let it free. An explosion of force left his body, sending tens of droids flying. He looked back to Commander Keeley once again. His helmet had disappeared, and he could see his face. There was a slight smile on his lips. He smiled himself. He wouldn't let his death, their deaths, be in vain. Running forward, General D spun his lightsaber faster than eyes could see, creating a nearly impenetrable blue circle that sent every laser back to the droid who fired it. When he got near the enemy force, he hacked at them wildly. Droid after droid fell, cut in dozens of pieces. Even the tough metal hide of the B-2 super battle droids could do nothing against his lightsaber, even more now that he was putting all his strength behind it. In all but a few minutes, hundreds of droids were dead on the ground, their bodies still smoking where the lightsaber slashed them. However, even more were coming forward, in an inexorable stream that wished nothing but to eliminate the last symbol of Republic presence on Ryloth. And now General D was starting to get tired. He panted hard, and watched the droids around him. Even more C-9979 landing crafts were getting near, ready to drop more clankers to join the battle. Maybe as some weird show of respect, the droids stopped firing, and just aimed at him. They knew he couldn't fight anymore. All they needed to do was press the trigger, and General D would be done for. However, before the droids fired again, a blue laser hit a B-2 unit, killing it straight away. General D was just as surprised as the droids when he saw Commander Keeley get up, holding his dc 17s He thought the commander was dead. Commander Keeley. I'm not finished yet, sir. General D laughed out loud, and retreated until he was next to the clone, cutting down any droid on his way. The two stood back to back, and both felt comfort in the presence of one another. They were going to die, but at least they were going to die together, and fighting, just like how the clones liked. Commander Keeley opened his eyes, dazed. He was certain he was going to die when he saw the thermal detonator land next to him, but he somehow had survived. His brothers weren't so lucky. Looking around, he realized two things. First, he didn't have his helmet on. It was on the ground, the visor broken, and a crack extending from one side to another of it. Secondly, he realized that while he was the last clone alive, there was still someone facing the droids. A solitary Nikto stood tall, even though he was surrounded by hundreds, maybe thousands, of droids. His lightsaber was pointed at the clankers, a sign of defiance against the overpowered enemy. At this moment, Commander Keeley was glad he had survived the explosion, because he could help his general one last time. Getting up, 
he eliminated one of the B-2 super battle droids, and heard General D yell his name. His head was still buzzing, but he felt grateful when the Jedi retreated to stand next to him. That was a good way to die. I'm not finished yet, sir. General D and Commander Keeley fought bravely for the next few minutes. But there were simply too many droids. We can do this, General. Let's make the end memorable. A smile touched both of their lips as a laser hit Commander Keeley's right shoulder, sending him stumbling back. Before he could regain his balance, two more lasers hit his chest. He fell to the ground, his eyes wide open. His blaster pistols fell out of his hands. Life had already left his body. General D only heard Commander Keeley scream in pain before he himself was hit. Burning pain came from his stomach, where a laser scorched through his skin and organs. Still holding his lightsaber with one hand, he did his best to deflect the incoming lasers. It was at this moment that he heard a voice through his comlink, which prompted him to look up. This is Republic Blockade Runner 0909. We have broken through. Several ships flew over his head, towards where the Trileks were escaping. Droids on the ground fired at them, but their puny lasers did little to the ships. The Trileks. We'll live to fight another day. Letting out a victorious yell, General D threw himself at the droids, waving his lightsaber. The clankers might have destroyed the 303rd, but for General D, they had one. Several lasers hit his shoulders, back, and chest. Strength left his body, and his hand went limp. His lightsaber fell, and without him holding it, the blue light disappeared. General D knelt on the ground, looking at his precious weapon and companion. He stretched his hand, trying to reach it, but never did. When his body hit the ground, a small cloud of smoke appeared, as if something much bigger than a person had fallen. The supplies have arrived at the drop point. Many, many kilometers away, Deja was walking next to the blurg which carried brain. Suddenly, he saw Ragu, who was in front of him, stop. The Padawan let out a gurgling noise, and tumbled down. Kneeling, Ragu put his head on the ground, and sobbed. At the same time, Dejer felt something. More accurately, he felt something missing. A presence that was always with him, but he never noticed, had disappeared. Slowly, he leaned on the wall of the canyon they were in, and slid down. His mind was in shock, and he didn't know what to do. The clones around the two, seeing their leaders fall like that, knew what happened. Many sat on the ground, saying nothing. Others punched the rocks, scaring the Trilex with the sudden brutality. Those who were too wounded to walk sat atop the blurgs, without reaction. Many troopers just stood still, looking at nothing, their minds blank. Touching his face, Deja realized there were warm tears streaming down it. Chapter 219 Suddenly, a loud noise woke Deja up from his daze. He looked at the sky, and saw several ships dropping their escape pods. The pods landed on the earth in front of the mixed group of Trilex and clones, and created small craters. One of the freedom fighters cautiously opened a pod, and pulled a box from inside it. It's food and medical supplies from the Republic. Cheers erupted, old and young jumping in happiness. Sindulla looked at the escape pods and at his people, running towards it, and humped in annoyance. However, he couldn't disguise the glints of relief on his eyes. However, none of the clones moved. The Trilex, initially surprised by their sudden stop and reactions, quickly forgot them, and ran to grab the supplies. Dejer sighed, and blinked. Using the back of his hand, he wiped out his tears. There would be a time to grieve, but it wasn't now. Tech, shield. Get. Get the others up. We have to keep moving. Subcommander. I know it. I know. Just. Keep moving. Dejer looked around. All of them were on the verge of tears, but they still followed his orders. Slowly, the clones got back on their feet, supporting each other. However, their backs were curved, and they walked unsteadily. An aura of defeat surrounded them. It was over. The 303rd Attack Legion was over. General D and Commander Keeley were dead. Admiral Dow, Rosal, 
Fonder, Timer, Narza, Barrow, Blyer, Ace, Jacks, Sharp, Fartum, Womp, Milo, Cooker, Macro, Young, Frit, Trapper, Sano, Virgo. Vigil, Plasma, Jesper, Pride, Smith, Storge, Torque, Agile, Wheat, Sparky, Falco, Bat, Ferret, Spark, Blyer, Posh, Kuvu, Spike, Shep, and so many others. They were all gone. Dager didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't what would be made of the few survivors, Hell Squad included. He didn't know a thing. What about the gene? General Regu. Cell approached him quietly. There was blood trickling down his fists. Even his armor wasn't able to protect him from himself when he punched the ground in anger and despair. Looking at Cell's ragged hands made Dager realize that he wasn't the only one who felt lost. Those who had something to do were still better than those who hadn't. Clones like 3-4 and Brain, who were too wounded to even move, could only stare at the sky blankly. The fact that they didn't have anything to occupy their minds made it worse. And then Dager saw Ragu. The Tigruta was crouching on the ground, crying. Dager could only imagine how bad it was for him. If even the clones felt the loss of General D so strongly, then what about Ragu, who had a direct connection with his master? I will talk to him. And, Sel. Send someone to fetch Sindola for me. I need to talk to him. I don't care if he doesn't want to come. He is going to hear this news from my mouth. I will go myself, sir. As Sel ran away, Dager walked towards Ragu. He thought about what he could say to cheer up the Padawan, and realized nothing would do this. After all, it was his master who died. Maybe telling the truth would be better. He grabbed Ragu's arms, and lifted the Padawan. Tears filled his face, but when he saw Dager, he tried to wipe and hide them. There is no need, General. I felt it too. We all did. Any wish of hiding his pain and despair left Ragu. He let the tears stream free down his face. What do we do? Master is dead. What can I do? Dager patted Ragu's shoulders. He didn't know how to comfort the Padawan. He was a soldier, he only knew how to fight. But he did know that in situations like that, sometimes just saying the truth was better. Now that General D is gone, you have to lead is, sir. I, I can't do that. You have to. The 303rd is gone, but some of us are still here. We have too many wounded, and the Seppis are still after us. We can't stop here. I I I. Okay. You should get in one of the blurgs, General. The Twi'leks have stopped to catch the supplies, but I will get them on the move. Meanwhile, I will find one of the freedom fighters to show you the way. The injured are priority. Thanks, Dager. It was weird to give orders to a Jedi, but Dager knew it was necessary. After Ragu started moving, Dager grabbed Maiwi, and told the Twi'lek to lead the way together with Ragu. For once, she didn't complain. Lieutenant Shield. I'm here, sir. I want every man who can still walk to get to those pods, and organize it. Don't let the civilians near it, otherwise it will be a huge mess. Sindulla is not gonna like it. I don't care whether he likes it or not. I'm going to talk to him. Remember, don't get in a fight with the Twi'lex, but don't let them take the supplies. And start getting them to walk. Tell them the clankers are on our tail, and we can't waste the time that General D brought us. Lieutenant Shield nodded, and assembled the troopers. Soon, Dager could hear complaints from the Twi'lex, but none of them dared confront the clones. Either they respected them for all they sacrificed, or they were afraid of the blasters. Dager didn't care. He wasn't in a good mood. Subcommander Dager. Order your men to stand down. He heard Sindulla long before the Twi'lek appeared, riding his blurg. Dager now understood why General D said they couldn't trust Sindulla to take care of the injured clones. He had completely ignored them, and only cared for the supplies. Rage filled Sindulla's face, but Dager just put on his helmet, and lifted his blaster. He didn't aim it at anyone, but Sindulla retreated a few steps nonetheless. Where is the Padawan? 
I want to talk to him. General Ragu is leading your people. Don't forget that we still have Sepis following us. Rar. I thought that was why that Jedi decided to stay behind. Can't he even stop a few droids, or did he just run? Despise filled Yates' face as the Trilek spat on the ground. He never liked the Republic, and even now, it didn't cross his mind why the clones had suddenly stopped. Yate, shut. Sindulla sensed something in Dager's eyes, and wanted to warn the freedom fighter to stay quiet, but before he could, Dager had knocked him out using the butt of his blaster. The impact was enough to send Yate in unconsciousness. Several freedom fighters aimed their weapons at Dager, seeing the clones suddenly attack one of them. Dager, however, ignored the blasters, and ordered his own troopers to stand down. Looking at Sindulla, he waited for the Trilek to do the same. What are you doing? Put those blasters down. Now. Hesitantly, the Trileks did as they were said. The clones looked at Dager surprised. They had never seen the subcommander lose control like that, but they knew Yate was lucky that Dager didn't use his vibroblade. Get him up. And when he wakes up, tell him it was well deserved. The Republic is our ally, and he should learn to respect them. Sindulla looked coldly at Yate as the Trilek was taken away, and then yelled for his people to let the clones take control of the situation, and get going. He already understood why Dager was so angry. Soon, only Dager, Sindulla, and Gobi were left there. The Trilek gestured for Dager to say what he wanted. General D and Commander Keeley are gone. If you don't want their sacrifice to be wasted, get us to your hideout at once. Chapter 220 General D and Commander Keeley are gone. If you don't want their sacrifice to be wasted, get us to your hideout quickly. Sindulla and Gobi stared at Dager in shock. They already suspected that was the case, but Dager was so blunt about it, and the way he talked made it seem like it was their fault. And, in a certain way, it was, but Sindulla would never admit it. How? How do you know? General D was General Ragu's master, Sindulla. Jedis have a special connection, and you know that. The two freedom fighters exchanged glances. They had never seen Dager, or any clone, for what it matters, get so angry. In fact, most of the time, they were like emotionless machines, who only knew how to fight. Even when their brothers died by their side, they barely looked at them. Or at least that was what the Trilex thought. They didn't know the pain that the troopers actually felt. I am sorry to hear that. We all are. Master D was a great Jedi, and he will be missed. He really was. Now, we need to get moving. Maiwi is already leading the way with General Ragu. Do you have any complaints, Sindulla? The Trilek looked at Dager, not with anger, but guilt. He knew he was partially responsible for General D's death. In a dark room at the Jedi Temple, General Yoda clenched his small fists. He felt a tug in the force, and sat down to meditate. His eyes closed, he called a droid forward, and told it to find General Kenobi, General Skywalker, and General Windu. Soon, four people arrived. Ahsoka Tano had followed her master. You wanted to see us, Master Yoda? The four sat in front of the small Jedi, their legs crossed. Ahsoka and General Skywalker were clearly itching to ask the reason for the meeting, but they let General Windu take the lead. Gone, Master D is. The force around Ryloth, turbulent is. We felt it too. Both General Windu and General Kenobi lowered their heads. They had known General D for a long time, so they also sensed when he died. General Skywalker and his Padawan, however, only got to know about this now. This is the first loss the Republic had in this war. But it won't be the last. We have to claim back Ryloth as soon as possible, otherwise more systems will join the Separatist. True that is. Master Skywalker, ready for this mission, you and your Padawan are. The 501st just have to restock, Master, and then we can leave. But careful you must be. A dangerous place, Ryloth has become. More than one Jedi, we need. Master Kenobi and Master Skywalker, as soon as your fleets free are, you will go too. Yes, Master Yoda. 
Now, meditate with me you must. Dark times ahead there are. Two days went by pretty quickly. The freedom fighters and clones had a lot to occupy their minds with, and the few supplies that the Republic sent were running out. However, they were enough to save hundreds of injured, and support them for long enough so Sindulla could use his contacts, and find a steady supply of food and medical supplies. Dajer didn't know where he got those things, and he didn't care. At this moment, the sub-commander was walking around the Trelek hideout, an underground world of tunnels and caves. Suddenly, he saw Shoyuda. The young girl was playing with her friends, unaware of everything that happened in the last few days. When she saw him, she ran over to him. She really liked Dajer, for some reason, and the clone had no reason not to return that affection. Mr. Dajer. Mr. Dajer. What is it, Shoyuda? I have a question. Daddy said that Mr. Jedi and Mr. Keeley died. Is that true? Dajer sighed, and knelt beside her. Her father, Gobi, wasn't very tactful in telling her that, but if one really thought about it, it was difficult to hide the fact that thousands of clones and Trelex have died. She and the other children would notice it anyway. Yes, it is true. They died to protect us. Oh. Shoyuda lowered her head, and for a moment Dajer thought she was going to cry. However, she didn't know the two of them well enough to feel so much for their deaths. You should go back. Your friends are waiting for you. You are right. Bye, Mr. Dajer. Bye, Shoyuda. What Shoyuda said made Dajer think of something. The droids had given up searching for them long ago. They thought that eliminating the 303rd was enough, and, to tell the truth, they probably were right. There was little to nothing that the survivors could do. Tech, Dab, Cell, and Metal, come to me. Not much later, the four clones arrived in front of him. Their armors were scarred and scorched, with holes and cracks, but none of them even though about repairing it. It was a symbol of the battles they went through. What is it, sir? We are going back. The clones frowned, not really understanding what Dajer meant. Air. Go back to where, sir? The battlefield. The Seppis have been gone for a while. I want to scout the area, and, more importantly, we have to bring General D's body back. The Jedis have a special way of treating their dead. Those are our orders. What about Commander Keeley? Dab asked this question so quietly that Dajer almost didn't hear him. However, he knew what the clone wanted. It was impossible to bring the bodies of all the troopers who died, but Commander Keeley had special importance for Hell Squad. Him too. Now, let's move. Six people left the Trelek hideout, heading towards the battlefield. Leading Dajer, Cell, Dab, Tech, and Metal was Maiwi. The Freedom Fighter, who apparently hated the idea of relying on the Republic before, now offered to help the clones in almost everything, especially after the 303rd was wiped out. Maybe it was pity, maybe it was something else, Dajer didn't know. However, she offered to take them there, and he gladly accepted. He knew the terrain, but not so well. Just before they got to where the battle had happened, Dajer stopped the group. He wanted to make sure that they would only carry two bodies back. It was a brutal, but necessary precaution. You saw before what the aftermath of a battle looks like, lads. But this is no normal battlefield. The clankers are gone, but we still have to watch out. My we? The woman nodded, and took the lead. After another half an hour, their BRC speeders finally entered the valley where General D realized his last stand. Oh. My we was surprised when they entered the tree lean. In fact, it was more accurate to say she was terrified. The small forest from before was destroyed. Trees lay on the ground, and the few which were still standing had scorch marks. So did the rocks and the ground. But what shocked her the most was obviously not the devastation, but the bodies. 325 clones stayed behind. None made it out alive. Their corpses laid on the ground, or leaning on trees and rocks. Many had not one or two black spots on their armors, but a dozen. It was clear that they all went down fighting. Chapter 221 
Dejer stopped beside a body. The clone was laying on a rock, facing the ground. His arms dangled around when Dejer moved him, and he almost seemed alive for a moment. Frit. The cheerful trooper had received almost ten lasers to the chest before he died. His blaster was next to him, and Dejer picked it up and put it on Frit's hands. No clone would like to die without his weapon. It was a representation of what they faced, and how they behaved before their deaths, and it was also a sort of superstition. No one in this galaxy knew what happened after one died, and there were thousands of millions of theories. Clones didn't even have the time to create an explanation. It didn't matter. Frit and the others died a valiant death, and they deserved this kind of respect. Since he couldn't bring their bodies back to Kamino, that was the least danger could do. They did all of that? Miley's shudder brought Hell Squad back to the present. They had all been roaming around, looking at their dead brothers, and remembering them. It wasn't the first time they saw something like this, and it wouldn't be the last. However, it was different. When the Chuilek called them, they finally looked at the battlefield as a whole. It was true that the 303rd had gone down in battle, but they weren't alone. The price of their deaths was the destruction of more than a thousand clankers. The broken remains of B-1 and B-2 droids made for a sharp contrast with the white and brown armor of the 303rd. The more they walked, the more droids they saw. Their metallic carcasses pilled up, side by side with the clones they were fighting. Suddenly, metal stopped, and Maiwi almost stumbled into him. Ignoring her, the clone knelt, and picked up a helmet. It was broken, scorched, and dirty. However, the two painted horns on it were unforgettable. Yes sir. Dejer walked over to him, and pulled the helmet of metal's grasp. The clone's fingers held onto it for a moment, not willing to let go. Dejer looked at the broken visor of Commander Keeley's helmet. The helmet he knew so well. Suppressing a sigh, he glanced around. It was easy to spot Commander Keeley's body. A pile of droids laid around him, bigger than any other. His dear DC-17s were next to him, and he had his eyes closed. If it wasn't for the laser marks on his chest armor, he might look like he was just sleeping. Unfortunately, he wasn't. General D wasn't too far away from Commander Keeley. Contrarily to the commander, there were almost no droids near his body. They all seemed to have been pushed away, certainly by a last exhibition of the force the Jedi used. There was a peaceful smile on General D's face. When Dejer got close to him, he noticed his comlink blinking. The Nikto must have received the news that the Freedom Fighters got their much-needed supplies. Turning to the other clones, Dejer gestured towards the two bodies. They picked them up quietly, and left the valley. It was a place of death, and it would remain like that for a long time. Much later, the bodies would be rescued, not only there, but in all of Ryloth. Or at least what remained of them. There were many creatures on the planet that didn't care whether their prey was dead or alive. Are those? They? Ragu watched as Hell Squad entered the hideout in their speeders, two bodies hanging carefully on them. Dejer stopped his BRC speeder in front of the young Tigruta, lifting a cloud of dust. Clones and Chuileks surrounded the speeders, the freedom fighters murmuring curiously, the troopers silent in respect and grief. Ragu stopped beside General D's body, touched his master's head, and closed his eyes. After a few minutes, he lifted his hand, and General D and Commander Keeley started floating. The people opened a path for him as he walked. It was kind of eerie, watching a Tigruta with dark circles under his eyes and two bodies floating behind him. Many of the Chuileks, and even clones, flinched, and parents took their kids away. Dejer, follow me. Looking at the members of Hell Squad behind him, Dejer shrugged. He wasn't the least shaken by the scene, but he knew it wasn't good for the morale of the troops. Without saying a thing, Ragu put the two bodies in special storage boxes, where they would be preserved until it was time for them to be properly sent to the afterlife. Dejer waited respectfully behind Ragu as the Padawan said his final goodbyes to General D. When Ragu finally looked up, Dejer saw a new glint in his eyes. There was still sadness, but also determination. A lot of it. 
Dager, as per today, you are being made commander of the 303rd Attack Legion. My. My master wouldn't want us to stop and grieve for him. He gave his life so he could help the people of Ryloth. We will do that in his stead. Dejah was surprised, to say the least. They didn't have a legion anymore. The 303rd was gone. So, how could he become the commander of it? I am a general, ain't I, Dejah? Yes, you are, sir. Then I have the authority to do so. Our legion might be gone, but we are still alive. I can't let master's sacrifice be in vain. I can't let anyone's sacrifice be in vain. And neither can you. Dejah didn't know what to say. For once, he wasn't happy about his promotion. It came at too high a cost. However, he could see that this was Ragu's way of reviving the 303rd. A new commander would bring sad memories, but it would also give a new purpose to the troopers. I understand, General. It is my honor to serve as the new commander of the 303rd Attack Legion. I will make sure the sacrifices of all my brothers won't be in vain. Ragu nodded. There was a dark aura around the Padawan, and for a moment, Deja remembered General D telling him to not look for vengeance. Ragu wasn't following those orders, but it wasn't Deja's place to tell him what to do. Let's go talk to Sindela. He has something for us. Deja followed, frowning. He didn't know what the Trilek could have for them, but after the few weeks of constant battling, his respect for Sindela had become despise. The freedom fighter only cared for those close to him, and didn't even wince when he saw 303rd troopers dying one after another while he and his freedom fighters ran. Still, the newly appointed commander followed his general. Looking at Ragu's back, Dejur felt pity. He didn't know a lot about the Jedis, but based on what General D told him, it would be difficult for Ragu to find a new master, especially when he was showing such blunt hate and rage that even a clone could feel. He really liked the young Padawan, and didn't want to see all his training go to waste. That is, if they survived. The clones reacted just as Dejur expected when Ragu announced his promotion. There was a sad silence at first, which was then followed by a few cheers and congratulations. It was normal for a sub-commander to take the commander's place in case he died, so there wasn't much of a surprise. The Trilex didn't really understand the implications of Dejur's promotion, so apart from those who had gotten somewhat closer to the clones, like Shoyuta, Gobi, Maiwi, and Iva, most of them ignored it. Chapter 222 This idea is plain stupidity. How do you expect us to do that? We have less than 200 men alive, and not even half of them can fight. A very angry Ragu was yelling at Cham Sindola, while the freedom fighter seemed unfazed. Dejah was also looking at him, his helmet covering his expression of surprise. He couldn't believe the Trilek would be such an idiot. Even Gobi, who always supported Sindela, couldn't help but try to convince him otherwise. However, his efforts were for naught. Let me see if I understood, Sindela. You want to, three days after the 303rd was annihilated, attack a separatist convoy guarded by almost a thousand droids? Is that right? Dejur said nothing, but he, and even Gobi, agreed it was madness. Sindela proposed they destroyed the convoy when it was going through the wreckage of several Republic and Separatist ships, which had crashed on Ryloth during the battle. The plan wasn't actually bad, if not for the fact that Sindela had less than 400 ill-prepared freedom fighters. Anyone with a brain could see that the operation was fated to fail, but Sindela insisted. When we attack, the droids will have no space to form up because of the terrain. We can ambush them if we put soldiers hidden in the debris. Because of all the metal, there is too much interference for their sensors to detect us. Ragu frowned. Sindela kept repeating the same thing, trying to convince him to take part in the attack. Although the Trilek didn't think Ragu was half as good as his deceased master, he was a Jedi, and only he could command Dejer and the clones to get into battle. With the support of seasoned soldiers like the clones, his ambush had bigger chances of working. Unfortunately for him, Ragu refused promptly. You're crazy, Sindela. I know you are angry. I know you lost a lot. I know you are disappointed in the Republic. But what you want to do is 
Pa. I knew I should never have trusted the Republic. All your promises were nothing but lies. Gobi, assemble the men. We are going, with or without those traitors. Cham. Maybe Mr. Ragu is right. We should probably stay quiet for a while. You heard me, Gobi. Or did my right hand become a traitor and a coward? Cham. However, Sindulla wouldn't hear any more of it. He left, and started mobilizing the freedom fighters himself. The poor bastards, without knowing what they were up against, and showing blind faith on Sindulla, excitedly grabbed their weapons and rode their blurgs. Gobi. He is sending his people to die. You have to stop him. Ragu put his hand on the shoulder of the Twi'lek. Gobi had always been more reasonable than Sindulla. However, just like the other freedom fighters, he would follow the man, even if it meant his death. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Who knows? Maybe it will work. Gobi flashed them a smile, then went to talk to Iva and Shoyuta. However, it was clear he didn't believe what he was saying. Dajer, watching the family say their goodbyes, couldn't help but turn to Ragu. General, are we letting Sindola go? He is going to die. They all are. There is nothing we can do, Dajer. Sindola lost his trust in the Republic. I could tell him anything, and he wouldn't believe it. But I'm not sending my troops to their deaths. The 303rd has barely 60 troopers who can still fight. We already lost too much protecting Ryloth. If the freedom fighters don't believe in us, then there is nothing I can do. But, just in case, get the men ready. We will be the only ones left to protect the hideout, the wounded, and the civilians. Understood, General. And may the force be with you, Sindulla. Destiny proved that Ragu was right in not leading the clones to attack together with the freedom fighters. The Twi'leks were massacred. Four hundred of them left the hideout, and less than a hundred returned. Clones and Twi'leks lined at the sides of the hideout, leaving a wide path in the middle for the survivors. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, wives, and husbands cried when they couldn't find their loved ones amidst the defeated faces. Blurgs without riders stood out. The moans of the pitifully small number of wounded forced Ragu to order the clone medics to walk forward and pick them up, because the freedom fighters couldn't muster a reaction. Dajer looked at the group. Sindulla and Gobi were still alive, their heads lowered in shame, regret, and pain. Especially Sindulla. No one needed to remind him that it was his fault. Pain tugged at Dajer's heart when he saw several familiar faces missing. Over the course of the month or so that the 303rd and the Twi'leks had been together, he and the others had made friends. Maybe they weren't as close as the clones were to each other, but still. He recognized fairly soon Maiwi's blurg, without its rider. The woman had been very hostile to Hell Squad and the troopers at first, but after a few battles, she was always by their side, not hesitating to risk her life for a clones. Yate also wasn't amongst the survivors. Before leaving, the hot-headed Twi'lek had scoffed at the 303rd and Ragu, and called them cowards. Still, he was loyal, at least to his people, and his death would be a huge impact on morale. By his side, Dajer saw Ragu take a small step forward, as if he wanted to walk up to Sindulla and say something. However, before he could do that, Gobi came to them. You should stay away for a while, Mr. Ragu. Cham. He is. He thinks it is our fault. Gobi suppressed a sigh. Sindulla had been complaining all the way about how the Republic was responsible for all the deaths, and that if they helped, the plan would have worked. At a certain time, Gobi lost his patience, and told him that the Republic wouldn't have made a difference. Sindulla, however, didn't get angry at him, but was even more sure that it was the Republic's, and Ragu's, fault. He said that if you hadn't abandoned us, Abandoned? Tell him to look at us, Gobi. The 303rd had 30,000 troopers before. Now, we have less than 200. Is that abandoning? I don't know what to. But I know. Tell Sindulla that the 303rd can't do anything for him now, but that soon the Republic will be back. We won't abandon Ryloth and its people. Never. 
Dager, give it to him, then organize the men. We are leaving. Gobi was stunned. He never imagined that Ragu would be angry enough to simply leave the freedom fighters. Mr. Ragu. I am sorry for Cham's behavior, but you can't leave. That will only make him more certain that the Republic betrayed us. Maybe. But the 303rd have new orders, and we are following them. Goodbye, Gobi, and may the Force be with you. Shocked, Gobi watched the 303rd gather their soldiers and wounded, and leave the hideout. It all happened so fast that he wasn't able to react. Before he knew, they were gone. Near, Sindulla watched the same scene, with hatred on his eyes. The Republic traitorous scum had finally revealed who they really were. When Gobi delivered to him a hologram projector, saying it was given to him by Ragu, Sindulla simply crushed it. He didn't want to deal with the Republic anymore. Chapter 223 A few hours before Sindulla and the survivors returned, Dejer was startled to see his comlink suddenly light up. For the past few days, it had been inactive, since the Sepis were jamming long-distance communications, but the comlink clearly indicated that the transmission was from far away. He tapped it quickly, and transferred the message to his hologram projector. An image of General Skywalker appeared. It wasn't live, and there were several moments when interference made it almost impossible to understand, but Dager was sure it was real. The codes used were known only to a few, himself included. Padawan. Out. Hold tight, there are. Fleets going to. Loaf. Help will ARR. Soon. At this moment the transmission broke off really badly, probably a sign that the separatist blockade had discovered it, and was trying to intercept the contents. Outside Nabot. You. Garrison. Clear Landy. The hologram disappeared. Judging by how long the transmission was, General Skywalker probably had been alerted that the Seppis were about to eavesdrop his message, and ended it. Although it was very fragmented, and most parts were impossible to understand, the purpose of the transmission was still clear. General Skywalker, and possibly another Jedi, had finally arrived to help Ryloth. Unfortunately, they were a few days too late. The 303rd was gone, and, although Dager didn't know that at the moment, so were the freedom fighters. The battles that General Skywalker was going to fight would be to conquer Ryloth, not protect it. Shaking his head, Dager quickly found Ragu, and showed him the message. From what General Skywalker said at the start, Ragu fished out something that Dager hadn't noticed. General Skywalker talked specifically to Ragu, not General D. That meant the Jedi Council, and, consequently, the Republic, already knew that the Jedi was dead. And General D's death meant the death of the 303rd. As such, the Jedi Council had to be confident in their ability to take back Ryloth, knowing that they wouldn't have a lot of support from the ground. What do you think about Master Skywalker's request? The newly appointed commander frowned hard, and grimaced in pain when the small movement caused the cuts and wounds in his head hurt. His scar was red and swollen, because it had opened again more than once during the many battles. That was one of the reasons why he was using his helmet less recently. It is dangerous. We have 58 troopers in condition to fight. It probably is enough to take on a small garrison. Besides, we don't have to hold it, just make sure that gunships can land. From there onwards, the job will be in the 501st hands. I feel a butt. What is it? We will have to time it perfectly. Dager pulled out his hologram projector again, and showed a diagram and a map of Nabot. The city wasn't as big as Lesu, but it was still huge. However, Dager wasn't focused on it, but on the relay station outside it. It was 50 kilometers away from the town, and would be ideal for the Republic troops to land. If we take it too late, the gunships will be gunned down. If we attack too early, Tambor's forces on Nabot will come to reinforce it, and we will all be eliminated. Is it possible to take down the clankers in there without alerting Nabot? I doubt it. According to our data, and that is a few days old, so a lot could have changed, there should be roughly 120 sepis. With 60 clones, we can take them easily, but it will be difficult to do that silently. If it is just Hell Squad, though. 
with brain and three four badly wounded, you are two men short. Besides, you are a commander now. I need you here. We will do as you said, and attack it when the time is right. For now. Um. We have to leave we are too far from Nabat, and we need to be ready to invade that relay base at any moment. Also. Sindulla is probably going to be angry with you, right? You shouldn't bother with him, General. But you also know I can't do that. I'm a Jedi, Dager. Or I will be someday. The clone said nothing. Ragu seemed to be reminiscent of something, and Dager wouldn't be the one to intrude upon his thoughts. Dager could feel Sindulla's hatred when the Trilek glanced at them as the clones left the hideout. He couldn't believe how stupid Sindulla was. Just like any clone soldier, Dager wouldn't voice his thoughts unless he was specifically asked to do so, but even he felt like arguing. The 303rd had lost literally everything, from their fleet, to their commander, admiral, and general. And Sindulla blamed them, telling Ragu that they had betrayed Ryloth. Unfortunately for Dager, he was too disciplined to actually do that. As such, he and the other clones could only leave with Ragu, which was kind of a relief to them. Although the other Trileks didn't seem to blame them for anything, they didn't like to be amidst civilians. Before they left, Shoyuta ran up to Dager to say her goodbyes. Just like any kid, the little girl had no idea of all the politics involved behind the 303 RD's departure. Gobi, her father, shook Dager's hand before they left. He was one of the few Trileks who Dager liked. It was a pity this was probably the last time Dager would see the two of them. It took two days for the clones to get to their new location. It was a cave, and a not very big one, but it fitted 197 clones well enough. 3-4, I want you and Brain to stay, and take care of the wounded. Understood. Shield, you are coming with us. We did this a hundred times before. We gotta be quick, and hit the clankers fast. We have one shot at it. Don't worry, Commander. You said it yourself. We have done it a hundred times before. Dager chuckled, and patted Lieutenant Shield's shoulder. Soon, however, his expression became serious again. It was rare to see Dager smile before, even more these days. We have to be careful, Lieutenant. I don't want to lose anyone more, okay? I understand, sir. Then, get everything prepared. We are taking all those who can fight. The others will stay here, and take care of the wounded. Get ready to go at any moment. As if waiting for Dager to say that, several Republic ships appeared in space. It wasn't a lot, but Dager could clearly see the 501st symbol on them. Soon, he spotted several starfighters aiming for the Lukerhulk class battleship that was the core of the Separatist blockade. Dager was almost sure he saw a Jedi starfighter leading the Republic forces. For a few minutes, the Republic V-Wings simply crushed the enemy vultures. The clones next to him cheered, and even Ragu smiled. Frowning, Dager saw the starfighters getting closer and closer to the Separatist blockade, seemingly unopposed. Something was wrong. A Separatist fleet capable of crushing the 303rd, even though they were already severely weakened, shouldn't be suppressed so easily. Then, Dager saw two things, and so did the soldiers beside him as they put their hands down. Firstly, he saw a squadron get too cocky, and approach the Lukerhulk class battleship. Well, maybe that was their plan all along. That was how General Skywalker liked to fight. Secondly, Dager watched as four Providence class dreadnoughts that were on the other side of the planet started to move. And then he knew what was wrong. Chapter 224 Short Distance Hyperspace Travel Entering and leaving hyperspace in a split second, just enough to travel less than half a parsec. Basically, it is enough for someone to go from one side of a planet to another. It was also a very dangerous and highly costly move. Such type of travel used the same amount of fuel as any long-distance one, sometimes even more. It was also risky because, since it was almost instant, it would shake the entire structure of a ship. Smaller ships would instantly fall apart, and bigger ones would suffer a lot. But that wasn't the worst of it. 
By using short-distance hyperspace travel, anything that hit the ship when it came out of hyperspace would have the same impact as a laser cannon shot. And, considering that Ryloth's surroundings were currently filed with debris, one could imagine how big the chances of accidents happening were. But the Separatist gamble paid off. After all, they had tactical droids, and their circuits were programmed to deal with situations like this. They calculated where the dreadnoughts would arrive perfectly, and, aside from a few holes in their shields, the ships were almost intact. And that was where General Skywalker's plan failed. He wasn't able to see two things. Firstly, he couldn't scan the fleet around the planet, so he failed to notice there were more enemy ships. Secondly, no one would have ever thought that the Separatist commander would be crazy enough to use short-distance hyperspace travel. Even for the Separatist and the Trade Federation, dreadnoughts weren't cheap. That isn't good. General Skywalker should retreat. He won't be able to break through now. This. Isn't Master Skywalker. What? What do you mean, General? Ragu frowned, and looked up. Following his gaze, the clones saw the small squadron that was attacking the Lukerholt-class battleship push on forward. What are they doing? They are being cut off. While Cell was questioning the mental state of the clone pilots, Dajer looked at Regu. The Padawan had an expression of horror in his face. Who is leading this squadron, General? I feel. I think it is Master Skywalker's Padawan, Ahsoka Tano. I feel her presence. I mean, Commander Tano. Why would she be leading the attack? Master Skywalker must want to train her, just like Master D once trained me. She is just like I was. Just like I was on Dantuin, with Kuvu. Well, Ryloth isn't exactly the best training grounds for a new Padawan. She has to fall back, otherwise they are all going to die. Unfortunately, there was nothing the few dozen troops on the ground could do. It didn't take long for the first starfighters to blew up, and the Republic fleet also started taking heavy damage. Almost hesitantly, the starfighters got back to their cruisers, not without losses. It all happened so fast. Firstly, it seemed like the Republic was winning, and in the next minutes, they were forced to run away with heavy losses, leaving several starfighters and one cruiser behind, to increase the amount of debris around Ryloth. The clones watched silently as their hopes were crushed. It was almost impossible to believe it. The Republic's attempt to save Ryloth lasted less than an hour. I is. Is that it? General Skywalker's capital ship was hit. I doubt they have the strength to fight the Seppies. I guess we don't have to attack that relay station now. Tech analyzed the battle better than any of the others. Small discussions filled the clone group. After so many battles, they had long learned that it was better not to underestimate the Separatist. Commander Tano, unfortunately, was too inexperienced to know that. Dajer looked at the troopers, and glanced back at Ragu. His meaning was clear. Ragu was now their general, and there were times that he should speak up to his troops. The Padawan nodded, and turned to the clones, who instantly stopped talking and entered formation. At ease. The first attempt of the 501st have failed, but if I know Master Skywalker, he will be back soon. For now, we stay put, to when he needs us. We have been in Ryloth for a long time already, a few more days won't make a difference. Dajer, Shield, you know your roles. The clones waited for a long time, ready to invade the relay station. However, the 501st didn't come back that day. When night arrived, Ragu ordered the troopers to go to sleep. General Skywalker wouldn't attack today. Dajer stood on guard that night. Usually, commanders wouldn't be on guard duty, but he insisted. Commander Keeley did that when he was still alive, and Dajer followed his example. It was a way to show the soldiers that although he was an officer, he was still one of them. When his shift was almost over, he heard footsteps behind him. His hands reached for his vibroblade and his DC-17, but when he turned around, he saw it was just brain. His brother saw him slowly moving his hand back, and nodded towards it. Things aren't good, are they, Commander? Ark. I still hadn't got used to you calling me Commander. It doesn't feel right. 
Brain knew Deja was deviating from the subject, but he didn't point it out. Other clones might not notice it, but Brain knew Deja was under a heck more pressure than he showed. The clone never let the others see his weak side, when he doubted their chances of survival, and, worse, when he doubted himself. The nightmares are getting worse, aren't they? That is why you insisted on doing a guard shift. Dager didn't deny it. It was only with Hell Squad, and especially Brain, that he could tell the truth, and didn't need to show a strong facade. After all, the six clones knew him better than anyone else. Their bond wasn't something normal troopers had. It was forged by months of constant war and death. The day General D died. The voice got stronger. It was. Happy. Happy that a Jedi died. And, for a moment, I felt happy too. Why, brain? Why do we dream that every night? We are soldiers, created to fight for the Jedis. For the Republic. Why would we want it to end? Why would we want to destroy the Jedi? We don't want to, sir. It is just nightmares, that's all it is. Dajer frowned, looking at the moons over Ryloth. He wished Brain was right. He wanted Brain to be right. But his feelings told him that wasn't the case. There was something else to the nightmares. He just didn't know what. With a sigh, he put his arm around Brain's shoulder, careful not to touch the bandages around his head and neck, which were covering his injury. What? What will happen with us, Commander? I mean, if General Skywalker is able to take back Ryloth. I have no doubt we will leave this planet, Brain. For better or for worse, our job here is done. There is nothing much we can do. The 303rd was destroyed. We will be divided amongst other legions. That is the normal procedures. As for Hell Squad. We are different. You know that. And what about General Ragu? He is a Jedi. They have their own ways. Remember, Brain, we are soldiers. And this war isn't over yet. It won't be over for a long time. We will avenge General D and Commander Keeley, no matter what. Chapter 225 Dajer woke up drenched in sweat. After his guard shift last night had ended, he had returned to his tent, his talk with Brain still on his mind. Unfortunately for him, the nightmares didn't go away. In fact, they became stronger. The hatred, the pain, the suffering. Dajer couldn't take it. Around him, he saw that many troopers were already awake, sitting on the ground, polishing their weapons. It seemed he wasn't the only one who was facing problems to sleep. He got up, and picked up his helmet and blasters. Going outside the cave, he used his macro binoculars to spy on the relay station. It was still the same, with a few patrols outside, mostly B-1 units, with a few B-2 super battle droids here and there. Cell, come outside. Using his comm link, Dager quickly contacted the scout. Cell had been out last night, with another trooper, to get closer to the target under the cover of darkness. Now, it was time to report. Dager totally disregarded the fact that the clone would be exhausted. They were at war, there was rarely time to rest. Right away, Commander. Soon, the clone arrived. His armor was dusty and battered, the paint that covered it scratched and with several black spots. Cell was still limping a little, thanks to his strained tendons from when a grenade launched him away. It wasn't a pretty sight at the time, and for some time, he didn't wake up, worrying Dager and the others. However, Cell wasn't one to go down so quietly, and as soon as he got up, he was back into the action. That was a few days ago already, when Commander Keeley and General D were still alive. Shaking his head, Dajer couldn't help but think of how everything reminded him of his two superiors. He was a lot more attached to them than he himself knew. Report. It is still the same, sir. Top Notch and I got pretty close to it, but we couldn't see anything of importance. The Seppi seem to be slacking on their security, though. The number of clankers is still the same, but their patrols are more sparse. I also wouldn't be worried after the disaster from yesterday. They probably think the Republic won't be able to even land a foot on Ryloth. Will we, sir? 
Of course. The Seppis aren't the only ones who have lots of troops. It will be painful and costly, but the Republic will get Ryloth back. Sel said nothing. War wasn't fair. War wasn't beautiful. It was dark and horrifying, and he knew that well enough. He had no illusions that the Separatist would give up Ryloth easily, not after the price the 303rd made they pay to get it. And he also had no illusions that if the price for the Republic became too great, the Senate wouldn't hesitate to abandon the few survivors of the 303rd. Permission to rest, sir. Grab as much sleep as you can. Tonight, I need you to take me to have a look at the relay station. You are having one of your ideas, aren't you, Commander? Dajer chuckled. The members of Hell Squad really knew him too well. He couldn't hide any of his thoughts from them. Yes, I am. Ha! I can't wait for it. Dajer shook his head. However, Sel's cheerfulness opened his eyes. With a Republic fleet nearby, and a clear plan on his mind, things weren't looking so glum anymore. The nights in Ryloth were always bright, thanks to the two moons that spun around the planet. This night, however, clouds covered the sky, blocking the light, and shrouding the planet in darkness. It was perfect for Dajer and Cell's scout mission. There it is, sir. Dajer lowered his macro binoculars, the green light helping him see in the dark. It was just as Cell said. The droids were patrolling in their normal groups of six, but there were big empty spaces between each patrol, more than enough for a small squad of clones to get by. Clearly, the commander of the relay station, probably a droid captain, wanted to save their batteries. Dajer had spent a few months struggling to understand how droids could become lazy like that, but since it happened all the time, and it was good for the Republic, he decided to just leave it be. Do you see something, Commander? Cell, hearing Dajer mumble, followed his line of sight, but couldn't find what interested his squad leader. You see those hatches? Now knowing what he was looking for, Cell quickly found the railings Dajer was looking at. However, upon seeing it, he frowned. It's the ventilation system. You are not thinking of using it to get in, are you, sir? It is too small for us. Dajer frowned. Cell was right. However, he had someone else in mind for the task. He just didn't know if Ragu would be willing. Ragu was willing. In fact, the young Jedi congratulated Dajer for thinking of such plan. In no moment he said anything about how dangerous it would be, being all by himself inside the vents of a separatist base. Together, Commander and General devised the rest of the plan. It would be ideal if they could contact General Skywalker, to ask when he would attack again. However, they wouldn't have this advantage. Luckily for them, when the 501st attacked again, five days after the first attempt, it was night on this side of Ryloth. Using the cover of the darkness, Ragu sneaked past the droids, and entered the vents. Dajer and the others would wait for his signal to attack. For a ventilation system, Ragu thought it was surprisingly hot. However, he had to admit that Dajer's plan was good. He could think of at least ten situations in the past that he could have done that. Captain, the Republic. Scum is attacking again. How many ships? Hum. Just one. One. Puny Republic efforts are nothing to our. Blockade. Ragu could hear a clanker reporting to the droid captain in charge of the relay station, however, but he couldn't see them. For a moment, he wondered why there was only one ship attacking. However, he also knew that now was the perfect time for the 303rd to do their job. Commander, start the party. With pleasure, General Ragu. As he heard the first laser shots being fired outside, Ragu chuckled at how promptly Deja responded to his order to attack, and pulled out his lightsaber. The droid captain and the B-1 unit which came to report were surprised to see a green light sever a piece of the vents. It was also the last thing they saw. When Dajer heard Ragu's order, he didn't hesitate to attack, paying no heed to the battle in the sky above, so he didn't notice that only one badly damaged Republic cruiser was slowly approaching the blockade. He lifted his DC-15A, and took aim. Next to him, the fifty or so clones who were laying prone also got up. 
the nearby clankers who spotted them didn't last long. Now, lads. Move up to the building. After taking out the patrols in a split second, they ran to the relay station. Dejer took out two of the droids guarding the door, and heard a trooper curse near him. Looking back briefly, he saw that the wound wasn't deadly, and ignored it. The trooper knew what to do. Arriving near the door, he crushed the control panel with his blaster, and the door opened. Instantly, he saw several dozen droids running towards him. Grinning, he dropped down to let the soldiers behind him fire without worrying about hitting their commander. Chapter 226 Dejer felt the heat of the lasers flying over his head. The moment he dropped to the ground, he didn't fire at the droids, but rolled to the side. His instincts were proven right, because several red lasers hit the spot he was in before. The droids were taken down pretty quickly, overwhelmed by the 303rd. All the clones who had survived up till now were not just elites. They were better than any other legion in the galaxy. They didn't miss a shot, they didn't make mistakes. Every laser that left their blasters meant a droid less in the Separatist army. Getting up, Dager stepped over the bodies of the droids. They had lost two clones at the doorway, but most of them made it through. What followed was a simple cleaning operation for the 303rd. They swept the relay station room by room, killing the droids fast and efficiently. In less than an hour, there were no droids left. Dab, take a few men and wait outside. I want to know the moment our ships break through the blockade or the clanker's reinforcements arrives, whatever happens first. Cell, go with him. Come, Cell. Right away. Tech, find General Ragu for me. Okay, Commander. Metal, how many did we lose? The heavy machine gunner approached Dager and took off his helmet, revealing a very familiar face. Metal looked around, and after confirming his report was right, he turned to Dager. 13, Commander. We also have a few slight injuries, but nothing too serious. Dager frowned hard. Having just 13 casualties and taking over a base with a droid garrison of over a hundred clankers were incredibly good numbers. Still, Dager didn't like the feeling of losing more of his brothers, not after he had already lost so many. I take you had no problems with the droid garrison. In the latter half, we were finding more sliced droids than living ones. Ragu chuckled. Obviously, he was quite proud of his work, and he had every right to be. At least fifty clankers were eliminated by him alone. Looking at the halves of the droid captain, Dager picked up a piece of scrap metal, and crossed a line on his armor. General, Commander, you have to come outside. The 501st did it. Dager had no idea at what he was looking at. When he went out, he expected to see an entire Republic fleet, but what greeted him was one cruiser, in flames, landing. Looking past the ship, he saw the remains of another cruiser, and surprisingly, found out that the Lukerholt-class battleship and the dreadnoughts were also destroyed. What happened? Where is the 501st fleet? Ragu asked the question that was on Dager's mind, but he was unable to answer it. Calling Dab over, he asked the sniper what happened. I am quite confused, sir. I knew General Skywalker was crazy, but not that. Dab stopped before he could finish the sentence, only now realizing he shouldn't be calling a superior crazy. However, what happened before had astonished him just too much. Ragu, however, gestured to him, showing the clone that it wasn't a big deal. Tell me what happened, Dab. Well. At first, just one cruiser came out of hyperspace. However, instead of battling, it just flew towards the Looker Hulk. It looked like it was surrendering. Then, it suddenly accelerated, and crashed in the Looker Hulk, breaking it in two. And when this cruiser came out of hyperspace, Dab gestured to the approaching cruiser. Now that it was closer, they could see that although it appeared to be in a bad shape, the only damage that it actually received was to its belly. The rest of the cruiser seemed fine. It turned sideways. I never saw anything like that. The rest was easy. Fighters and bombers took down their ships. Well, it is not much of a fleet. Maybe not, General, but they took down the blockade. 
And if General Skywalker was confident enough to sacrifice one of his cruisers, then he must be sure there is help on the way. Probably Master Kenobi. The last time my master talked with the Jedi Council, they said Master Kenobi's fleet would soon be free to help. Maybe. We will need to talk to General Skywalker. About everything. I know, Dager. Let's go meet him. Dager was surprised by how quickly and determinately Ragu answered. Only when he saw the Padawan's trembling fists did he understand that Ragu wasn't nearly as calm as he was showing. Straightening his back, Dager took off his helmet, and held it under his arm, with his DC-15A on his other hand. Watching the cruiser land, and the lower ramp open, he called his men. 303rd Attack Legion of the Republic, on me. Troopers scurried forward, and formed up in front of him and Ragu. The Padawan gestured at Dager to give his speech. Troopers, men of the Republic. We have fought bravely. And we lost too much. But now, our duty here in Ryloth is over. Ryloth will be ours again, thanks to the brave sacrifices of our brothers. Now, it is time for you to rest. Let the 501st take over. You did well, my brothers. Deja knew it wasn't the most inspiring speech, but he didn't mean it to be. They were way past the point of lying to the clones, telling them everything would be all right. But now, he could at least promise them that their fight on Ryloth was over. The Clone Wars were still raging on, but the commander was sure his few men would get some time out of the war. Forty-four troopers stood in front of him, lined up, their helmets under their arms just like Dager. They weren't a large force, but dozens of dead droids surrounded them, making for an impressive sight. When General Skywalker and his Padawan Ahsoka stepped out of their only remaining cruiser, they were greeted by about fifty clones. Captain Rex, who was following behind them, stopped for a moment, hesitantly. Just by looking at the dirty, scarred, and damaged armors, he knew what had happened to the 303rd. And he knew that the troopers before them were all that was left of the once mighty legion. General Skywalker walked forwards, and put his hand on Ragu's shoulder. He could see that Tigruta was trying to be strong, but deep down, he was afraid. All the sadness from the past few days and weeks was boiling inside him. As such, General Skywalker decided not to talk about war matters right now. Ragu. I am so sorry for your loss. Master D was a great Jedi, and he will be missed. T thank you, Master Skywalker. Snips, take Ragu to the ship. We need to get you back to Coruscant, young one. Ragu looked at General Skywalker and then looked back to Dager. He wanted to ask what would be made of his troops, but Dager nodded at him, instigating him to go. For a moment, it looked like they were friends, not an officer and his superior. And that is because they were friends. Ragu had long considered Dager more than just a soldier. You should go, General. We will see you soon. Ragu nodded, and followed Ahsoka, disappearing inside the ship. As Dager looked at his general's back, he heard the sound of several ships coming out of hyperspace. Looking up, he saw several Republic cruisers. It would take time, and the price would be hefty, but Ryloth would belong to the Republic once again. General D, Commander Keeley, Admiral Dow. Their sacrifices weren't in vain. The 303 RD's sacrifice wasn't in vain. Chapter 227 after he sent Ragu and Ahsoka to the cruiser, General Skywalker stared at the clones before him. Forty-five soldiers, including the one leading them, who he recognized as the sub-commander Dager. His different armor gave it away. Over his right shoulder pad and arm, there were several uniform lines. They were very similar to the ones Captain Rex had on his helmet. Walking down the ramp, with Captain Rex by his side, he stopped in front of Dager. An ugly scar, red and swollen, covered the right side of the clone's face crossing over his eye. Other small scars and bruises covered his face and neck, at least ten of them. Dager saluted him, as did the other troopers, but it was clear that they were hesitant. Subcommander Dager. Where is the rest of your legion? His words caused the clone to stutter, and take a heavy breath, before letting out a sigh. Lowering his hand, Dager looked past General Skywalker, past the cruiser, and past many mountains and valleys, 
to a place that thousands of his brothers gave their lives to defend. We are it, General Skywalker. 185 troopers, of which 141 are critically injured, and unable to battle. Also. I am a commander now. It took a few seconds for General Skywalker to process what Deja was saying. An entire legion, 30,000 men, wiped out. That was unheard of. He knew that General D had died, but he didn't think the entire legion would be gone. And, since Deja was now a commander, that meant Commander Keeley had also perished. I see. Then, Commander Deja, we should get your men inside the cruiser. They probably need medical attention urgently. That is true, General. Lieutenant Shield, get on with that. Also, Commander Deja, the 501st will be retreating for now. We suffered heavy losses in this battle, and Admiral Yellerin was badly injured. Master Kenobi and Master Windu will take over from here. You can leave the ground assault to them. You and your men are going back to Coruscant. Dajer looked at the troopers behind him. They were all tired, battered up, and dispirited. He couldn't deny them the rest they deserved, nor the treatment to their wounds. With a nod, the clones started to board the cruiser. As soon as they were out of sight from their superiors, they dropped their blasters and sat on the floor. They lost everything, but this battle was finally over. More would come, but that was a problem for the future. General Skywalker and Captain Rex waited for the 303rd to board, saying nothing. Only when they two were about to enter the cruiser, did they notice that Dajer and six other clones weren't following them. Aren't you coming? Dajer looked at his squad. During the time the wounded were being moved, Brain and 3-4 had joined him and the others, and Hell Squad's ranks were filled up. Glancing at the very similar faces, he saw them nodding at him. They knew what he was planning, and they were more than willing to follow him. Hell Squad still has a job to finish here in Ryloth. Oh. And what job is that? Get rid of every clanker on the planet. For the 303rd. General Skywalker glanced at them, clearly feeling the hatred that Dajer and the others held for the Separatist. Still, he didn't stop them or order them to go back to Coruscant, although that was what he should have done. Dajer always felt that General Skywalker understood the clones better than the other Jedis. The young Jedi didn't seem to hold revenge and anger as terrible feelings. You do you, Commander. But you would better report to Master Windu once he lands. He won't like it. I understand, sir. And, thank you, sir. General Skywalker nodded, and walked up the ramp. The clones from the 501st didn't even set a foot on Ryloth, but nobody could blame them. Their job was to break the blockade, and that they did. Good luck, brother. Thanks, Captain. We will see you back at Coruscant before you know it. Captain Rex nodded, and followed his general. Soon, the lower ramp of the cruiser closed, and Hell Squad got away from it so it could take off. Commander, do you think General Ragu will be all right? It will take time, but he will. He is a Jedi, after all. And what about us? We fight. We are soldiers, after all. Now, stop asking questions, and prepare to receive General Kenobi in General Windu. The Republic set camp near the relay station that the 303rd had taken over. During the night, a few thousand droids tried to attack them, but were easily defeated by the clones. The counterattack of the Republic started the next morning, as troops were deployed all over the planet. Gruesome battles and the fires of war took over Ryloth once again, as the Separatists countered the Republic offense with their vicious tactics. And it was only later that day that Hell Squad got the chance to meet with General Windu, General Kenobi was already off to a battle somewhere on the planet, they couldn't meet with the Jedi before because Brain and 3-4 could barely walk properly. However, after being treated in a back to tank for one night, they were ready for battle again. In fact, not only them, but most of Hell Squad went to the back to tanks. Now, their wounds still hurt, and their scars were still closing up, but that wouldn't stop them from fighting. Commander Dajer. Take me to General Windu, Trooper. Hell Squad followed the 91st Trooper around at TES and at RTS, until they arrived in front of General Windu. 
The Jedi was talking to Commander Pons, whom Dager hadn't seen since Geonosis. Commander Dager. General Windu, Commander Pons. Commander Pons stepped aside, and let General Windu face Dager. As always, the general had a serious expression, as if nothing could make him smile. He looked at Dager frowning, probably wondering why the clone was still in Ryloth. Commander Dager. Skywalker contacted me, and said you and your squad wanted to stay behind. Why is that? The Seppis eliminated my legion, sir. My commander, my general. Hell Squad won't leave Ryloth before they are kicked out of here. General Windu frowned even harder, and looked at Commander Pons. The clone, however, decided not to give his opinion, and stayed quiet. Hell Squad will be leaving Ryloth in the next transport. Look at your men, Commander. Look at yourself. You are in no condition to battle. The Jedi might have been right, but he didn't understand. For once on his life, Dager willingly defied the orders of a superior officer. We can't leave, General. General D died for Ryloth. The 303rd was destroyed for Ryloth. I would be betraying all of my brothers if I left without seeing this battle to its end. Ryloth will be taken back, I guarantee you. Now, Commander Dager, go to nearest transport, and leave this planet. I won't let one of the best units the Republic have be destroyed because of your stubbornness. Dager said nothing, but he also didn't move. General Windu stared at him, and he stared back. He and Hell Squad had long decided that they would either be there when Ryloth was conquered, or die on the planet. They owned that to General D and Commander Keeley. Didn't you hear me, Trooper? You have your orders, so get him OV. 30,000, General. That is how many 303rd troopers died for Ryloth. And I knew every single one of them. They were my brothers. Chapter 228 30,000, General. That is how many troopers died for Ryloth. And I knew every single one of them. They were my brothers. As Dager said that, every clone in the vicinity looked at him in shock. Not because of the numbers he brought up, after all they already knew that, but because he had interrupted General Windu. Not only was he a Jedi, but he was also one of the highest ranking ones, only under General Yoda. Even General Windu himself seemed surprised. After five months of war, he had grown used to clones only listening and doing everything he ordered. He rarely saw one of them defy the discipline ingrained in their genetic code, like Dager was doing now. I know that, and I am sorry for your loss, Commander, but this is war. Losses are to be expected. What isn't expected, is a trooper being disrespectful to your superior officer, do you understand? I do, sir. But with all due respect, there is no sense in sending Hell Squad away. You said yourself that we are one of the best units the Republic have. General Windu didn't know how to answer to that statement. Hell Squad might be in a bad shape, its armor in shambles, and its members hurt, but it still was better than any other unit the 91st had. No matter how much he disliked having to admit it, but they really would be of great help. However, as a Jedi, he would never let a wounded person get in danger, whatsoever fight in a war. There will be plenty for Hell Squad to do later, Commander. I understand your feelings, but you can't let yourself be overtaken by hatred and revenge. This isn't a path anyone should follow. Dager shook his head. Just like General D, General Windu, or any other Jedi, for what matters, wouldn't ever understand how a clone felt. He could see Commander Pons looking as to him, shaking his head. The clone wanted him to stop before it was too late. But Dager couldn't. He had made a promise to General D, and he could only fulfill it by being there. Maybe it isn't the Jedi's way, General. But since the first clone died on Geonosis, revenge has been more than enough for any of us. Every clone held their breath. Dager was talking, but he didn't mean what he was saying. Or, at least, he wasn't talking to General Windu. He was talking about the dreams. General Windu, of course, didn't know that. He assumed Dager was talking about the way of the Jedis, and disrespecting him. Commander Dager, you should be careful with what you say. I never meant any disrespect, 
General. But, whether you allow it or not, Hell Squad is going to partake in this battle. Now Dager wasn't just being disrespectful. He was going against the orders of his superior. That was insubordination, plain and simple. General Windu was just as surprised as the troopers, and became enraged. You are going against the orders of a general, commander. Do you know what are the consequences of that? I do, general. If you order me arrested, I won't resist. But Hell Squad has sworn to fight for the Republic. And at the moment, Ryloth is a battlefield, and a very personal one to us. So, even if you command us to go, I regret to say that we can't follow. General Windu stared at Dager for a long time, and the clones of the 91st tensed up, waiting for Commander Pons to give the order to arrest Hell Squad. As much as they agreed with Dager, if they were given the order, they would follow it. General. Commander Pons looked at General Windu, waiting, but the Jedi gestured for him and his men to stand down. Dager was being insubordinate and disrespectful, but none of what he said was wrong. Very well. If you wish to continue on this war, then I will allow it. You are, after all, soldiers. I won't hold you for your insubordination today, Commander, but you better be careful next time. I understand, General. Commander Pons, let's go. We have a city to take. Hell Squad wouldn't be part of the heavy group led by General Windu. Using ATS and walkers, the 91st would carve a path to Nabit, where what Tambor currently was. It wouldn't be easy, but it was necessary. Hell Squad, on the other hand, would be part of the group attacking Lesu, together with the 212th. More than a week had passed, and the 212th had finally arrived in front of Lesu. General Kenobi and his legion had gone through a lot, including fighting not only clankers, but also native predators. However, they had also accomplished much, and had not only destroyed the tactical droid responsible for Lesu's defenses, but also had freed up a bunch of Trilek civilians who were being forced to work as human shields. Of course, Hell Squad hadn't been idle this whole time. Together with some troopers of both the 91st and 212th, they cleared out all clankers around Lesu. Now, the roles had switched, and those defending the important towns were the separatist, while the Republic was attacking. That had both advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages were obvious. The 303rd made the droids pay a hefty price to take any of the cities, and the Sepis would do everything they could to get their payback. However, the Republic had one advantage, and that was Hell Squad. So, Commander Dager, what do you think are our options here? Hell Squad stood in front of General Kenobi. During the last few days, they had been in constant battle, burning a few scratches to their already battered armor. Now, it was almost impossible to recognize the patterns that identified each of them. The red dust of Ryloth that was glued to the armor, however, made for a camouflage better than any other. Well, there is the hard way and the dangerous way here, General. General Kenobi lifted an eyebrow, and looked at Dager. Both options seemed pretty similar and unwelcoming. Explain. The hard way is bombarding the city until we get the bridge back up. It will take time, and the clankers won't be quiet while we do that. And the dangerous way? I defended this city for a few days, until Tram Chalk betrayed us and let the Seppies inside. I know exactly what to do and where to go to get Ray Bridge up and running. But, to do that, we first have to get to the city. And, the only way to do that is. Climbing, right? I had a feeling you would say that. What do you think, Cody? The commander approached. He had a scar very similar to Dager's, but his came from a piece of metal, not a lightsaber. Both of them were lucky to have survived. It won't be easy. That is why Hell Squad is here. It will be difficult, but we can do it. I agree with Dager. If we can take ten or so men, and get inside Lesu, it will make our lives much easier. However, it will also take time. We have to first go down on this side, then climb the other. Dager was nodding when he looked at his belt, and an idea came to his mind. He grinned. His plan had just gotten a lot worse. Not necessarily. Chapter 229 Not necessarily. 
General Kenobi's eyebrows arched even more when he heard Dager. He couldn't help but think that the commander was a little out of his mind when he pulled out his DC-17. What could the pistol do to help them? What do you have in mind, Dager? I don't think you were in the battles of Thule and Alaris Prime, were you, Cody? I was in Felucia at the time, on a special mission. Well, Commander Keeley and I used the grappling hooks a lot on those battles, to climb up the walls the Seppies built. From there on, it became quite natural for Hell Squad, but I know other legions don't use them nearly as much. I see. You know, Dager, you and Anakin would get along pretty well. Commander Cody opened his mouth. He already knew what Dager's plan was, and he didn't like it. However, before he could say anything, General Kenobi was already agreeing, and Commander Cody had to go along. Get a few men ready, Cody. No more than five. Together with Hell Squad, we will be more than ten, and I don't want to risk getting the droid's attention with a large group. You are coming too, General. Well, of course I am. This is our best chance, and I have no doubt a Jedi will come in handy. Right, Dager? Sure thing, General Kenobi. Well, no time to waste. As soon as you are ready, let's go. Kick back, stop, dingo, come here. Waxer and boil, you too. Soon, five 212th troopers approached them. They saluted Commander Cody and General Kenobi, then turned and did the same to Dager and Hell Squad. Judging by how they held themselves, and by how beaten up their armors were, Dager knew they were veteran soldiers. Grab grappling hooks, you five. General Kenobi has a mission for us. General Kenobi left to talk to some of his men. Since he and Commander Cody would be climbing the cliffs around Lesu, he had to leave someone in command of the offensive on the outside, to keep the droids distracted. That left the clones alone, and they could speak more freely with each other. Or, at least, Commander Cody and Dager, who had the same rank, could. You know you are crazy, right? Ha! Huh. We have to be. Otherwise we wouldn't be a special unit. Commander Cody laughed. He and Dager had known each other for a long time, and got along very well. It's good to have you back, brother. And. I will talk to General Kenobi, to see if we could get the men from the 303rd to join us. We lost some troopers, and I would be glad to have elite like them on our ranks. The smile on Dager's face faded, but he knew Commander Cody meant good. After all, even after the troopers who were injured healed, the 303rd would have less than a hundred clones who could fight. It wasn't official yet, but the 303rd attack legion would certainly be disbanded soon, and the few surviving troopers would be scattered around several legions. Thank you, Cody. Hell Squad, on me. We are going to check the best place to go down. Commander Cody nodded, and watched Hell Squad follow Dager to the border of the abyss between them and Lesu. Midway, he saw their sniper, Dab, pull out his DC-15X, while the scout, Cell, used his binoculars to keep a lookout for any clanker aiming at them. Are they really as good as it is said, Commander? Boyle approached Commander Cody, and couldn't help but ask. They all had heard of Hell Squad. In fact, almost every clone in the Republic Army had. They were an elite force, created in Geonosis. They had been to every corner of the galaxy, and faced everything from droids to the creatures of Scarif and from bounty hunters to Ventress. Sometimes, it was almost impossible to believe what was said about them. They are more than good, Boyle. The fact that they survived the annihilation of the 303rd proves it. But can they still fight? I mean, they look really bad right now. Kickback intertwined, gesturing to the figures of Hell Squad. It was understandable why he asked that. 3-4 was still limping slightly, Brain had bandages wrapped all around his head, and Tech's entire chest was bruised, and he had at least three broken ribs. Metal and Dab both had been shot in their shoulders and arms, and Cell in the thigh. Dager also wasn't looking too good. Thanks to the piece of metal that pierced his leg, also due to being shot, he too was limping. Of course, none of the bandages and wounds could be seen under the armor, but seasoned soldiers could tell that the clones under them were hurt. Not only that, 
but their armors looked like it had been thrown under a banta. That is because they are. You have been through a lot of battles yourself. You know that sometimes you have no option other than to fight, even when you are hurt. And Hell Squad had been doing that for more than a month. Don't worry about them. You will see what I mean when the time comes. General Kenobi loomed over the abyss, looking down. Behind him, Commander Cody, five clones from the 212th, and Hell Squad waited. Are you sure that is the best spot? Dager scouted it earlier. From here, we will be out of sight from the clankers in the walls. Before we use the cables, we need to go down a little, so they won't see us while we are crossing. General Kenobi looked down at the dark abyss once again. He could barely see the bottom of it. It would be a long, long fall. All right then. Let's get to it. No sense in wasting time. Saying so, he grabbed the cable that was hanging over the edge, and started climbing down, using it to steady himself. The others followed suit. At least to go down here, they wouldn't have to do free climbing. Going up on the other side, however, was an entirely different story. Dager was the last one to go. He grabbed the cable with one hand, and used his feet and his other hand to find grooves and slits to steady himself. This continued for more than half an hour, and the group kept going down without saying anything. Any wrong step could cause one of them to fall to their deaths, so they had to pay a lot of attention. At one time, Dager put his foot in the wrong spot, and slipped, forcing him to put his weight on his injured leg. He groaned in pain, but, but steadied himself. I think this should be enough. After another twenty minutes, he heard General Kenobi's voice. Stopping, he looked down, and saw the Jedi analyze the opposing wall of the abyss. Above General Kenobi, the clones flexed their fingers one hand at a time, trying to relax the tensed muscles. What do you think, Cody? That should do it, General. We are low enough so the Seppis won't see the cable when we launch it. Dager, you did this before. Would you do the honors? Dager thought for a moment that he never did something quite like that, but now wasn't the time to hesitate. Grabbing the DC-15A that was strapped to his back, he hooked his foot around the cable that he was holding, and took his hand off it. Chapter 230 For a second, Dager leaned forwards dangerously, as gravity tried to pull him down. However, he steadied himself with his feet, and quickly took aim. Finding a slit on the other side of the abyss, he calmly fired his blaster. Instead of a laser, a black cable was sent flying. The slit he aimed for was barely a meter wide, and was more than a hundred meters away, but he hit it perfectly. The hook opened, and penetrated the rock. On his end of the cable, Dager hammered it to the wall his side. After making sure it was firm enough, he pushed a button on the cable launcher, and the cable tightened up. Dager used one of his hands to pull it, and, after making sure it wasn't going to falter, he passed his blaster above it, and held the DC-15A with one hand on each end. Looking down, he saw General Kenobi nodding at him, and took a deep breath. Without hesitating anymore, he pushed himself off the wall. The journey to the other side was brief and slightly terrifying. Since the cable had to be angled downwards, Dager could see the abyss below him as he slid towards the wall. In less than ten seconds, he was already there. Before he crashed face first into the rocks, he put his feet up, and slowed down. Maintaining his legs bent, he put them against the wall, and stopped. He felt a sharp spike of pain, but it quickly went away. Finding somewhere to grab and hold, Dager pulled out another hook from his belt, and pierced it into the rocks, making a steady support for himself, and put a cable around it, tying himself. He wouldn't be able to use it all the way up, but at least now he could help the other clones who were sliding down the cable without worrying about falling. One by one, the troopers followed Dager. There was one tense moment when Stock's hand slipped, and he almost fell off in the midst of sliding down the cable. However, the clone was able to grab hold of the cable with his hand, although his blaster fell. He had to do the rest of the crossing by putting one hand after another, and when he finally got to the other side, he could barely move his arms. Thankfully, the droids didn't know they were there, so they had the luxury of resting. That is, if you could consider holding on to the side of a cliff resting. The last one to come was General Kenobi. 
graceful like all Jedi's were, he jumped before he even got to the end of the cable, and grabbed a groove on the rocks easily. After waiting for a few minutes, General Kenobi started climbing, and the clones looked at each other. Now that they were there, there was no retreat, but glancing up, Lesu seemed so distant that it looked like it was out of reach. Aren't you coming, troopers? You wouldn't let an old man like me be all by myself, right? Hearing General Kenobi, Hell Squad stuttered. The Jedi was already meters above them, climbing without any equipment as if it was nothing, and he was calling himself an old man. Let's move lads. We didn't come all the way here so you could appreciate the view. We are right behind you, Commander Dager. Detaching themselves from the safety of the hooks and cables, the clones started climbing. Surprisingly, it wasn't as difficult as they thought it would be. The irregular rocks gave them plenty of supports, and there were even some spots where they could stop and rest slightly. Still, climbing without the help of ropes or cables was difficult, and the wind didn't help. After climbing for more than an hour, they weren't even halfway done. What the? Suddenly, Dager heard a clone screaming. Looking down, he saw Dingo barely holding on to the cliffside with one hand. His other hand was holding something that looked like a bug. Dejah recognized it as a froder, an insect-like lizard that was usually inoffensive. Dingo, however, seemed to have put his hand inside the nest of the froder, and the creature had attacked him. Dingo swung his arm, launching the froder in the abyss, but the surprise attack made him lose his hold of the wall. His body leaned backwards, and his hands grabbed empty air as he tried to grip onto something. The others, including General Kenobi, could only stare at the poor clone as he fell, screaming. There was nothing they could do to help him, or they would also fall. The stunned clone stared at the spot where their brother had disappeared for a few seconds, before Commander Cody finally came back to his senses. Keep moving, boys. We still have a mission to complete. And be careful of where you put your hands. Dejer shook his head, and started climbing up again. He knew the chances of losing somebody during the climbing were high. He never expected Dingo to die because of a small creature like the Froder, but accidents happened, and sometimes they were lethal. Thankfully, they arrived at the top without losing anyone else. There were some close calls, but the clones were always able to steady themselves, sometimes with the help of General Kenobi. After two hours of climbing, even General Kenobi was tired. However, if they stayed outside the city like that, they would soon be found. So, they couldn't stop, and had to once again pull out their grappling hooks, but this time they would use it to climb up the wall around Lesu. To do that, however, they needed cover, or the Separatist would easily spot them. Start the attack on the east side. A few seconds after Commander Cody gave the order through his comlink, Dager saw huge blue lasers leaving the ATES on the other sides of the abyss, and impacting the all. It was far enough so it would distract the droids, but wouldn't hurt the small invading force. Now is our chance. Three cables were fired up, and the hooks went over the walls before catching into something. They didn't have the time to check if it was safe or not. When we get up there, don't fire unless it is necessary. The longer it takes for the droids to notice us, the better our odds get. Commander Cody, Dager, and General Kenobi were the first to go up. Thankfully, the attack the 212th was faking made the droid commander in Lesu divert his troops to defend against an attack. The few droids that saw the hooks were quickly cut down by General Kenobi. Dager and Commander Cody helped the other get up, and General Kenobi gestured for Dager to take the lead. Hell Squad stayed in Lesu for a few days, and knew the walls way better than him. The bridge controls are over there, in the tower. Our attack plan is quite simple. We have to get there, and get the bridge back up. Once we are inside the control room, defending it should be easy. Our major source of problems will be how to get there. There should be more than a thousand droids on the way. We should have thought of that before. Quiet, Cell. Do you have a plan to slip past the droids, Dager? There are two options, General. Either we go down the wall, and try to sneak through the buildings, or we can go on the offensive up here. We probably should go to the city. It will take longer, but it will be safer. General Kenobi played with his beard, 
and looked at the city below them. Deja already that would be his answer, and he already had a counter to it. I wouldn't bet on that, General Kenobi. Last time, we were betrayed by some of the freedom fighters. I have no doubt that some of the civilians would hesitate to turn us in. Chapter 231 General Kenobi analyzed their options. Deja was right when he said they couldn't totally believe the Trilex. He could feel a lot of fear in Lesu, and fear was a path to many darker emotions. Deja is right, General. Civilians are too easily swayed. Before we take the city, they won't believe us, and will prefer to trust the Sepis, even if that means living in fear. That happened more than once since the war started. The Jedi caressed his beard, frowning. Neither plan was perfect, but he trusted Commander Cody. If the clone was telling him that it was better to use brute strength to get past, then he believed him. Let's not waste any time then. Commander Dager, you will lead the way. Cody, Waxer, and Kickback, you are the rear guard. Pay attention to any droids that might come behind us. Still, the big threat should be the droids in front of us. Understood, General. Dager grabbed his blaster, and crouched. He started running, staying as low as possible. Behind him, Hell Squad and General Kenobi followed. A few seconds later, he saw a section of the wall, already damaged from the battle when the Republic was on the defending side, crumble and fall, taking down several dozen droids with it. It was almost at this moment too that the first droids came to their sight. There were seven of them, B-1 units. Apparently, fearing an all-out attack by the Republic, the droids had concentrated near the gates of the city. Just a few scattered patrols remained on the way. On one hand, it was good, because it meant that they would face less opposition until they got near the bridge controls. On the other hand, they would have to face all those droids before they could get to the control room. Well, there was nothing they could do other than go along with the flow. Dager gestured for them to slow down, and the members of Hell Squad instinctively walked forward, leaving General Kenobi behind. The Jedi looked at them quite surprised, since he would usually be the one on the front, after all, he had a lightsaber. Hell Squad, however, didn't need his help. Seven droids, seven clones. Dager pulled out his vibroblade, and, when he was twenty meters away from the unsuspecting droids, started running. The clankers heard him, and turned around, but Hell Squad was already on them. Slashing down, Dager sent the head of one of the droids flying in the air. The other clones used their normal strategy of putting their blasters around the droids' necks, and twisting, breaking their joints. In a few seconds, the seven droids were dead, and it was all done without a noise. The clones from the 212th watched in awe, finally understanding why Commander Cody said they shouldn't underestimate Hell Squad just because they were hurt. Six more groups of droids were eliminated using the same tactic before something went wrong. One of the droids was able to let a shot out of his blaster before being eliminated, and that alerted the other clankers. Usually, a laser fired in the midst of a battle of this proportion wouldn't attract much attention, after all, there were laser cannon shots being fired, and explosions happening everywhere. But not even the clankers were stupid enough not to notice when a laser was randomly fired in a portion of the wall where the battle hadn't even arrived yet. Seeing the red lasers coming in their direction in droves, General Kenobi took the lead, his blue lightsaber spinning. There was little to no cover on the wall, and in a situation like that, the best option was to advance, and don't look back. Keep going. The Jedi ran forward, his weapon slashing down, cutting three droids in half. Behind him, the clones pressed their triggers, taking down one droid after another. Dager saw a laser getting past General Kenobi's lightsaber, and pushed Waxer down. The laser, which would have hit the clone in the head, scratched his shoulder. Thank you, Commander. On your feet, Trooper. Keep moving. Cody. Are you all right? Dager looked back to see that Commander Cody had been hit in the leg. With how many droids were in front of them now, Dager doubted they could even arrive at the bridge controls building. I'm okay, General. But we are never going to make it past this many clankers. Hold on. Cover me. General Kenobi suddenly turned off his lightsaber, and closed his eyes. 
Dejo had seen this happen enough times to know he was using the Force, but the Jedi couldn't have chosen a worse time. Dejo knelt, his DC-15A aiming at the droids barely a hundred meters away. There were dozens, maybe a hundred of them, firing without stop. Dab, charged shot. Brain, cold detonators. The clones followed his orders immediately, and a small explosion took out almost ten droids. Unfortunately, Dab's DC-15X would be unusable for some time, until it cooled down. The sniper, however, wouldn't stand idle, and was about to pull out his pistol when Dager gave him his DC-15A. When the detonators land, shoot it. Brain had found his previous order, to just throw the detonators, without activating them, weird. Now, however, he understood. If he had activated the detonators, they would blow up before it reached the droids. By throwing it inactivated, it would be useless, unless someone hit it with a laser, and who was better for that than a sniper. Three thermal detonators were sent out, and three explosions followed, killing a dozen droids each, and sending more falling over the edge of the wall. At the same time, the clones suffered their second casualty. Stock was hit two times in the chest, dying immediately. Before the clones suffered another death, though, they saw a huge shadow passing by them, and suddenly a broken piece of the wall crashed into the ground in front of them. Several red lasers hit it uselessly, and now the troopers had enough cover. Dejo knew it was impossible for a piece of the wall be conveniently blown up and land right in front of them, providing perfect cover. So, he looked at General Kenobi, the only one with enough power to do that. Sure enough, the Jedi was sweating profusely. It seemed that moving a giant piece of rock using the Force took a lot, even for a Jedi. However, it was the cover that the clones needed. Now, they could fire at the droids without being totally in the open, and that meant that the fifty or so droids that were left after Brain and Dab's joint attack, lasted about thirty seconds. The aim of the droids never was great, and they relied on numbers to win, but this time, they were going against eleven of the most elite clones the Republic Army had, and a Jedi. Still, more and more droids were arriving, in an endless stream. Dejo had already anticipated that there would be a few hundred droids between them and the bridge controls, and they had only eliminated a little more than a hundred of them. That won't do. Cody, Dejo, any ideas? No, General. I don't think so, sir. Maybe we should retreat. As long as we get down to the city, we can escape the clankers pretty easily. And do what? We can't keep running for days, until the others break through. I might have an idea, sir. While Dejer, General Kenobi, and Commander Cody were discussing, Dejer was surprised to hear Dab speak up. It was rare for the sniper to interfere in a conversation. Say it. If we let the Seppis approach, do you think you would be able to push the rock again? That will open a path, and you could get through it and go to the bridge controls building. Chapter 232 Both Commanders, and General Kenobi, stared at Dab. It was a plan. A bad one, but still, a plan. General Kenobi glanced at Commander Cody, who shrugged. It isn't the craziest thing we have done today, sir. If you think you can pull this off, it is worth a try. It might be our only chance of surviving this battle. The Jedi nodded, and put his two hands close together. Dejer patted Dab's shoulder, and took back the DC-15A that the clone gave him. Good thinking, Dab. The sniper only nodded, without even turning his head to talk to Dejer. He was too concentrated on firing at the incoming droids. Tech yelled and a laser hit his shoulder, and metal cursed when his blaster was pulled out of his hands by another laser. Now that the clankers were getting closer, their accuracy was getting better. Now should be about time, General. The Jedi didn't answer, but pushed his hands forward. The piece of the wall, which was at least three meters long, and one and a half meter high, was sent tumbling away. The droids on its path were crushed or pushed, falling down the wall. At least a hundred sepis were destroyed with that one move, creating a path to the bridge controls building. Now is the time. Move, move. The group took off running, taking advantage of the opportunity, and killing any droid on their way, but there were still too many. Seeing their path getting blocked once more, 
Dajer looked at Commander Cody, and saw him nod. They knew what was going on each other's mind. General Kenobi. You have to go first. We will hold the clankers. That isn't happening, Dajer. You are a Jedi, sir. You are the only one who can get to the controls before the Seppis fill this damn wall. We will keep them occupied. You just have to come back to help us as soon as you are done. General Kenobi looked at the two clones with a complicated expression. But there was no time to deliberate. He turned on his lightsaber, and ran towards the building. Without having to keep up with the clone's pace, he was easily able to get to the bridge control's building, cutting down any seppai on his way. Dajer watched as General Kenobi disappeared inside the building. He had no doubt that a Jedi would have no problems to get the Ray Bridge back up. That meant that their mission was almost accomplished. Now, they just had to survive to see the end of it. Keep firing, boys. The clones arranged themselves in a half moon, kneeling on the ground. Red lasers hit the ground and cut the air around them, but the clones stood still as stone. They weren't phased by how many times death almost got to them. That was what they were created for, and what they were the best at. Reloading. Tech crouched, barely dodging a laser, and 3-4 covered him, pressing the trigger of his blaster without stop. Waxer and Boyle were also an impressive team, killing one droid after another. Kickback, Dager, Commander Cody, and Metal were at the very front of their formation. The double-barrel repeating blaster at the clone had was wreaking havoc amidst the droids. Dajer felt an impact in his chest, and stifled a groan. If it wasn't for the blast padding in his armor, he would be dead. Behind him, Dab's forearm was hit, and Waxer's helmet was sent flying was a laser hit it, narrowly missing his head. Suddenly, they heard a loud sound of metal scraping metal. Looking behind the droids, they saw a dwarf spider droid. The long laser cannon on it was pointed directly at them. Scatter. The huge impact wave of the laser cannon shot was enough to send Dajer off his feet. His head was ringing like a bell, and his vision was blurry. His blaster had escaped his hand, and he saw the world turn. Flailing his arms around, he felt his hand wrap around something, and gripped it. The sudden stop made his shoulder let out a loud sound, and he felt his joint pop out. Incredible pain traveled through his body, but his instincts told him that if he let go, he would be dead. And so, he kept his grip strong, but pain was slowly weakening him. Blinking, he opened his eyes, and saw the ground fifty meters below him. This prompted him to grab even strongly, as he held the edge of the wall. Lifting his other arm, he used both of them to grab the wall, and tried to pull himself up. However, he didn't have enough strength, at least not with a dislocated joint. The fact that it was the same shoulder he had broken before didn't help. Hang on. Dajer looked up, and saw Brain leaning over the edge, reaching to grab him. What about the spider? General Kenobi took care of it, sir. Now, hold on. Cell, help me here. The scout soon appeared, his helmet nowhere to be seen. Together, he and Brain pulled up Dajer, even as the clone groaned in pain when they grabbed his arm. When he was finally back up in the wall, Dajer realized that the bridge was on, and thousands of troopers were running through it, already getting into the city. Fights erupted everywhere, and lasers were flying all over. From time to time, Dajer could hear civilians screaming on fear. The situation on top of the wall was better. General Kenobi and Commander Cody were taking care of the last droids on the wall. The dwarf spider droid was missing three of its legs, and laid dead on the ground. Metal and Kickback were sitting on the ground, each holding their left arms, which seemed to be broken. Do you want me to put that in place, Commander? 3-4 approached Dajer. He was holding his helmet under his arm, and there was a small cut on his forehead, bleeding slightly. Dajer looked at his right arm, which was dangling uselessly on his side, and nodded. Do it. 3-4 nodded, and had Dajer kneel on the ground. He put his knee and shin on his back, and grabbed his arm. Without any warning, he shook Dajer's arm, and, with a th pop, the shoulder was back in place. The commander suppressed a yelp of pain, and moved his arm. It was hurting, but at least not as badly as before. How is it, 
Commander. Working. You did a great job, 3-4. Now, go take a look at the other, Commander Cody in dab first. Metal and kickback, you two stay put, and try not to move your arms. Cell, brain, tech, waxer, and boil, with me. There is still a battle going on. We already did our part, Commander Dager. Lesu is ours. And so is Ryloth. We just received confirmation from Master Windu. He and the freedom fighters of Sindulla took Nabat and captured Wat Tambor. Dajer looked at the city below the wall and saw that General Kenobi was right. There was still a lot of fighting going on, but the Sepis were being pushed back. Sitting down, he leaned against the side of the bridge controls building. The battle for Ryloth was over. The planet was now part of the Republic and would stay like that for a long time. Chapter 233 Dager looked out of a Republic cruiser's window. Under him, Ryloth was getting smaller and smaller. Soon, the ship would make the jump to hyperspace. Dager didn't know when and if he would see it again. Hell Squad stood next to him, three clones on each side. They weren't using their armor, but brown clothes that showed they belonged to the 303rd. Without their armor, the scars on their faces and arms were plain for anyone to see, showing just how much they had been through. From time to time, a trooper from the 212th would pass by them, and look at the group for a second. When Ryloth was substituted by the blue and white lines of hyperspace, Dager turned around, and Hell Squad followed. In the end, Ryloth was just another battle in a war that was far from over. A painful battle, that they would remember and regret forever, but still, just a battle. Walking around the ship towards their quarters, Dager was remembering what transpired after their crazy climbing plan and the battle on top of the walls of Lesu. As soon as Lesu was captured by the Republic, several separatist ships tried to leave Ryloth and escape the system. Many were shot down, but some escaped. However, of the almost half a million clankers on Ryloth, less than half survived. Of course, the separatists would have no problem replenishing their ranks, but a victory was still a victory. Dager saw General Windu briefly after the battles were over, when the Jedi was transporting the captured separatist leader, Wat Tambor, to a Republic cruiser scheduled to take him to the prisons of Coruscant. Together with the Jedi was Cham Sindulla, the freedom fighter leader. Sindulla just looked at Hell Squad, and scoffed, before leaving, but Dager could see guilt in his eyes. Gobi and Iva were nowhere to be seen, and neither was their daughter, Shoyuta, but one freedom fighter informed Dager they were okay. Gobi had suffered a slight wound in the battle for Nabat, but it wasn't serious. Shaking his head, Dager pushed all his thoughts of Sindulla or the Trilex to the back of his mind. He now had something else to worry about. Now that the Battle of Ryloth was over, Hell Squad was returning to Coruscant. As the commander of the 303rd Attack Legion, Dager had to be present when the higher-ups decided what would be done of the few survivors. As the leader of a special unit, Dager had to be present when the higher-ups decided what would be done of Hell Squad. General Kenobi The Jedi was walking in the other direction, towards the command bridge of the cruiser. Surprisingly, although General Kenobi had done everything Hell Squad had, from sliding over an abyss, climbing up a cliff, and fighting a thousand droids, he didn't have a single bruise. Meanwhile, Hell Squad had several light wounds, and at least two broken bones. That went to show how different from the normal folk the Jedis were. Listen, Dager, I just received a transmission from Coruscant, and was about to send a trooper after you. You are to go immediately to the Judgment Room on the Senate Building, as soon as we arrive. They want to sort this out as soon as possible. And. What about General Ragu? The Jedi Council will deliberate on his fate. Usually, when a Padawan loses his master before their training is complete, they finish it on the Jedi Temple. But Regu won't be there for long. In a few months, his training will be complete. Thank you, General. General Kenobi nodded, patted Dajer's shoulder, and continued on his way. The commander gestured to his squad, and went to their quarters. The Senate building was impressive, to say the least. High towers of a dark shade of red, the building was in the heart of Coruscant. Hundreds of thousands of people walked by and on it every day, 
and it was where the most important decisions of the Republic were made. As such, of course the security would be tight. Before Hell Squad got to the judgment room, they had to go through four security checks, even though they were clones. The ones responsible for the security were clones who wore long red armor, very different from the normal Phase 2 ones. Senate Guards Dajer never understood them. They never talked, and rarely moved, and he had never seen them training. Even clone commandos would train with normal clones for a while, but the Senate guards didn't. When Hell Squad finally arrived in the judgment room, what greeted them was a giant platform that floated above a hole. On the walls on both sides, protected by blast shields, were people of many different species. Directly in front of the platform, surrounded by Senate guards, was Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. He was old, but still younger than most chancellors who came before him. He also had a smile on his lips, and looked like a very easygoing person. However, for some reason, when the Chancellor gazed at him, Dajer felt shivers running down his spine. He was a dangerous man. CT-4063, named Dajer, commander of the 303rd Attack Legion of the Grand Army of the Republic. Is all that was said correct? A fat Twi'lek near Chancellor Palpatine read a data pad in his hands, his voice loud enough for everyone to hear. Dajer straightened himself, and so did the other members of Hell Squad. This audience will now hear Chancellor Palpatine, to decide what will be done of the 303rd Attack Legion. The Twi'lek sat down, and Chancellor Palpatine got up, smiling. He was standing far above Dajer, but he stretched his hands as if he could touch Dajer. It was easy to understand why he was elected Chancellor. Commander Dajer, we are all terribly sorry for the loss of Master Imagun D and Commander Keeley. However, this is the first time an entire legion of the Republic Army was destroyed, and we can't hesitate. We shall not show weakness. I understand, sir. Then, the surviving troopers shall be sent to other legions. Commander Cody, of the 212th Legion, seemed to show interest in them. I am sure elite troops such as yours will be of high importance. Dajer nodded, and the Chancellor's assistant, the Twi'lek, got up again, to read another note. 185 clones remain of the 303rd Attack Legion. Of those, 123 have been seriously injured, and won't be able to battle again. They will be taken good care of. The remaining 62 troopers, with the exception of Hell Squad, will be sent to the 212th Legion. Dajer knew it wasn't his place to ask what would be done of Hell Squad. They were going to tell him next anyways. And that was what Chancellor Palpatine said next. Commander Dajer, in accounting to all the missions and tasks Hell Squad accomplished on behalf of the Republic, we thought it would be a waste to bind you to another legion. As per today, Hell Squad will be a free unit. Of course, unless there is some special task, you will fight on the battlefield just like you have done up till now. Thank you, sir. Unless anyone has something else to say, then I will declare this secession as finished. None of the audience said anything, and, after waiting for a few seconds, the Chancellor sat down again. I am sure you will do a good job, Commander Dajer, leader of Hell Squad. After all, you are one of the best of the Republic. You are free to go. Dajer nodded, and turned around. Hell Squad followed, and he could already sense their questions. He would answer them, but they all knew that a whole new phase for Hell Squad was about to start. Chapter 234 All in all, the reunion in the Judgment Room was concluded quite fast. Hell Squad entered the Senate building as members of the 303rd Attack Legion, and left as an independent unit. Still, in their hearts, they would always be part of the 303rd. Shield, meet us at the infirmary in the headquarters, and bring everyone. I have to announce something. Understood, Commander. Dajer wanted to be the one to tell his legion what their future was, and he wanted every trooper, including the wounded, to hear. Clones were used to being moved around, so becoming part of the 212th wouldn't bother them. However, Dajer knew this would be the last time he saw many of them. He had grown up, trained, and fought with those brothers of his, and he wanted to see them one more time. The troopers received the news quietly. It was what they were expecting, so there was no reaction of surprise. Ragu had also appeared in the infirmary, and that surprised them. 
The Padawan still had dark circles under his eyes, but he seemed better now. He talked to each of the clones, and just shook Dager's hand before leaving. Now, their paths would part, since they weren't in the same legion anymore. In fact, they weren't in any legion. After his brief talk with Ragu, Dager brought Hell Squad out of the infirmary. Lieutenant Shield ordered the fifty or so clones who weren't wounded, or had already recovered, to follow them. Together, the group took a transport to the Revanter. Until the troopers were moved to the 212th Legion, and the dissolution of the 303rd was officially sanctioned, they were still members of the same Legion. And, for now, they were away from the battlefield. When Dager pushed the doors open, he was greeted by loud music and laughter. Countless clones walked around, some drunk, some just talking. Although the clones of the 303rd were in a large group, only the troopers closer to the door paid attention to them. It was, after all, quite normal to see so many clones together. However, once they recognized the pattern of the clothes Dager and the others were wearing, those troopers stopped talking, and looked at them. Slowly, all noise died away, as more and more clones looked for the reason of the sudden silence, and saw the 303rd. Eventually, even the music stopped. As Dager walked forward, and the others followed, the clones got up, and stared at them in silence. Dager didn't know who started it, but all the hundreds of troopers brought their right hand to their foreheads, and kept their left hand behind their bodies, their back straight. It was a standard salute, one that every clone knew. However, it wasn't directed at Dager or any of the clones. They were saluting not those who were alive, but those who were gone. Dager took a deep breath, and returned the salute. His men mimicked him. Seeing that, the other clones lowered their hands in unison, and returned to what they were doing before. From time to time, furtive glances were thrown in their direction. Shield, be at ease. We aren't serving right now. Let the men have a good night. For Commander Keeley. For General D. For the 303rd. For the 303rd. The clones scattered themselves amidst the others. The Revanter wasn't a place to grieve, but to drown your sorrows. They had stories to share, and moments to remember. Dager walked straight to the officer rooms on the second floor, and Hell Squad followed him. None of them had any less authority than a captain of the clone army. Entering the room, Dager saw many familiar faces. Commander Cody, Captain Rex, Commander Fox, Sergeant Hound, Lieutenant Thorne, Commander Bly, and Captain Locke were all there. None of them said anything about the 303rd, and just shook Hell Squad's hands, or hugged their brothers. Soon, they found themselves with a drink in their hands. Now that you are a true special unit, do you already have your next mission, brother? Dager shook his head. He couldn't take the image of Chancellor Palpatine out of his head, when the man smiled at him while saying Hell Squad would become an independent unit. The Chancellor made him remember his nightmares, for some reason. Realizing he was daydreaming, and that Captain Locke was still waiting for an answer, Dager pushed his thoughts to the back of his mind. To tell the truth, I have no idea what exactly Hell Squad is supposed to do. Although we have been a special unit for a long time, we were always with our Legion. The battles we fought were their battles too. Sometimes I wonder when this war will be over. Now, come on, Bly. You know it is far from the end. Just. So many have died already. Dager nodded. Commander Bly was telling the truth. Sometimes, he also wondered when the Clone Wars would be over, and he and his brothers would be able to have a life that wasn't filled with war and death. But such a life needed sacrifices. The 303rd was the first Legion to be annihilated, but it wouldn't be the last. It was only two weeks later that Hell Squad received a mission. By now, most of their wounds were healed, and all that was left were some bruises. Frowning, Dager read the data pad he was given. Looking at Commander Fox, of the Coruscant Guard, Dager closed it. What is this, Fox? Don't ask me, Dager. This came from the higher-ups, maybe even the Chancellor himself. He seems to think very highly of Hell Squad's abilities, and he isn't wrong. Commander Fox shrugged awkwardly to show he didn't mean to downgrade Hell Squad. 
It is an escorting mission, Hell Squad can do that easily. The problem is the next part. A trade? Since when did we start negotiating with the Seppis? Since we received orders to do so. Look, Dager, I know Tambor feels kind of personal to you since Ryloth, but General PLO Kuhn is a member of the Jedi Council. That is why General Secura is leading the negotiations. Dager looked at the data again, and sighed. Commander Fox was right. He was only complaining because he didn't like being near what Tambor. He had only seen the Separatist once, but he was one of the people responsible for the 303 RD's annihilation. However, orders were orders, and he would follow them until the end. Yeah, you are right. Still, Fox, I think there is something going on. Like what? I don't know. But something about this mission isn't right. I can feel it. Master. Darth Tyrannus, my apprentice. One of the leaders of your little separatist alliance was captured recently. Yes, my lord. What Tambor? He will be punished accordingly. For that, you have to get him back first. This small negotiations of yours will be a good opportunity to get rid of some of those filthy Jedis. Leave none alive. As you wish, my lord. Count Dooku caught a glimpse of an old face beneath the hood as the hologram disappeared, but a dark mist covered it. He couldn't tell who his master was, but his fear of him was immeasurable. The consequences of when he tried to defy him were. In the darkness of his room, the cold and murderous leader of the CIS shivered. He would never dare to go against his master. Not again. Turning on his hologram projector, he faced Asajj Ventress. The woman bowed to him, a creepy smile on her lips. Behind her, several clones laid, dismembered. What can I do for you, master? I have a new mission for you. Chapter 235 Ayla Secura was a female Trilek, and one of the youngest Jedis of the Jedi Order. She was in charge of the 327th Star Corps, an elite legion that, just like the 303rd, existed since Geonosis. General Secura, as the clones called her, had been to many battles in the last few months. As such, she wasn't new to the horrors of war. However, when she looked at Hell Squad, she couldn't help but frown. They brought back some bad memories. Although Jedis were supposed to leave their affections behind for the greater good, she still worried about her home planet when Ryloth was attacked by the Separatist. She was on Felucia at that time, and couldn't help, but news of all the cruelties that her people were subjected to still reached her ears. The death of General D was another blow to her. He hadn't been her master, but he had trained her in the Jedi Temple, and she was quite fond of him. Of course, she didn't blame Dager for anything that happened on Ryloth. She knew, as well as any Jedi that was leading troops on this war, that clones weren't machines, and that they felt the deaths of their brothers and commanders as deeply as any Jedi. Still, the armor of Hell Squad was a reminder of what happened. The Hell Squad that now stood in front of General Secura was very different from the one that left Ryloth. Their armors had been cleaned from all the blood, dirt, and laser marks. The holes and cracks had all been fixed, and the blast padding had been changed. However, they had refused to change armors. Armors weren't like blasters. Blasters were all equal, with the exception of a few like Dab's DC-15X. Armors, however, were unique. Each clone crafted and modified their armor during the war, many because wanted to have their own identity, others because of something that happened. Be it Dager's scratch marks, be it the long line that crossed the entirety of Dab's chest plate, because of when a commando droid slashed it dash, or the tattoo shaped like a horn that Tech had on his head, all of them were something that only their armor had. It couldn't be copied. Their armor was a companion that followed them through battle and death. More subtle than when clones started getting names, their armor was nevertheless a symbol that they were people. They had thoughts, they had emotions, they had a family they cared about. No matter what others said about them, the troopers knew very well that they might have been created to fight a war, but the republic they were protecting was also their home. After saluting General Secura, and greeting Commander Bly, leader of the 327th Star Corps, Dager lowered his hand, and the others mimicked him. Where is the exchanging taking place, General? 
on a small planet called Kiros. Colonized by Tigrutas, it is a neutral planet, or at least it was supposed to be. They were part of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, but they left when the war started. Deja nodded. It was a good place to exchange prisoners. Although it had some affiliation to the Separatists before, it was now a neutral planet. And, considering it were the Sepis who proposed it, it was understandable that they would want to do the change somewhere they knew. Is it safe? General Secura shook her head when she heard Commander Bly's question. As safe as it can be. The Separatists aren't exactly honorable, so we will have to be careful. That is the reason they sent a special unit. She gestured at Hell Squad, and Dager acknowledged it. That was what they were best at. In a big battle, or a planet-wide invasion, even, there was little a single squad could do. Small operations like that were where they really made a difference. Later that same day, already on a ship to Kiros, Dager finally found the time to talk with Commander Bly. There was something that had been bugging him ever since Commander Fox gave him the details of this mission. There were too many things that didn't make sense, but Dager didn't dare to ask Commander Fox about that. The commander was a loyal clone, sometimes too loyal. Dager had no doubt that the answer he would receive if he asked him would be just a stern face and nothing else. Bly, nobody said anything about Wolf. Not a word. But you and I both know he was captured too. Commander Bly scratched his head. Clearly, he was troubled by the same question. Commander Wolf was the leader of the 104th Battalion, and the commander under General PLO Kuhn. The Jedi had been captured in battle, and so had been the commander. The other clones with him had been eliminated, but a commander of the Republic Army had some value. However, it was as if everyone forgot Commander Wolf existed. From the Chancellor to Commander Fox and General Secura, nobody mentioned the clone. You know the answer to that as well as I do, Dager. To the higher-ups, a clone isn't that important, even Wolf. Our mission this time is General PLO Kuhn, not him. Sometimes, his brothers were too fixed in fulfilling their orders, and didn't think about anything else. Maybe because they had more independence, special units like Hell Squad, Delta Squad, and Deep Squad weren't so disciplined. No, that was wrong. They were disciplined, they just thought more about the commands they were given, instead of just following them. Still, if Hell Squad has a chance of rescuing Wolf, we will. And I will help, brother. Dager nodded to Commander Bly. They wouldn't leave a brother behind, unless they had no other option. What is our course of action there, then? Just like the simulations. We put Tambor forward, they put General PLO Kuhn. They walk, and we trade. At the first sign that the Sepis might be thinking of doing something, shoot Tambor. Dager grinned. He might not have been to a prisoner's trade like that before, but he sure had trained for it. Sometimes it went right. Most of the time it went right. But when it didn't. Hell Squad would take care of it. Two days later, their ship arrived at Kiros. They only landed after making sure there were no separatists waiting to ambush them. One can never be too cautious when dealing with clankers. Twenty-eight clones, seven from Hell Squad and twenty-one from the 327th, followed General Secura out of the ship. Two clones pushed what Tambor forward, his hands tied with electromagnetic chains. If he tried to escape, all General Secura had to do was push a button, and they would electrify him, not enough to eliminate him, but it would hurt. The Separatist, led by a commando droid, also appeared, bringing with them their prisoner. The Keldor was limping, but apart from that, he didn't seem to be too hurt. Weirdly, General PLO Kuhn had a device covering his mouth, preventing him from talking. Dager, however, didn't think much of it. He knew Jedi's words had power, so it was normal the droids wouldn't allow him to talk. Seeing the Jedi was alive, Dager started analyzing the enemy troops. If anything went wrong, he wanted to have a plan ready. Chapter 236 The Separatist group was composed of only twenty clankers, but all of them were commando droids. Dager had fought them on more than one occasion, and he knew they were deadlier than an entire battalion of B-1 units. It appeared the Sepis weren't taking any risks. 
the leader of the commando droids gestured for his men to stop, and continued by itself. Seeing that, General Sakura did the same. The female Trilek walked forward, until she and the droid were only two meters apart. Both had their melee weapons, a lightsaber and a vibroblade, but there was no doubt about who would be faster to pull it out if needed was. Jedi. We brought our prisoner. Bring yours forward. You first, droid. Unless I am sure Master PLO Kun is safe, Tambor isn't going anywhere. The commando droid looked at her, his white eyes flashing. He had orders not to give the Jedi to the Republic unless Amir what Tambor was safe in their hands. The Jedi is safe. R0, S5, bring him forward. Stop there. One of the commando droids pushed General PLO Kun, and he stumbled forward, almost falling. After he walked about twenty meters, the clanker held his shoulder, keeping him from moving. Now that he was closer, Dajer saw that the general seemed anxious. He couldn't talk, and the eyes of the Keldor weren't easy to read. However, Dajer had long grown used to reading a person's body language, and General PLO Kuhn was too tense and nervous. Even in his situation, Jedi's usually were calm. There was something wrong. Commander. Everyone, stay in your positions, and be prepared to fight. Bly, something is going to happen. Cell wanted to warn Dager. His sharp eyes had already discovered the same problems as Dager. Commander Bly and his men were more used to open battles, so they hadn't noticed. What is wrong? I don't know yet. But keep your aim on the commando clanker. Aim for the head. All right. General Secura was focused on the commando droid, and didn't notice General PLO Kuhn's warnings. She motioned for the clones to bring Wattambor forward. She and the droid had gotten in a silent agreement to do the trade at the same time. When one of the 327th troopers stepped ahead to take Tambor, Dajer moved to grab the Separatist's arm. With his head, he gestured for the clone to stay, and took his place. The man was confused, but he stayed quiet. Now wasn't the time to show indecisiveness. While he was leading the Separatist, Dajer let his eyes dart from side to side. They were on a landing platform, but obviously, it wasn't being used. Bunches of crates laid here and there, but they had scanned it from the ship, and there was no droid hiding inside them. The most they found were some small life forms, animals of some sort. The buildings on the north and the east blocked the vision of any sniper, whatever side it may be. Clearly, the Seppis had chosen the location carefully. They wouldn't be able to ambush the Republic there, but the Republic also wouldn't be able to catch them off guard. Still, Dager's instincts told him there was something fishy going on. The closer he got to General PLO Kuhn, who was now being brought forward too, the stronger this feeling got. When he arrived by the side of General Secura, she too had noticed General PLO Kuhn's weird behavior. Frowning, she looked at the device preventing him from speaking, and turned to the commando droid. Take it off. I do not have. The tools for that. You can take it out yourself, Republic. Scum. Dajer saw General Secura clench her fist in anger. She could easily destroy the device with her lightsaber, but turning it on would be considered a violation of the small truce they had to realize the trade. And, considering there were twenty blasters aimed at General PLO Kuhn's back, this wasn't a very intelligent move. Tied like he was, even a Jedi wouldn't be able to dodge. What are you waiting? For. Trade the prisoner. Both Tambor and General PLO Kuhn walked forward at the same time, and crossed paths. With the trade completed, both sides were preparing to return to their ships and leave when a dark figure jumped out of one of the containers. Holding two red lightsabers, the person ignored General Secura and General PLO Kuhn, and looked at the clone near them. Oh, my dear Dager. I'm glad I have another chance to eliminate you. Ventress had been hiding in the container for the past day, waiting. Since her master gave his command, she was more than glad to eliminate two Jedis. Knowing the Republic would scan the location that had been chosen, she hid her life force using an ancient Sith technique. Watching through a gap in the container's frame, she was surprised to see the characteristic armor of Hell Squad. 
she usually wouldn't remember the names of the clones, after all, they were no more than worms she could easily squash. However, Deja was different. Not only had he resisted her interrogation, but he had escaped her not once, but twice. And, to top all that, he had buried her alive under thirty meters of snow. She had failed to eliminate him in Iktach, but she wouldn't fail this time. Her hatred for him was so great that she almost ignored the Jedis she was sent to eliminate. Oh, my dear Dager. I'm glad I have another chance to eliminate you. She grinned, and waved her two lightsabers in a downward slash, aiming not at Dager but at General P.L.O. Kuhn. She might hate the clone, but she knew that her biggest threat were the Jedis. Dager looked surprised at Ventress. He didn't expect to see her here, and the fact that she had her lightsabers out meant she wasn't respecting the truce. He saw her swing her lightsabers at General P.L.O. Kuhn, who still had his hands tied, but General Secura used her own weapon to intercept it. Using the force to push Ventress back, General Secura cut the chains that tied General P.L.O. Kuhn, and the device in his mouth. At the same time, she threw a green lightsaber to him. Together, they started to fight Ventress. All of that happened in less than three seconds. Looking at the commando droid holding what Tambor, Dager discovered that their metallic faces seemed as surprised as the clones by the turn of events. However, that surprise wouldn't last long. After all, Ventress was a separatist, and the truce was gone. Lifting his blaster to waist height, Dager fired three shots, hitting the commando droid in the head. The clanker was a powerful unit, and could take several dozen shots to the chest, but not to the head. It fell to the ground twitching, and it didn't get up. At the same time, both sides reacted, and an all-out battle started. Tambor ran to hide, and Dager fired at his direction, but he was forced to dodge the lasers of the droids, and most of his shots missed, barely scratching the legs of the Separatist leader. Running backwards, Dager ducked behind a crate, just in time to escape death, and heard Metal chuckling as he warmed up his double-barrel repeating blaster. You were right, Commander. There was something wrong. Chapter 237 The landing platform had become a battlefield in no time. While Dager had taken care of the leading commando droid, the Republic wasn't faring so well. General P.L.O. Kuhn and General Secura were locked into a fight with Ventress, and it seemed they would be there for quite some time. With a yell of pain, a 327th trooper fell dead. The commando droids weren't just more resistant than normal clankers, but also had much better accuracy. That was the third trooper to fall, and up till now, only two seppies were eliminated. With the corner of his eyes, Dager saw what Tabor running towards the Separatist ship, clearly trying to escape. The device they had put on him to prevent his escape had already been removed. Two commando droids followed him, putting their bodies between him and the blue lasers. Unfortunately, all those lasers could do was knock them down, but in seconds, their ridiculously flexible bodies were back up. Dager, we gotta move. Forget Tambor and retreat. Hell Squad's leader acknowledged Commander Bly's words. He was right. Emptying his magazine, Dager hit two clankers right on the head, killing them immediately, and also got several shots on the chest of another, who was quickly finished off by Dab. Suddenly, Dager saw two of the droids leave the combat, and turn their aims to the Jedis. They had chosen the right moment, because both generals were locked in a forced struggle with Ventress, and wouldn't be able to dodge. Metal, Brain, left. Commando droids were tough, but even they couldn't survive the onslaught of lasers that Metal's blaster was spewing. That, coupled with the thermal detonator Brain threw, was enough to transform them in a pile of smoking scrap metal. Fall back. While retreating, Dager mimicked the commando droids, and turned his blaster to the three figures fighting with lightsabers. Just like the two Jedis, Ventress was also immobile, fully concentrating in her own battle. Dager pressed the trigger five times. Two lasers aimed for her back, another two for her legs, and the last for the head. He wasn't ashamed of attacking someone from the back. This was war, and Ventress was an enemy. A very, very dangerous enemy. Just before the lasers hit her, the Sith turned off her lightsabers, and crouched. 
Taken by surprise by the sudden lack of resistance, General PLO Kuhn and General Secura staggered forward, and Ventress smashed her hands on the ground. Apparently, she created some sort of invisible shockwave, because both Jedis were sent flying, and landed rolling. General Secura seemed like she wanted to give chase to Ventress when she saw the woman run towards the Separatist ship, but General PLO Kuhn held her back. Together, they couldn't win against her, whatsoever alone. Both sides retreated to their respective ships, and took off. Still in the lower ramp while it was going up, Dejer could see Ventress flash him a creepy smile. Something about this whole operation was wrong. Dejer got this feeling about a lot of the battles he had been through. It was as if someone was controlling everything from the shadows, but the clone knew that was impossible. Master PLO, are you okay? Yes, thanks to you. The two Jedis sat on the floor, panting. Clearly, the battle had exhausted them, albeit it was just a short one. We will be back to Coruscant soon. Meanwhile, you should let the medical droid have a look at your leg. Suddenly, General PLO Kuhn got up. Shaking his head, he looked at General Secura. We can't, not yet. I need to rescue Wolf. He has something of utmost importance. Dejer and Commander Bly had been talking quietly about their losses in the battle, but when they heard that, both clones turned their heads simultaneously. When they didn't see Commander Wolf at the prisoner exchange, they had assumed he was dead. After all, why would the Seppis give back a Jedi general but keep a clone? Exchanging a glance, both commanders approached the Jedis. Even amongst clones, there were closer groups of friends. New captains and commanders like Captain Rex, Captain Locke, and Commander Titas had been in the war for a long time, but they weren't part of the first battle. Commander Wolf, however, was, and so were Commander Bly, Commander Fox, Commander Pons, Commander Cody, Commander Gree, Commander Monk, Commander Bakara, and, of course, Commander Keeley. Usually, Dejer wouldn't be part of such a group, but thanks to Hell Squad's promotion to a special unit, he got to know the commanders outside the battlefield. And, as brothers, ranks weren't important when they weren't in battle. And, as such, Commander Wolf held a high importance in Dejer's and Commander Bly's hearts. That wasn't to say that they would leave others behind, but they would try everything they could to rescue the commander. General Secura got up, surprised by the urgency in General PLO Kuhn's voice. What does he have that is so important? We lost seven troopers in that fight, Master PLO. I am not sure we have what it takes to fight the droids again. The Separatists attacked us while we were in space. Since my legion has to keep the battle on Foline, myself and Wolf were going to Coruscant with a small group of troopers. We were bringing a Force-sensitive child with us. A human, named Cal Kestis. However, we were boarded, and I was captured, together with Wolf. The others were eliminated. The two clones stood quiet at the side, listening carefully. Like always, they wouldn't say anything unless they were questioned, but both frowned under their helmets. It was General Secura who asked what was on their minds. Why would the Separatists propose to exchange you if they knew you would tell us about the youngling? And why they kept Commander Wolf? Before we were captured, Wolf put the boy in an escape pod, and sent him somewhere. I didn't let him tell me where. They are probably trying to break him, and get him to tell them which planet it was. However, it isn't the first time Wolf is interrogated. If we move fast enough, we might be able to rescue him before he gives in. I wouldn't be so sure. They had a Sith with him. That woman. She is powerful. General PLO Kuhn nodded, and then turned to Dejer. You are Dejer, from Hell Squad, aren't you? Wolf talked about your unit before. That Sith, she knew you. What can you tell us about her? Dejer nodded, and took off his helmet, showing them his scar. None of the Jedis were surprised. They had seen worse before, especially since the Clone Wars started. She is the one who gave me this, in my Jito. Her name is Asajj Ventress. As General Secura said, she is powerful. I and a few hundred others were captured, and she tortured me, trying to get me to tell her what our battle plans were. Dejer didn't say if he gave in or not. He himself didn't know, because he could barely remember the interrogation, 
and the Republic had changed their plans entirely after his escape. General D fought her too, sir, and couldn't win. Her methods. I've never seen anything like that. With all due respect, generals, but she is like an evil Jedi, if that makes sense. I almost lost my mind. Wolf had been through a lot, but I don't think even he will be able to keep his mouth shut for too long. Chapter 238 Dager clenched his fists slightly, easing them before someone noticed. As a commander, he couldn't show his emotions easily. However, he couldn't help but think of Barrow and Captain Hylix. Ventress had eliminated them both, cruelly. He could still remember the nightmares that she forced into his mind, and the wounds she infringed on him. His shoulder and face ached. Where is Commander Wolf, Master Piello? We can't let a youngling fall in the hands of a person like her. She and Count Dooku would train him to be a monster like them. Calm down, young Ayla. Commander Bly, set course to Corbin. It was where I was being held before, and Wolf is probably still there. Right away, General. As for you, Commander Dager, I need your squad ready. Corbin is currently separatist ground, and it won't be easy to rescue Wolf. Dager nodded, and ordered Tech to bring him a map of Corbin. The planet was filled with swamps and marshes, so it was difficult to use any heavy vehicles. It didn't really matter in their case, because they didn't have any vehicles aside from a few BRC speeders. While he was analyzing the fortress that General PLO Kuhn told him was the place where Commander Wolf was being held, Dager suddenly remembered something. Glancing at Commander Bly, who was next to him, Dager zoomed out of the map, showing the system where Corbin was located. Bly, isn't Corbin one of the targets on our latest battle plans? Commander Bly stood quiet for a moment, presumably thinking about it. Dager was right. They were set to attack Corbin, not now, but in a few months. It was a separatist planet, and, albeit not a very important one, there were some resources there that would come in handy for the Republic. If the clone remembered correctly, the 41st Elite Corps would be in charge of it. They had experience in fighting in planets like Corbin. Maybe we could start the attack. Bly, Commander Dager, if we use this chance to not only rescue Commander Wolf, but also take a separatist fortress on the planet, how long would it take to reinforcements arrive? General Secura actually looked quite interested in starting the battle for the planet. If Dager had to guess, she probably wanted to prove herself, since she had just recently become a fully-fledged Jedi. He, however, wasn't so anxious. Even if they could receive support from another legion, it would take time, and he doubted twenty clones could capture and hold an entire fortress on their own. Not only that, but he thought somberly that they wouldn't have twenty clones by the end of their mission. That is too risky, Ayla. We should call for reinforcements, and maybe even start the battle on Corbin, but we can only rescue Wolf. We don't have enough firepower to capture the entire fortress, whatsoever hold it. Commander Bly and Dager nodded. They looked at the separatist base in the hologram. It was just a rough design, because they couldn't get the entire architectural plans of it, but it probably was similar to other Sepai bases around the galaxy. General PLO Kuhn is right, General Secura. There should be between two to three hundred clankers in a fortress like that, not to mention that they know we will come for them. That means they will be prepared. Also, we will have to deal with commando droids. You saw them on the platform. They are dangerous. The only good thing about this whole operation is that Corbin isn't exactly an important planet, so we won't face a lot of resistance to get into the atmosphere. Both Jedis went deep in thought after Commander Bly said that. The clone had perfectly analyzed the situation, and, even though he didn't include Ventress, they knew they would have to deal with her. Dager frowned, and his scar became scarlet because of it. In the last months, he had rarely smiled, and his forehead was creased. Unfortunately, he knew what to do to get into the fortress, after all, Hell Squad had done it dozens of times. Getting in won't be difficult. Brain and Tech can rig the gates, and blow it. Finding Wolf also shouldn't be a problem. If this base is similar to the others, and there is no reason not to be, the holding cells are on the bottom floor. The real problem will be getting out. General PLO Kuhn raised an eyebrow. 
what Dejer said was a bold declaration. However, when he remembered what he heard about Hell Squad, and how Dejer had survived more than one encounter against a Sith, he thought that maybe they had the ability to back up his statement. After all, clones didn't usually brag, because failing to live up to the standards set for them meant death most of the time. All right then. Commander Dejer, contact the Republic, and request for a legion to be sent to aid us. Ayla, you and I shall talk to the Council. It is important to let them know about the child. Yes, Master PLO. That is our current situation, General Unduli. We are currently in dire need of reinforcements, otherwise we won't be able to escape Corbin after rescuing Commander Wolf. Dejer faced the projection of a green-skinned Miriolan, and reported General PLO Kuhn's request. Luminara Unduli was an old Jedi Master, and wasn't nearly as hot-headed as General Secura. Upon hearing Dejer, she didn't immediately agree, but went deep in thought. This child cannot be left for the Separatist, otherwise they will train him to be a Sith like that woman you spoke of and her master. Commander Dejer, tell Master PLO Kuhn that we will assist him. However, you will need to rescue Commander Wolf by yourselves. I will tell him that. Dejer out. After turning off the hologram, Dejer looked out of the window. The white lines of hyperspace were a familiar sight. Sighing, he realized he was tired. Although he was born and trained for war, after months of endless fighting, even he was tired. Too much had happened, too many have died. Putting on his helmet, Dejer went to find General PLO Kuhn. Their plan of attack was quite simple, but it wouldn't do any harm to go over it again. Commander Bly, leave seven of your men in the ship. We don't want to come back and discover it's surrounded by droids. Commander Dejer, are you sure your men can break open the gate? Either Tech opens it or Brain blows it up. The Jedi glanced at Dejer, once again surprised by how confident in his men the clone was. He didn't even hesitate to answer, despite knowing that a mishap could cause their deaths. All right then. We have no time to waste. In two hours, we will come out of hyperspace above Korriban. There is no blockade around the planet, so we should be able to land safely. Once we are on the ground, we gotta move fast. Master PLO, are you sure you don't want to stay on the ship? Your leg is obviously still hurt. Don't worry about me, Ayla. What is important is that we find out where the youngling is. We can't let the Separatist get their hands on him. Chapter 239 Just like Dejer said, landing on Corbin and entering the Separatist base was easy. Tech was able to hack in the main computer, and not only open the gate, but also locate Commander Wolf. Considering how big the fortress was, knowing where the clone was helped a lot. As soon as the gate opened, Dejer ordered Brain to destroy the engines, preventing it from closing again. He didn't want to be trapped there. Unsurprisingly, they didn't face a lot of resistance to get in. General PLO Kuhn and General Secura cut down two dozen droids, but, after that, they saw none else. Needless to say, it was suspicious, to say the least. Wolf should be just down this corridor, General. Ayla, Commander Bly and Commander Dejer, come with me. You, 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 and you too. The others, keep an eye out for any droid. They haven't appeared until now, but they will soon. Dejer acknowledged the order, and the troopers the Jedi had chosen followed him. The corridor was dark, eerily illuminated by a flashing red light here and there. Holding cells on both sides were empty, except for one. They could hear screams of pain, and a mechanical voice asking questions. Hearing one of his brothers screaming, the clones clenched their fists, but they were all seasoned soldiers, and kept their cool. This is a trap. It sure is. Commanders, you are first through the door. Dejer and Commander Bly got on both sides of the door, and General Secura used the force to push a button and open it. As soon as the door slid to the side, the two clones entered, their DC-15 as aimed at whatever was inside. Four lasers were fired, two from each blaster. Dejer got a commando droid on the head, and he fell to the ground, twitching. The other droid was a floating ball with many small arms, and it crashed on the floor with a loud sound. Commander Wolf was chained to the ceiling, bare-chested. 
One of his eyes was closed, and the other, the blind one, was looking up. Clearly, the commander had fainted. His muscles were still twitching, the reason being an electrostaff in the floor, and there were several cuts on his body, still bleeding. Dejer couldn't believe the separatist would be so cruel. If news of their torture methods were spread, several systems would leave their side. General PLO Kuhn walked forward, and cut the chains. Two troopers caught Commander Wolf before he fell to the floor. He was unconscious, and didn't wake up even after a few tries. Let's bring him like that. Move out. We need to. Suddenly, the Jedi trailed off, and looked at General Secura, who nodded slightly. I felt it too. Felt what, my dear Jedi? Cough. Cough. Shut up, assassin. It didn't come as a surprise to the Republic when they looked to the left end of the corridor and saw a separatist. What surprised them, though, was who it was. Several dozen B-1 and B-2 units, and almost thirty commando droids were being led by the Sith, Asajj Ventress. Next to her was an abomination like Dajer had never seen. It stood at almost three meters tall, and it was made of bone-like yellowish metal. Its feet were massive paws, like that of a Waranak, and he was holding two lightsabers in his claw-like hands. All in all, he would look like a droid, if it wasn't for his eyes. They weren't lifeless like the eyes of normal droids. Reptilian pupils and light green eyes, surrounded by blood-red flesh flashed with a cruel light. It was almost like someone, or something, had been put inside a droid. And Dager had never heard a droid coughing. Both Jedis obviously felt threatened by the droid too, because, they ordered the clones to start retreating. In a confined space like that, the troopers had no intention of engaging, even more when they were outnumbered. Carrying Commander Wolf, they left as quickly as they could, but General PLO Kuhn and General Secura stayed behind. Go after them. Leave the Jedi scum to me. Stay put, assassin. Cough. 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 I will deal with them. As you wish, walking corpse. That was the last bit of conversation that Dajer heard before the clones turned a corner. He could still hear the sound of lightsabers clashing and metallic footsteps though. Ventress frowned when she heard General Grievous speak. She didn't like the murderous machine, nor did she like the fact that Count Dooku, their master, thought one of them wasn't enough to deal with the Jedis. Watching the clones tune down the corridor, she ordered the droids behind her to go after them. One of the Jedis wanted to stop them, but General Grievous lit up his lightsabers, one green, and one blue, and stopped him. Spinning his arms in an impossible way, the general battled both Jedis at the same time. Using an opening, Ventress tried to slip past them, but the female Trelek used the force to push her back. Smiling creepily, the Sith turned on her red lightsabers. She was going to love killing another Jedi. Dajer turned around a corner, and stopped. Without the need for orders, Hell Squad did the same, taking positions. With his head, Dajer gestured for Commander Bly to keep going. The clone nodded. He knew that Hell Squad was more than enough to stall the enemy, and Commander Wolf was their priority now. Hell Squad could hear the droids approaching, and Cell put one finger up. The normal units were in the front, and the commando droids on the back. Unfortunately, Brain could only use droid poppers, otherwise he would risk blocking General PLO Kuhn's and General Secura's escape path. If that wasn't the case, they could just throw thermal detonators at the droids until they ran out. Hearing the clankers get closer, Dajer pointed two fingers forward. Hell Squad sprung into action, surprising the droids. Dajer didn't hesitate to fire two lasers in the head of the nearest clanker. Before the droid hit the ground, he had already aimed and fired at the next B-1 unit. In a short few seconds, over fifteen droids fell by Hell Squad's hands, and Dajer ordered them to fall back. As much as he would like to keep pressing his trigger until he was out of ammo, he had been through enough battles to know when it was time to retreat. His decision was proven right, because, after a stunned moment of surprise, the droids showered them with red lasers. No clone was hurt, because they were already twenty meters away from their last position, and running at full speed. Suddenly, Dajer heard the noises of a battle ahead of them. Cursing, 
he turned a corner, and saw the clones of the 327th, and Commander Bly, engaged in a battle against a group of clankers, similar in numbers to the ones that Hell Squad was facing. Looking around frenetically, he saw a blast door closed on their left. He pressed the control panel, but it didn't open. Hearing the impact of lasers as the clones were caught between two fires, he knew they didn't have much time. Brain, blow this door up. On it. Two thermal detonators took quick care of it, and the clones started retreating to it, not before leaving two bodies on the ground. That is not the way out, Dager. I know, but we don't have a better option. Now, let's move. Commander Bly dove in just in time to avoid a torrent of lasers. Looking at the unknown corridor, Dager shrugged. It was that, or dying. Chapter 240 TS-5 was a commando droid, and a new one on top of that. In his circuits, he only had one thought. Eliminate the clones, as per he was ordered. For that, he was holding his E-5, and had a vibroblade on his back. After the clones had blown up a door, and escaped that way, he and the other commando droids had stayed behind, and let the ordinary B-1 and B-2 units take the lead. They would only attack when the enemy had been weakened. Fast, efficient, and merciless, for foes and friends, that was how commando droids operated. T-S-5 could hear the sounds of battle, and see the light of lasers ahead. As such, it came as a huge surprise for him when he felt someone grab his neck, and put a blaster against the back of his head. Before the commando droid could use its superior flexibility and strength to escape, the blaster fired. At point blank, his entire head exploded, becoming a mess of wires and sparks. The clone that was responsible for his death held the T-S-5's body in a well-practiced manner, using its tough body as a mobile cover. The single horn on his helmet glinted as sparks flew up, and he smiled. Three minutes earlier. The droids were fast to follow the clones. Not knowing where the corridor led, the Republic forces had to be even more careful, and the clankers were catching up pretty fast. Suddenly, Dager saw the troopers that were in front of him stop and curse. It's a dead end. A storage room of some sort. Stopping dead on his tracks, Dager stretched his neck, and saw many boxes and crates. He could also see blasters hanging on one of the walls. Open one of the crates. What is in it? E-5 magazines, sir. A lot of them. Dager nodded, and looked at Commander Bly. The yellow paint on his helmet was dirty, contrasting with the black visor. Are you thinking what I am, Bly? Ammunition deposit, a bunch of angry clankers, and two lightsaber-wielding enemies? I sure am. Brain, you stay here, and follow Bly's orders. Hell Squad, you come with me. Commander Bly had already been moving and ordering the clones to set up a defense when he heard Dager, and stopped. Turning around, he looked at the clone. What the hell are you planning? Dager grinned. The droids had used a pincer move on them before, but now he thought it was time to give the Seppis a taste of their own tactics. You will see. Now, come on, we don't have time to waste. Going back, Hell Squad hid behind the indents on the walls. Squeezing himself against the wall as best as he could, Dager saw the clankers running, their backs turned to him. Soon, he heard lasers being fired, and clones and droids screaming alike. Looking at Tech, who was on the other side of the corridor, Dager gestured for him to wait. When the last droid, a commando, went past them, Dager got out of his hiding spot, grabbed the droid's neck, put his DC-17 against his head, and pulled the trigger. Without letting the body fall to the floor, Dager did the same thing he had done countless times before, and used it as cover. Cell, Tech, 3-4, and Dab had done the same, and Metal pulled his double-barrel repeating blaster out. When the commando droids in the back of the clanker group turned around, hearing the blasters being fired, Hell Squad took them down in mere seconds. Several shots hit the dead commando droids that the clones were holding, and only a few got through, doing nothing else than scratching Hell Squad's armor. Dager fired his pistol wildly, each laser hitting the head of a commando droid accurately. They were the biggest threat, so they had to be taken care of first. 
more feeling than seeing a laser come towards his head, Dager lifted the droid corpse he was holding, and used it as a shield. The impact was enough to make his arm numb, and he unwillingly released his protection. Metal. Off. The moment his cover was gone, Dager ducked to the side, and, at the same time, called the heavy machine gunner. The torrent of blue lasers sent the clankers flying back, giving Dager a precious two seconds that he used to get up and hide in a crevice on the wall. Quickly reloading his DC-17, Dager held it in his left hand, and fired at the droids while only showing half of his body. Caught between two fires, the once 200-strong droid force was reduced to nothing. Obviously, the clones had to pay a price for it. Of 17 soldiers that entered the ammunition deposit, only 12 left. Commander Bly was unharmed, and the worst injury the troopers had were some flesh wounds, nothing too serious. Seeing that, Dager ordered them to go back the way they came, and towards the exit. Commander Bly and Dager had the same rank, but seeing the 303rd clone being so decisive and serious, he followed his orders without hesitation. Dager had an aura of command around him, and instilled confidence in the others. Generals, we are nearing the exit. We also planted some explosives at their ammo depot. As soon as you get out, we can blow it up. Do it, Commander. Don't wait for us. Dager looked at Commander Bly, surprised. He had done his fair share of crazy things with General D, but never did he blow up a building while his superior was still inside. Do it, Dager. We have our ways of getting out. Before Dager could answer, Commander Bly grabbed the comlink from his hands. No can do, General. We are not leaving you behind. He didn't have that big of a connection with neither of the Jedis, but he wouldn't blow up the ammunition deposit and risk their lives. Worse came to worse, they simply wouldn't explode the fortress. Their target was Commander Wolf, and they were almost getting him out. Bly, you have to believe in me and Master Piello. If you don't blow up this building, Ventress and Grievous will receive reinforcements sooner or later, and then we will be really doomed. For a few seconds, Commander Bly said nothing, conflicted. As someone who had been forced to leave his general behind once, Dajer knew what was going on through his brother's head. Finally, the clone sighed, and nodded to Dajer. Tell us when it is time. Dajer still didn't like the idea, but General Secura was Commander Bly's superior officer, not his. Hell Squad was merely a support unit in this operation, so they had to follow the Jedi's lead. After killing the clankers that were after them, getting out of the fortress was quite easy. When they got to the ship with Commander Wolf, they saw several dead droids scattered around it. Approaching carefully, they found a dead trooper near the lower ramp. Gesturing with his head to Dager, Commander Bly pulled out his DC 17s. They were better for close quarters combat. Fortunately, the blasted weren't needed. They soon found the six other clones that stayed on the ship, one of them bleeding profusely from a wound on the stomach. Dajer quickly told 3 4 to work on him, and called the Jedis. Chapter 241 We are on the ship, General. Commander Wolf is safe. We are just waiting for you. Behind the hushed voice of General Secura, Dajer could hear the sound of lightsabers clashing, sick coughing, and footsteps. It was clear that the Jedis were having to fight for every step of the way back. Blow it! Blow it now! Dajer hesitated for a moment, and glanced at Commander Bly. The clone nodded, and so, Dajer took a deep breath, and pressed the switch. At first, nothing happened. Then, suddenly, the entire fortress shook. Bits and pieces of it started collapsing, revealing a cloud of fire and smoke beneath. They are out, sir. Dajer shifted his macro binoculars to the exit of the fortress, in time to see General Secura and General PLO Kuhn running. The series of explosions that brought the building down followed in their heels. Unfortunately, they weren't the only ones that escaped the fortress. Ventress and the metallic abomination got out too, followed by a dozen commando droids. Take off. Commander, take off. Dajer was able to hear the Jedis even without using the communicator. He quickly relayed the orders to the pilot, and the ship got off the ground, the lower ramp still opened. While the ship was lifting, Dajer knelt, 
doing his best to not fall and fire at the clankers at the same time. It wasn't easy. The commando droids were quite far, and were agile enough to dodge almost every laser. The fact that the clones were firing from a moving ship also didn't help. Red lasers hit the ramp in several spots, some even ricocheting in the inside of the ship. Since it was hovering 20 meters above the ground, the Seppis also had difficulties aiming at the clones. Most of their shots hit the underside of the ship, leaving scorch marks and nothing else. General. Seeing the two Jedis approaching, Dajer stopped firing, and grabbed one of the support poles with one hand, and stretched the other. Although she was on the ground, 20 meters below Dajer, at this moment General Secura turned off her lightsaber, and jumped. The seemingly impossible jump was easily completed by her, and she landed softly on the ramp, ignoring Dajer's hand. Once there, she pulled out her lightsaber again, and started deflecting lasers. General PLO Kuhn was the next one. He used the force to push back Ventress and the monster that was with her, and jumped up. Right when he landed in the ramp, however, his injured leg gave up, and he stumbled backwards. Before he fell, though, two hands held him, and pulled him back. The Jedi nodded briefly, acknowledging Dajer's and Tech's help, and turned to the Separatist below. After seeing the two Jedi's escape, Ventress had ordered the commando droids to stand down, and stop firing. Dajer could see hatred burning in her eyes as she looked at them. The being next to her was angrily swinging his two lightsabers at the ground, leaving deep, burning scars on it. We will get you next time, Jedi scum. I will enjoy killing you both, slowly. And you, Dajer, sweetie. I hope the destruction of your legion was painful. I wish I could have been there, and eliminated that Jedi general of yours with my own. Hell Squad wasn't able to listen to Ventress' hateful words. When she started talking about the 303rd, Dajer couldn't hold himself back anymore. He pressed the trigger of his blaster, only releasing it after the weapon started overheating in his hands. The six clones behind him did the same. No matter how good she was with the Force, Ventress was caught by surprise. She had assumed the clones would listen quietly, but she hadn't thought of the impact her words would have on Hell Squad. A laser hit her thigh, making her kneel in pain. Her two lightsabers waved around, deflecting the dozens of blue lasers coming for her. It was only after the monster next to her intertwined and helped, that she was able to get up. Listening to the sick coughing, and the cackling laughter, her hatred for Hell Squad and Dajer grew bigger. Time after time, the clone had escaped from her hands, and ruined her plans more than once. Cutting in half a commando droid next to her, which had been stupid enough to try and assist her, Ventress glanced at Dajer. The ship was getting farther and farther up the sky, but she could still clearly see them. I will eliminate you, clone. And I will make sure to make you and your squad suffer in despair. Up in the ship, Dajer ignored Ventress, and pressed a button inside the cargo compartment, making the lower ramp close. Ventress wanted to eliminate him, and he would welcome her to try at any moment. She had caused a lot of pain to him, and Beryl wasn't the only brother of his that she had eliminated. She might be a Sith, but he had confidence in Hell Squad. How is Wolf doing? The medical droid is taking a look at him, General. He should be awake in about twelve hours. According to the droid, his wounds aren't too deep, so he shouldn't be still unconscious. Apparently, there was some kind of damage to his mind. Hearing Commander Bly and the two Jedis talking, Dajer frowned. He was very familiar with Wolf's condition. It was Ventress, sir. What do you mean? When I was tortured by her, she didn't use just the normal tools. She eliminated my men in front of me. And she used the Force. She got into my mind, to the point where I didn't know how I was, and on which side. General Secura frowned. Jedis never used their powers to torture and break the mind of the people, but she knew it was possible. Is that why she hates you so much, Commander? Because you didn't tell her what she wanted. Dajer sighed, and looked at the sleeping Commander Wolf. With his wounds dressed, and after treatment, he clearly was better, but his eyebrows were furrowed, a sign of the nightmares getting worse. Without him realizing, his hand touched the scar on his face, making the Jedi's exchange a curious glance. I don't know what I told her, 
General. All I remember is pain and darkness. And, I don't mean to say we can't trust Wolf, but I don't think he will remember it either. They escaped. And now the child will become another Jedi. Looking at the ship flying into space, Ventress snarled at General Grievous. She couldn't believe they let the Jedis escape, and, worse than all, she wasn't able to break Commander Wolf. She didn't know where the Force-sensitive child was. Kakaka. Cough. The Jedi. Will lead us to to the child, assassin. I am not as stupid as you. Captain, is the tracker in position? Ventress glanced at the clanker, and then at General Grievous. Her anger turned into embarrassment, caused by the droid abomination outwitting her, and then turned into joy. Since they had a tracker on the ship, they would know exactly where the Jedis were going. Thinking about the punishments that she just escaped, Ventress could not help but shudder. And glancing at General Grievous, she was stunned by the intelligence the abomination showed. She suddenly realized that she had to be more careful around it. Chapter 242 General Commander Wolf opened his eyes slightly, and closed then again soon after. He had grown used to the darkness of his cell, and the light hurt his eyes. After a few seconds, his vision returned, and he sat up. He felt pain all over his body, but especially in his head. The nightmares had been a lot worse recently, ever since. Suddenly, his memories came back, and he shuddered. Before he could delve too deeply into those memories, though, he felt a hand on his shoulder, and a wave of calmness hit him. Glancing up, he saw the familiar face of his general. Stay down, Wolf. You suffered a lot back there. Shaking his head, Commander Wolf frowned. The moment he had put the Force-sensitive child in the escape pod, he knew he would be tortured. That didn't scare him before, and it didn't scare him now. What was important was that he hadn't told Ventress anything, and he knew where the child was. Falleen. The child is there. It was General P.L.O. Kuhn's turn to frown. Falleen is a to-be battleground. Why send the boy there? There wasn't much of an option, sir. It was the closest planet. The only one in range of the escape pod, in fact. I told the child to hide somewhere near where he landed. General P.L.O. Kuhn furrowed his eyebrows, pondering. After a few seconds, his complexion eased. He knew Commander Wolf had done all he could to keep the boy safe. I will call General Undulai, sir. We were already thinking of speeding up our plans, this will only confirm it. In the meantime, try to contact our troops on the planet. See if they found a human child that fits the description. Hearing the familiar voice, Commander Wolf looked up, and, for the first time, noticed that he and General P.L.O. Kuhn weren't alone. General Secura, Commander Bly, and Dager were also there. The one who just talked was Dager. He nodded at Commander Wolf, and left the room. The commander knew Dager was now the leader of a true special unit, so he wasn't surprised they were sent to rescue him. Droid, take care of him. Trooper, tell the pilot to change the course to Falleen. Although he was a tough soldier, Commander Wolf didn't complain when General P.L.O. Kuhn forced him to stay on the bed. He knew he wouldn't be of much help in battle in his current state, so he had to rest and recover. Commander, there is something you might want to see. Commander Bly and Dager were sitting on a table at the canteen of the ship when a clone ran up to them with a data pad, and gave it to his superior. What is it, Bly? I don't know yet. Maybe nothing. Probably nothing. Here, take a look. He handed over the data pad to Dager, and he glanced at its contents. It showed the sensors of the cargo bay and hull going off. Scanners revealed a commando droid had entered the ship, but left a few seconds later. It probably got in during the battle. But why would it leave? I have no idea. Trooper, get Surgeon Sketch. Tell him it's urgent. Right away, Commander. After the trooper left, Dager glanced at his brother. What are you thinking? I don't know yet. Sketch was in charge of the ship's defense. If he tells me he saw the commando droid and put it on the run, then nothing. If he didn't, then we might have a problem. Sergeant Sketch gave then a negative answer. 
the commando droid had entered and left the ship at its own volition. Whatever it wanted, it got. We need to talk with the Jedis. Now. Deja nodded, and followed Commander Bly. He could think of several reasons why the commando droid entered the ship, and none were good. They found General PLO Kuhn and General Secura meditating together. As soon as the two clones entered the room, they opened their eyes, and looked at them. You are worried. Commander Bly quickly explained what happened, and both Jedis frowned. What do you two think the droid was after? Dajer looked at the 327th commander, but he shrugged, indicating that Dajer should be the one to talk. There are a lot of possibilities, General Secura. Worst case scenario, he sabotaged the ship, but I don't think that is likely. The hyperdrive is working perfectly, and so are the engines and the main computer. Any chances they changed the coordinates without us knowing? I already had tech check it out. No one tapped into the mainframe. In fact, the commando clanker didn't even get to a control panel before he left. You said sabotage was the worst possible outcome. What is the second worst? The clanker planted a tracker in the ship, and will know exactly where the youngling is. That is most probably what happened. Commander, order the pilot to get out of hyperspace immediately. We need to find and destroy that tracker. Deja nodded, but before he could even turn on his comm link, the ship shook slightly, and the hyperspace outside became the black infinity of the void. Cursing at their luck, and at the fact that they took too long to discover the tracker, Dajer pulled up their coordinates. Faline, generals. We were too late. General PLO Kuhn frowned, but then got up. He believed the force worked in strange ways. If it brought them to Faline, so be it. Ayla, contact Master Undulai. Tell her we need immediate assistance and that the Separatist will attack Faleen. How long do you think we have, Commander? They can't follow us through hyperspace. The tracker can only start relaying its signal now. So, we have anywhere between two and five days before they arrive. That is enough. Master Undulai and her fleet should get here before that. While they set up defenses, we will look for the young Cal Kestis. This is a race against time. If we don't find the boy without the Separatist interfering, we won't find him when the entire planet is thrown in a war. Commander Bly and Deja nodded, and left the room. They had a lot to do before they landed on Foleen. Jean. Rao. We received a response from the. Tracker on the Republic. Ship. Where? Where? Faline system, General. We also detected a Republic fleet moving to jump position. According to our BZZ. Calculations, Faline is one of the possible destinations. That is it. My dear General, I have to admit that, for once, you were more intelligent than a droid. Shut up, assassin. Pilot, plot our course to Faline. Taking heavy steps towards the window, General Grievous put his hands behind his back, and looked out. A huge fleet with dozens of ships entered hyperspace one after another. Soon, the Clone Wars would arrive at a new planet. Slowly but surely, the entire galaxy was being engulfed in this war. Meanwhile, in the planet of Faline, a young human child, about four or five years old, was crouching in a corner, hiding behind a trash bin. The young Cal Kestis had no idea a huge battle was about to start because of him. At the moment, all he worried about were the armed men facing him. What do we have here? Chapter 243 What did you say? A Rodian cowered behind a table, looking at a Kel door. Behind the Kel door, a Twi'lek and several clone soldiers, with different armors, looked menacingly at him. T the Pikes took him. Three days ago. A human boy. Some people tried to capture him, but he pushed them using. I don't know what it was. It was supernatural, and not from this galaxy. That was what we call the Force. And that young child is one of us. So, tell me where I can find the pikes. Seeing the Kel Dor shift his brown robes to the side, the Rodian followed his hands, and gasped in surprise. Hanging on the man's waist was a short metal stick. A lightsaber. 
stumbling backwards, the Rodian tripped on a chair and fell on the ground. Since all eyes on the bar were already on them, the noise didn't bother anyone. They were all too worried about the fact that there was a Jedi in the same room as them. Jedis had powers no one understood, and were feared by most. Th they have a base. On the west side of the city. Th that is all I know. I promise. Scoffing at the Rodian, the Jedi and his companions turned around, and left the bar. Not five minutes after, two men walked up to the Rodian, who was still shivering. One of them murmured something on his ear, while the other stabbed him with a dagger. A few people on the bar looked curiously when they heard the Rodian groaning in pain, but seeing who his assailants were, they quickly turned back to their drinks. The Jedis instilled fear in them, but not as much as the Pike Syndicate did. When he stepped out of the bar, Dajer glanced warily at the surroundings. Short buildings, covered in mold and black stains, and trash on the streets. Droids and several tall people, with light green skin, Faleen, natives of the planet, yelled, trying to sell all kinds of things. The group, which consisted of two Jedis, General PLO Kuhn and General Secura, and twenty clones, Hell Squad and thirteen soldiers of the 327th, had landed on the capital of Faleen, and soon got the news that a child using the force had been seen. The rumors led them to this bar, where they found the Rodian, who in turn told them everything. Holding his DC 15A up to his torso, Dajer warded off several street vendors and looked at General PLO Kuhn. The Pike Crime Syndicate, General. That is bad news. Slightly waving his hand, the Jedi made the people step back and leave them. While glancing at a map of the city that General Secura showed him, he answered Dajer. They don't know that the boy is part of the Jedi Order. As long as we ask, they will return him. I wouldn't be so sure of that, sir. The Pikes have a reputation of not respecting anyone. General Secura stopped and turned around to look at Dajer. Cal Kestis is, still, a youngling. If those bandits don't hand him over for good, we will take him by force. Ayla is right, Commander, although she is harsh. We Jedis might be keepers of the peace, but we won't let anyone suffer in the hands of a crime family like the Pikes, even more a youngling. Dajer shrugged, and shut up. The Jedis were going to rescue the Force-sensitive child regardless of what he said. Commander Wolf looked at him, a bit discontent that Dajer had questioned his general, but said nothing. Generals, should I call in for reinforcements? General Unguli and the 41st will arrive soon. No time, Bly. We can't let the young one stay on the hands of the Pike Syndicate for long. What they can do to him could ruin his entire life, maybe even turn him to the dark side. Dark side. It wasn't the first time Dajer heard those two words, and they were mainly associated with Ventress. Thinking back to General D's death, and Ragu's expression that day, he couldn't help but wonder what was the relationship between the good side and the dark side. For him, it seemed just a difference between the color of their lightsabers and for which side they were fighting. Shaking his head, he followed the Jedis. He was a clone and a soldier. His job was to fight and follow orders, not think. Sir, a group of Republic scum is asking about the boy we captured yesterday. One rat told them where our base is. Was he taken care of? Bring the child here. I don't want to mess with the Jedi Order, not when a war is happening. I will try to elude them. If this fails, then we will use the child as a bargaining chip. In a large hall, two shadows finished talking. One of them bowed to the other, and left. The one that remained stood quiet for a long time, lost in thought. Vara, prepare the ship to leave Jedis and clones in Faleen, it is not a good sign. The Clone Wars are finally arriving here. Put all our savings on it. We are moving. What about our men? Small fries. Leave them. A third figure, which had been hiding in the shadows, unnoticed, left the hall. The first person got up from his chair, and walked to a landing platform outside the building. Droid, come here. He put a hologram projector on a small spider-like droid. Soon, a red-haired human boy was brought, tied up, to him. The man locked the child and the droid together, 
and entered a ship that was sent to pick him up. Half an hour later, the doors of the building were blasted apart, and several clones, holding their blasters up, invaded. Clear. Clear. Clear two. First floor is empty, Commander. I will take the second floor, Deja you take the third. Nicked, blast, forge, with me. That won't be necessary. The moment they heard the voice, the troopers turned around, and aimed their blasters at the source. Of course, veterans like they were, several of them kept their eyes pry to any danger, in case the voice was a distraction. Fortunately, it wasn't. A droid approached them, and a human-sized hologram was on it. The clones, however, ignored the hologram for now, because there was a boy chained to the droid. Dajer instantly knew it had to be Calcestis. Tech, free him. The trooper quickly opened it, and helped the child up. All clear, generals. After receiving the sign from Commander Bly, General Secura and General PLO Kuhn walked into the building. Seeing the young and tired boy, both of them used the force to move him towards them. Don't worry, young Cal. We got you now. Everything is going to be okay. I'm Master PLO. Are we going to the Jedi Temple? Hee <laughs> hee. Soon. Now, rest. General PLO Kuhn waved his hand in front of the child, and he quickly fell asleep. Holding him on his arms, General PLO Kuhn nodded at General Secura, and left the building, followed by Commander Wolf and three troopers. The Chuilek Jedi watched their departure, then turned to face the hologram. It showed a small person, but with a huge, blood-red mask, adorned by several spikes. On his hands, he carried a scepter with a giant white crystal. Master Jedi. It is good to see you. I was hoping. Who are you, and why did you capture a youngling of the Jedi Order? Chapter 244 Master Jedi, my name is Fife. I am the leader of the Pike Syndicate in this region of the galaxy. As for the child, I don't believe he has become a member of the Jedi Order. In fact, my sources tell me he hasn't even become a youngling yet. Isn't that why you and the Separatist brought war to this planet? To decide who keeps him. General Secura was flustered, and didn't know what to say. Clearly, everything Fife had said it was right. But don't worry, Master Jedi. I already gave the boy back to you, didn't I? The Jedi wasn't stupid. She knew that the Pike Syndicate had the means to disappear with Cal Kestis, so that the Jedi Order could never find him or them. Otherwise, the Republic wouldn't have such trouble to extinguish the crime families. And, since Fife brought this up now, that means he was ready to tell the main reason why he left the child behind. Say what you want at once. Fife smiled. Sometimes he wondered how Jedis could be so powerful, but at the same time so dumb. She had fallen right into his trap. Well, since you want to pay back my favor, Master Jedi, I won't decline it. What? General Secura was completely stunned, only now realizing that the Pike had been leading the conversation since the start, all to arrive at this point. Now, he made it look like she and the Jedi Order were in debt with him. You see, Master Jedi, I already left Falin, but some of my ships are still there. Considering there is a war, which you brought, approaching the planet now, I would appreciate it if you let those ships leave without thinking too much. I would hate if the next time we interacted, we couldn't help each other. That was a naked threat, but there was nothing General Secura could do about it. Of course, she could decide to ignore it and stop all ships leaving Falin, but it would do no good for them, and would prompt the Pike Syndicate to be unwelcoming towards the Republic in the future. All right, Fife. We won't stop your ships. Thank you, Master Jedi. Then, I shall take my leave I look forward to many pleasant cooperations in the future. Kakik. In your dreams. Kakik. The hologram disappeared, leaving behind Fife's laugh. He had played General Secura, and she could do nothing about it. He had to admit, it was a good feeling. How was the situation with the Pike Crime Syndicate settled? Unfortunately, we had to let them go. However, we rescued Cal. 
The serious expression on General Undulai's face eased when she looked at the boy that General Sakura pushed forward. M. Master. Smiling at the awkward and slightly terrified youngling, General Undulai turned to General PLO Kun and General Sakura. That is no problem. What is important is that he is safe. You will become an apprentice and, one day, a Jedi, Cal. Now a true youngling, Cal nodded to the three Jedis, and walked back. All right, let's discuss battle plans. Commander Gree, please. A clone with fully green armor stepped forward. The 41st Elite Corps fought mostly in jungle planets like Felucia, so their armor was fully camouflaged. Generals, commanders. Our plans will be pretty simple. The fleet will keep them on the skies for as long as we can hold. However, considering they have about the same number of ships as they, a few will get past. When that happens, the ground defense will be up to you. Commander Bly and Commander Wolf nodded. The 41st had prepared several ground defenses, but since Commander Gree would be in the capital ship, those defenses would be left for the two commanders. As for you, Commander Dager, I believe you already know your assignments. The day before, Dager had discussed Hell Squad's participation on the battle with General Undulai and General PLO Kun, since they were members of the Jedi Council, and, consequently, the highest ranking officers in Falim. Acknowledging General Undulai's subtle order for him to explain, Dager stepped forward and pulled up a hologram of a recusant class destroyer. That is their capital ship. The plan is that, while our fleet is locked into a fight with theirs, Hell Squad will enter that destroyer and take it out. Without it, all droid units on the ground should turn off, leaving only their ships for us to deal with. How do we know that the signal controlling their droids is coming from this ship? We don't. However, it doesn't make sense for them to put their controls anywhere else. The destroyer is the strongest and most fortified ship they have and, if it isn't that ship, at least we will have taken a recusant class destroyer out of the picture. And how exactly do you plan on destroying that ship? Dager looked at General Secura, who asked the question, and then zoomed in into the hologram, showing two red spots in the front and back of the ship. Those are energy cells. Every big-sized ship has them, and they are highly unstable. We will deactivate the protection mechanism, and the energy cells will do the rest. The cells are usually guarded by multiple layers of shields, both to stop invaders and to contain the energy inside them. How will you get past them? And, even if you do, how will you leave the ship? You won't have more than three minutes to get out of it before it blows up. Dager grinned slightly. All the worries the Jedi had were true, but that was because she didn't know Hell Squad well. She, like most of the people on the galaxy, treated them as normal soldiers, maybe a tad better than the other clones. They weren't normal troopers. The shields only protect against energy waves. It can stop lasers, not a person. We just have to walk past them. As for leaving the destroyer, it will be tight, but it isn't nothing Hell Squad hasn't done before. It was a bold statement, one that few clones would dare to make. However, Dager was one of them. Every Jedi on the room had either heard about or seen Hell Squad's abilities, and although they weren't sure if they could pull this off, they knew they were the best option for the mission. The reports from our spies just arrived, General. Hand them over. General Grievous looked at the data pad in his hands, and a glint of cruelty flashed through his eyes. The King of Falin had joined the Republic, and his troops would fight alongside the clone army. That would make the battle tougher, but he didn't care about how many clankers he lost. In fact, he saw an opportunity. Assassin. What is it, dear General? Do you want me to put an end to your suffering? Shut up. I have a job you are certain to like. Oh. And what is it? Killing a king. Kaka kaka. Ventress smiled. That sure was a mission she would enjoy. Chapter 245 Dager hit his head hard, and almost passed out. Thankfully, he was strapped to his seat, so he wasn't sent flying after the forceful landing. Well, it was more accurate to call it a forceful crash. It was exactly one week after the Separatist arrived, and the battle began. Hell Squad partook in several skirmishes on the planet's surface, 
but they spent most of the time in the 41st capital ship, waiting for an opportunity to board the recusant class destroyer. When it finally came, it was at a high cost. Seven pilots died to open a path towards the ship. Only after that tech was able to half land, half crash their gunship into the upper hangar. Getting up, Dejer verified all the members of Hell Squad were all right. They sure were. Tech, you seriously need to go back to Kamino and train with the Shines. How can you be a pilot if every time you crash the ship? First Geonosis, and now here. Very funny, Metal. You know I am no pilot. However, we couldn't bring someone else with us. Tech is right. It would probably mean his death. You three, quiet. What is our next step, Commander? After Brain put the clones in order, he turned to Dager. To tell the truth, although they were joking and playing around, even though they were by themselves in an enemy ship, in no moment Hell Squad was distracted. Their gaze was darting around, and their weapons were ready. They didn't need a reminder to pay attention. They were too experienced for this. Follow the plan. Brain, Metal, Cell, and Dab, go to the first energy cell. Tech and 3-4, we will go to the second. When I say it, turn off the protection mechanism. What if they jam communications? They won't, otherwise they will cause interference with their own clankers. But, if they do that, you turn it off when you think it is time. If that happens, the first team to get to the escape pods go, don't wait for the other. The clones nodded, acknowledging his orders, so Dager moved out of the crashed lot. Most of the droids were on the surface of Falleen, and the vultures were fighting outside. That meant that aside from ten or so sepis, the upper hangar was empty. Needless to say, the poor B-1 units didn't withstand a chance against Hell Squad. After splitting up, Dager led Tech and 3-4 to the back of the destroyer. It didn't take long for them to encounter the first batch of droids, sent to investigate the gunship that crashed. Five droids lost their heads before the others noticed what was happening. Without giving them any time to react, Dager pressed the trigger of his DC-15A. Another three droids died in all hot a second, and the two clones who were with him took care of the remaining four. Anyone got hit? Nope. Then let's keep moving. The clones nodded, and ran. A few minutes after, Dager suddenly felt a tingling sensation near his right ear, so he cranked his neck to the left. A laser scratched his cheek, leaving a black line on his helmet. He dove to the side, hiding behind a door, and Tech and 3-4 did the same. The three were pressed together, but it was the only thing that slightly resembled any kind of cover. How many? Sixteen. No, eighteen. Two more just showed up. Okay. It will be just like Kamino. I distract, you attack. A lot of things happened on Kamino, but I don't remember that being one of them. Ah, uh, shut up, three-four. You are starting to sound just like Brain. Dager almost hit them both. They were pinned down, three against eighteen, and they were still joking. He traded his DC-15A by Tech's DC-15S, and put three fingers up. On three. One, two. Three. He slid out of the doorway, holding Tech's DC-15S on one hand and his own DC-17 on the other. Several lasers flew over his head, and a dozen others hit the ground in front of him. Thankfully, the droids weren't able to adjust their aim too fast, otherwise he would be dead for sure. He fired his blasters, killing three droids instantly. Two other clankers fell to the floor, missing a leg, which had been busted up from their knee joint. Their plan worked flawlessly. When the Seppis aimed down to fire at Dager, 3-4 and Tech jumped out of cover, and returned it. Twenty seconds later, all eighteen clankers were dead on the floor, and the three clones were unscathed. If anyone saw it, they wouldn't believe, because the odds were terribly against them. However, for Hell Squad, that was just normal. They had several encounters with clankers on their way to the energy cell, but each and every one of the droids was quickly taken care of. Commander, we are in position. Hearing Brain's voice through his comm link, Dager briefly answered for him to wait, and ordered Tech and 3-4 to quicken their pace. 
it took another ten minutes for Daedra's group to get to the energy cell. What greeted them was a hole in the middle of the ship, one side connected to the other by bridges without railing. In the exact center of that hole was a giant, blue pillar. Several shields kept a mass of blue lightning, almost liquid-like, apart from the outside. Past the shields, just before the center of the energy cell, was a control panel. Dajer looked to the sides, and saw no droids. Glancing at his two brothers, he gestured at the energy cell. All right, let's go. Tech, you work your magic. 3-4, stay sharp. The three clones quickly ran over the bridge, and passed through the shields. Each layer held on to them for a few seconds before returning to their original position. Now, just one shield separated them and the raw energy. If they touched it, their entire body would be fried to a crisp in less than a second. While Tech started tampering with the energy cell's controls, Dager turned on his comlink. Brain, we are ready. Wait two minutes and deactivate the protection mechanism. With please. Commander Dager. Commander Dager, come in. Brain was suddenly cut off by General Unduli. The urgency in her voice was clear. Dager here. What is it, General? Listen to me carefully. Abort your mission. Abort your mission now. W.H. Watt. We are already at the energy cells, General. We just need a few more minutes. You don't have time. We are in full retreat. The Separatists were much stronger than we expected. The Fallen King is dead. Ventress murdered him. His forces either ran away or were eliminated, and we suffered heavy casualties. His eyes opened wide when he heard that. They were so close, and it had been so easy so far, he couldn't accept Hell Squad had to run. How much time do we need, Tech? Ninety seconds. We can do this, General. No, you can't, Commander. Listen to me. We are retreating. If you don't get out off this ship in three minutes, we won't be there to pick you up. And that is not all. Grievous is up there. Retreat, Dager. That's an order. Chapter 246 Grievous is up there. Retreat now, Dager. That's an order. Dager clenched his hands. The highly obedient and disciplined soldier in him was screaming that he followed his orders and aborted the mission. However, a small part of him, one that he didn't know was there, but which was growing battle after battle, told him that he couldn't. If they could take out the destroyer, then maybe the droids would stop working, and the Republic wouldn't have to take another loss. They couldn't afford to lose. He couldn't afford to lose, not immediately after Ryloth. We will deal with Grievous when he comes to us, General. Leave the system. Hell Squad will find a way out of this, or we will die taking a whole destroyer with us. I gave you an order. Leave this ship, now. Dager out. He turned off his comlink. Tech and 3-4 were looking at him, unsure of what to do. On one hand, they couldn't disobey a direct order given by a Jedi general. On the other, they also couldn't bear to leave their mission unfinished. You heard me. We complete our mission. At most we will die, and if we are lucky, we will bring Grievous with us. They nodded. Their blood made them want to follow their orders, but Dager had been their leader, and their brother, for as long as they remembered. Their respect for him wasn't something anyone could compare. They wouldn't hesitate to follow him even to certain death, whatsoever now, when they already had a plan to escape the ship. Whatever happened later, they would deal with it. On the other side of the destroyer, Brain heard everything. He nodded to himself, and ordered Dab to deactivate the protection mechanism as soon as possible. The Venator-class cruiser rumbled as several laser cannon shots landed on its shields. General Unduli looked back at the leading ship of the Separatist offense. A squad of seven clones had disobeyed her orders, and stayed there, instead of retreating. Unfortunately for Hell Squad, even if they destroyed the recusant class destroyer, and even if the droids stopped working, it would be too late for the Republic. The 41st Fleet had already lost several ships, and had no option but to escape. What happened, Master Undulai? She turned around and glanced at General Secura and General PLO Kuhn. 
Commanders Wolf, Bly, and Gree were behind them. Hell Squad decided to complete their mission, regardless of the cost. Admiral, give the order. We are leaving. Abotham, the admiral of her fleet, nodded. In a few seconds, the Republic cruisers and corvettes disappeared, entering hyperspace. What is their plan? I don't think they have a plan, Commander. You know them better than I do. Now, their fate is on their own hands. My lord, you asked for frequent reports on Hell Squad. On a well-lit room in Coruscant, Grand Chancellor Palpatine was looking at some documents when a Senate guard in red armor approached him. Glancing up, he flashed a warm smile at the guard, who, in turn, shuddered. He knew that under the facade of a good man, was a vicious and merciless killer. Yes, I did. They are a powerful tool, one that we must groom and use carefully. Tell me. The Senate guard bowed, and started his report. Yes, my lord. We think that there might be a problem with their chips. A few minutes ago, they disobeyed a direct order from a Jedi. Oh. That shouldn't be possible. Their chips control them so they will follow even a command to eliminate themselves. I already reported it to the Kaminoans. They will analyze their data, but they think it may be because of Ryloth. The impact of losing their entire legion could have been too much, and overrode the chips. Has any of the survivors of their legion showed the same symptoms? A few, but not as pronounced as them. Chancellor Palpatine frowned, and put a hand on his chin, thinking. It was too soon. He couldn't risk the chips being discovered. His plan wasn't complete yet. Maybe he would have to eliminate Hell Squad. They were a unit he would like to have near to him in the future, but if needed be. My lord. Should we bring them in for? Repairs? Suddenly, the Chancellor raised his hand, forming a claw, and the Senate Guard was pulled up in the air. His hands instinctively grabbed his throat, trying to release whatever was suffocating him, but there was nothing there. That would be too suspicious. No, we will wait. You said other soldiers of the 303rd showed similar actions, didn't you? Why yes, my Elor Lord. Chancellor Palpatine unclenched his hand, and the guard fell to the ground, gasping for air. When he looked up, he saw the Chancellor right in front of him, a smile on his face. Choose one of those clones. Modify his chip so the regulator fails at some moment. Then we will have a reason to verify the chips of all clones, including Hell Squad. And, remember, don't tell this to anyone. Not even the Kaminoans. I understand, my lord. And, just to make sure the chip is working, after you do that, throw yourself off the side of the Senate. Make it look like an accident. The Senate guard stumbled, terrified. However, something inside of him made him feel that it was a normal order. After a few seconds of shocked confusion, he nodded. He had his orders, he would follow them. The Chancellor grinned creepily. A few minutes later, he put on a sad expression when he received the news that one of his personal guards had tripped into a gonk droid, and unfortunately was sent over the railings, and crashed into the ground 300 floors below. How long do you need, Tech? 14 seconds. And how long before it all blows up? 6 minutes. Brain, how are you there? Same thing, sir. We will be in time. 8 seconds. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. We are ready. Us too. Do it. Tech pulled down a lever, and, instantly, red lights lit up, as sirens warned every personal to evacuate the ship. Once the protection mechanism was deactivated, there was no turning back. Brain, meet us at the escape pods. Roger that. When they were halfway through the bridge, Dager looked back to the energy cell. It was now entirely red, and several holes appeared in the shields. Clankers. Turning back after hearing 3-4 yell, Dager saw two dozen B-1 units blocking their way. Thinking of the giant explosion that would happen in a few minutes, Dager fired his blaster. Only way out is forward. The set pie that he hit fell to the side, into the insides of the ship. 
Tech and 3-4 also fired their blasters, and several droids died and fell, some bringing others with them. However, the bridge was too narrow, and it didn't have any cover. When Tech stepped back to dodge a volley of red lasers, his foot touched empty air. Because of the sudden lack of support, he stumbled backwards. Just when he thought it was over for him, a hand grabbed his leg, and he hanged upside down. His blaster and helmet disappeared below. Looking up, he saw Dager holding him with one hand, while using the other to grab the bridge's side and steady himself. Chapter 247 Dager could feel his muscles being ripped apart as he held not only his own weight, but also Tex, using just one hand. His legs hovered above the deep hole inside the destroyer, and, to make matters worse, he could feel his fingers slipping. Dager, Tech. Three four yelled concerned above them, having to fight the clankers at the same time. He had only seen Tech fall off the bridge, and then Dager jump, disappearing himself. The only proof that the two of them were still alive was Dager's fingers on the side of the bridge. Three four, hold them off. Tech, I can't lift us both. You gotta climb yourself. Tech nodded, and tried to curl in a ball, aiming to grab Dager's hand. The movement, however, made them both swing, and Dager groaned in pain as his fingers slipped even more. Tech almost fell once more, and now Dager was holding him by his ankle. Come on, Tech. I can't hold on for much longer. Just a second, sir. Once again, Tech tried to grab Dager's hand. This time, the fact that they were swinging actually helped. Using the extra impulse, Tech grabbed Dager's wrist. His commander then let go of his leg, and Tech was upside down no more. He weaved a sigh of relief, although he was still in a very similar predicament to the one he was before. Tech. You know this isn't my good shoulder. Don't just hang in there. Dager almost let go of the bridge. His entire body, and especially his arm, was burning. He didn't know for how long he could hold on. The fact that several lasers almost hit his hand didn't help. Thankfully for him, Tech was fast to recover from his relief, and quickly climbed, using Dager's body as a ladder. Just when he put his head above the bridge, trying to get on it, he was forced to duck down again. Feeling Tech's weight on his shoulders once more, Dager couldn't help but groan. Tech. Sorry, sir. Hang on in there, I will help 3-4 take care of the seppies and we will pull you up. Just get off me, and I can get up myself. Tech chuckled, completely unfazed by Dager's anger. He knew his commander for too long to believe he really was angry. When he finally got up, he and 3-4 quickly took care of the ten or so clankers that remained. The medic had been hit in the chest, but, once again, thanks to the blast padding, he wasn't too hurt. According to himself, all he felt was a slight pain in the chest. After killing the droids, both troopers turned around, and helped Dager. When he finally was up in the bridge again, Dager made sure the two clones were all right. How are you two? I'm good. I'm okay too, sir. Thanks to you. Dager nodded, and kept walking, kicking the droid bodies off the bridge. It was weirdly satisfying. He and the clones under his command had been through so much, and had saved the lives of each other hundreds of times. That was just another one. Brain paced back and forward nervously, stepping over the bodies of several clankers. He, Metal, Cell, and Dab had just arrived at the escape pods, and, although Dager said they were to go as soon as they could, they decided to wait. It was a unanimous and collective decision. Why are you still here? Brain turned around to see Dager looking at him. His commander was gasping for breath, but that didn't stop him from shouting at his second in command. We. No time. Grievous is behind us. Get into the escape pods. Brain was cut off short by 3 4, as the medic fired at the direction they came from. Now, he could hear the sound of metallic footsteps, and one pair was much heavier than the others. Hell Squad had been briefed about General Grievous after they met the Separatist General on Corbin. Nobody knew where he came from, but General Grievous was an abomination that lived for two reasons only. Obey Count Dooku, and eliminate Jedis. He was half machine, half something else, and had been trained in the Jedi arts. 
He knew no pain and had no morals, and would stop at nothing to complete whatever task his master assigned to him. Brain remembered shuddering in anger when he read the files. The clanker had cruelly eliminated hundreds of his brothers, and tortured dozens more. Thinking of this, Brain wanted to grab his blaster and shoot at General Grievous, but discipline spoke louder, and he entered an escape pod, followed by Tech, Metal, and Cell. Dager, Dab, and 3-4 would have to fit in another pod. Before they could do that, though, Brain saw a giant figure emerge through the door. Three lightsabers waved as he cut the barrel of Dager's blaster, and a kick sent Dab flying. The sniper hit a wall with a loud sound, and fell to the ground motionless. 3-4's fate wasn't much better, and a claw grabbed his neck before lifting him up, and smashing the medic against the ceiling. Dager saw General Grievous, who was at least twenty meters away, suddenly drop on all fours, and crawl forward faster than he could react. When he arrived in front of Dager, his lower half exchanged places with his upper half, in a sickening move that the clone couldn't describe. When the general was back on his feet, his arms had split into four, and he slashed with his lightsabers, cutting Dager's blaster in half. With his foot, he kicked Dab, and he used one of his hands to grab and lift three-four. All of that happened in less than a second. Seeing one of his brothers unconscious, and the other struggling to breathe, Dager dropped his useless blaster, and grabbed his viper blade. He tried to stab it into a crevice between two armor plates on General Grievous' chest, but the Separatist sneered, and released 3-4. As the clone fell, the clanker used his hand to grab and crush the viper blade. The assassin was right. Kakakakaka. You are special, clone. Now, die. A lightsaber swung down, aiming for his head. Dager knew he wasn't able to evade it. However, just when he had accepted he was going to die, the barrel of a blaster appeared between him and General Grievous, aiming directly at the Separatist's face, and fired three times. The clanker was forced to stop the hand that was going for Dager, and bring it back to deflect the blue lasers, giving the clone a chance to stumble backwards. He glanced back, and saw that his savior was Brain. Metal, Tech, and Cell were pulling 3-4 and Dab to the escape pods, while the Grenadier had come to his rescue. Let's go, Commander. Dager nodded, and ran to an escape pod with Brain. With the corner of his eye, he saw two other pods leave the ship, carrying the other members of Hell Squad. He quickly pushed the buttons on the control panel, trying to close the door of the pod as fast as he could, and, for a moment, he thought they were safe. But then, a hand grabbed Brain by the back of the head, and pulled him. Just as the doors closed, Dager saw his brother on the ground, General Grievous' claw-like foot holding him down, and heard the abomination laugh. The pod was ejected, and Dager looked at the destroyer without a reaction. Seconds later, it exploded. No other pod left the ship. Chapter 248 Brain Dager stared at the remains of the recusant class destroyer, looking for any signs that Brain might have survived. He couldn't find any. A part of his mind noticed that many vulture droids were just floating in space, their lights turned off. That meant they were right all along, and that the destroyer was the one controlling the clankers on Falin. The price was too great for Dager to feel any joy. Unfortunately, the Republic had already retreated, and there were still Providence-class dreadnoughts and Munificent-class frigates, as well as the vultures belonging to those ships. Are you there? I, I am here. Cheers erupted from the other members of Hell Squad. They were on other escape pods, so they didn't know what had happened. Metal was the first to notice something was wrong. They had just taken down a destroyer, but Dager didn't say a word. Are you hurt, sir? Or brain? Silence. Dager kept quiet, staring at the debris. A month ago, he lost his legion, and now he lost his best friend. He had known Brain ever since both were cadets. They had trained in the same squad, and grown up together. And now he was gone. Sir, what happened to Brain? Cell's trembling voice brought him back from his memories. Dager opened his mouth, but no sound came out. He simply couldn't say it. It was as if saying it out loud would confirm it was true. Brain. Brain is. He didn't make it. 
Dejer's words were like a hammer striking their hearts. For an instant, their minds were blank, before they all thought the same, that is impossible. They wanted to say something, or that Dejer told them he was just joking, but they knew the commander would never joke about the death of a brother. Sir, we. We have to decide where we are going. The vultures will notice us soon. Tech was right. They had disobeyed their order to retreat, and, although they completed their mission in the end, they didn't have any support. They would have to escape by themselves. He felt sad and defeated about losing a brother he knew for so long, but he still had responsibilities as the leader of Hell Squad. He couldn't let them die because he was sorrowful, especially after he put them in this situation. Tech, where is the nearest battlefield? Quell. General Secura's fleet was just attacked there. General Secura was here on Foline. As soon as our forces retreated, General Secura went to meet her fleet, but soon after, they suffered a surprise attack. It started just a few minutes ago. Can the pods make it there? Tech stayed silent for a few seconds, and Dager heard him tipping over his comlink. I know they are our enemies, but the Seppis build good ships. The pods can go even to Fonder with this amount of fuel, whatsoever quell. Less talking. Send the coordinates. We got to go before the clankers notice us. In ten minutes, the planet of Foline was nothing but a dot against the darkness of space. It was the second loss in a row for the Republic, and, according to the information Dager had on the other battlefields, this was just the start. Looking outside the window of the escape pod, Dager was glad he was alone, although he wished Brain was there. It was always painful to lose a brother, but, unfortunately, war waited for no one. Turning off his comm link, he closed his eyes. The past few hours had been hectic, and he needed some sleep before jumping right into another battle. He didn't sleep. The nightmares made sure of that. It took three hours for the escape pods to arrive in Quell. Tech was right when he said the Separatist built good ships. The pods could almost reach light speed, and had a good reserve of fuel. Tech, contact General Secura, and transfer it to me. The rest of you, get ready. This is purely a battle for sky supremacy, and I'm not sure yet on how we are going to land, so be prepared. Can't we just land in one of our ships, Commander? We can't risk opening the hangars, lest the clankers get inside our cruisers. Dager looked out of the pod's window, and saw the yellowish atmosphere of Quell. Only when they entered said atmosphere did he notice how fierce the battle was. Starfighters and vulture droids flew at top speed, chasing and destroying one another. Separatist frigates and dreadnoughts hovered above Republic cruisers, raining lasers upon them. There were also thousands of a new type of clanker that he had never seen before. They looked like a B-2 super battle droid, but had thrusters on their backs, allowing them to fly around. Using that ability, they were landing on the cruisers, and tearing them apart until they found an entrance. Deja needed just one glance to see the situation was pretty bad. Connecting General Secura now, sir. Commander Deja. You are alive. Although they couldn't get a hologram transmission, Dager could still hear General Secura loud and clear, and, in the background, the sound of lasers being fired and screams of pain. I will take full responsibility for my indiscipline. No time for that, Commander. We are in a pretty bad situation here. Just say what we need to do. Commander, our ship had been breached, but General Skywalker and his Padawan are already on it, with an escape plan. However, those B-2 RPs keep coming. I take it you destroyed the destroyer on Foline. I need you to do something similar here. As long as you can eliminate the tactical droid on their capital ship, it will cause chaos amongst their command chain, and my fleet will have a chance to escape. You can count on us, General. And, Dager? Yes, General. Follow your orders properly this time. After that, the Jedi disconnected. Deja nodded to himself, and changed the course of the escape pod to the coordinates that General Secura sent to him. Sir, how are going to land inside a Sepai dreadnought? Deja grinned. How could 3-4 and the others not know what he was thinking? 
They knew the separatist would never open a hangar for them, even though they were in separatist pods, for the same reason the Republic also wouldn't. We aren't. Tech, how slow can we make those pods fly? If you don't care about them falling from the sky, pretty slow. We are jumping, aren't we? Yes, we are. You always complained about Delta Squad when they told us about their mission on Kessel, didn't you, Metal? They were a lot more prepared than us. They had jetpacks too, while we have nothing. And, they weren't jumping on a moving ship. Although they were in different pods, Dajer could see, in his mind, Metal sighing. The other clones laughed. Why don't we just crash land the pods on top of the ship? Jumping is more fun. Ha! Huh. Dajer didn't even have time to answer the question before Cell did it for him, making Hell Squad laugh even more. Come on, boys. We are in the middle of a battle, about to do something dangerous, and you are all laughing. What would General D say if he saw us? Well, it's pretty normal for us. The general probably would have jumped with us. Dajer grinned, because he knew Tech was right. Quiet now. Get ready. We will have a small window of time to jump. Follow my lead. Chapter 249 Go, go, go. Dajer felt the wind passing by his helmet as he looked outside the escape pod, now with its door opened. Below him, just four meters away, was a massive Providence-class dreadnought. Although they had slowed down the pods as much as they could, they were still going pretty fast. Not enough to eliminate Hell Squad when they jumped, but it would still hurt. After hesitating for a second, Dajer took a deep breath, and gave the order. A second later, he himself dropped down, already in a ball-like shape, so he could soft his landing. It hurt like hell. Usually, falling a four meters drop would cause pain. Falling a four meters drop from a moving ship, or pod, caused a lot more pain. Air left his lungs because of the impact, and his ribs came dangerously close to cracking. Around him, Hell Squad's members felt the same. However, no matter how much pain he felt, Dajer's decision to jump had been the right one. The moment the escape pods crashed on the dreadnought, they became piles of burning metal. When he got up, Dajer's first reaction was to check his shoulder. He had dislocated and broken it once, so it wouldn't be a surprise if it happened again. Thankfully, it hadn't. Anyone hurt? I don't think so. Tech, you don't have a helmet. How is your head? I'm okay, Commander. See, Metal. It wasn't so bad, was it? The moment Tech opened his mouth, a Republic starfighter fired two missiles, hitting the dreadnought. The entire ship shook, and tilted to the left. Hell Squad was thrown off their feet by the sudden movement, and started sliding down the already curved exterior of the ship. Dajer had a glimpse of the ground, eleven kilometers below him. Grab something. His hand closed around a cable, and he came to an abrupt stop. Metal and Cell both grabbed the same cable as him, and the other members of Hell Squad found something to hold on to. Thankfully, although the dreadnought had tilted to the side, it soon got back into its normal position. The missiles, mostly stopped by the shields, only left scorched marks on the ship. Dab, find us an entry point. Now that the separatist ship was back to its normal position, and they were all back on their feet, Dajer wanted to get inside as quickly as possible. It wasn't a nice feeling, staying outside a ship in the middle of a battle. There is a hatch over there. Tech. On it. Along every big ship, there were always several entrances or exits, used to effectuate emergency repairs. The hatch that Dab found was one of those. However, since it was a warship, the entrance was secured, and it would take a few seconds for Tech to open it. Clankers incoming. Hearing 3-4 yell, Dajer turned around, and saw several dozens of the new type of B-2 droid flying towards them. The dreadnought sensors had discovered them. Tech, hurry up. It is encrypted, sir. I need a few more seconds. While he told Tech to work faster, Dajer turned to face the droids. Aside from being slimmer and having black paint, and jetpacks in their backs, they were very similar to the normal B-2 units. Facing dozens of them in an open space with no cover, the sky, 
Hell Squad would have problems if Tech didn't get them inside soon. It was quite difficult to hit the Seppies when they were flying, but Hell Squad almost never missed a shot. Metal was especially impressive. His blaster was spewing blue lasers, making up for the lack of aim in quantity. Seven or eight droids died to him alone, falling to the ground, kilometers away. Adding his kills to Hell Squads, they had taken down almost two dozen B2 RPs before the Clankers could even get close to them. Unfortunately, the moment they did, Hell Squad started to be overwhelmed by their numbers. With no cover available, it was just a matter of time before one of them got hit. To make matters worse, the Dreadnought had started to move forward, to attack position, and their footing got even more unstable. Tech, we really need you to be quick. I'm trying my best. The Seppies don't leave their ships open for us. Try harder. Deja took a step to the side, dodging a red laser, and, at the same time, firing back, hitting the clanker who shot it in the thrusters, sending him spiraling in the sky before exploding. Come on, come on, come on. Yes. I got it. 3-4, pull that lever. The medic didn't hesitate and kicked the lever. The hatch opened, and he dove inside, followed by Tech, Cell, and Dab. Your turn, Commander. Don't try to be a hero, Metal. Having said that, Dager also jumped inside the hatch. Rolling on the ground to dampen his fall, he found himself in the midst of his brothers. They were paying attention to both sides of the corridor they ended up in, to make sure no clanker was after them. After confirming they were safe, at least for now, he looked up worriedly for a moment, hearing the sound of Metal's double-barrel repeating blaster. A second later, he saw the clone jump down, unharmed. The top of the hatch was showered in red lasers, and Dager quickly closed it. He didn't want the B-2 units coming in after them. He was sure there would already be more than enough clankers inside the ship. Let's move. We don't have a lot of time. Dab, Cell, Tech, you go in the front. Metal, 3-4, and I will take the rear guard. The troopers nodded, and started moving. The tactical droid they were looking for wouldn't be anywhere else than in the command bridge. Stop right there. You are under AR. The head of the droid sergeant popped off its socket when Dager fired his pistol at point blank. His left hand grabbed the E-5 the clanker was holding before it even fell to the ground, and he used it to take out three more seppies. He would have preferred to have his vibroblade by his side, slicing droids was oddly satisfying, but he would make do with what he had. The other five members of Hell Squad followed behind him, quickly destroying the patrol that had just turned a corner. After stepping over the clanker bodies, they faced a circular door. It wasn't the first time Dager had seen one of those. Okay, the tack clanker is behind that door. Only crew and two dozen B1S should be with him. We will do as usual. Tech, you open it up. Dab and Cell, cover the left. Metal, you take the right. Dager suddenly trailed off as he realized what he was about to say. It would take the time to get used to Brain not being there with them. Seeing that their commander had frozen, the clones looked at one another until 3-4 finally broke the silence. I will give support. I will be first to enter. Tech, you are up. The clone connected his data pad to the door panel. Unknowingly, he also got access to what was being said inside the command bridge. It was mostly clankers reporting numbers, but one conversation caught his attention. Sir, you should listen to this. Chapter 250 Sir, you should listen to this. Tech transmitted what he was hearing to Dager. There was a lot of chatter coming from the clankers, but he could distinguish the voice of the tactical droid. Fire at there. Command ship. We still have troops inside. The ship. Don't care. Fire. Dager exchanged a glance with Tech. Both clones felt the urge to barge inside the command bridge and stop the Seppies, but it was too late. Direct. Hit. We have confirmation. The cruiser was destroyed. Job. Any survivors? A shuttle left the cruiser before it exploded. We can't confirm who was inside. 
Send someone after. It. Dager let out a sigh of relief. If someone left the ship, it was very probably the Jedi's. That meant that, although General Secura lost her capital ship, she probably would escape. So, all that it was left was for Hell Squad to finish what they came here for. When you give the order, Commander. The clone nodded, and typed something on the panel. When the door opened, the first thing Dager did was analyze the biggest threat. It was easy. Two commando droids were turning around and aiming their blasters at him. Dager leaned to the right, and the first shots fired by the clankers barely missed him. After dodging, the commander didn't fire his blaster pistol immediately, as the droids were expecting, but instead, approached them. Even the commando units were surprised. No one had ever dared to engage in close combat with them. After all, they were tough and flexible, carried a vibroblade, and knew how to use it. What surprised the droids even more, though, was that the clone wasn't alone as it seemed at first. While Dager distracted them, making the two clankers change their aim to him, five more troopers appeared. Each commando droid received half a dozen lasers to the chest and head, dying instantly. Dager crouched, hiding behind a chair, and, at the same time, grabbed the vibroblade one of the commando droids had. It wasn't the same as the one General Grievous destroyed, but it would do the job. Like they had expected, there were only twenty or so security droids, normal B-1 units with red painting, and it didn't take long for Hell Squad to take care of them. Dager kicked a droid's body aside, and saw a crew clanker, recognizable by the blue lines, cowering on the side. He executed the droid with a single laser. The Seppis didn't deserve mercy, even more so when they were just droids. After a few steps, Dager finally arrived in front of a tactical droid. He was the only Seppi still alive on the command bridge, although he had lost a hand when he tried to grab a blaster. Dab was quick to put an end to his antics. 3-4, contact General Secura's fleet. Tell the captains to be prepared to escape, and tell them to send someone to pick us up. You won't get away. With this, Republic. Scum. Dager grinned when he heard the droid speak. Shut up, scrap metal. You have two options now. Either you order your ships to move out of the way, or you die. I will never. Obey a clone. Dager already knew the tactical droid was going to say that, and he didn't care. Clankers didn't feel fear. They were war machines, not real people. Using the tip of his newly acquired vibroblade, Dager made a line on his shoulder pad. There were already a few dozen there. I thought so. Die, then. Dager slashed upwards with the vibroblade, and the tactical droid's head was sent flying. Its body crashed down, and Dager picked up the head, and threw it to Tech. Later, see if you can get any useful information out of him. Meanwhile, tell our brothers that it is time. Just when Hell Squad was turning around to leave the command bridge, Dager suddenly thought of something. He ran to some of the many panels in the command bridge, pressed buttons, and pushed levers forward. When he was done, he hurried up his men. What did you do, Commander? I have no idea. But the Seppis will have to spend some time to fix the mess I made, because I put the ship on full speed forward, so, they better stop it or they will crash into the ground pretty fast. Ha ha ha. Not bothered by the fact that they were in an enemy ship, Hell Squad laughed out loud when they heard Dager. They knew their commander wasn't kidding, because the Separatist ships were made for droids, not humans. The controls were sure to be different, meaning that Dager probably didn't know what many of the buttons he pressed did. As they felt the dreadnought pick up speed, Hell Squad quickly ran to the upper hangar. They passed by several droids on their way, but apart from a few who decided to stop them, most just ran past the group. They had to stop the ship before it crashed. As always, the hangars of a separatist ship didn't have many smaller ships, only deactivated vulture droids. There were still, however, one or two maxillipede shuttles. Captain Gold said they broke through the separatist fleet, and are ready to pick us up. Tech, you pilot. While the shuttle was taking off, Dager connected his comlink to the main controls of the ship. Then, he transmitted a code that would let the Republic cruisers know they were friendly. Terminator, 
This is CT 4063, Commander Dager. Hell Squad is currently approaching you on a Maxillipede shuttle. I repeat, Hell Squad is approaching you in a separatist shuttle. Copy that, Commander. Identifications being verified. A309. You are clear to landing. You will have to be fast, sir. Understood, Gold. See you soon, brother. You heard him, Tech. Try not to crash this time. You are never going to let me forget it, are you? Dager chuckled. He might be their commander, but the troopers still made fun of him sometimes. It was only fair he returned it. No, I won't. Now, get us out of here. Stay still, General. Work faster, droid. Unless you stop moving, I can't. In a dark room, General Grievous was laying on a metal bed. His entire body was burnt and scarred, and he was missing three of his four arms, and one of his legs. You were critically injured in that explosion, General. It will take time for you to recover. The abomination that was the separatist coughed, and glared angrily at the medical droid, but stood quiet. He understood how serious his injuries were. If it wasn't for the fact that he was partially machine, he would have died. Also, General, Count Dooku left a message for you. What did he say? He said he would make use of the trophy you brought back, and took it with him. Trophy. He was with you in the escape pod, so Count Dooku assumed you kept him alive on purpose. He. I didn't bring anyone. Who is he? Chapter 251. Commander, it's good to see you. Your squad saved our fleet. As soon as Hell Squad stepped on the Terminator's command bridge, Captain Gold approached them. Say nothing of it, brother. It is good to be back in a ship where no one is trying to eliminate us. Captain Gold smiled. He was at ease now, because the 327th fleet had received a lot less damage than it could have, and he received confirmation that General Sakura, and also Commander Bly, General Skywalker, Ahsoka Tano, and Captain Rex, were alive. However, the captain suddenly noticed that something was missing. If he remembered correctly, Hell Squad had seven members. However, he was seeing only six in front of him. You lost a man, Commander. In Foline. The clone only nodded. It was normal to lose soldiers during the war. Where are you headed next, Gold? Although we didn't lose many cruisers, many of our ships are still badly damaged. We are going to the shipyards in Bracca. Do you already know what your next mission is, Commander? After Foline, they had jumped directly into the Battle of Quell. Hell Squad had no time to discover what their next assignment was. Not yet. Inside a Venator class cruiser, one of the biggest military meetings in the history of the Republic was happening. It was also the biggest ever since the Clone Wars started. Around a hologram table, half a dozen Jedis, some in person, some in holograms, and several clones waited for General Yoda and General Windu's arrival. The Jedis, General Kenobi, General Skywalker General Unduli, General Mundi, and the two Padawans Ahsoka Tano and Beris Afi, were talking amongst themselves, while the clones stood quiet, their hands behind their backs. Commander Cody, Commander Gree, Commander Jet, Captain Rex, and thirty or forty other high-ranking officers were there, silent. However, on the other side of the room, ten clones were talking quietly. It's good to see you again, boss. You three as well. Sev, Scorch, and Fixer nodded at Dager and the members of Hell Squad. Despite their antics and discussions, both units had long become friends. After a mission on Felucia, where Hell Squad rescued Delta Squad from a separatist base, and later from a bunch of the giant creatures known as Rankers. The clone commandos realized that their feeling of superiority over the normal clones was uncalled for, and, most of the times they were no different than their brothers. How are you doing, Dager? Any idea of what this meeting is about? The Clone Wars had been raging on for over a year and a half, but this was the first time he partook in a meeting this big. We will have to wait for General Yoda to know. Wait more you will not, Commander. Here, I am. Dejo turned around to find the hologram of a small, green being, with a wrinkled face and pointed ears. 
Immediately, he saluted the Jedi. General Yoda wasn't only the leader of the Jedis, and the highest-ranking general of the Republic Army, but was also extremely respected by the clones. Dajer once saw him destroy an entire droid battalion before the clankers could even lift their blasters. Come on, start this meeting we have to. Important it is. Very important indeed. The clones turned to the the small Jedi and his tall companion on the hologram table. As soon as General Yoda appeared, all noise died down. Welcome, welcome. Sad to bring bad news, I am. A new battle, start we have to. Dajer couldn't help but think that, although General Yoda was powerful, he didn't make much sense most of the time. Like most Jedis, he always beat around the bush before finally arriving at the topic he wanted. Soldiers like Dajer preferred more direct conversations. We are already fighting on several fronts, Master Yoda. I'm not sure we can afford to engage in another one. Our choice to make, that is not, young Skywalker. When this war we started, our choice was done. Bear the consequences of our decisions, we have to. It wasn't our fault, Master. The Separatists started this war. General Skywalker's Padawan, Ahsoka, complained, only to receive a stern stare from her master. Padawans weren't supposed to talk in this kind of meeting. At fault, we all are. Just one side, a war doesn't have Separatist and Republic, both decided. This choice, where will it take us, see I can't. Blurred the force is. A few minutes of silence followed what General Yoda said. The Jedis were quiet, and the clones exchanged a few discreet glances, but didn't say anything. It was only when General Mundi talked that the silence was broken. The Syrian had left the Battle of Maijito to lead a company of clones specialized in heavy weapons such as flamethrowers. Commander Bakara stayed on the snow planet, so, the one General Mundi currently had under him was Commander Jet. Master Yoda, you said this is a battle we can't escape from. The longer this war goes on, stronger the dark side gets. End this struggle, this clone wars, we have to. Attacking Geonosis, once more, we are. Destroy the droid factories, a must is. Dajer tensed up. Geonosis had been where the first battle of this war happened, and it was also a special place for many of the clones who partook in said battle. Too many brothers lost their lives trying to conquer the planet, but the Republic barely succeeded in forcing the Separatists to hide underground. For the last three months or so, the Republic had been forced to reduce its troops on the planet, and the Sepis took the chance to fight back. General Yoda was about to speak again, when a trooper walked up to him and whispered something. Dajer, who was close, was able to understand the words, General, and, arrived. Before I left Coruscant, a last-minute addition to the attack force, I ordered. Very eager to battle, Master Latte was. When he heard that, Dajer was shocked, and so were the members of Hell Squad. Latte was a name they hadn't heard in a few months, but it was one they would never forget. Turning to the door, the six clones surprised Delta Squad and the other clones with their sudden movement. Hell Squad ignored their reactions, and saluted the figure that was approaching. Ragu Latte, that was the name of the young Tigruta, dressed in the brown Jedi robes, that entered the command bridge. The Padawan, no, Jedi Master, smiled when he saw Hell Squad, and, after greeting the other Jedis around the hologram table, shook Dajer's hand, and then proceeded to do the same with the others. Dajer, Dab, Tech, Cell, 3-4, and Metal. It's good to see you again. Dajer noticed that Ragu refrained from saying anything about Brain, and was glad. He was sure the Jedi would want to talk about it later, but now wasn't the time. Long time no see, General. It's good to see you too. Very good indeed. It's been what? Five months? Six, and you know that. Ever since Ryloth, I've met S.H.I.E.L.D. and the others a few times, but Hell Squad hasn't been to Coruscant once. We have been jumping from one mission to the other, General. Of course you have. Erm. Master Ragu, Commander Dajer, I am sure you two have a lot to catch up, but we have a meeting in progress. Dajer returned to standard military position, and Ragu nodded at General Kenobi, to say he was sorry. 
He wasn't a Padawan anymore, so he had to behave like a master. Chapter 252 The Chancellor, join us Will. Very interested in this battle, he is. General Yoda pressed a button on the hologram table, and an image of Chancellor Palpatine appeared. The Jedis greeted him, while the clones saluted. Once again, Dajer shivered, as his instincts warned him of something, he just didn't know what. To his surprise, he found that Boss had a very similar reaction. He would need to find the clone commando and talk to him. Something was definitely wrong. Thank you, my friends. I didn't want to disturb you, but this invasion will be of extreme importance to the Republic. Master Yoda, please do continue. Master Kenobi, explain our plan, now will. Yes, Master Yoda. The Jedi put a data pad above the hologram table, and transmitted the information on it. Soon, several stone buildings, characteristic of Geonosis were showed, all surrounded by a red shield. Our ships are in position, and we are ready to begin our campaign against the Geonosians. And what about Poggle? Any report on his location? General Windu interrupted General Kenobi. Poggle the Lesser was the main leader of the Geonosis, and one of the most important separatist commanders. The factories of droids under his command were responsible for over 60% of the droid army. It seems he is held up at the primary droid foundry, here. General Kenobi put his finger on one of the buildings, exactly on the center of the massive shield that was shown in the hologram. The factory is protected by a shield generator. Anakin, Kiati, and I shall attempt a three-pronged attack through their defenses lines, to a staging area just short of the shield. Three green lines, in different angles, appeared on the hologram, all going to the shield generator's location, in the outer area of the shield, not out of it, just near the border. It would be heavily defended by hundreds of thousands of droids, there was no doubt. Dajer heard a trooper sighing, and muttering this is gonna be fun under his breath. He had to agree. It certainly wouldn't be easy. Once we have landed, we shall knock out the shield generator. That, is our primary target. Up till now, the plan was simple. Most invading forces, when faced with a shield, would do the same. The tricky part would be landing. This wasn't like the first invasion, when the Seppis didn't even know that the Republic had an army. This time, they would be prepared. Isn't it risky, committing three generals to one area of the attack? If something goes wrong, we could be dealt a serious blow. Surprisingly, the next one to talk was Chancellor Palpatine. He seemed genuinely concerned, which was uncommon for politicians like him. To ensure that rises again, Geonosis does not, capture Poggle we must. The Chancellor looked at General Yoda, and smiled. Of course. As always, I shall leave the strategy to you, Master Jedi. Our thanks, Chancellor. Politely as always, General Kenobi acknowledged Chancellor Palpatine's words, before nodding General Yoda and General Windu. As the three holograms disappeared, Dajer heard General Windu speaking. The hologram table turned off, leaving only General Kenobi, General Skywalker, General Mundi, General Unduli, Ragu, and the two Padawans, as the Jedis who would lead the attack. Under his helmet, Dajer was looking at General Skywalker, and frowning. Before the holograms disappeared, the commander was sure Chancellor Palpatine had glared at him and Boss for quite a long while, but most of the time, he was looking carefully at the Jedi. Dajer couldn't help but wonder why. Still, it wasn't his business. He turned to General Kenobi, waiting for the details of the plan. Cody, these are the coordinates for the rendezvous. The 212th commander stepped forward, and pulled up another hologram, this time of the landing zone. When we hit the ground, we will create a perimeter there. Getting past their defenses here, will be the trick. Dajer glanced at the line that Commander Cody had drawn into the map. As the clone went on, he grinned, he already knew what Hell Squad's assignment would be. Generals, our gunships will never be able to get past this point if those artillery barrages are working. Jed is right. However, I believe that is young Ragu's job. General Mundi agreed with his commander, then looked at Ragu. The Tigruta was already nodding, and pointed at the anti-aircraft turrets. Don't worry, masters. 
we will take care of this. The Sepis split their artillery into two different blocks, north and south. I will take Hell Squad to the south one, while Boss and Delta Squad take care of the other. Most of the Jedis nodded, while the two Padawans, Ahsoka and Barris, exchanged glances, somewhat confused. Finally, General Skywalker's apprentice wasn't able to contain herself anymore. Master Ragu, are you sure just you is enough? I could go help, and also bring some troopers. I appreciate it, Ahsoka, but we can handle it. Although she wasn't supposed to speak, my Padawan's concerns are accurate, Ragu. Are you sure you won't need help? General Skywalker put emphasis on the word Padawan, glaring angrily at his apprentice, before turning to Ragu. He, however, just smiled. We will be at the landing point long before you all, Master Skywalker. Right, Dager, boss. General Ragu is right, General Skywalker. This is our job. Dager nodded, agreeing with boss. That was exactly the type of mission that special units excelled in. Still, we will only be able to take out their main artillery. The lots will face a lot of opposition to land, but we will do our best to reduce it as much as possible. The Jedi's exchanged glances, and, while the two Padawans still seemed unconvinced, they didn't say anything else. General Mundy and General Kenobi had already seen both squads in action. They knew they weren't just special units. They were the best even amongst those on top. Look at that giant wall with all the gun emplacements. That won't be easy to get past. With the anti-aircraft turret situation set, the group soon turned to the other obstacles in their path. This battle wouldn't be an easy one. Everything, from landing, to advancing, taking out the shield, and finally capturing or killing Poggle, would require a price in clone blood. Don't worry. We aren't going anywhere near that. What happened to all the enthusiasm I saw earlier? Don't worry about us. You just make sure you get to that landing zone in one piece. I shall be waiting for you when you finally arrive. Ahsoka, General Kenobi, and General Skywalker soon started joking around, which prompted General Undulai, General Mundy, Commander Cody, and Captain Rex to shake their heads. It was clear this was quite the common occurrence. Gentlemen, if you are quite finished, we have a battle to begin. You are right, Luminera. Everyone knows your role. Several people nodded. Commander Cody, Commander Jet, and Captain Rex left to prepare the gunships, while General Unduli, Barris, and Commander Gree went to their own cruiser. Hell Squad, Delta Squad, in the lower hangar in five. We need to get going soon. Yes, General Ragu. I will meet you there. I just need a minute with boss. Ragu glanced at Dager before nodding. He sensed there was something wrong with the commander, but if he wouldn't tell him, then Ragu wouldn't ask. Chapter 253 What is it, Dager? Boss looked at the commander, impatiently waiting for him to say why he wanted to talk in particular. There was an invasion going on, and they couldn't waste time. Dager, on the other hand, seemed almost absent-minded, which was very uncommon. Boss rarely saw a clone more focused than Dager. The commander could face an entire droid company without even flinching, and more than once, had sustained a wound in exchange for killing a clanker. To see him now, daydreaming, was surprising, to say the least. Dager? Sorry, brother. It's just. You felt it too, didn't you? The Chancellor, there is something about him. Careful, Dager. Those are dangerous grounds. By boss reaction, he was sure the clone commando had the same doubts as him. Still, none of them could put the finger on what it was, exactly. Forget it. Here you are. Boss, Delta Squad is waiting for you the other gunship. Dager, Hell Squad is on this one. The lower hangar was bustling with activity, as pilots, crewmen, engineers, troopers, Jedis, and droids walked from one side to the other, prepping lots, Y-wings, and V-wings. Many ships were already taking off, and Dager quickly got into his, while Boss nodded to Ragu, and entered another lot. We are ready to go. Oddball, take off. Fly low, you will just drop us and return. 
the doors of the gunship closed, and it left the Venator-class cruiser. Several calculated attacks were hitting many parts of Geonosis, also the main force could strike the factories where Poggle the Lesser was hiding. However, if Hell Squad and Delta Squad didn't deal with the anti-aircraft turrets, hundreds, maybe even thousands of ships would be shot down before they could even get near the rendezvous point. Dajer put on his helmet, and held on to the straps hanging from the ceiling. It would be a rough landing, that was for sure. The red lights flashed, indicating that they had entered the atmosphere. Here we go again. Dajer grinned when he heard Cell. All the members of Hell Squad had been in the first battle of Geonosis, so this brought back memories. Even though only a year and a half had passed, it seemed a lifetime away. Just like the old times. Let's just hope we don't crash this time. Crash. You never talked about the start of the war. Ragu couldn't help but ask. He only met Hell Squad after Mon Kala, and that was a few months after the Clone Wars had started. Before that, he was still training at the Jedi Temple, and wasn't even a Padawan yet. You weren't at the first assault, right, General? Back then, Hell Squad wasn't a special unit yet. Me, Brain, Tech, and 3-4 were already on Hell Squad, but we were just a normal unit. Cell, Dab, and Metal only joined us later. And what about the crash? Even though the Seppis weren't expecting us, they still had a lot of defenses in position. Our lot was hit, and we lost our sergeant. Pilots were also down. We did our best to hold on, but we still lost many men when we crashed. To tell the truth, we were lucky anybody survived at all. And, to make matters worse, there were countless clankers between us and the command post where we were supposed to land. Well, that sounds like it was fun. It had its moments. The commander took down an AAT, and I had to put his shoulder back in place. Dajer felt like cursing 3-4 and the others when he heard them laughing. Back then, it hadn't been so simple as they made it sound now. It was only after a battle was over that one could be so carefree about it. In the midst of it, all Dajer could think was about his brothers dying, and the Seppis in front of him. Dajer, Cell, Tech, Dab, 3-4, Metal. I heard about Brain. I'm sorry I couldn't be there to help. Ragu couldn't be blamed for anything. He was at Coruscant, completing his training, as General D asked. It isn't your fault sir. It isn't anybody's fault. Brain made a decision. If it wasn't for him, I would be dead. He went out like a real soldier. And he took that disgusting separatist, Grievous, with him. Ragu nodded. It wasn't the first time a clone sacrificed himself, and it wouldn't be the last. He wasn't that innocent kid anymore. He knew that wars weren't a game. War had a price no one in a sane state of mind would be willing to play, but there was no other option than to keep going, until it was over. Oddball, how are we looking? Minus ten until we enter their range, General. Go lower then. Dager, Dab, Metal attach the ropes. We will only have a few seconds to leave the gunship. At least we won't be jumping. I can arrange that, if you want. No, thank you, sir. Cell shuddered when Ragu grinned at him. He loved to complain about Quell, because he really hated heights, and the Jedi knew that. The other clones laughed freely. Well, it is very good to have you with us again, General. Those last six months hadn't been easy, and having a Jedi with us will be of great help. Ragu grinned, but there was a trace of sadness hidden within it. Only because I'm a Jedi? I thought you would think highly of me, Tech. Sorry, General. Dajer almost facepalmed, but held himself back, and only knocked Tech's head with his knuckles, like an adult scolding a child. You know Tech never was good with words, sir. Hey but few know what we all went through back in Ryloth. Hell Squad is glad to have you with us, not only as a Jedi, but as a friend. The Tigruta looked at Dajer for a long time, as emotions dwelled inside him. To him, the clones of the 303rd weren't just soldiers. They all went through a baptism of fire together, especially Hell Squad and him. The commander and the men under him were some of the closest friends he had, and he trusted each of them with his life. He knew they would never let him down. 
We are approaching their defenses. You better hold on to something. This is gonna get bumpy. Oddball's alarm brought Ragu back to his senses. It was time. Thanks. Let's just hope we don't have your bad luck this time. Seeing that the conversation had once again turned against him, Dager was about to rebuke when the lot shook, while the pilot tried to dodge the enemy fire. We got three vultures on our tail. We have to destroy them or we won't be able to land. Dab, take the other beam. Dager entered the cockpit, and got into a ball made of glass that was hanging outside. It was a composite beam turret. Each lot had two of them, and they fired highly focused and unstable lasers. No matter what, be it vulture droids, infantry, or even some of the lighter vehicles, once it was hit by it, it would be gone. Chapter 254 The composite beam turrets fired green lasers, which were highly unstable. That was proved when Dager, aiming at one of the vulture droids, missed, and hit a rock pillar. After a brief second, the entire pillar, which was over a hundred meters tall, and twenty meters wide, imploded. Ehu. Dab yelled victoriously as a vulture droid blew up. Two more to go. How long to the landing site, Oddball? Six minutes. Knowing that time was running out, Dager focused even more on his target. Instead of trying to aim at the vulture, he calculated in his mind what was the droid's trajectory, and fired. The vulture flew right into the green beam, and was cut in half before exploding. He tried the same trick with the last droid, but the clanker was faster than he expected, and he missed. Dab, he is going to your side. I see him. And I. Got it. Letting out a sigh of relief, Dager watched the last vulture droid crash into the ground, missing a wing, and returned to the main compartment of the lot. Good job, you two. Oddball, go down, and drop us now. We are still 12 kilometers away from the landing zone, General Ragu. I know, but by the time we get there, we will have more seppies on our tail. I don't want to see you blow up in the sky. Boss, do you copy? Loud and clear, General. Beautiful job cleaning those vultures. We will be landing now, and you will do the same. You got it. Raver, bring us down. The lots didn't even touch the ground. Before they did so, both squads, and the Jedi, had already jumped out, weapons ready. However, there weren't any clankers nearby. While the clones prepared to move out, in the direction of the anti-aircraft turrets, Ragu knocked twice on the side of the gunship. Oddball, you and Raver go back to the fleet. You still have a lot of work today. Be careful of the bugs out there. Those things are nasty. You got it. Now, go. The lots took off, and Ragu turned to the two squads of clones, at the same time opening a map on his comlink. We have about 10 kilometers of ground to cover until we get to our original landing zone. There shouldn't be any separatist on our way, but be careful. Delta squad, when we get there, we split. You already know your tasks. Then let's move. And remember the Geonosians are hostile. Pay attention to every nook and crevice on the way. I heard some pretty gruesome stories. Both squad leaders nodded. They had been on the first assault of Geonosis, and they knew the Geonosians weren't exactly righteous or proud. The bugs were especially fond of picking up troopers, and carrying them hundreds of meters high before letting the poor soldier go. There were also a few unlucky clones who were captured, and brought to the tunnels under the ground. Needless to say, none of those troopers was ever seen again. It was said the Geonosians all worked for a queen, and had their minds controlled by her, although no one had ever seen the so-called queen. Still, Dager had seen his fair share of insect-like creatures around the galaxy, and he knew how a hive worked. If the bugs really followed a queen, then he didn't want to get anywhere near her. Ragu closed his fist, then opened it and put two fingers up before pointing to the south. Boss nodded, and gestured for Delta Squad to follow him. The clone commandos broke up from Hell Squad, and started running to their section of the anti-aircraft turrets. The Jedi then made the same signals, but this time pointing to the north. Hell Squad followed him quietly. 
They were very close to their target, and, although there weren't any sepis in sight, they had to be careful. The Geonosians could blend in perfectly with the rocks. Dajer lowered his macro binoculars, and zoomed in, scanning the separatist camp, looking for their target. It wasn't difficult to find them. Anti-aircraft turrets weren't exactly small. The artillery we have to destroy are J-1 proton cannons. Those things are droids too, so they will actively try to eliminate us. Ragu frowned as he tried to remember what the J-1s were. He knew Hell Squad had destroyed a few in Ryloff, but he had only seen the wreckage of them. Anyways, they would only have to be more careful. Master Ragu, are you there? Hearing Ahsoka's voice, Ragu answered his comlink. We had some troubles in the sky, but we are about to make our move. That's great to hear, Master. Master Kenobi said we will start the attack in two hours, even if those artillery guns are still there. Don't worry. Two hours is more than enough. I will see you at the landing zone. After finishing the call, Ragu turned to Hell Squad, and grinned. He could sense their excitement, and he felt the same. It had been six long months since he fought alongside clones, and he missed it. For a Padawan that was trained amidst a war, the conclusion of his training on the Jedi Temple had been painfully boring, although he had finished it with stellar results. How do you want to do this, General? They saw us landing, and it isn't like we were very secretive about our plans. This is a head-on battle, Dager, so let's behave accordingly. Each of those artillery droids needs a large amount of ammunition, and I bet it isn't light. That means it will have to be near the J-1s, otherwise it would take a long time to reload. I see what you are going for, General. It's a plan. A good one. That depends on whether or not we survive. But you are right, it is the only viable option. All right, Hell Squad. Let's blow up some clankers. Turns out the J-1 proton cannons weren't manned by droids, but by Geonosians. The bug-like creatures were grabbing cylindrical, red capsules as big as a human, and putting them on piles near the anti-aircraft turrets. Although the droid cannons could aim and fire by themselves, they still needed someone to load them. Now that they were quite close to the Separatist camp, Hell Squad discovered their plan wouldn't go smoothly. There was an open area of about 200 meters between them and their target. All the rocks and boulders had been removed, to make sure no one could sneak upon them. And, of course, that wasn't the only problem. Termite type ammo, Commander. My charged shot might be able to get through the capsule, but normal lasers won't. We will have to get close and throw a couple of detonators. That will cause a chain reaction. We won't be able to get out on time. Dager frowned, and knelt, before aiming at the nearest Geonosian. Two hundred meters were nothing for him, especially when he had a stable position. However, he didn't press the trigger, but kept switching his aim between the bug and the nearest pile of ammo. In the end, he got up. Any ideas? The clones shook their heads, and even Ragu didn't see to know what to do. Ultimately, the Jedi patted Dager's shoulder. We will figure it out. For now, let's start. Chapter 255 Shouldn't we send back up to Master Ragu? He only just completed his training. Not long ago, he was still a Padawan. Baris Afi was a very quiet Padawan, but this time, she decided to voice her thoughts to her master. She wanted for their mission on Geonosis to be accomplished as soon as possible, and Ragu hadn't given her a good impression. At the meeting, he barely greeted the other Jedis, before immediately engaging in a conversation with a special unit called Hell Squad. She thought her master, Luminara Unduli, would agree, as she did most of the time, but she was wrong. Ragu should be able to take care of this task with no problems. Even before he became a Jedi Knight, his skills with a lightsaber and the Force were better than many in the Order. Imagun D was a member of the Council, and one of the best. Ragu learned a lot from him. Besides, he has Hell Squad by his side. The Mirielan Jedi patted her apprentice's shoulder, and went to talk with a 41st captain. The preparations for the invasion were almost done, but there was no harm in double-checking. Barris was left quite confused. She hated when things weren't properly explained, and, above all else, 
when her questions weren't answered. And now, she was the most curious about Hell Squad. Everyone, Jedi or clone, seemed to think of them as invincible. As such, she stopped Commander Gree, to satisfy her curiosity. Gree, who are those clones? Hell Squad. All I can find in their files are their names and that they were associated with the 303rd Attack Legion. I can't find their record of battles or anything like that. The commander took off his helmet and gave his data pad to a trooper, so the preparations would be carried on. His dark green armor was filled with scratches, both from battles and also just from the native flora of Felucia, where his legion spent most of the war up till now. It's because you are looking at the wrong files, kid. If you want to know about their battles before Ryloth, look at the 303rd files. Anything after that should be classified. Even I can't access those. You will have to ask General Unduli, if you want to have a look at them. Barris frowned, for two different reasons. First off, she didn't like being called a kid, but her master had warned her that the clones would only call her, General, after she earned their respect. And the only way to do that was through battle. The second thing that disturbed her was, of course, all the secrecy around Hell Squad. She hated to be left out. Why all that? They are a special unit. Just like Delta Squad, the missions they take part in aren't normal stuff. If any information about them was to fall in separatist hands, we could lose a lot. But although all of this is classified, every clone in the Grand Army of the Republic knows them. Are they really that good? Good. Kid, you will see them in action in this battle. Hell Squad is probably the best unit the Republic has. Arc Troopers, Clone Commandos, even Delta Squad, Dager and his men are a step above them. Barris was surprised. Commander Gree rarely complimented someone, whatsoever say that that someone was the best the Republic had. You think very highly of this squad, Gree. I fought with them before. That's how I know how good they are. Moreover, they have General Regu with them. The general was part of the 303rd too, you could say. Their coordination is flawless. They will get the job done. Although they were currently being praised by Commander Gree, Hell Squad wasn't faring too good. Dajer cursed when a laser hit the ground between his feet, and ducked behind a crate of ammunition to hide. He had forgotten how infuriating the sonic blasters that the Geonosians used were. Not only they were dangerous, but the green rings they shot also caused a shockwave upon impact. General, on your left. Ragu used his lightsaber to defend against a laser, and pulled the Geonosian that shot it using the force. The being was still screeching when the Jedi cut him down. At the same time, he used his weapon to cut the legs of a J-1 proton cannon, making the droid fall, and become a useless pile of metal. That was the alternative that they had found. Since they couldn't blow the anti-aircraft turrets without killing themselves, then Ragu would go one by one, destroying them. Hell Squad's job was to eliminate every Seppai on his way. Damn bugs. They just keep coming. The scout, Cell, yelled as he emptied his clip on a swarm of Geonosians. They were flying out of their nests underground, and for the clones, it was like that for every Geonosian they eliminated, ten more appeared. Danger, this just won't do. I will give you and Metal a boost, and you keep the Seppis away while I take care of the other cannons. Wait, what? Boost? What does that? The two clones were confused to what the Tigruta meant, but before they could sketch any reaction, they were lifted off the ground, and launched through the air. They flew for more than a hundred meters before they crashed against an invisible, but soft, wall, and dropped to the ground. It was confusing and unexpected, but Dager and Metal were elites. Flexing their knees, they softened their landing, and immediately fired their blaster at the very startled Geonosians. Metal's blaster, especially, created quite the havoc, as the bugs dropped from the sky, their wings full of holes. Now that they were closer to the Seppis, the bugs became clumsy. Their bodies were fragile, and they weren't made for war, like clones and clankers. Dager discarded his DC-15A, and pulled out his DC-17. The pistol was better for close ranges and it had the bonus of leaving his left hand free to use his dear vibroblade. 
He approached two Geonosians, who were loading a J-1 proton cannon, and slashed upwards, cutting the wings of one of them, and the head of the other. The bug that was still alive shrieked, trying to get away, but Dager put his pistol against his head, and pulled the trigger. No enemy of the Republic deserved to live, even if he was out of combat already. That was the order in his genetic code. While he and Metal were laying waste to the Geonosians, the other members of Hell Squad, and Ragu, took care of the remaining anti-aircraft turrets. At the same time, they heard a large explosion a few kilometers away, followed by a sequence of smaller ones. It was likely Delta Squad's doing. We are done. Let's get out of here. We need to take care of those bugs first, or they will hunt us all the way to Rain Point. Danger, Metal, step back. The Jedi somersaulted his way forward, until he was next to the clones, while Metal and Dager did as they were told. Then, Ragu turned off his lightsaber, and stretched his hands towards the cave entrance from where the Geonosians were coming. With a flick of his wrist, the entire cave started shaking, and collapsed amidst rumbling noises, and the screams of the bugs being buried alive. Chapter 256 Dager was sitting on the ground, his blasters and helmet next to him, and his eyes closed. Around him, the members of Hell Squad, and also the clone commandos from Delta Squad, were also resting. General Ragu had his legs crossed, and was floating three or four centimeters above the ground. The group had completed their objective, the artillery was gone, and were now waiting for the rest of the Republic forces. Point Rain was an open area, several kilometers inside enemy lines, but still quite a distance away from the foundries where Poggle was hiding. A small group of eleven people had no problem sneaking past or killing the Separatist on their way. The job of systematically clearing the bulk of the enemy forces would be left for the legions. All right, listen up. Commander Dager, Hell Squad, you too. Fixer, Delta Squad's mechanic, pilot, and technology specialist, called out the clones, being careful not to interrupt Ragu's meditation. General Kenobi just contacted me. They are about to start the real invasion. And what they have for us? Nothing. They told us to stay here, and hold our position. Are we expecting trouble? Aren't we always? The troopers laughed. Scorch had made a good point. When in battle, there was always the possibility of being attacked, so staying sharp was obligatory. Anything else? At some moment, while the clones were talking, Ragu had woken up from his meditation, and was looking at them. It was clear that, although the Jedi was quite distant, his hearing was much better than that of a normal person. I don't think so, General. As soon as our gunships start landing, this area will become the focus of the Separatist counterattack. We take it our job will be to defend until we can form a perimeter. Just us. That isn't going to be easy. No, it won't. They are going to throw everything at us. Dwarf spiders, AATs, hailfires, and what else? Plus the bugs and the tin cans. Ragu raised an eyebrow, but he wasn't that surprised about how nonchalant the clones were about it. After one or two battles, every trooper acquired a certain level of disinterest towards the future. When you could die in the next second, the future didn't seem so important. As you said, General Ragu, it isn't going to be easy. But before we can win this battle, dozens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of our brothers will die. The bare minimum we can do is make sure they have somewhere to land in. The Jedi looked at Dager, not shocked be Dager's bluntness. Such was the reality of war for the clones. You entered combat not only knowing you could die, but also having the certainty that several of your brothers would perish. And yet, you still pick up a blaster, put on your helmet, and follow your orders. That is what it meant to be a clone. You are right. Well, this is going to be fun. It wasn't fun. The Republic's initial predictions were that, after destroying the two main groups of anti-aircraft, the few scattered clumps that remained wouldn't be enough to cause much trouble. They were wrong. Hundreds of lots were shot down the moment they left the cruisers, many blowing up instantaneously, and several other crashing on the planet. The initial time predicted to reach the landing zone with a sizable enough force to make a stand was of three hours. It took eight before the first gunship even got close. 
General Mundy and General Skywalker, together with their respective clone commanders and troops, were hit and crashed, although both groups survived, not without casualties. General Kenobi had been the only one to reach Point Rain, or, more accurately, to crash in Point Rain. Luckily for him, he and the few survivors had been rescued by a team sent by Commander Cody. Ragu and the two special units were the first sight that the Jedi saw when he was brought, limping, to the perimeter that the lots had created. You arrived, Master Kenobi. Just a second. Ragu jumped on top of a gunship, and used the force to deflect several incoming missiles from a hail fire. The missiles changed directions, and hit a cluster of clankers, blowing them and everything around to pieces. The hail fire that launched the missiles became the target of two ATS, and didn't last long. General Kenobi raised an eyebrow when he saw Ragu pull this stunt with the force. It wasn't easy, especially considering that the Tigruta had a bloody bandage wrapped around his torso, and a laser mark on his thigh. Are you having fun, Ragu? Before you arrived, no. I was too worried to have fun. I know you and Master Skywalker had a bet going to see who arrived first, but you took quite a long time. I and the two squads had some trouble to secure this landing site. Nothing too bothersome, I hope. Did you lose anyone? No, fortunately. When the troops arrived, I ordered them to take a rest. They are over there. Surprised, General Kenobi raised his eyebrow even further. Although Ragu made it seem like nothing much, the Jedi Master knew it couldn't have been easy. Looking to where the Tigruta pointed, he was even more sure. Sev, Fixer, and Metal were laying on improvised beds, unconscious. 3-4 and Cell had their arms covered in bandages, and it was clear it weren't wounds from just one laser or two. Boss and Tech had their legs and torso in the same situation. Dab also had similar injuries, and only Scorch seemed mostly unharmed. Although they were all alive, it was clear they had gone through a brutal few hours. General Kenobi found Dager in the command post, a moving, circular platform with four legs. The clone was talking to Commander Cody, and General Kenobi was surprised that he was still standing. His left arm was immobilized, he had a bandage around his head, and he wasn't using his armor's chest piece. This stomach and torso had several bruises, and a medic was currently wrapping it with white clothing. Several scars and bruises could be seen in the skin below the bandages. Welcome, General. General Kenobi. Good to see you in one piece. I wish I could say the same of you, Dager. Shouldn't you be in a Bacta tank? Are you talking about the arm? I broke it once, and it got dislocated two or three times, so it is quite susceptible to. A lot, really. But 3-4 already put it back in place. I wasn't talking just about the arm, Commander, and you know that. Commander Cody stifled a laugh when he heard how exasperated General Kenobi sounded. He had long grown used to Dager's attitude of not caring about himself. I was taking a look at our plans. General Skywalker and General Mundy should arrive soon, so I have to get Hell Squad ready. Are you sure you and your men can take part in this assault? By holding this landing site, you save thousands of soldiers. We can't ask more of you. Besides, you aren't exactly in perfect shape. Dejo grinned, and looked at Ragu, still fighting. He couldn't stop, not while his general was still going. That was something he owned General D. We have been worse, General. Delta Squad 2. We keep going until this war is over. That is how clones do it. Chapter 257 We keep going until this war is over. That is how clones do it. After Dager said those two phrases, every trooper within earshot paused for a brief moment, before resuming what they were doing. They all put more effort into their actions, be it firing at the sepis, dealing with data at the command post, or treating wounded. Dager was right. Waking up every day, ready and willing to fight and die. Every trooper was born to battle, and they were proud of their destiny. Commander Cody glared at Dager silently for a few seconds before turning back to the control panel and ordering the heavy vehicles to concentrate fire on a group of dwarf spider droids. General Kenobi, on the other hand, was impressed. Two mere sentences, casually uttered by Dager, 
had been enough to make the clones double their efforts. It was easy to see why General D had been so focused on developing Dager, even though the commander had been bred to be just a simple clone. He was a natural leader, and was respected by the men around him. After over a year of war, the Jedi knew it wasn't easy to earn the respect of the clones. To people who faced death every day of their lives, what normal folk considered as invaluable and absolutely necessary, they deemed as worthless. Perishing in battle, with a blaster in his hands, and his brothers by his side, was all a soldier could ask for. And General Kenobi also felt something else. The flow of the force around Dejah was different. It was. Erratic, confused. It wasn't strong enough so Dejah could use it, and he couldn't sense it inside the clone. It was as if the force surrounded Dejah, not shaping his decisions, but going along with them. The clone would have some role in the course of this war. However, due to the nature of the force itself, the Jedi couldn't tell which role would this be. Sometimes, do you have dreams? Not normal dreams, but some sort of vision. Dejah shuddered, and lifted his head to look straight into General Kenobi's eyes. His hand unconsciously moved towards his hip, where his blaster pistol was, but he stopped himself, and controlled his facial expression. Gazing at Commander Cody through the corner of his eyes, Dejah prepared his words very carefully. He didn't know why, but he couldn't tell the Jedi about the nightmares. Everyone has dreams, General Kenobi. Even clones. The Jedi was surprised by the sudden wave of hostility that hit him, and shocked to find that it didn't come just from Dejah, but from all the clones around him, even Commander Cody. He thought it was because he had been rude, although he wasn't sure which score spot he had touched, and quickly explained himself. Luckily for him, he hadn't noticed the hands reaching for the blasters, otherwise things would have escalated quickly. Dejah's mind had blanked, and for a moment, he had seen the Jedi as an enemy rather than as a superior. Just like the nightmares. I didn't mean to intrude on your personal thoughts, Dejah. Of course, General Kenobi. It's just that. Clones usually don't have good dreams. Too many brothers have fallen, more than we can remember. The Jedi nodded. It made sense. Even before the war, he would have nightmares about how his master died. It was normal that clones also would, considering that thousands upon thousands of them died every day. Now, if you would excuse me, General Kenobi, I have to rest while I can. I'm sure the higher-ups will soon send another mission to my squad, so I have to get them in shape for it. Sure thing, Commander. I will see you on the battlefield. Dejah nodded, and left the command post. He didn't plan on resting, as he was afraid of what he would see when he closed his eyes. Instead, he wanted to help defend against the Seppis that were attacking their perimeter, but he realized it wasn't needed. General Skywalker and his Padawan had arrived, and with the help of the 501st, the 212th was able to push back the clankers. General Mundy also arrived not much later, although he was pretty badly wounded. It didn't seem like he would be able to partake in the battle anymore. Dejah was just about to head to where Hell Squad was when a lieutenant, using the white and yellow armor of the 212th stopped him. It was only after Lieutenant Shield took off his helmet that Dejah recognized him. Hello, Commander Dejah. Great job destroying those turrets. Shield. I see you are doing well in the 212th. Still alive. We lost Jolt and Bowman today, but the others are doing fine. I don't know about our brothers in the 501st, though. After the 303rd attack legion had been disbanded, some of the survivors went to the 212th, while others to the 501st, under Captain Rex and General Skywalker. Both were elite legions, and Dejah tried his best to keep track of the sixty or so clones. It wasn't easy, but using his authority as a commander, he could at least know when one of them died. They are doing well too. Helm, Cork, and Welly died, but most of them are okay. Lieutenant Shield nodded. There wasn't much they could do for their fallen brothers, but he was glad to know about them. Dejah didn't keep Lieutenant Shield occupied, and told him to get back to work. The battle was still going on, and the lieutenant could be punished if he wasn't doing his job. He also had just seen the Jedis and their respective commanders going towards the command post which he had just left. 
it appeared it was time for another meeting. Thanks to Master Ragu and the men under him, we were able to prepare a safe landing zone, for now. However, we are still far from the foundry. We will use this region as a resupply point, and advance from here, by air and ground. General Kenobi explained their battle plans to Ragu, General Undulai, and her Padawan, Barris. General Skywalker and Ahsoka were already back in the fray, leading not only the 501st, but also Commander Jet and his men. I shall find young Skywalker, and join his attack. Obi-Wan, I take it you will be in charge of the air assault. We will try to keep the Separatist forces on the planet away from the droid factories. Ragu, I am going to need your help. The Tegruta looked at the hologram table, and nodded. No matter how much he would have liked to invade the foundries and capture Poggle, he wasn't that harsh young apprentice anymore. He could see the bigger picture, and knew where he would make a difference. I spoke with Dejer earlier, and he said his squad is ready to return to combat. Is that right? Hell Squad and Delta Squad only had some flesh wounds, no broken bones. We will be at the front lines tomorrow. If you say so. We need every man we can get on the battlefield. Geonosis is a core planet for the Confederacy of Independent Systems. We conquer it, and it will be as if we have chopped off their arms. The bearded Jedi looked around the table, and saw several nodding heads. Then, ladies and gentlemen, you know your tasks. This battle is still going, so let's move along. Chapter 258 Dajer saw the pilot of his lot, Heater, die. A piece of metal, previously part of another gunship, had pierced the cockpit, and cut half of his neck. The commander put pressure on the wound, trying to stop the blood from gushing out, but it was too late. All he could do was put the body aside, and take control of the lot before it crashed. Cursing, he turned the gunship to the left, and went down. The dials on the controls flashed, indicating that they had been hit, and were losing fuel. You on the back, brace yourselves. We are going in. Dajer wasn't the best pilot, but he had learned a few things, mostly out of necessity. Dodging a few LR-1K sonic cannon shots, he pushed the throttle to the maximum. He knew that if they left the bigger group of Republic forces, they would easily be shot down. He heard Ragu warning General Kenobi that they had been hit, and the sound of troopers grabbing their blasters and tying their cables. Though wasn't too sure why, until Ragu touched his shoulder. The doors are broken, Dajer. They won't bulge. Slow down as much as you can, and get us low. I will cut the floor, and we will rappel down. Can't I just land? Only if you want to be blown up. Look over there. Dajer glanced down, only to see that there was an entire section of the Separatist forces set apart to go after the gunships that crashed or landed but weren't destroyed. Cables it is. Get ready, General. The Jedi nodded, and, using his blue lightsaber, cut a circle on the floor. When he kicked it, the piece of metal fell, and the hot air of Geonosis entered the gunship, the strong winds hitting the troopers' faces. Go, go, go. Six clones pushed the cables through the hole, attached their carabiners to it, and jumped down. They quite literally flew for a few seconds, until they started sliding down the cable, and reached the end of it. Detaching, they rolled in the sand before getting up. A lot could hold up to thirty troopers, maybe even forty if they were willing to be squished. It took all but two minutes to all the clones to leave the gunship. Hell Squad, obviously, were the last ones to slid down the cables, leaving only Ragu and Dajer still on it. You go first, General. I have an idea. The Tegruta looked at Dajer, but didn't disagree. He knew the commander well enough to know he would never do something he wasn't sure it would work. Waving his hand, he jumped down the hole, and landed softly on the sand below. The battle on the ground was in full swing. Dozens of thousands of clones spread out for kilometers, fighting three times their number in sepis. Every second, hundreds died on both sides. It was a scene that would make any normal person terrified. Geonosians picked up troopers, only to drop them from high up in the sky. Cannons, tanks, and turrets sent clankers and clones flying, in a mess of broken limbs and death. And the noise was deafening. This was a head-on battle. 
No skirmishes, no stealth, no mercy. Both sides collided against one another, and only one would survive. Where is Commander Dager, General? Pulling a droid with the force, Ragu made it levitate in front of him, and used it as a shield against the incoming lasers, at the same time spinning his lightsaber, and cutting in half any seppai that got near. He said he had an idea. I don't know what it is. Cell looked at the other members of Hell Squad, and then at the gunship that was slowly approaching an AAT and a group of seppis. Only Dager would be so crazy to try that again. He is doing the same he did in Kamino, only on a smaller scale. What did he do in Kamino? The commander and Barrow hijacked a separatist ship, and threw it on the seppis. The Kaminoans weren't happy. Ragu was slightly confused by what the last phrase meant, but he perfectly understood the rest. Still, he wasn't the least bit surprised. It was Dager style to do something like that. The clone left the ship just a few seconds before it was hit by an AAT. Dager slid down the cable, rolled, and knelt, his DC-15A already in position and firing. The gunship lost a wing, and spun to the right, missing the cluster of droids, but hitting the tank. Both went out in a small explosion. Instead of retreating until he reached the Republic's lines, Dager waited for them to go to him. Using the burning remains of a hail fire as cover, he killing every set pie in sight. Any Geonosians who tried to get to him gained another hole in their heads, thanks to Dab, who was over 600 meters away. How are you doing, Dager? Having fun. Where is your squad, Scorch? Dager heard the voice of the explosives expert in his comlink, but there was too much smoke and dust in the air for him to see where Delta Squad was. Behind you, to your left. We managed to land, although I have to say I would have liked to crash our gunship as you did. Shut up, Scorch. Dager, boss here. Do you see the crashed lot about a hundred meters to your left? He scanned the area that boss had indicated, and easily found the gunship, and, 300 meters behind it, Delta Squad. The clone commandos were using their DC-17M to perfection, shredding any seppai that they could lay their eyes on. I got eyes on it. Survivors? Do you think you can get there? We will provide cover. Dager surveyed the path he would have to take, and knew the chances of him surviving were slim. However, he couldn't let his brothers wait for their deaths inside the gunship. Wait. Hell Squad, find a suitable position, and aid Delta Squad. General Ragu, I will need your help too. Going in will be difficult, going back will be almost impossible. Roger that, Commander. Leave it to me, Dager. Go get them. Dager waited for Hell Squad to get into position, then looked at the gunship, and took a deep breath. Before his courage failed him, he started running. Almost immediately, dozens of red lasers came after him. He could see and hear them flying past him, barely missing, or hitting the ground where he just was. Even with the suppressive fire of the two special squads, he was still being targeted by dozens of clankers. Zigzagging, Dager also fired his blaster, making the heads of three droids fly, and a Geonosian fall out of the sky. He didn't know how, but he arrived at the crashed gunship unharmed. Dropping his blaster on the ground, he grabbed the door, and, grunting, pulled it open. He was received with a fist. Ducking, Dager instinctively pulled out his DC-17, and aimed at the owner of the fist, only to find out it was a trooper using the dark blue of the 501st. When the clone saw he was friendly, he dropped to the floor, panting, and holding his torso. Just by that, Dager could tell he had a few broken ribs. Slow down, brother. I'm here to help. Sorry, commander. We didn't know it was you. Getting up, Dager looked inside the gunship, and cursed. It was a graveyard. Chapter 259 The interior of the lot was filled with corpses. The crash had obviously been violent, as of the thirty clones inside the gunship, more than twenty had died. Their bodies were laying everywhere, and some were so twisted that their armor had cracked open. Dager wanted to eliminate every single clanker on the planet when he saw that, but he controlled himself. It wasn't something he hadn't seen before, but it saddened and angered him every time. However, 
he had survivors who needed help. He entered the gunship, stepping over the bodies of his brothers, and quickly ran his eyes over the six survivors. Most just had broken bones, or were unconscious from the impact, but two were in critical condition. The first was a sergeant, probably the highest ranking officer in the lot. His head was bleeding profusely, and his two legs were bent out of shape, broken in many places. Still, the sergeant was ignoring his wounds, and holding up a trooper. The clone was laying on the ground, and a sharp piece of metal, about a meter long, had pierced his back, and came out on his abdomen. Blood dripped down his white armor, marking it with red stains. Dajer just needed one glance to know he wasn't going to survive. He knelt down, and touched the sergeant's shoulder. The pilot? Died before we hit the ground. Hang on tight, brother. I will be back for you. You too, I need you to get up, and help them. Dajer gestured to the soldier with the broken ribs, and to another one, who seemed mostly unharmed. Together, they picked the two unconscious troopers, and prepared to leave the lot. We are never going to get past that stretch, Commander. We have a Jedi. General, you better be ready. Helping to drag one of the wounded, Dajer warned Ragu before going out. Immediately, he saw a blue light spinning amidst the dust, as Ragu made his way towards them. When he was fifty meters or so away, the Jedi turned off his lightsaber, and the four wounded clones floated towards him, falling clumsy, but alive, on the ground. Take them back. Hell Squad, Delta Squad, cover. Seeing that the four troopers were almost safe, as safe as they could be in the middle of a giant battle, Dajer went back inside the gunship. He planned to painfully explain to the sergeant that they couldn't save the last trooper, but he stopped when he heard them talking. How was? How was your first? First battle, Sarge. Pretty similar to this one, rookie. We were on Dantuin, and our ship crashed. However, we still showed the clankers who is boss. Show them who is boss once more, Sarge. 4. For the Republic. For the Ripu. Dajer saw the light in the trooper's eyes die out. The poor trooper died in his first battle, before he could even have a proper fight. Unfortunately, that happened far too often. The sergeant let his brother down. He had seen the horrors of war before, and it wasn't the first time a soldier died in his arms. Cruelly, every veteran had to grow used to this, even to the point where they wouldn't be phased by it. Are you sure you can get me through there, Commander? I am pretty much useless. Try to stop that bleeding on your head, Sergeant, and let me worry about the rest. It won't be easy. The Sergeant grunted in pain when Dajer dragged him, but there was no other way. Either that, or the clone died. Looking forward, Dajer once more warned Ragu that he was coming, and stepped out of the lot. It took three weeks, and it cost 270,000 clone lives, but Geonosis was retaken by the Republic, the droid factories on it were mostly destroyed, and Pago the Lesser was captured. Hell Squad was now escorting a Geonosian to a ship. The Separatist leader, Pago, had been captured, and was to be escorted to Coruscant for further interrogations. After putting Poggle inside a cell, Dajer let his men relax. They had been fighting for almost a month, and gone through days of uninterrupted battle. Now that they had the chance to stop and rest, they would take advantage of it. Hell Squad had been in the front lines the entire time, and on some occasions spent over 48 sleepless hours locked in battle. As such, it was impossible for them to be unharmed. Their bodies were adorned with countless scars, but after spending some time in a Bacta tank, they were mostly healed. One of the differences between lasers and projectiles was that lasers left a clean, and cauterized, wound, which were quick to heal, as long as they hit just flesh. Dajer pushed Poggle forward, and the Geonosian shrieked in his native language. The clone didn't understand a thing, but he was sure the bug wasn't praising him, so he used the butt of his DC-15A to hit his back, and the Geonosian stumbled, almost falling. After that, he kept quiet. They were now in a medical station, in the middle of space. They were originally going to Coruscant, but there were some complications. Two Padawans, Ahsoka and Barris, who were in another ship, 
going for the medical station, and initially had the objective of grabbing supplies to take to General Windu's troops on Dantuan, had to face some sort of parasite from Geonosis. Those parasites infected some troopers, and controlled their minds. In the end, the Padawans were able to eliminate the parasites, but by that time, several clones had died, and the Jedis were terribly weak. As such, the frigate originally transporting Poggle had stopped at the medical station, so General Skywalker and General Unduli could help their Padawans. After putting the Geonosian in another cell, Dager went to the command bridge. From what he had been briefed, there had been an attack on a Republic ship, and Jedi Master Eeth Koth had been captured. Dager didn't know the details yet, but a rescue mission was bound to happen, and it probably involved Hell Squad. When he got to the command bridge, he found General Kenobi, General Skywalker, and a Jedi he didn't know. She was a Tholothian, recognizable by the hair-like flesh on her head. When Dager approached the hologram table, a trooper was telling the Jedi something, but General Skywalker signaled for him to stop, and introduced the Tholothian to Dager. Dager, this is Master Adi Gallia, a member of the Jedi Council. And Master Gallia, this is Commander Dager, of the 303rd Attack Legion, and leader of Hell Squad. I heard a lot about you, Commander. After the necessary introductions were made, General Skywalker gestured for the clone to resume his report. Although it took some time, we were able to recover footage from General's Koth ship. It appears that the one who boarded the ship, and took him prisoner, was Separatist Commander General Grievous. Repeat that, Trooper. Every Jedi and clone around the table was surprised by Dager. The usually calm and collected commander had an incredulous expression on his face. Grievous, Commander. He was the one who attacked. That is impossible. Grievous is dead. Chapter 260. That is impossible. Grievous is dead. Dager looked almost furious at the poor trooper as he yelled, shocking every person in the command bridge. Commander Cody and Captain Rex both stepped forward, and put a hand on his shoulder, trying to calm him down. Evidently not, Commander. Why do you say that is impossible? It was General Gallia, who didn't know Dager before, who asked the question. It took a long while for Dager to answer, because his mind was full of questions. If General Grievous had somehow survived the explosion of the destroyer over Foleen, then maybe. Dager? Answer Master Gallia, please. Six months ago, in the Battle of Foleen, Hell Squad boarded the capital ship of the Sepis, a recusant class destroyer. Our mission was to blow it up, giving the Republic the chance to maintain control over the planet. We were too late. By the time the energy cells were nearing the critical point, our fleet was long gone and Hell Squad stayed behind. I remember that. You disobeyed your orders, didn't you, Commander? Under my lead, Hell Squad decided to stay, instead of leaving as General Secura ordered. We were too deep inside the ship, and we would never make it, so we didn't bother trying. The clanker, Grievous, was on the ship. When we reached the escape pods, he was already onto us. He nearly eliminated 3-4 and Dab. Dager took a deep breath, and organized his thoughts. He never should have let his emotions take over, be he had been too shocked by the news that General Grievous was still alive. And? Hell Squad entered the escape pods, and left the ship. We were forced to leave a man behind. Generals, I watched that destroyer blow up with my own eyes. No other pods left it. There is no way Grievous could have survived. The Jedi's exchanged glances in silence for a moment, before General Kenobi, who had gone up against General Grievous more than once, turned to Dager. Grievous is slippery. I don't know how he might have survived, but he did, and he has a Jedi as a prisoner. We have to rescue Master Koth. Luminara and Kiati will take Poggle to Coruscant, while us three will go after Grievous. Hell Squad requesting permission to tag along, General. General Kenobi looked at Dager pensively for a long, long while before answering. Dager, I know what you are thinking. However, Grievous surviving doesn't mean your man did. I doubt the Separatist would be merciful to someone who blew up one of their most expensive ships. I've known Brain since we were cadets, General. If someone could have survived that explosion, 
that someone is him. With all due respect, generals, but I think we should take Hell Squad. Clones don't leave a brother behind. If there is any chance that Brain is still alive, we have to help him. Captain Rex stepped forward, and looked at the Jedi straight in the eyes. Although he thought the chances of finding Brain alive were slim, he still felt it was worth a shot. Any clone would do the same for him, and he would do the same for any clone. General Skywalker glared at Captain Rex, and then at Dager, before nodding. However, Dager, you must be prepared to accept the truth, whatever it is. I see my brothers die every day, General. If Brain is alive, we will find him. If he isn't. He went out a true soldier. Two days later, the Jedi Council received a transmission from the Separatist. The hologram was recorded, and showed General Grievous stepping on General Koth. Greetings, Jedi. It would appear that, once again, one of your orders has lost its way. And, even better, a puny member of the Jedi Council. Listen to me, Jedi. I do not care about your politics. I do not care about your republic. I only live. To see you die. An IG-100 Magna Guard stepped forward, and hit the fallen Jedi with his electrostaff, making General Koth scream in pain. But death won't come so easily for Master Koth. I will make him suffer, because I know it is more painful for you all. Kakakakaka. Dajer stood behind Ragu, so he wouldn't appear in the projection. There were over ten holograms around the table, each showing a Jedi, since they were scattered around the galaxy, each fighting their own battle. At the moment, Ragu and Hell Squad were in the 501st fleet, above Coruscant. General Skywalker was on the planet below, at the Jedi Temple. The clone could see the pain and despise in the faces around the hologram table. General Grievous might be a sadistic idiot, but he was right. The best way to make a Jedi fell despair wasn't to eliminate and torture him or her, but those close to them. Dajer was sure not even a Jedi would be able to go through the Separatist torture methods with losing their minds. It was at that moment that Commander Wolf, under General P.L.O. Kuhn, appeared in the hologram, and said something to the Jedi. Commander Wolf has found a message in the hollow transmission. Play it back. The transmission was replayed, and they soon found the hidden message. General Koth made several small, almost unnoticeable, hand signals, which had been missed before. While General Kenobi was translating, Dajer had already deciphered the meaning. After all, he and his men used such signals every time they needed to do something quietly. General Grievous was in the Salukami system. A nearly deserted system, with just a few colonizers from several different planets. It was a perfect base of operations for a wild card like General Grievous. Decided it is. Master Kenobi, young Skywalker, and Master Gallia, to Salukami system, go you must. Find Grievous, and an end to his cruelty, put. The three chosen Jedis nodded, and left to make the necessary preparations. General Grievous was sure to have an entire army by his side, so even with their three legions, they weren't sure it would be enough. Master Yoda, I would like to go too. Master Koth is a good friend. The green Jedi frowned, before shaking his head. When a youngling, you were, Train you eth did. Ragu nodded. Let you go, I can't. Anger, I feel. A better job, I have. The Jedi looked as if he wanted to complain, but he realized that Master Yoda was right. He was angry at General Grievous, and the first thing he learned when he was a youngling, was that anger led to darker emotions. Sorry, Master Yoda. What do you want me to do? Good, good indeed. Control your emotions, a Jedi way is. Taught you well, Master D did. To show those lessons you learned, and pass to the young ones, I trust. To Ilum, take the younglings, you will. Time for them to become Padawans, has come. It was a very important assignment, one that even many more experienced Jedis didn't have the opportunity to do. That showed that General Yoda trusted him. I will do my best, Master. You will. The transmission was ended, and the holograms around the table disappeared one by one. I will have to go to Coruscant, Dajer. 
Hell Squad will probably go on this mission to Salukami. I can't be with you, but I do hope you find Brain, alive and well. Thanks, General. And remember, no matter what happens, don't let rage consume you. He controlled his emotions well. He will be a great master, one day. A lot of Imagun D, he has in him. A lot from him, this war took. But a lot, it also gave soon, time for him to become the master, it will. Chapter 261 Me and Master Gallia will board Grievous ship, and rescue Master Koth. However, we will need a distraction. Obi-Wan, I do believe you got it covered, right? I will engage Grievous fleet with both mine and the 501st. Knowing that it is me, I am sure he will try to board my cruiser. General Skywalker and General Gallia nodded, agreeing with General Kenobi's plan. Hell Squad, we are going to need you here, to distract Grievous forces while I distract him. Dajer didn't have much to say, other than acknowledging his orders. Boarding parties needed to be small, and two Jedis would do better than ten Hell Squads together. As much as he and his brothers wanted to believe Brain was alive, and to find him, they couldn't let their feelings get on the way of their main purpose. Win this war. Still, when General Skywalker was about to leave to his ship, he wouldn't be using a cruiser, but a smaller and almost undetectable ship, to infiltrate General Grievous' main vessel, Dager stopped him. General Skywalker, Grievous should have a tactical droid as his advisor or commander. If anyone knows about Brain, it would be him. As long as we have his head, Tech can uncover everything he knows, and not only about Brain. The young Jedi glanced at Dajer, and, after a few seconds, nodded. He had witnessed countless clones fall in battle, and he had seen the expression on their faces when their brothers died. He could understand that feeling. He also lost someone very dear to him, and if he had any chance, no matter how small, to bring her back, he would do everything he could. I will see what I can do. Thank you, sir. General Skywalker walked away, and Dajer stood at standard military position. Now, all they had to do was wait for their fleets to engage General Grievous. Everything went mostly as planned. General Grievous ordered his ship to use the tractor beam to pull General Kenobi's cruiser, and prepared to board it. 212th troopers, as well as Hell Squad, Commander Cody, and General Kenobi, waited for them. The Jedi's plan was to separate General Grievous from his forces. While General Kenobi dealt with the big clanker, the clones would take on the others. When they saw four lightsabers cutting a circle in the door, the clones gripped their weapons tighter. Two of them, who were just next to it, put their blasters directly on the edge of the hole. The first Seppai to come through would have a bad surprise. When the lightsabers retracted, a burning circle was left on the door, and a few seconds passed, eerily quiet. Then, the door was kicked in, and sent flying, crashing into two unfortunate troopers. The sound of bones breaking was clearly heard. However, General Grievous was a cunning idiot. Instead of entering first, he let his unit of commando droids go through. The first two seppies were immediately executed, with a laser to the head, by the troopers positioned next to the door. But the next commando clankers that entered were faster than the first two. They stabbed the clones with their vibroblades, killing them immediately. Here they come. Go, go, go. The small corridor, barely four meters wide, and three meters tall, became an intense battlefield in a matter of seconds. Each commando droid took several clone lives before being eliminated, and in all but a few minutes, casualties for the Republic side were in the dozens. Suddenly, Dajer saw three commando clankers pouncing towards him, their vibroblades sharp. Clearly, they had noticed that he already had eliminated six commando droids, and identified him and his squad as the biggest threat after General Kenobi. The Seppis left no angle for him to dodge, but Dajer stayed calm. Using his pistol, he blew off the head of one of them, and, at the same time, pulled out his own vibroblade. When Dab and 3-4 took care of a second commando droid, only one was left. Dajer stepped sideways, and the vibroblade missed him by millimeters. However, the weapon on the clone's hand didn't. He stabbed it on the clanker's neck, and flicked his wrist, ripping its head off. Cody, retreat. 
hold them off while I deal with Grievous. Seeing their losses only getting bigger, General Kenobi did a backflip, and started running away from the battle. General Grievous coughed and laughed, completely aware that he was being baited, but fine with it. His four lightsabers spun around, slicing three clones in several parts, and he ran after the Jedi. Two Magna Guards followed him. While the Jedi led the Abomination away, the clones had to fight the commando droids with everything they had. Metal's blaster torn many clankers apart, but they were so flexible that they could climb the walls and ceiling, and dodge most of the lasers. Seeing another brother fall dead next to him, Daedra knew they couldn't let the Seppis have their way, otherwise many more would die. Cody. Take your men and retreat. We will hold them back. The commander nodded, and, followed by his men, fell back. Daedra obviously didn't mean to sacrifice himself and Hell Squad, although he wouldn't hesitate to, if it was necessary. His plan was to split the droid forces, and it worked. About 30 commando droids and B-2 units went after Commander Cody and the 212th troopers, while 20 commando droids and 30 B-2 super battle droids went after Hell Squad. Dager ducked, dodging a volley of red lasers, and threw a droid popper, deactivating half a dozen clankers, but more kept coming. Even Hell Squad couldn't face that many commando droids face to face. Firing twice, Dager took down another B-2 unit, while Dab and Tech took down another two. However, they were being pushed back more and more. Ah! Useless clanker. Metal cursed when a laser hit his left arm, forcing him to drop his giant blaster. The heavy machine gunner proceeded to grab a DC-15S on his back, and used one hand to fire it. Without the firepower of Metal's double-barrel repeating blaster, Hell Squad was outgunned. They retreated while fighting, not giving the Seppis a meter unless they had no other choice. Droid bodies piled up, but their metallic brothers stepped on them without any regards. A commando droid slashed at Cell, cutting a nasty gash on his right shoulder. The scout counterattacked by blowing the clanker's head when he fired his blaster at point-blank range. Dab fell to the ground, hit in the chest by two lasers, only surviving thanks to the blast padding. Ack. Deja was shot in the thigh when he tried to pull Dab to some sort of cover. The clankers approached them, and Hell Squad tried their best to fend them off, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. Watch out! Dab ignored the pain to his chest, and rolled over, firing his DC-15X twice, and killing the commando droid that was about to shoot Dager. The droid fell on top of Dager, and he couldn't get up. Just when Hell Squad was about to be overwhelmed, several blue lasers hit the group of clankers, killing over ten of them immediately, and sending the others in disarray. Chapter 262 The sound of metal being torn apart was heard as General Kenobi cut the last Magna Guard in half with his lightsaber. When the persistent droid tried to crawl away, still alive, the Jedi spun his lightsaber, and pierced the clanker's head. The Separatist leader, General Grievous, watched coldly as his bodyguards were cut to pieces. He could make more of them if he wanted to. I will make you suffer today, just like I did to your fellow Jedis. General Grievous spread his cloak, showing over ten lightsabers hanging on it. Each one belonged to a Jedi he eliminated. General Kenobi felt pain and anger when he recognized some of them. Why do you do this, Grievous? Only hatred and rage in your heart, and so many meaningless deaths. Kaka Kaka. Meaningless deaths. Don't say that to me, Jedi. Your kind came to my planet, and eliminated my people. I will hunt you down, and I will use the greatest droid army the galaxy has ever seen to do it. An army with no soul or purpose, which only aims to eliminate. General Grievous laughed, full of hatred, noticing that the Jedi hadn't said anything about the massacre of his people. Without saying anything else, General Grievous lunged at General Kenobi, swinging four lightsabers in an X motion. The Jedi jumped backwards, deflecting General Grievous' attacks, and counter-attacking with one of his own, which the Clanker defended against by bringing back one of his lightsabers. You are a monster, a pawn of Dooku. Kakakakaka. General Kenobi dodged a stab from General Grievous' lightsabers, and jumped over the Clanker's head. However, before he could turn around and attack General Grievous, he was kicked in the back, 
and sent flying. His head buzzed, and he couldn't get up. And what about Skywalker, Kenobi? Did you really think? Did you really think I wouldn't be prepared for his little rescue mission aboard my ship? A metal claw grabbed the Jedi's neck, threatening to break it, and General Kenobi's vision started to go back. But he got lucky. Something hit the ship, making General Grievous lose his footing, and the Jedi used the chance to swing his lightsaber at General Grievous, and used the force to push him back. Gur. I will see you again, Kenobi. For now. I will eliminate your friends. General Grievous put away his lightsabers, and got on all six, he had four hands, and crawled away like a spider, faster than the Jedi could react. Cody. Grievous is heading your way. We have to keep him on the ship. Dajer heard General Kenobi yelling on Commander Cody's comlink. He executed a commando droid who was still alive, even though half of his head was gone, and turned to his brother. Hell Squad will go to the connector. You try to hold him here. Good luck, brother. Stepping over the clanker's bodies, Hell Squad ran as fast as they could to the connection between the Republic's and the Separatist's ships. They had been saved by Commander Cody and the 212th troopers, who had dealt with the clankers who went after them, and came to help Hell Squad. Metal, prepare your blaster. When that clanker appears, shoot everything you have we can't let him through. Hell Squad took position, kneeling on the ground, or standing up, their weapons aimed at the direction General Grievous would be coming from. Deja knew they weren't match for the clanker, but that was no reason not to try. He would rather die than let General Grievous escape. Deja, we couldn't hold him. He is coming to you. Almost at the same time that he heard Commander Cody, Deja saw a spider-like figure running towards them. Immediately, he and the others opened fire, and the corridor was filled with blue lasers, but General Grievous was unfazed by this. He crawled on the walls and ceiling, dodging everything that was thrown at him, and smashed into metal. The poor clone was sent flying, and crashed into the wall, falling to the ground, unconscious. Doing something impossible to a normal person, the clanker got up, each part of his body turning into a different direction, and punched Selm 3-4 with the back of his hands, knocking them out. Dab was literally kicked out of combat, while Tech was grabbed by the neck, and flung away. In less than three seconds, only Deja remained up. He fired his blaster, hitting General Grievous on the left shoulder, but all that happened was a scorch mark, and the clanker didn't even bulge as he glanced at Deja with bloodshot eyes. He slapped the blaster out of the clone's hands, and tried to kick him, but Deja dodged, and pulled out his vibroblade. Seeing a clone use such a weapon made General Grievous remember something. You. The entire ship shook very suddenly, cutting off General Grievous, and almost making Dajer fall. The connector between the two ships flailed, almost breaking, and the clanker turned his attention to the more pressing matters at hand. Escaping to his ship before every Jedi on the Republic went after him. Thanks to his moment of carelessness, General Grievous wasn't able to dodge when Dajer slashed his vibroblade at his torso. However, all the weapon did was leave an indent, and cut off a piece of the clanker's cape. In return, he received the same fate as Dab, and was kicked, flying a good four meters before crashing on the ground. His head was spinning, and no matter how much he tried to get up, he couldn't. He saw several blurry figures run past him, and get into the connector moments before it broke, almost pulling Hell Squad into the vacuum of space. They were saved by the emergency doors, that closed immediately. Getting up, he saw that the laser cannons on General Grievous' ship were targeting their cruiser's engines. It was only a matter of minutes before the entire ship blew up. Without hesitation, Dajer connected his comlink to the loudspeakers of the ship. All troops, this is Commander Dajer speaking. Abandon the ship. I repeat, abandon the ship. Get to the escape pods. He helped Metal get up, and a few 212th troopers came to Hell Squad's aid, and brought them to the escape pods. Suddenly, Dajer stumbled upon something. Looking down, he saw two metal sticks, of different sizes. Lightsabers. Surprised, he picked them up, and put them into his belt. The Jedis would be interested in the weapons. Not much later, all the troopers and crewmen were in escape pods, floating in space. 
The battle was still happening, but it was clear the Republic was winning, so the clankers had no time nor troops to waste with a few pods. Suddenly, a bright light flashed, and General Kenobi's cruiser cracked in half. For a millisecond, flames burned, before being extinguished. Luckily, the Jedi, as well as Commander Cody, had followed General Grievous to the Separatist ship, where they had been picked up by General Skywalker. It was a quite confusing series of events, but it all worked out. The only ones who remained on the ship were the captain and his co-pilot. Both clones refused to leave a captain always went down with his ship. Commander Dager. Here. What is it, Admiral? I'm sending someone to pick you up. General Skywalker says he has something for you. Chapter 263 For Jedis, General Kenobi, General Skywalker, General Gallia, and General Koth, as well as Commander Cody, Captain Rex, and Captain Locke were looking at a hologram of Salukami, trying to pinpoint General Grievous' location. Several Separatists C-9979 had landed on the planet, so they would have to go through them one by one until they found the clanker. When Dager entered the command bridge, after leaving Hell Squad on the infirmary, aside from a few laser wounds, and the cut that Cell received. They weren't too hurt, and even the fight with General Grievous had only left a few bruises, the first thing he saw was the black and red head of a tactical droid. He was anxious to have Tech have a look at the droid circuits, but he was disciplined enough to hold himself back. Instead, he took out the two lightsabers that he had found, and put them on the hologram table. Instantly, they became the focus of everyone, and Dager could feel the questioning gazes of the Jedis. The clanker, Grievous, dropped those when Hell Squad confronted him. I thought you would be interested in them, generals. The Jedis exchanged glances, and General Kenobi picked up the two lightsabers. He ran his fingers through them, feeling the engravings. Those. They belong to Master Barek and Master Madama. We already knew that monster had eliminated Master Barek, but Fowl went missing before this war even started. For how long have Grievous been killing Jedi? And how many did he murder? The Jedis went on deep thought for a few minutes, after which General Kenobi put the two lightsabers away, and nodded at Dager. He then turned back to the hologram table, and continued explaining their plans. I will take Cody and Rex to the planet, and we will search for Grievous. Meanwhile, Anakin will engage his forces up here, and make sure Grievous have no reinforcements. Master Gallia, if you could take Master Koth to Coruscant. I don't need that much help, Master. Obviously, you do. Leave it to me, Master Kenobi. General Kenobi nodded, and General Gallia helped General Koth out of the command bridge. Then, the bearded Jedi turned to Dager, and knocked the tactical droid head with his fingers. Get your man to crack this open as fast as he can. We only have about 11 hours before the automatic burn process begins. The automatic burn process that General Kenobi referred to was a command in the circuits of the tactical droids, which deleted every information they had, in case they were eliminated. After all, tactical droids carried lots of separatist plans, so the Seppis couldn't risk it. However, by cutting or tearing off the droid's head, this process wouldn't start immediately, but only after a few hours. Because of this trick, the Republic had foiled several separatist schemes before. Right away, General. Tech, come to the command bridge, and bring your toys. Soon, the clone arrived, carrying two different data pads, as well as a few cables and a hologram projector. General Kenobi, General Skywalker. Tech, is that right? Discover everything you can, and transfer it to our databases. Of course, if you can find anything about the trooper your squad lost, gather it too. Tech immediately got to work, connecting the cables to the droid head, and then to the data pads. He completely immersed himself in it, and spent several hours breaking down the defenses around every bit of information he could get his hands on. General Kenobi was already on Salukami, in hot pursuit of General Grievous and his forces, while General Skywalker was still on his command ship, analyzing the Separatist plans and data that Tech had managed to hijack before the tactical droid circuits were burned. Did you find anything useful, Tech? The clone shook his head, and then shrugged. He turned to General Skywalker, and the data that he was reading. I'm not sure yet, sir. 
General Skywalker is looking at it, but the information was mostly outdated. Up till now, the only useful piece of intel we found is about three or four separatist bases we didn't know about. Anything about brain? A trace of sadness flashed through Tech's eyes before he gave his answer. Nothing, Commander. I think. Brain is gone. We already knew that. General Skywalker heard them talking, but just slightly paused before resuming what he was doing. Dager, on the other hand, just sighed. He knew it was wishful thinking of his to believe that Brain was still alive. He saw his brothers die every day, he just didn't want to believe that Brain was one of them. Taking control of his emotions, Dager started looking through the intel. Brain was another death he would make the Seppis pay for, but, as a clone, Brain was always prepared to die, and Dager, also as a clone, was always prepared to see his brothers fall. After over twenty minutes, General Skywalker made some surprised sounds, prompting Dager and Admiral Yellerin, the 501st Legion Admiral, to look at him. Tech had already returned to his quarters. Did you find anything, General Skywalker? Maybe. You too, have a look at this. The Jedi pulled up a projection of a weirdly shaped building. It looked like an inverted pyramid. It wasn't like any separatist base Dager had ever seen. What is this? The building plans of a separatist space base, orbiting Sullust. A prison, to be exact. The prisoners appear to be mostly clones, with a few insurgents from the planets the Seppis captured. Dager frowned. That was something he had never seen. And, apparently, Admiral Yellerin agreed with him. The separatist never kept prisoners before, unless they were of a high position, like a Jedi Master. Why would they have a prison for clones? That isn't true, Admiral Yellerin. When the Seppis need someone to do the hard work for them, they keep prisoners. It happened to my legion on Majido, and to General Fisto's troops on Mon Cala. Admiral Yellerin and General Skywalker frowned. What Dager said brought up another question. What are they building that they need so many workers? I don't know, but we gotta find out. Admiral, I will leave Salukami to you. Dager, prepare your squad. You have a new mission. Right away, General. Be careful, General Skywalker. A few hours later, an Arquitans class light cruiser left the 501st fleet, and jumped to hyperspace. It was one of the smallest cruisers the Republic had, so it wouldn't be detected as easily, and, in case it was, it was fast. Remember, we aren't attacking the prison. We will infiltrate, free the prisoners, and then the ship will dock, and we escape. Remember, our objective isn't to destroy it. If we can find anything about what they are building, better. How will the cruiser dock? And how will we get in without them noticing? General Skywalker acknowledged Dab's questions, and turned to Dager. The clone stepped forward, and showed a hologram of the building plans that they had recovered from the tactical droid. After we get inside, Tech, Metal, and Cell will deactivate their weapons system. And how are we getting inside? Dager looked at his squad, and shrugged. They wouldn't like it, but they would do it all the same. General Skywalker said he did this before. We will follow his lead. Chapter 264 I don't like this. When have you ever liked anything? I know, but this is different. Shut up, Cell. You are embarrassing Hell Squad. Dager knocked the scout on the shoulder, making him close his mouth, but he had to admit Cell was quite right. What they were about to do was crazy. Ready? When you are, General. Don't be so serious, Dager. This is going to be fun. Go. Dager watched General Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano jump out of the ship, wearing spacesuits and jetpacks. Dager looked at his squad, and gestured towards the vacuum beyond the ray doors. A black carpet, with countless white stars. And, in front of all that, a weirdly shaped, upside-down pyramid, floating in space. Having said that, Dager took a step forward, and, without the ray shields, he was instantly sucked into space. Thankfully, they were prepared, and had their jetpacks. I hate this. Still, Cell jumped. Just like always, the clone would complain about everything, 
but when it was needed, he wouldn't falter. Six clones, and two Jedis, using jetpacks, made their way towards the Separatist prison. To their left, or perhaps under them, was the grey planet that was sullust. Several stripes of red and orange crossed the planet, showing the lava streams that ran through the whole surface. When General Skywalker had told Hell Squad and his own Padawan, Ahsoka, what his plan was, he had received quiet, but astonished gazes. It was madness, and genius at the same time. Not even the clankers would expect someone to attack by space like that. The clones certainly didn't expect. Now, as the prison got bigger in front of them, and the turrets defending it got more and more menacing, Dager wasn't so sure if it was a good idea. If they were detected, no matter if it was clone or Jedi, they would be blasted to pieces. But they reached their target without any problems. As terrifying as it sounded, using the jetpacks on the vacuum was actually pretty easy. There was no wind or anything to get on the way, so all they had to do was aim in the right direction. That didn't mean the clones didn't grab the first holder that they could, and didn't let go. In that case, it was the bottom half of platform. Dager looked over it, only showing the top half of his face. Several B-1 units and a few vulture droids were walking around in the hangar, while at least a hundred clones, wearing ragged clothes, were carrying pieces of metal, putting them together, and building something. That something was then carried and loaded into a separatist ship, which flew out of the hangar, just over the heads of the Republic group. Now. The clones followed the Jedis, and pulled themselves up, the zero gravity making it pretty easy, and entered the hangar, immediately hiding behind some containers. However, it was only when they crossed the blue ray shields and put their feet on solid ground that they felt safer. Dager had to admit it was a good tactic of infiltration. No one would ever expect someone to cross one-fourth of a parsec in space. However, he hoped he would never have to do that again. He much preferred the more direct and simple frontal attack. All right, we split here. Snips, go to the weapon system, and take it down. Quietly. You three, go with her. I will go free the prisoners. Okay, master. And may it be with you too, my Padawan. Now, go. The group broke up, and sneaked past the clankers in the hangar, going to separate directions. Tech hacked into the prison's network to discover where the weapon system was, and, at the same time, showed Dager where the clones they came to rescue were. Silently, Dager gestured that he understood, and followed General Skywalker. They had to be as careful as they could, because they were outnumbered a thousand to one by the clankers. Suddenly, they heard the sound of metallic footsteps coming their direction, and General Skywalker closed his fist, making them stop, and pointing to their left, where a door could be seen. Dager nodded, and knelt down. In a few seconds, the door was opened, and they got in. What greeted them was about 12 B-1 battle droids, overseeing a group of 20 clones assemble something. Both droids and prisoners were clearly surprised, especially when a Jedi jumped at them, and cut the seppies in pieces. The three clones behind him didn't even need to do anything. General Skywalker put his finger over his lips, telling the prisoners to stay quiet. Dager closed the door behind them, and just in time, because the footsteps in the corridor grew louder, went right past the door, and disappeared. After he was sure that they were safe, General Skywalker switched off his lightsaber, and turned to the clones. They all had long hair, and even some principle of a beard, showing that they had been prisoners for a long, long time. Who is the highest ranking officer here? The clones exchanged glances, and one of them stepped forward. We are all troopers, General. My name is Guard, 187th Legion. We came to take you out of here, but we are going to need some assistance. Dager stepped forward, and told the clones to relax. They had all been standing straight, saluting General Skywalker. Dab and Three-Four walked amidst them, seeing if any were injured. Surprisingly, they weren't. They were malnourished, that is for sure, but not hurt. Don't worry, brothers. We will get you all out. Not now, though. We still need to take care of their defense systems, and free the others. But first off, guard, how long will it take for someone to notice we eliminated those clankers? At least a few hours. We will be long gone by then. 
where are the other prisoners kept? And how many? At the lowest levels, although most of the time the Shinies have a few groups somewhere else, like us. And there should be maybe 1,300 of our brothers in this hell. Dajer saw Guard's fist close in anger, and he could only imagine how the clone felt. Looking at General Skywalker, he noticed that the Jedi was talking to the other clones, so he took the chance to ask another question. I'm Dajer, commander of the 303rd Attack Legion, or at least I was. Do you know if a clone named Brain is here? He is part of my squad. Guard looked at Dajer, and at the scar on his face, and finally realized from where he knew the clone. Hell Squad, right, Commander? I was wondering who was crazy enough to come here. Brain is at the lower levels. He won't stop talking about how he blew that clanker ship. Dajer felt a weight lift on his chest. Brain was alive. He grinned, and tapped Guard's shoulder. He will be disappointed to know that Grievous survived. But the ship did blow up. It was beautiful. The two clones laughed, and Dajer told Guard to rest, while he went to talk to General Skywalker. As much as he would like to rest, there was no time. Chapter 265 Do you know anything about what they are making you build? Guard shook his head to General Skywalker's question. There was no way the Seppis would tell the prisoners that, and no reason for. They only needed to work. The clankers only needed us for the jobs their broken circuits can't process, like turning screws and so. You know us clones, General. We prefer to die than to do that, but. They eliminated others as a warning. Guard and the other clones, including the members of Hell Squad, clenched their fists in anger, but Dajer knew it wasn't that simple. Clones were born ready to die, and ready to witness their brothers die. Even if the Seppis executed them one by one, they wouldn't utter a word. They would rather die than yield. But there were worse ways to make a clone obey. Not only that. Every time we refused to do what they wanted, they would pull one of our brothers, and torture him for hours before throwing him back into the cell, almost dead. That happened again, and again, and again. We couldn't watch them suffer. General Skywalker sighed. It wasn't their fault. You did what you had to do to survive. Dead, you would be only numbers in the Republic's reports. Alive, you can fight, and give the Separatists what they deserve. Hearing the Jedi, the clones straightened their backs, and their eyes flicked with determination. They had been feeling ashamed of themselves for giving in to the enemy, but they were true soldiers. They wouldn't give up so easily, especially now that they had a chance to fight back. Just say what we have to do, General Skywalker. We have been waiting for quite some time to destroy those damn Seppis. However, for now, I need you to stay here, quietly. We will be back for you. The ex-prisoners nodded. They understood that a small group was needed for what General Skywalker and Hell Squad wanted to pull off. After making sure there were no droids in the corridor, they left, and took the first elevators they found. They went down over forty floors before reaching the cells. Twenty floors of them, and countless clankers as guards. Snips, how are you looking with the weapon system? A hushed voice answered General Skywalker. His Padawan clearly was somewhere she had to be careful. We can deactivate it whenever you want us to, Master. However, we will have to be fast, otherwise the droids will get it back up. You stay put, Ahsoka. When it is time, I will tell you. After confirming that the other group was in position, General Skywalker turned to Dajer, and gestured towards the nearest patrol of clankers. The droids were all B-1 units, with red painting, and could also be called security droids. Dajer nodded, showing he understood, and checked his blaster. Grinning, he made a signal for the two clones behind him. This was going to be fun. Brain was sitting on the ground, his back on the wall of the cell. Around him were twenty-one other clones, and a Celestin, member of a rebel group on the planet. He had been in this prison, building whatever the Separatists were building, for over six months now. Like the others, he had refused at the start, but later, when his brothers were tortured one after another, he had given in. Still, the spirit of a special unit had remained. He had used the few chances he got to find out about what the hell the clones were being forced to build, and, 
although he didn't get a lot of information, he had a few bits and pieces of it. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be able to give that intel to the Republic. Or so he thought. Suddenly, the sound of lasers being fired, and clankers yelling, could be heard above him. He got up, and went to the front of the cell, just in time to watch three or four droids fall down, past his cell, and to the bottom floor. After a few minutes of uninterrupted fighting, which only appeared to grow louder, he could only suppose it was because someone was freeing his brothers, and they were grabbing the blasters the droids left behind, and joining the battle, arrived near his cell. When the two B-1 units guarding the cell were cut down by a blue lightsaber, Brain knew who was rescuing them. When 3-4 shot the lock, Brain discovered who was crazy enough to follow General Skywalker in such an impossible mission. Brain. Brother. 3-4. I never thought I would see your ugly face again. The two clones laughed for a moment, before 3-4 moved on, ducking behind a railing, and firing at an enemy out of Brain's field of view. Dager appeared next, followed by Dab. The sniper nodded at Brain, while Dager picked up the two E5s that the clankers had dropped, and threw them to Brain and another clone. Commander, sir. It's good to have you back, brother. All of you. Now, get up, and get moving. We are getting you out of this place, but we will have to fight our way out of it. The clones nodded, and followed Dager out of the cell. On the entirety of the prison, where droids had once been, now were clones, who, even though they were outgunned, were cutting down the droids. The metallic bastards didn't withstand a chance against a Jedi. More than one trooper fell, victim of the red lasers fired by the clankers, but most survived, and fought back. In less than half an hour, all the droids in the prison levels had been eliminated, and so were the small groups of reinforcements that had been sent. However, more would come, so they had to move fast. The brain before Dager's eyes was a pitiful sight. Although the clone tried to hide it, his clothes were ragged, so Dager could see the countless new scars that adorned his body. His eyes were cloudy and misty, and, although he was behaving like nothing was wrong, more than once he simply stopped moving, for no reason, and required Dager to push him forward. What did they do to you, brother? His right hand heard his whispers, and, for a moment, looked ashamed of himself. I told them what I knew, sir. I couldn't stop myself. But they didn't believe I only knew so much. So they picked our brothers, and tortured them in front of me, until they died. Anger and sadness were hidden in Brain's explanation. Deja knew how it was to see your brothers die because of you, and not be able to do anything about it but the Seppis were targeting the wrong spot with Brain. He was just a soldier, after all. Sure, he was a member of a special unit, and had access to more information than normal troopers, but not by much. The chances of a member of Hell Squad being captured or eliminated were high, so, apart from danger, they were clueless about their missions and battle plans until they were already in the middle of it. And danger had proved he could resist a Sith interrogation. All right, boys. We are going to the hangar F3. Hell squad, you get the front. The ones who got weapons, cover the rear. Let's move. Hearing General Skywalker, Dager shook his head, and put a hand on Brain's shoulder. He didn't say anything, but his brother grinned madly, understanding. Snips, we got the prisoners. Wait two minutes, then deactivate their systems, and get to the hangar where we entered. Captain, we are ready to extract. You got it, Master. Understood, General Skywalker. We will move in closer. After confirming they were good to go, General Skywalker started running, followed by a thousand clones, and about a hundred very confused insurgents and rebels of different species. They were joined along the way by other groups of prisoners, who had been working on the other parts of the prison. General, Brain says he knows something about what the Seppis are building, although he has no idea of what it means. General Skywalker nodded, while deflecting two lasers, and using the force to push two clankers. Something about a prototype superweapon, using Kyber crystals as the core. Kyber crystals. General Skywalker stumbled, clearly surprised by what he heard. Dager, on the other hand, had no idea of what Kyber crystals were. That is not possible. 
Only Jedis know the secret to using kyber crystals. And to make it into a superweapon. It would have to be gigantic, the size of a planet. As much as he was perturbed by those thoughts, General Skywalker quickly dismissed them. Brain said it was a prototype, and he was sure it was one impossible to make. The Separatists were walking to a dead end, and he was happy to let them do that. Chapter 266 We detected a Republic ship approaching our position. Should we open fire? Mutia Li Ahang was a Troig, a tall, reptilian species, with two heads. He was also the prison director, responsible for the prisoners in Sullust. And he wasn't in a good mood. What are you waiting for? You idiot. Destroy. Them. Each head completed the other's sentence, and spat saliva on the poor B-1 unit, before pushing it in anger. His honor and life depended on the prisoners being recaptured, and the invaders being destroyed. However, he was going to be disappointed. The systems are offline. We can't control our turrets. It didn't take long for Ahang to understand that it was all part of an elaborate plan. He would be an idiot if he failed to see that he had been played, and that the invaders, which he assumed were part of the Republic scum, were much better prepared than he thought. And that only made him even angrier. Send someone to take back the weapon systems. And send out the vulture. Droids. That ship must be destroyed at all. Costs. A clone screamed as two lasers hit him. The blaster in his hands fell to the ground, and the trooper behind him picked it up. Stepping over his brother's body, he fired at the clankers. That wasn't the first time this had happened, and, unfortunately, it was a normal occurrence for clones all over the galaxy. A battle didn't stop because a combatant died. While the trooper was firing at the droids, a figure suddenly jumped out of a corner, and a green light flashed, aiming for his neck, and leaving no time for any kind of reaction. He was sure he was dead, but the light suddenly stopped, revealing itself to be a lightsaber, wielded by a young, female Tegruta. Dogma? I thought you were dead. The soldier, Dogma, took a second to realize who the familiar face was, and then went back to shooting at the clankers. Commander Tano. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure you were a friend. Now I see I was wrong. Where is Master Skywalker? He should be coming right up. He went to free some others. Just as Dogma said that, the main group of once prisoners appeared in the corridor, led by General Skywalker. His Padawan nodded at him, and started running too, followed by Cell, Metal, and Tech. How was it on your end, Snips? Their systems are down for now, Master. However, we will have to hurry, before they can get it back on. Master and Padawan nodded to each other and ran forward, overtaking Dogma and the other clones who were in the front. They swung their weapons together, and the lightsabers cut the clankers like they were nothing. When the clones who had gone with Ahsoka saw Brain, they smiled under their helmets, and greeted him hurriedly. Cell slightly punched his shoulder, and the grenadier couldn't help but open a wide smile. Missed me? We were in need of someone who knew how to throw things. Of course, even though they were talking, their eyes never left the enemy ahead, their fingers kept pressing the trigger, and they kept running. Hearing the small interactions between his brothers, Dager's thoughts went back to Ryloth, and to a promise he had made to Commander Keeley. The broken helmet that once belonged to the commander still sat on a shelf on his quarters in Coruscant, both as a treasure and a reminder. He knew he couldn't save all his brothers, but he would do his utmost to make sure the 303rd troopers lived, even if they were in other legions now. Pushing those thoughts away, he concentrated on the present, and lifted his DC-15A, pressing the trigger three times, and each laser took a droid's life. Hell Squad was a deadly unit, even after they lost brain. Now that the clone was with them again, no clanker could stand on their way. The hangar is just ahead, General. The cruiser is already there. After turning a corner, Dager informed General Skywalker, to which the Jedi answered with a nod. The hangar had several scorched marks on the ground and walls, and at least two dozen clankers, in pieces, were scattered around. Clearly, the Seppis had tried to stop the Arquitans class Republic cruiser, but they were no match to the turrets on the ship. 
As soon as the clone captain saw the ex-prisoners arriving, he opened the lower ramp of the ship. Under the protection of the Jedis and those who had blasters, the troopers entered, hesitantly followed by the thirty or so insurgents that were also kept captive. However, before everyone could get into the cruiser, an entire platoon of B-1 droids appeared in the hangar, and gunned down many clones who still were outside. Over twenty troopers fell, cowardly shot in the back. Unfortunately, Hell Squad and General Skywalker, as well as his Padawan, were already inside the ship, and their path back was blocked by the prisoners they had rescued. Noticing that, the few clones who outside the ship looked at each other, and nodded. Coincidentally led by guard, they picked up the blasters on the ground, and started fighting back. You gotta leave, General. We will hold them back. Negative, Trooper. Get inside. Guard hesitated for a moment, but witnessing his defenseless brothers being slaughtered, he made up his mind. Hitting a panel next to the ramp, he made it close, leaving him and fifteen other clones locked outside. It all happened too fast for General Skywalker to react. Before he knew it, the ramp had closed. As much as he wanted to open it again, he knew that by the time that happened, the brave soldiers outside would already be dead, and he would only expose more clones for the Separatists to eliminate. Angry but powerless, he ordered the cruiser to take off, and glanced at the almost a thousand ex-prisoners with the corner of his eyes. They took the sacrifices of their brothers way better than him, mainly because they would have done the same if they swapped places with guard. Putting down his blaster, Dajer started to do a headcount of the rescued prisoners, even as he felt the cruiser rock under the attacks of the vulture droids. He knew that only those seppies wouldn't be able to take down the shields. In total, 1,104 prisoners escaped. The rest had either been eliminated or captured again, and Dajer preferred not to think about it. As the ship entered hyperspace, he sat down, and rested his head against the wall. That mission was over. Now, Hell Squad had to wait for their next assignment. They were under the leadership of Jedi Master Anakin. Skywalker, my lord. In a dark room, Count Dooku listened to the report, his expression unreadable. The attack, and the escape that followed it meant nothing to him. Neither did the young Skywalker. He was more interested in someone else. And who were the Republic dogs that accompanied him? Not just any clone can succeed in such daring plans. A special unit called Hell Squad. Hell Squad, hum. Get me a report of their previous actions, and send it to every commander. It isn't the first time I've heard that name. Chapter 267 Thanks, Dajer. You can rest now. The clone nodded to the young Tigrota, Ahsoka, and stayed at ease, although he didn't leave the command bridge. As an officer, even when he wasn't doing anything, he had to be ready, even if that meant staying in the same position for hours. After a few hours, he heard a transmission being received by one of the many crew members. Usually, he would only bother with it if the trooper came to him, but he recognized the pattern, so he went up to the clone, and grabbed the earpiece that he offered. As he listened, his expression grew serious, and he put the helmet that was under his arm in the control panel. It didn't take long for Ahsoka to notice his reaction. Bad news, Dajer. Very bad, Commander Tano. I haven't heard it entirely, but... Lacro, patch it through. While the crewman was doing that, Dajer walked up to the hologram table, and, at the same time, ordered a trooper to find General Skywalker. They used the urgent codes to send the message, Commander. That means the Separatists are planning a major attack on one of our core planets. Which one? Dajer took a deep breath, and showed a hologram of a planet he knew too well, made mostly of water, and raining all year. Kamino. Home. A massive Separatist fleet, bigger than any we have ever seen, is preparing to strike Kamino. If they destroy the cloning facilities, our entire army, and even the Republic, will be endangered. We need every free fleet to rendezvous at Kamino. That includes you, Anakin. I will be there, Master Kenobi. Do we know who is the Separatist leader responsible for the offensive? Who could it be other than Grievous? After finishing talking to General Skywalker and Ahsoka, the hologram of General Kenobi turned to Dajer. 
he had basically just repeated the contents of the message they had received a few hours prior. Hell Squad also has been ordered to come to Kamino, Commander Dager. I believe I don't have to tell you the importance of that planet. Hell Squad won't let the Seppis touch the facilities. No clone will, no matter the price. General Kenobi nodded, and then bowed to General Skywalker and his Padawan, who returned the gesture, before finishing the transmission. Commander, you better make the needed preparations. I would rather let the men rest and recover, however, seeing how most of them are just tired, but unharmed, we will need them. Dejer nodded, and put on his helmet. The prisoners they had rescued wouldn't miss the battle that would come by any chance. Kamino was their home planet, not to mention the dozens of millions of cadets in training, and wounded soldiers that were there. He would rather die than let the clankers destroy a single building. Will do, General. The commander left command bridge, and went to inform his squad and the soldiers. As he had expected, their reactions were of anger and anxiety. While waiting for them to calm down, Dejer felt his scar burn slightly. That always happened when a big battle was coming up. Kamino was the image of a battlefield, even though the Separatist hadn't even arrived yet. Barricades were being built, ammunition and fuel were being moved, and troopers from several different legions were moving around, finishing the preparations to resist the invasion. Dejer could also see a good number of clones wearing shining new armor, without any paint or ornaments. Some were soldiers who had completed their training, and were waiting to be deployed, while others had their training rushed. Either way, their first battle would be a difficult one, and Dejer didn't have much hope that a lot of them would survive. War was cruel, and it liked to crush inexperienced soldiers. The more battles one fought, the higher their chances of survival were. However, over 30% of the clones died in their first combat. You are here too. A raspy voice called for Dejer, and he easily identified its owner. 99, the deformed clone that helped young cadets. He was also a good friend of Dejer. Hello, 99. It is unfortunate that the only time I come home is to fight. The hunchback clone excitedly shook Dejer's hand, and turned to the other members of Hell Squad. Of course, he couldn't recognize all of them, since there were millions of clones on Kamino, but he knew Brain. CT 2891. How is life on the battlefield? Brain chuckled, and put an arm around 99's shoulder. The clone might be deformed, or even defective, but he was still a brave soldier for every trooper that knew him. You will see it by yourself soon enough, brother. And I got a name now. Those are Cell, Metal, 3-4, Dab, and Tech. Hell Squad of the 303rd Attack Legion presenting itself. Ha ha ha. 99 was more than happy to shake hands with Hell Squad. He thought for a moment about commenting about the destruction of the 303rd, but decided against it. He might not have the battle experience that other clones had, but, in comparison, he was much more emotionally mature than them. He knew when to talk, and when not to. And, he figured that Hell Squad had heard more than enough, sorry for your loss. You better try to stay safe during the battle, 99. The cadets will need you. I never would have gotten through training if it wasn't for your bits of advice. The clone nodded, and bid his farewells to Dejer and the others. He, like many troopers, and even cadets, was moving blasters and ammunition around. From time to time, he would recognize someone, and greet him. All the clones were extremely polite to him, because they knew he was fighting as much as them, on his own way. Poor 99. He wishes to do more, but he can't. He already did a lot. I hope he survives this battle. Enough chatter. We need to talk to Brody, of Deep Squad, and to an ARC trooper named Colt, of a Ranker Battalion, and see what our duties will be. Metal and Cell shrugged, and the former laughed, while patting his giant blaster as if it was a pet. Put a clanker in front of me, and you will see my duty, sir. I will see if they dare to step into our home. By the way, do you think the record of fastest run on the training course is still ours? Talking and laughing, Hell Squad continued to walk towards their objective, occasionally passing by other clones. The soldiers would salute Dejer, and some from the 501st and 212th that knew Hell Squad would greet them. 
The cadets would look at the different armor that Hell Squad used, and all the battle marks on it, and quickly understand that they weren't normal clones. Especially when they saw the scratches that covered the entirety of Dager's right shoulder pad, and a part of his arm. Over twenty minutes later, Hell Squad arrived at the core of Topoka City, a gigantic room, which could house over a thousand people. However, at the moment, only a dozen clones, and four Jedis, were there, waiting for them. Commander Dager, I am glad you arrived. If everyone is here, now let's discuss how we can save Kamino. Chapter 268 The eleven members of Deep Squad were just like Dager remembered them, perhaps with a few more scars. Arc Trooper Colt, of Ranker Battalion, on the other hand, was clearly a seasoned soldier, who had gone through a lot. In the room were also Jedi Generals Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Shock T, and Ahsoka Tano, as well as their respective clone commanders, and a few soldiers Dager didn't know. They all had serious expressions on their faces, a testament to the importance of the battle to come. After paying his respects to the Jedis, Hell Squad nodded at their brothers, greeting them, and paying special attention to the new faces. They were two, from the 501st Legion. One of them had a number 5 tattooed on his head, while the other had a blue handprint in his right chest. Both had the disposition of old veterans, but also some of the anxiety of a new trooper. Dager guessed they had their first combat situation not long ago, but they were better than normal clones. Not unlike how Hell Squad came to be, back on the first days of the Clone Wars. Captain Rex, Commander Cody, and Brody from Deep Squad all nodded at them, while the two troopers saluted Dager. Colt inspected the special unit in front of him, and it didn't take long for him to be convinced that they truly were something else. Turning his attention back to General Shock T, who was explaining how they got word of what was, at first, a surprise attack by the Separatist. As she told the people around the hologram table about how a battalion of commando droids had been sent to take over a sentry post on Rishi Moon, Dager understood why the two 501st troopers, Fives and Echo, were there. They, together with Commander Cody and Captain Rex, had been the sole survivors of the garrison. A member of their squad, called Heavy, had sacrificed himself, by holding back the clankers, and later blowing himself up with the sentry post. With it destroyed, the safe signal that was sent was switched off, telling the Republic that something was wrong. To that, Dager nodded at Echo and Fives. He knew it wasn't easy to lose a squad member, and also their sergeant, and several friends. However, according to General Shock T, they had behaved as true soldiers. Master Skywalker will be commanding our fleets in the air, from his own fighter. Obi-Wan and I will stay here, to protect our facilities. The young Jedi nodded, and so did his Padawan. Seeing that the rest of the meeting didn't have to do with their role in the battle, both took their leave they didn't know how long it would take for General Grievous to arrive, so they had to be prepared. Recently, Deja reflected, most of the battles he had been to had had to do with either General Grievous or Asajj Ventress. He guessed that was what it meant to be a special unit. On Kamino, the Separatist will have two main objectives. The first one will be to cause destruction, and eliminate as many cadets in training as possible. They can't do that. They are only children. Coburn, a member of Deep Squad, couldn't help but say that. While Dager agreed, he also knew that the clone only said that because he hadn't partaken in enough battles. That would change soon, unfortunately. The Seppis don't care. For them, a clone is a clone, no matter if they are soldiers or cadets. I fear Cody is right. The Separatist war machines will shoot anything and anyone who isn't one of them. Several faces nodded when they heard General Kenobi. They didn't need a reminder of how brutal the war was. Every trooper had done things he regretted, and so had the Seppis. Yuum. Their second target will be our Matrix facilities. There are three of them, and each contains a sample of the original genetic code for the clones. Unchanged, and intact. Commander Dager, I believe you were involved in an incident that took place in Coruscant, regarding a mad separatist scientist. Remembering the blue-skinned man, and his brothers coughing up blood, dying while Dager and the others watched, powerless, he nodded. They failed that time, because the genetic code of every clone was modified. 
Those three samples, however, weren't. If they get their hands on it, it will only be a matter of time before they can create a virus or a toxin that will destroy and eliminate our entire army in days. Can't we move them to a safer place? I fear not, Brody. If the embryos are disconnected from this genetic code for too long, it may incur in defects in their growth, maybe even death. Regretting it immediately, Dager thought of 99, the poor clone. He guessed that was what General Shock T meant by defects. It bothered him to hear she talk about how clones were born, because it was a grim reminder that they weren't normal, but he understood that, if he wanted to give himself and his brothers a normal life, he couldn't let the Seppis touch the samples. The samples are in the east, south, and west side of Topoka City. Me and Shock T will defend the east, from where their main attack will come. Commander Brody, your squad will be responsible for the south, and Dager, Hell Squad take the west. Cody, Red, you will be responsible for the rest of our defenses. Hold for as long as you can. We have to give Anakin time to push back their fleet. Dager, Brody, you can't leave your positions, no matter what. Kamino won't be lost, and reinforcements are already on the way. The Separatists only want to damage us, not conquer the planet. However, if they get their hands on those samples, they can, and will, eliminate the entire clone army. No matter how the battle goes, you stay put. Dager and Brody exchanged glances, and nodded, their faces serious. General Kenobi couldn't be more clear, and they understood perfectly that they were the last line of defense, not only for this battle, but for all their brothers throughout the galaxy. So, I believe we are finished here. To your positions, and may the Force be with you. Chapter 269 After the Jedi's left, the clones lagged behind, in an unspoken agreement. They weren't sure all of them would survive the battle to come, one of the most brutal of the war, they would see later, and Dager, in specific, had something to ask to the two troopers behind Captain Rex. You said you are from Domino Squad, right? Did you have a trooper named Cut Up with you? A glint of surprise flashed through the clone's eyes, and the one named Fives, probably because of his number, nodded. He. He was eaten by some sort of creature. Did you know him? Dager nodded, and patted Fives' shoulder. The poor Cut Up, whom he had met over a year ago, hadn't been as lucky as his brothers. He was still a cadet, when Kamino was attacked the first time. It was I who gave him his name. Poor kid. Echo and Fives looked at Dager surprised. When Cutup had arrived at their quarters, after the attack, he had proudly announced his new name, and wasted no time in giving the others their own. In all but a few weeks, it had become a tradition, and as soon as they could, the cadets would give and receive names and nicknames. Who would have thought that this originated from the clone in front of them? Somehow, it added more to Dager's identity as the leader of a special unit. While talking, the group of clones arrived at the outside of the facilities. Surprisingly, it wasn't raining, for now. One by one, the members of the group left, Commander Cody and Captain Rex to go to their own legions, Fives and Echo following the later, and Deep Squad going to the south facility. With a head gesture, Dager ordered Hell Squad to follow him. That would be a battle they would never forget. Several hundred troopers took their positions in the railways and bridges outside the west facility. Hell Squad was in the middle of the defenses, right in front of the entrance, and Dager was, at the moment, standing on top of a crate, yelling orders, and making sure everything was in place. He was still like that when over a hundred ships suddenly appeared in the sky. Frigates, dreadnoughts, destroyers, troop carriers, small cruisers, and, of course, vulture droids, as well as hyena-class bombers. The Separatists were going all out, but the Republic wasn't to be outdone. The clones were defending their home, and their brothers. They would do everything they could to stop the clankers, and their determination wouldn't falter. As the first starfighters clashed with the droids, and small explosions appeared on the sky, Dager turned to the clones in front of him. They had hesitated for a moment when they saw the enemy forces, but were now working with renewed effort. Still, there was little else they could do to prepare, so Dager ordered them to rest. They would need all their energy for the battle to come. At ease, soldiers. 
Our brothers in the sky will give the Sepis a hell of a beating before they can touch our home. And when they come, we will eliminate them. Remember, today we aren't fighting only for the Republic. We are fighting for all our brothers in the galaxy, and for our home. We will hold our ground, understood? The only way those bastards get through us will be by stepping on our dead corpses. So let's show them what the clones are worth. Getting down from the crate, Dager accepted the DC-15X that Dab offered him. It wasn't the clone's weapon, but one which he had retrieved from the armory. Since they were the last line of defense, they obviously would be one of the last groups to engage. As such, with the exception of Metal and Cell, the other members of Hell Squad had all grabbed sniper blasters. They might not be as good as Dab, but they didn't need to. All they had to do was keep the clankers at bay for as long as they could. For the next seven hours, the clones stood quiet, watching the battle unfold above them. Several ships from both sides had already become debris, and fallen into the ocean, creating gigantic waves that crashed on the pillars of Topoka City. Still, there was no sign that the battle would end any time soon, prompting the clones to stay focused. The veterans, like Hell Squad, and a few others, were calmly analyzing the surroundings for any threat, while the new troopers were anxiously fiddling with their weapons and feet. Seeing the rookie closest to him suddenly turn his head at the sound of a piece of a ship falling, Dager patted his shoulder. Calm down, Shiny. You will know when the Seppis are attacking. They aren't exactly subtle. Shiny, sir. Dager laughed, and patted his own armor, full of scars and battle marks. You have nothing on your armor. It is shining new, just like a clanker which just left the factory. He was about to say more when suddenly, a portion of the ocean next to them exploded, and shot upwards like a geyser. Inside the pillar of water, to everyone's surprise, was an enormous, octopus-like droid. It reminded Dager of the Blixis he had escaped from on Scarif. The droid used its arms, each one over a hundred meters long, to grab a platform. In the entire city, dozens more did the same, and started spewing droids. In all but a few minutes, dozens of thousands were roaming through the platforms and bridges of Kamino, and the sounds of battle erupted everywhere. On top of that, the clankers were all B2 units, which, for inexperienced soldiers, were a tough enemy. Dager looked through the scope of his blaster, and pressed the trigger twice, killing two clankers just as they left the belly of one of the weird machines. That made the other droids, when they jumped out, stumble, and become easier targets. Once again, Dager entered the weird state of mind that every veteran had when in battle. As a commander, he was paying attention to every minor change of the battlefield, and ordering the troops to move when necessary, but most of his mind was focused on the weapon in his hands. He would aim, press the trigger, aim, press the trigger, aim. He was well aware of the screams of his brothers, and the metallic footsteps of the clankers, but instead of taking it all at once, he would concentrate on his target, and his target only. It was the way the clones found to survive a battle without going crazy, and also why many people saw them as killing machines no different than droids. At some moment, after over three hours of uninterrupted battle, he had switched his DC-15X for his normal DC-15A, and, later, when his ammunition ended, for a DC-15S belonging to one of his fallen brothers. The same trooper he had been talking to when the droids arrived. Looking at the thousands of bodies, from clones and droids alike, and at the now very near B2 super battle droids, Dager pulled out his vibroblade, and ordered the surviving troopers to enter the facility. If outside they already were making the Seppis pay a hefty price, then, inside, they would make the clankers regret invading their home. Chapter 270 A blue lightsaber sliced a B2 super battle droid diagonally, and the two halves fell to the floor with a thunderous sound. Immediately after, General Kenobi used the force to push away two other clankers, but suddenly he felt burning pain on the back of his left shoulder. Turning around, he saw a group of over a dozen droids appear in the corridor he was in, and fire at him. Ignoring his wound, he ordered the troopers near him to focus on the first batch of droids, and lifted his lightsaber to face the second. General Shock T spun around, her long robe forming a circle, and cut down two droids. Beside her, a clone screamed in pain, holding his stomach, and another fell silent, 
his visor broken by a laser. When more lasers started hitting the soldiers around her, coming from above, she jumped up, and used the force to push several droids off the edge of the bridge, sending them into the ocean below. Analyzing the battle, she quickly found her next target, and ran towards it, cutting down any enemies on her path. Admiral Yellerin watched as a separatist frigate broke in half under the focused fire of three Republic cruisers. The ship fell to the planet below, colliding with a building, and bringing it down, taking hundreds of clones and droids with it. At the same time, two V-wings were hit, and crashed into the cruiser, making it tremble. Soon after, several dozen hyena-class bombers and over a hundred vulture droids started targeting them. Barking orders, he watched the enemy close in, and braced himself for impact. Ahsoka Tano spun her Jedi fighter, a modified starfighter, and pressed the triggers, destroying four vulture droids in quick succession. Her squadron followed her, aiming for a dreadnought, but they were intercepted before they could get there. An attack from the side eliminated three of her pilots, and put two others out of combat, leaving them defenseless. With no other option, she turned around to help the soldiers under her command. Deep Squad faced an attack coming from three different directions, but held strong. Like Hell Squad, they had been forced to retreat to inside the facilities, but, at least for now, they were holding on. However, a red light flashed, and the heads of two members of the special squad detached from their bodies. Broody was suddenly launched away by an invisible enemy, and hit the wall, entering unconsciousness immediately. An eerie laugh was the last thing he heard, as someone walked past him, and grabbed the sample they had been protecting. Commander Cody saw a droid aiming at him, and, before he could dodge, a laser was fired, coming straight for his head. He thought he was gone, but a trooper pushed him down, saving his life. Without wasting time, both of them returned fire, melting the outer layer of the B-2 unit. Then, someone screamed on his comlink, prompting Commander Cody to order his troopers to move to the outside of the building. However, that wasn't possible. They were being pressured by the clankers, and would have to deal with them first. Two thermal detonators landed right at Captain Rex's feet. He was able to kick the first one, which blew in midair, but all he could do regarding the second was duck to the side. The shockwave sent him flying, and he crashed in the ground ten meters away, unconscious, bruised, and with a broken rib, but alive. Three other clones weren't so lucky. Fives knelt on the ground, holding the lifeless body of Ninety-Nine. The poor clone had saved his life, as well as Echoes and the lives of several young cadets, not more than kids. The price had been his own life. Closing the eyes of the deformed clone, Fives gave him a quick salute, the same he would give to a proper soldier, because that was what Ninety-Nine was. A true clone, and a real brother, to the very end. Picking up his blaster, he nodded at Echo, and ordered the cadets to stay where they were. The battle was still going. General Skywalker, now on the surface of Kamino, somersaulted backwards, dodging a swing from Ventress lightsabers, and at the same time, pushing her using the force. The vial on her hands fell, bouncing on the ground, and rolling away. She stretched her hand, and the vial came flying towards her, but was intercepted in midair by a hand clad in white armor. To her surprise, she saw that the hand belonged to a clone, who was aiming his blaster at her. Over twenty other troopers were doing the same, and she realized, with surprise, that all the droids in the hangar had died or retreated, leaving only her. Clearly, General Grievous thought the price they were paying was too much. Her ears twitched, and she saw a round, white ship flying towards her. Smiling at General Skywalker, who had her blue lightsaber pointed at her, she slammed her hands on the ground, propelling herself up, and grabbed the open door of the ship. She was met by the cruel stare of General Grievous, mocking her, but she also noticed that his body was covered in black spots, thanks to laser hits. Slashing the inside of the ship in anger, she glared at the young Jedi who had fooled her plans. The invasion of Kamino had failed. The Republic had won this battle. When the droid that he was about to fire at fell to the ground, split in two, Dajer knew they had won the battle. Giving a slight nod to General Kenobi, the commander let exhaustion take over him, and fell to the ground, holding his left side. He could fell at least three cracked ribs, maybe broken, although he wasn't sure of how it happened. And that wasn't all. 
His right shoulder was burning, thanks to two laser that had hit it, and so was his left thigh. The troops that had defended the west facility weren't faring much better than their commander. A few meters to his left, Brain was holding his stomach, panting painfully, and his right arm was hanging uselessly. Metal was laying under two B-2 units, and couldn't move because of their weight. One of his legs had been broken when the clankers fell on top of him. Tech was unconscious, leaning against a wall, blood dripping down from a cut on his head, but apart from that, he was unharmed. Dab and Cell were also out, side by side. They had been hit by several lasers, none fatal. Around them was a wall of dead droids. 3-4 was the only one mostly unharmed, apart from a few scratches on his armor, and was already treating the injured clones. Of the 4,500 troopers tasked to defend the West facility, only 400 were still alive, most in critical condition. 2,400 of them lay dead on the outside, together with over 5,000 of their enemies. Another 1,700 clones had died inside the facility, and their bodies, as well as clankers, littered the corridors, sometimes even making walking difficult. The room where the sample was, and where Hell Squad had organized their last defense, was a mess. The once white walls and floor were now destroyed, marked by lasers and explosions. Medical equipment, crates, and droids, were in pieces, and several glass containers, which held embryos, were broken, dripping their content. When Dager saw General Kenobi approaching him, while the 212th clones helped their injured brothers, and moved bodies to the side, he tried to get up, but his leg didn't let him. The Jedi gestured for him to stay down, and sat next to him, to Dager's surprise.